Chapter 8, Part 4 of the Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Ken Campbell. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Chapter 8, The New York Governorship, Part 4. My troubles were not at an end, however. The bill put the taxation in the hands of the local county boards, and as the railway sometimes passed through several different counties, this was inadvisable. It was the end of the session, and the legislature adjourned. The corporations affected, through various counsel, and the different party leaders of both organizations, urged me not to sign the bill, laying a special stress on this feature, and asking that I wait until the following year, when a good measure could be put through with this obnoxious feature struck out. I had thirty days under the law in which to sign the bill. If I did not sign it, by the end of that time it would not become law. I answered my political and corporation friends by telling them that I agreed with them that this feature was wrong, but that I would rather have the bill with this feature than not have it at all, and that I was not willing to trust to what might be done a year later. Therefore, I explained, I would reconvene the legislature in special session, and if the legislature chose to amend the bill by placing the power of taxation in the state instead of in the county or municipality, I would be glad, but that if it failed to amend it, or amend it improperly, I would sign the original bill and let it become law as it was. When the representatives of Mr. Platt and of the corporations affected found they could do no better, they assented to this proposition. Efforts were tentatively made to outwit me by inserting amendments that would nullify the effects of the law, or by withdrawing the law when the legislature convened, which would at once have deprived me of the whip hand. On May 12th I wrote Senator Platt, outlining the amendments I desired and said, Of course it must be understood that I will sign the present bill if the proposed bill containing the changes outlined above fails to pass. On May 18th I notified the Senate leader John Raines by telegram, legislature has no power to withdraw the ford bill if attempt is made to do so i will sign the bill at once on the same day by telegram i wired mr odell concerning the bill the leaders were preparing some provisions of bill very objectable i am at work on bill to show you tomorrow the bill must not contain greater changes than those outlined in my message my wishes were heeded and when i had reconvened the legislature it amended the bill as I outlined in my message, and in its amended form the bill became law. There promptly followed something which afforded an index of a good faith of the corporations that had been protesting me. As soon as the change for which they had begged was inserted in the law, and the law was signed, they turned round and refused to pay the taxes, and in the lawsuit that followed they claimed that the law was unconstitutional because it contained the very clause which they had so clamorously demanded. Senator David B. Hill had appeared before me on behalf of the corporations to argue for the change, and then appeared before the courts to make the arguments on the other side. The suit was carried through the Supreme Court of the United States, which declared the law constitutional during the time that I was president. One of the painful duties of the chief executive in the states like New York, as well as in the nation, is refusing of pardons. Yet I can imagine nothing more necessary from the standpoint of good citizenship than the ability to steal one's heart in the matter of granting pardons. The pressure is always greatest in two classes of cases. First, that where capital punishment is inflicted. Second, that where the man is prominent socially and in the business world and where in consequence his crime is apt to have been one concerned in some way with finance. As regards capital cases, the trouble is that emotional men and women always see only the individual whose fate is up at the moment, and neither his victim nor the many millions of unknown individuals who would in the long run be harmed by what they ask. Moreover, almost any criminal, however brutal, has usually some person, often a person whom he has greatly wronged, who will plead for him. If the mother is alive, she will always come, and she cannot help feeling that the case in which she is so concerned is peculiar, that in this case a pardon should be granted. It was really heart-trending to have seen the kinfolk and friends of murderers who were condemned to death, and among the very rare occasions when anything governmental or officials caused me to lose sleep 
were the times when I had to listen to some poor mother making a plea for a criminal so wicked, so utterly brutal and depraved, that it would have been a crime on my part to remit his punishment. On the other hand, there were certain crimes where a request for leniency merely made me angry. Such crimes were, for instance, rape, or that circulation of indecent literature, or anything connected with what would now be called the white slave traffic, or wife murder, or gross cruelty to women and children, or seduction and abandonment, or the action of some man getting a girl whom he had seduced to commit abortion. I am speaking in each instance of cases that actually came before me, either while I was governor or while I was president. In an astonishing number of these cases of men of high standing signed petitions or wrote letters asking me to show leniency to the criminal. In two or three of these cases, one where some young roughs had committed rape on a helpless immigrant girl, and another in which a physician of wealth and high standing had seduced a girl, and then induced her to commit abortion, I rather lost my temper, and wrote to the individuals who had asked for the pardon, saying that I extremely regretted that it was not in my power to increase the sentence. I then let the facts be made public, for I thought that my petitioners deserved public censure. Whether they received this public censure or not, I did not know, but that my actions made them very angry I do know, and their anger gave me real satisfaction. The list of these petitioners was a fairly long one, and included two United States Senators, a Governor of a State, two Judges, an Editor, and some eminent lawyers and businessmen. In the class of cases where the offense was one involving the misuse of large sums of money, the reason for the pressure was different. Cases of this kind more frequently came before me when I was President but they also came before me when I was governor, chiefly in the cases of county treasurers who had embezzled funds. A big bank president, a railway magnate, and the official connected with some big corporation, or a government official in a responsible fiduciary position, necessarily belonged among the men who have succeeded in life. This means that his family are living in comfort, and perhaps luxury and refinement, and that his sons and daughters have been well educated. In such a case, the misdeed of the father comes as a crushing disaster to the wife and children, and the people of the community, however bitter originally against the man, grow to feel the most intense sympathy for the bowed-down woman and the children who suffer for the man's fault. It is a dreadful thing in life that so much of atonement for wrongdoing is vicarious. If it were possible in such a case to think only of the banker's or county treasurer's wife and children, any man would pardon the offender at once. Unfortunately, it is not right to think only of the women and children. The very fact that in cases of this class there is certain to be pressure from high sources, pressure sometimes by men who have been beneficially, even though remotely, interested in the man's criminality, no less than pressure because of honest sympathy with the wife and children, makes it necessary that the good public servant shall, no matter how deep his sympathy and regret, steal his heart and do his duty by refusing to let the wrongdoer out. My experience of the way in which pardons are often granted is one of the reasons why I do not believe that life imprisonment for murder or rape is a proper substitute for the death penalty. The average term of so-called life imprisonment in this country is only about 14 years. Of course, there were cases where I either commuted sentences or pardoned offenders with real pleasure. For instance, when president, I frequently commuted sentences for horse stealing in the Indian Territory, because the penalty for stealing a horse was disproportionate to the penalty for many other crimes, and the offense was usually committed by some ignorant young fellow who found a half-wild horse and really did not commit anything like as serious as an offense as the penalty indicated. The judges would be obliged to give the minimum penalty, but would forward me memoranda, stating that if there had been a less penalty, they would have inflicted it, and I would then commute the sentence to the penalty thus indicated. In one case in New York, I pardoned outright a man convicted of murder in the second degree, and I did this on a recommendation of a friend, Father Doyle, of the Paulus Fathers. I had become intimate with the Paulus Fathers while I was a police commissioner, and I had grown to feel confidence in their judgment, 
for I had found that they always told me exactly what the facts were about any man, whether he belonged to their church or not. In this case, the convicted man was a strongly built, respectable old Irishman, employed as a watchman around some big cattle-killing establishments. The young roughs of the neighborhood, which was then of a rather lawless type, used to try to destroy the property of the companies. In a conflict with a watchman, a member of one of the gangs was slain. The watchman was acquitted, but the neighborhood was much wrought up over the acquittal. Shortly afterwards, a gang of the same roughs attacked another watchman, the old Irishman in question, and finally, to save his own life, he was obliged in self-defense to kill one of his assailants. The feeling in the community, however, was strongly against him, and some of the men high up in the corporation became frightened and thought it would be better to throw over the watchman. He was convicted. Father Doyle came to me, told me that he knew the man well, that he was one of the best members of his church, admirable in every way, that he had simply been forced to fight for his life while loyally doing his duty, and that the conviction represented the triumph of the tough element of the district and the abandonment of this man by those who should have stood by him under the influence of an unworthy fear. I looked into the case, came to the conclusion that Father Doyle was right, and gave the man a full pardon before he had served thirty days. The various clashes between myself and the machine, my triumph in them, and the fact that the people were getting more and more interested and aroused, brought on a curious situation in the Republican National Convention in Philadelphia in June of 1900. Senator Platt and the New York machine leaders had become very anxious to get me out of the governorship, chiefly because of the hostility of the big corporation men towards me, but they had also become convinced that there was such a popular feeling on my behalf that it would be difficult to refuse me a renomination if I demanded it. They accordingly decided to push me for vice president taking advantage of the fact that there was at the time a good deal of feeling for me in the country at large. See Appendix B to this chapter. I myself did not appreciate that there was any such feeling, and as I greatly had dislike for the office of Vice President and was much interested in the governorship, I announced that I would not accept the Vice Presidency. I was one of the delegates to Philadelphia. On reaching there, I found that the situation was complicated. Senator Hanna appeared on the surface to have control of the convention. He was anxious that I should not be nominated as vice president. Senator Platt was anxious that I should be nominated as vice president in order to get me out of the New York governorship. Each took a position opposite to that of the other, but each at the time cordially sympathized with the other's feelings about me. It was a manifestation, and not the feelings that differed. My supporters in New York State did not wish me nominated for vice president because they wished me to continue as governor. But in every other state, all the people who admired me were bound that I should be nominated as vice president. These people were almost all desirous of seeing Mr. McKinley renominated as president, but they became angry at Senator Hanna's opposition to me as vice president. He, in his turn, suddenly became aware that if he persisted, he might find that in their anger these men would oppose McKinley's renomination, and although they could not have prevented the nomination, such opposition would have been a serious blow in the campaign, which was to follow. Senator Hanna, therefore, began to waver. Meanwhile, a meeting of the New York delegation was called. Most of the delegates were under the control of Senator Platt. The senator notified me that if I refused to accept the nomination for vice president, I would be beaten for the nomination for governor. I answered that I would accept the challenge, that I would have a straight-out fight of the proposition, and that I would begin at once by telling the assembled delegates of the threat, and giving fair warning that I intended to fight for the governorship nomination, and, moreover, that I intended to get it. This brought Senator Platt to terms. The effort to instruct the New York delegation for me was abandoned, and Lieutenant Governor Woodruff was presented for the nomination in my place. I suppose that this closed the incident, and that no further effort would be made to nominate me for the vice presidency. On the contrary, 
the effect was directly the reverse. The upset of the New York machine increased the feeling of the delegates from the other states that it was necessary to draft me for the nomination. By the next day, Senator Hanna himself had concluded that this was a necessity, and acquiesced in the movement. As New York was already committed against me, and as I was not willing that there should be any chance of supporting that the New Yorkers had nominated me to get rid of me, the result was that I was nominated and seconded from outside states. No other candidate was placed in the field. By this time the legislature had adjourned, and most of my work as governor of New York was over. One unexpected bit of business arose, however. It was the year of the presidential campaign. Tammany, which had been lukewarm about Byron in 1896, cordially supported him in 1900, and when Tammany heartedly supports a candidate, it is well for the opposing candidate to keep a sharp lookout for election frauds. City government was in the hands of Tammany, but I had the power to remove the mayor, the sheriff, and the district attorney for malfeasance, or malfeasance in office. Such power had not been exercised by any previous governor, as far as I knew, but it existed, and if the malfeasance or malfeasance warranted it, and if the governor proposed the requisite determination, the power could be, and ought to be exercised. By an act of the legislature, a state bureau of elections had been created in New York City, and a superintendent of elections appointed by the governor. The chief of the state bureau of elections was John McCullough, formerly in the police department when I was a police commissioner. The chief of police for the city was William F. Devery, one of the Tammany leaders who represented in the police department all that I had warned against while commissioner. On November 4th, Devery directed his subordinates in the police department to disregard the orders which McCulloch had given his deputies, orders which were essential if we were to secure an honest election in the city. I had just returned from a western campaign trip, and I was at Sagamore Hill. I had no direct power over Devery, but the mayor had, and I had power over the mayor. Accordingly, I at once wrote the mayor of New York, to the sheriff of New York, and to the district attorney in New York County, the following letters. State of New York, Oyster Bay, November 5, 1900. To the mayor of the city of New York. Sir, my attention has been called to the official order issued by Chief of Police Devery, in which he directs his subordinates to disregard the chief of the State Elections Bureau, John McCullough, and his deputies. Unless you have already taken steps to secure the recall of this order, it is necessary for me to point out that I shall be obliged to hold you responsible as the head of the city government for the action of the chief of police. If it should result in any breach of peace and intimidation or any crime whatever against the election laws, a state and city authority should work together. I will not fail to call to summary account either state or city authority in the event of either being guilty of intimidation or conveyance of fraud or failure to protect every legal voter in his rights. I therefore hereby notify you that in the event of any wrongdoing following upon the failure of immediate to recall Chief Devery's order, and upon any action or inaction on the part of Chief Devery, I must necessarily call you to account. Yours, etc., Theodore Roosevelt. State of New York, Oyster Bay, November 5, 1900, to the Sheriff of the County of New York. Sir, my attention has been called to the official order issued by the Chief of Police, Devery, in which he directs his subordinates to disregard the Chief of the State Elections Bureau, John McCullough, and his deputies. It is your duty to assist in the orderly enforcement of the law, and I shall hold you strictly responsible for any breach of the public peace within your county, or for any failure on your part to do your full duty in connection with the election tomorrow. Yours truly, Theodore Roosevelt. State of New York, Oyster Bay, November 5, 1900. To the District Attorney of the County of New York. Sir, my attention has been called to the official order issued by Chief of Police Devery, in which he directs his subordinates to disregard the Chief of State Elections Bureau, John McCullough, and his deputies. 
In view of this order, I call your attention to the fact that it is your duty to assist in the orderly enforcement of the law, and there must be no failure on your part to do your full duty in this matter. Yours truly, Theodore Roosevelt. These letters had the desired effect. The mayor promptly required Chief Devery to rescind the obnoxious order, which was promptly done. The sheriff also took prompt action. The district attorney refused to heed my letter and assumed an attitude of defiance, and I removed him from office. On election day there was no clash between the city and the state authorities. The election was orderly and honest. Appendix A. Conservation. As foreshadowing the course I later as president followed in this matter, I give extracts of one of my letters to the commission and from my second and last annual message. I spent the first months of my term in investigations to find out just what the situation was. On November 28, 1899, I wrote to the commission as follows. I have had very many complaints before this as to the inefficiency of the game wardens and game protectors, the complaints usually taking the form that the men have been appointed and are retained without due regard to the duties to be performed. I do not wish a man to be retained or appointed who is not thoroughly fit to perform the duties of game protector. The Adirondacks are entitled to a peculiar share of the Commission's attention, both from the standpoint of forestry and from the less important but still very important standpoint of game and fish protection. The men who do duty as game protectors in the Adirondacks should, by preference, be appointed from the locality itself, and should in all cases be thorough woodsmen. The mere fact that a game protector has to hire a guide to pilot him through the woods is enough to show his unfitness for the position. I want as game protectors men of courage, resolution, and hardihood, who can handle a rifle, axe, and paddle, who can camp out in the summer or winter, who can go on snowshoes if necessary, who can go through the woods by day or by night without regard to trails. I should like full information about all your employees, as to their capacities, as to the labor they perform, and to the distribution from where they do their work. Many of the men hitherto appointed owed their positions principally to political preference. The changes I recommended were promptly made, and much to the good of the public service. In my annual message in January 1900, I said, Great progress has been made through the fish hatcheries in the propagation of valuable food and supporting fish. The laws for the protection of deer have resulted in their increase. Nevertheless, as railroads tend to encroach on the wilderness, the temptation to illegal hunting becomes greater, and the danger from forest fire increases. There is need of great improvement, both in our laws and in their administration. The game wardens have been too few in number. More should be provided. None save fit men must be appointed, and their retention in office must depend purely upon zeal, ability, and efficiency in which they perform their duties. The game wardens in the forest must be woodsmen, and they should have no outside business. In short, there should be a thorough reorganization of the work of the commission. Careful study of the resources and condition of the forests on state lands must be made. It is certainly not too much to expect that the state forest should be managed as efficiently as the forest on private lands in the same neighborhoods, and the measure of difference in efficiency of management must be the measure of condemnation or praise on the way the public forests have been managed. The subject of forest preservation is of the utmost importance to the state. The Adirondacks and Catskills should be great parks, kept in perpetuity for the benefit and enjoyment of our people. Much has been done of late years towards their preservation, but very much remains to be done. The provisions of law in reference to sawmills and wood pulp mills are defective and should be changed so as to the prohibit the dumping of dye stuff, sawdust, or tan bark in any amount whatsoever into the streams. Reservoirs should be made but not where they will tend to destroy large sections of the forest, and only after careful and scientific study of the water resources of the region. People of the forest regions are themselves growing more and more to realize the necessity of preserving both the trees and the game. 
A live deer in the wood will attract to the neighborhood ten times the money that could be obtained for the deer's dead carcass. Timber theft on state lands is, of course, a grave offense against the whole public. Hardy outdoor sports like hunting are in themselves of no small value to the national character and should be encouraged in every way. Men who go into the wilderness, indeed men who take part in any field sports with horse or rifle, receive a benefit which can hardly be given by even the most rigorous athletic games. There is a further and more immediate and practical end in view. A primeval forest is a great sponge which absorbs and distills the rainwater, and when it is destroyed, the result is apt to be an alternation of flood and drought. Forest fires ultimately make the land a desert, and are a detriment to all that portion of the state tributary to the streams through the woods which they occur. Every effort should be made to minimize their destructive influences. We need to have our system of forestry gradually developed and conducted along scientific principles. When this is done, it will be possible to allow marketable lumber to be cut everywhere without damage to the forest, indeed with positive advantage to them. But until lumbering is thus conducted on strictly scientific principles, no less than upon principles of the strictly honest towards the state, we cannot afford to suffer it at all in the state forests. Unrestrained greed means the ruin of great woods and the drying up of the sources of the rivers. Ultimately, the administration of the state lands must be so centralized as to enable us definitely to place responsibility in regards to everything concerning them and to demand the highest degree of trained intelligence in their use. The state should not permit within its limits factories to make bird skins or bird feathers into articles of ornaments or wearing apparel. Ordinary birds, and especially songbirds, should be rigidly protected. Game birds should never be shot to a greater extent that will offset the natural rate of increase. Care should be taken not to encourage the use of cold storage or any other market systems which are a benefit to no one but the wealthy epicure who can afford to pay a heavy price for luxuries. These systems tend to the destruction of the game, which would bear most severely upon the very men whose rapacity had been appealed in order to secure its extermination. I reorganized the commission, putting Austin Wadsworth at its head. Appendix B. The Political Situation in 1900 my general scheme of action as governor was given in a letter I wrote one of my supporters among the independent district organization leaders, Norton Goddard, on April 16, 1900. It runs in part as follows. Nobody can tell, at least of all the machine itself, whether the machine intends to renominate me next fall or not. If, for some reason, I should be weak, whether on account of faults or virtues, doubtless the machine will throw me over. I think I am not uncharitable when I say they would feel no acute grief at doing so. It would be very strange if they did feel such grief, if, for instance, we had strikes which led to riots. I would, of course, be obliged to preserve order and stop the riots. Decent citizens would demand that I should do it, and in any event I should do it wholly without regard to their demands. But once it was done, they would forget all about it while a great many laboring men, honest but ignorant and prejudiced, would bear a grudge against me for doing it. This might put me out of the running as a candidate. Again, the big corporations undoubtedly want to beat me. They prefer the chance of being blackmailed to the certainty that they will not be allowed any more than their due. Of course, they will try to beat me on some entirely different issue, and, as they are very able and very unscrupulous, nobody can tell they won't succeed. I have been trying to stay in with the organization. I did not do it with the idea that they would renominate me. I did it with the idea of getting things done, and in that I have been absolutely successful. Whether Senator Platt and Mr. Odell endeavor to beat me, or do beat me for that renomination next fall, is of very small importance compared to the fact that for my two years I have been able to make a Republican majority in the legislature do good and decent work, and have prevented any split within the party. The task was one of great difficulty, 
because on the one hand I had to keep clearly before me the fact that it was better to have a split than to permit bad work to be done, and on the other hand the fact that to have a split would absolutely prevent all good work. The result has been that I have avoided a split, and that as a net result of my two years and the two sessions in the legislature, there have been enormous improvements in the administration of the government, and there has also been a great advance in legislation. To show my reading of the situation at the time, I quote from a letter of mine to Joseph B. Bishop, then editor of the Commercial Advertiser, with whom toward the end of my term I had grown into very close relations, and who together with my other two friends, Albert Shaw, of the Review of Reviews, and Silas McBee, now the editor of the Constructive Quarterly, knew the inside of every movement, so far as I knew it myself. The letter, which dated April 11th, 1900, runs in part as follows. The dangerous element, as far as I am concerned, comes from the corporations. The, naming certain men, crowd, those like them, have been greatly exasperated by the franchise tax. They would like to get me out of politics for good, but at the moment they think the best thing to do is to put me into the vice presidency. Naturally, I will not be opposed openly on the ground of the corporation's grievance, but every kind of false statement will continually be made, and men like, naming the editors of certain newspapers, will attack me, not as the enemy of corporations, but as their tool. There is no question whatever that if the leaders can, they will upset me. One position which as governor and as president I consistently took, seems to me to represent what ought to be a fundamental principle in American legislative work. I steadfastly refuse to advocate any law, no matter how admirable in theory, if there was good reason to believe that in practice it would not be executed. I have always sympathized with the view set forth by Palladia Webster, in 1783, quoted by Hannes Taylor in his Genesis of the Supreme Court, laws or ordinance of any kind, especially of august bodies of high dignity and consequence, which fail of execution are much worse than none. They weaken the government, expose it to contempt, destroy the confidence of all men, native and foreigners, in it, and expose both aggregate bodies of individuals who have placed confidence in it to many ruinous disappointments which they would have escaped had no such law or ordinance been made. This principle, by the way, not only applies to an internal law which cannot be executed, it applies even more to international action, such as an universal arbitrary treaty which cannot and will not be kept. And most of all, it applies to proposals to make such universal arbitration treaties at the very time that we are not keeping our solemn promise to execute limited arbitration treaties which have already been made. A general arbitration treaty is merely a promise, it represents merely a debt of honorable obligation, and nothing is more discreditable for a nation or an individual than to cover up the repudiation of a debt which can be and ought to be paid by recklessly promising to incur a new and insecure debt which no wise man for one moment supposes ever will be paid. End of chapter 8. Recorded by Ken Campbell. Chapter 9, Part 1 of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Chapter 9. Outdoors and Indoors, Part 1. There are men who love out of doors, who yet never open a book, and other men who love books, but to whom the great book of nature is a sealed volume, and the lines written therein blurred and illegible. Nevertheless, among those men whom I have known, the love of books and the love of outdoors, in their highest expressions, have usually gone hand in hand. It is an affectation for the man who is praising outdoors to sneer at books. Usually, the keenest appreciation of what is seen in nature is to be found in those who have also profited by the hoarded and recorded wisdom of their fellow men. 
Love of outdoor life, love of simple and hearty pastimes, can be gratified by men and women who do not possess large means, and who work hard, and so can love of good books, not of good bindings and of first editions, excellent enough in their way, but sheer luxuries. I mean love of reading books, owning them, if possible, of course, but, if that is not possible, getting them from a circulating library. Sagamore Hill takes its name from the old Sagamore Mohannis, who, as chief of his little tribe, signed away his rights to the land two and a half centuries ago. The house stands right on top of the hill, separated by fields and belts of woodland from all other houses, and it looks out over the bay and the sound. We see the sun go down beyond long reaches of land and water. Many birds dwell in the trees round the house, or in the pastures, and the woods near by, and, of course, in winter, gulls, loons, and wild fowl frequent the waters of the bay and the sound. We love all the seasons, the snows and bare woods of winter, the rush of growing things, and the blossom spray of spring, the yellow grain, the ripening fruits and tasseled corn, and the deep, leafy shades that are heralded by the green dance of summer, and the sharp fall winds that tear the brilliant banners with which the trees greet the dying year. The sound is always lovely. In the summer nights we watch it from the piazza, and see the lights of the tall Fall River boats as they steam steadily by. Now and then we spend a day on it, the two of us, together, in the light rowing skiff, or perhaps with one of the boys to pull an extra pair of oars, we land for lunch at noon under wind-beaten oaks, on the edge of a low bluff, or among the wild plum bushes on a spit of white sand, while the sails of the coasting schooners gleam in the sunlight, and the tolling of the bell buoy comes landward across the waters. Long Island is not as rich in flowers as the valley of the Hudson. Yet there are many. Early in April there is one hillside near us which glows like a tender flame with the white of the bloodroot. About the same time we find the shy mayflower, the trailing arbutus, and although we rarely pick wild flowers, one member of the household always plucks a little bunch of mayflowers to send to a friend working in Panama, whose soul hungers for the northern spring. Then there are shade blow and delicate anemones, about the time of the cherry blossoms, the brief glory of the apple orchards follow, and then the thronging dogwoods fill the forest with their radiance, and so flowers follow flowers until the springtime splendor closes with the laurel and the evanescent honey-sweet locust bloom. The late summer flowers follow, like flaunting lilies, and cardinal flowers, and marshmallows, and pale peach rosemary, and the goldenrod, and the asters, when the afternoon shortens and we again begin to think of fires in the wide fireplaces. Most of the birds in our neighborhood are the ordinary home friends of the house and the barn, the woodlot and the pasture, but now and then the species make queer shifts. The cheery quail, alas, are rarely found near us now, and we no longer hear the whippoorwills at night. But some birds visit us now which formerly did not. When I was a boy, neither the black-throated green warbler nor the purple finch nested around us, nor were bobolinks found in our fields. The black-throated green warbler is now one of our commonest summer warblers. There are plenty of purple finches, and best of all, the bobolinks are far from infrequent. I had written about these new visitors to John Burroughs, and once, when he came out to see me, I was able to show them to him. When I was president, we owned a little house in western Virginia, a delightful house, to us at least, although only a shell of rough boards. We used sometimes to go there in the fall, perhaps at Thanksgiving, and on these occasions we would have quail and rabbits of our own shooting, and once in a while a wild turkey. We also went there in the spring— of course, many of the birds were different from our Long Island friends. There were mocking-birds, the most attractive of all birds, and blue grosbeaks, and cardinals and summer redbirds, instead of scarlet tanagers, and those wonderful singers, the Bewick's wrens, and Carolina wrens. All these I was able to show John Burroughs when he came to visit us, although, by the way, he did not appreciate as much as we did one set of inmates of the cottage, the flying squirrels. We loved having the flying squirrels, father and mother and half-grown young, in their nest among the rafters, and at night we slept so soundly that we did not in the least mind the wild gambols of the little fellows through the rooms, even when, as sometimes happened, they would swoop down to the bed and scuttle across it. 
One April I went to Yellowstone Park, when the snow was still very deep, and I took John Burroughs with me. I wished to show him the big game of the park, the wild creatures that had become so astonishingly tame and tolerant of human presence. In the Yellowstone the animals seem always to behave as one wishes them to. It is always possible to see the sheep and deer and antelope, and also the great herds of elk, which are shyer than the smaller beasts. In April we found the elk weak after the short commons and hard living of winter. Once, without much difficulty, I regularly rounded up a big band of them, so that John Burroughs could look at them. I do not think, however, that he cared to see them as much as I did. The birds interested him more, especially a tiny owl the size of a robin, which we saw perched on the top of a tree in mid-afternoon, entirely uninfluenced by the sun, and making a queer noise like a cork being pulled from a bottle. I was rather ashamed to find out how much better his eyes were than mine in seeing the birds and grasping their differences. When wolf-hunting in Texas, and when bear-hunting in Louisiana and Mississippi, I was not only enthralled by the sport, but also by the strange new birds and other creatures, and the trees and flowers I had not known before. By the way, there was one feast at the White House which stands above all others in my memory, even above the time when I lured Joel Chandler Harris thither for a night, a deed in which to triumph, as all who knew that inveterately shy recluse will testify. This was the Bear Hunter's dinner. I had been treated so kindly by my friends on these hunts, and they were such fine fellows, men whom I was so proud to think of as Americans, that I set my heart on having them at a hunter's dinner at the White House. One December I succeeded. There were twenty or thirty of them, all told, as good hunters, as daring riders, as first-class citizens as could be found anywhere. No finer set of guests ever sat at meat in the White House, and among other game on the table was a black bear, itself contributed by one of these same guests. When I first visited California, it was my good fortune to see the big trees, the sequoias, and then to travel down into the Yosemite, with John Muir. Of course, of all people in the world, he was the one with whom it was best worth while to thus see the Yosemite. He told me that when Emerson came to California he tried to get him to come out and camp with him, for that was the only way in which to see, at their best, the majesty and charm of the Sierras. But at the time Emerson was getting old and could not go. John Muir met me with a couple of packers and two mules to carry our tent, bedding, and food for a three days' trip. The first night was clear, and we lay down in the darkening aisles of the great sequoia grove. The majestic trunks, beautiful in color and in symmetry, rose round us like the pillars of a mightier cathedral than ever was conceived even by the fervor of the Middle Ages. Hermit thrushes sang beautifully in the evening, and again with a burst of wonderful music at dawn. I was interested and a little surprised to find that, unlike John Burroughs, John Muir cared little for birds or bird songs and knew little about them. The hermit thrushes meant nothing to him, the trees and the flowers and the cliffs, everything. The only birds he noticed or cared for were some that were very conspicuous, such as the water ousels, always a particular favorite of mine, too. The second night we camped in a snowstorm, on the edge of the canyon walls, under the spreading limbs of a grove of mighty silver fir, and next day we went down into the wonderland of the valley itself. I shall always be glad that I was in the Yosemite with John Muir, and in the Yellowstone with John Burroughs. Like most Americans interested in birds and books, I know a good deal about English birds as they appear in books. I know the lark of Shakespeare and Shelley, and the Ettrick Shepherd. I know the nightingale of Milton and Keats. I know Wordworth's cuckoo. I know Mavis and Merle singing in the merry green wood of the old ballads. I know Jenny Wren and Cock Robin of the nursery books. Therefore, I had always much desired to hear the birds in real life, and the opportunity offered in June, 1910, when I spent two or three weeks in England. As I could snatch but a few hours from a very exciting round of pleasures and duties, it was necessary for me to be with some companion who could identify both song and singer. In Sir Edward Grey, a keen lover of outdoor life in all its phases, and a delightful companion, who knows the songs and ways of English birds as very few do know them, I found the best possible guide. We left London on the morning of June ninth, twenty-four hours before I sailed from Southampton. Getting off the train at Basingstoke, we drove to the pretty, smiling valley of the Itchen. Here we tramped for three or four hours, then again drove, 
this time to the edge of the new forest, where we first took tea at an inn, and then tramped through the forest to an inn on its other side, at Brockenhurst. At the conclusion of our walk my companion made a list of the birds we had seen, putting an asterisk opposite those which we had heard sing. There were forty-one of the former, and twenty-three of the latter, as follows. Birds which they both saw and heard. Thrush, blackbird, lark, yellowhammer, robin, wren, gold-crested wren, goldfinch, chawfinch, greenfinch, dunnock, blackcap, golden warbler, willow warbler, chiff-chaff, wood warbler, reed bunting, sedge warbler, turtle dove, cuckoo, night jar, and swallow. Birds which they only saw pied wagtail, sparrow, hedge accenter, missile thrush, starling, rook, jackdaw, tree creeper, coot, water hen, little greb, dab chick, tufted duck, wood pigeon, stock dove, peewit, tit, or coal tit, martin, swift, pheasant, and partridge. The valley of the Itchen is typically the England that we know from novel and story and essay. It is very beautiful in every way, with a rich, civilized, fertile beauty, the rapid brook twisting among its reed-beds, the rich green of trees and grass, the stately woods, the gardens and fields, the exceedingly picturesque cottages, the great, handsome houses standing in their parks. Birds were plentiful. I know but few places in America where one would see such an abundance of individuals, and I was struck by seeing such large birds as coots, water-hens, grebs, tufted ducks, pigeons, and peewits. In places in America as thickly settled as the Valley of the Itchen, I should not expect to see any like number of birds of this size, but I hope that the efforts of the Audubon societies and kindred organizations will gradually make themselves felt, until it becomes a point of honor, not only with the American man, but with the American small boy, to shield and protect all forms of harmless wildlife. True sportsmen should take the lead in such a movement, for if there is to be any shooting there must be something to shoot. The prime necessity is to keep, and not kill out, even the birds which in legitimate numbers may be shot. The new forest is a wild, uninhabited stretch of heath and woodland, many of the trees gnarled and aged, and its very wildness, the lack of cultivation, the ruggedness, made it strongly attractive in my eyes, and suggested my own country. The birds, of course, were much less plentiful than beside the itchin. The bird that most impressed me on my walk was the blackbird. I had already heard nightingales in abundance near Lake Cuomo, and had also listened to larks, but I had never heard either the blackbird, the song-thrush, or the black-cap warbler, and while I knew that all three were good singers, I did not know what really beautiful singers they were. Blackbirds were very abundant, and they played a prominent part in the chorus which we heard throughout the day on every hand, though perhaps loudest the following morning at dawn. In its habits and manners the blackbird strikingly resembles our American robin, and indeed looks exactly like a robin, with a yellow bill and coal-black plumage. It hops everywhere over the lawns, just as our robin does, and it lives in nests in the gardens in the same fashion. Its song has a general resemblance to that of our robin, but many of the notes are far more musical, more like those of our wood-thrush. Indeed, there were individuals among those we heard, certain of whose notes seemed to me almost to equal in point of melody the chimes of the wood-thrush, and the highest possible praise for any song-bird is to liken its song to that of the wood-thrush or hermit-thrush. I certainly do not think that the blackbird has received full justice in the books. I knew that he was a singer, but I really had no idea how fine a singer he was. I suppose one of his troubles has been his name, just as with our own catbird. When he appears in the ballads as the Merle, bracketed with his cousin the Mavis, the song-thrush, it is far easier to recognize him as the master singer that he is. It is a fine thing for England to have such an asset of the countryside, a bird so common, so much in evidence, so fearless, and such a really beautiful singer. The thrush is a fine singer, too, a better singer than our American robin, but to my mind not at the best quite as good as the blackbird at his best, although often I found difficulty in telling the song of one from the song of the other, especially if I only heard two or three notes. The larks were, of course, exceedingly attractive. It was fascinating to see them spring from the grass, circle upwards, steadily singing and soaring for several minutes, and then return to the point whence they had started. 
As my companion pointed out, they exactly fulfilled Wordsworth's description. They soared, but did not roam. It is quite impossible wholly to differentiate a bird's voice from its habits and surroundings. Although in the lark's song there are occasional musical notes, the song as a whole is not very musical. But it is so joyous, buoyant, and unbroken, and uttered under such conditions as fully to entitle the bird to the place he occupies, with both poet and prose writer. The most musical singer we heard was the black-cap warbler. To my ear its song seemed more musical than that of the nightingale. It was astonishingly powerful for so small a bird. In volume and continuity it does not come up to the songs of the thrushes and of certain other birds, but in quality, as an isolated bit of melody, it can hardly be surpassed. Among the minor singers the robin was noticeable. We all know this pretty little bird from the books, and I was prepared to find him as friendly and attractive as he proved to be, but I had not realized how well he sang. It is not a loud song, but very musical and attractive, and the bird is said to sing practically all through the year. The song of the wren interested me much, because it was not in the least like that of our house wren, but on the contrary, like that of our winter wren. But the song did not seem to me to be as brilliantly musical as that of the tiny singer of the north woods. The sedge warbler sang in the thick reeds a mocking ventriloquial lay, which reminded me at times of the less pronounced parts of our yellow-breasted chat song. The cuckoo's cry was singularly attractive and musical, far more so than the rolling, many times repeated, note of our rain-crow. We did not reach the inn at Brockenhurst until about nine o'clock, just at nightfall, and a few minutes before that we heard a nightjar. It did not sound in the least like either our whippoorwill or our nighthawk, uttering a long-continued call of one or two syllables, repeated over and over. The chaffinch was very much in evidence, continually chaunting its unimportant little ditty. I was pleased to see the bold, masterful missile-thrush, the storm-cock, as it is often called, but this bird breeds and sings in the early spring, when the weather is still tempestuous, and had long been silent when we saw it. The starlings, rooks, and jackdaws did not sing, and their calls were attractive merely as the calls of our gackles are attractive, and the other birds that we heard sing, though they played their part in the general chorus, were performers of no especial note, like our tree-creepers, pine-warblers, and chipping-sparrows. The great spring chorus had already begun to subside, but the woods and fields were still vocal, with beautiful bird music. The country was very lovely, the inn as comfortable as possible, and the bath and supper very enjoyable after our tramp, and altogether I passed no pleasanter twenty-four hours during my entire European trip. End of chapter 9, part 1 Chapter 9, part 2 of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Nelson Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Chapter 9, Outdoors and Indoors, Part 2 Ten days later, at Sagamore Hill, I was among my own birds, and was much interested as I listened to and looked at them, in remembering the notes and actions of the birds I had seen in England. On the evening of the first day I sat in my rocking chair on the broad veranda, looking across the sound towards the glory of the sunset. The thickly grassed hillside sloped down in front of me to a belt of forest from which rose the golden leisurely chiming of the wood thrushes, chanting their vespers. Through the still air came the warble of Virio and Tanager, and after nightfall we heard the flight song of an oven bird from the same belt of timber. Overhead an oriole sang in the weeping elm, now and then breaking his song to scold like an overgrown wren. Song sparrows and catbirds sang in the shrubbery, and one robin had built its nest over the front and one over the back door, and there was a chippy's nest in the wisteria vine by the stoop. During the next twenty-four hours I saw and heard, either right around the house or while walking down to bathe through the woods, the following forty-two birds. Light green heron, night heron, red-tailed hawk, yellow-billed cuckoo, kingfisher, flicker, hummingbird, swift, meadowlark, red-winged blackbird, sharp-tailed finch, song sparrow, chipping sparrow, bush sparrow, 
purple finch, Baltimore oriole, cow bunting, robin, wood thrush, thrasher, catbird, scarlet tanager, red-eyed vireo, yellow warbler, black-throated green warbler, kingbird, wood peewee, crow, blue jay, cedar bird, Maryland yellowthroat, chickadee, black and white creeper, barn swallow, white-breasted swallow, oven bird, thistle finch, vesper finch, indigo bunting, towhee, grasshopper sparrow, and screech owl. The birds were still in full song, for on Long Island there is little abatement in the chorus until about the second week of July, when the blossoming of the chestnut trees patches the woodland with frothy greenish-yellow. Alas, the blight has now destroyed the chestnut trees, and robbed our woods of one of their distinctive beauties. Our most beautiful singers are the wood thrushes. They sing not only in the early morning, but throughout the long, hot June afternoons. Sometimes they sing in the trees immediately around the house, and if the air is still we can always hear them from among the tall trees at the foot of the hill. The thrashers sing in the hedgerows beyond the garden, the catbirds everywhere. The catbirds have such an attractive song that it is extremely irritating to know that at any moment they may interrupt it to mew and squeal. The bold cheery music of the robins always seems typical of the bold cheery birds themselves. The Baltimore Orioles nest in the young elms around the house, and the orchard Orioles in the apple trees near the garden and outbuildings. Among the earliest sounds of spring is the cheerful, simple, homely song of the song sparrow. And in March we also hear the piercing cadence of the meadowlark, to us one of the most attractive of all bird calls. Of late years now and then we hear the rollicking, bubbling melody of the bobolink in the pastures back of the barn. And when the full chorus of these and of many other of the singers of spring is dying down, there are some true hot-weather songsters, such as the brightly-hued indigo buntings and thistle finches. Among the finches, one of the most musical and plaintive songs is that of the bush sparrow. I do not know why the books call it field sparrow, for it does not dwell in the open fields like the vesper finch, the savannah sparrow, and grasshopper sparrow but among the cedars and bayberry bushes and young locusts in the same places where the prairie warbler is found. Nor is it only the true songs that delight us. We love to hear the flickers call, and we readily pardon any one of their number, which as occasionally happens, is bold enough to wake us in the early morning by drumming on the shingles of the roof. In our ears the red-winged blackbirds have a very attractive note. We love the screaming of the red-tailed hawks as they soar high overhead, and even the calls of the night heron that rest in the tall water maples by one of the wood ponds on our place, and the little green herons that nest beside the salt marsh. It is hard to tell just how much of the attraction in any bird note lies in the music itself and how much in the associations. This is what makes it so useless to try to compare the bird songs of one country with those of another. A man who is worth anything can no more be entirely impartial in speaking of the bird songs with which from his earliest childhood he has been familiar than he can be entirely impartial in speaking of his own family. At Sagamore Hill we love a great many things, birds and trees and books and all things beautiful, and horses and rifles and children and hard work and the joy of life. We have great fireplaces, and in them the logs roar and crackle during the long winter evenings. The big piazza is for the hot, still afternoons of summer. As in every house, there are things that appeal to the householder because of their associations, but which would not mean much to others. Naturally, any man who has been president and filled other positions accumulates such things, with scant regard to his own personal merits. Perhaps our most cherished possessions are a Remington bronze, the Bronco Buster, given me by my men when the regiment was mustered out, and a big Tiffany silver vase given to Mrs. Roosevelt by the enlisted men of the battleship Louisiana after we returned from a cruise on her to Panama. It was a real surprise gift presented to her in the White House on behalf of the whole crew by four as strapping man-of-war's men as ever swung a turret or pointed a twelve-inch gun. The enlisted men of the army I already knew well, 
Of course I knew well the officers of both Army and Navy, but the enlisted men of the Navy I only grew to know well when I was President. On the Louisiana Mrs. Roosevelt and I once dined at the Chief Petty Officer's Mess, and on another battleship, the Missouri, when I was in company with Admiral Evans and Captain Cowles, and again on the Sylph and on the Mayflower we also dined as guests of the crew. When we finished our trip on the Louisiana I made a short speech to the assembled crew, and at its close one of the petty officers, the very picture of what a man of war's man should look like, proposed three cheers for me in terms that struck me as curiously illustrative of America at her best. He said, Now then, men, three cheers for Theodore Roosevelt, the typical American citizen. That was the way in which they thought of the American president, and a very good way, too. It was an expression that would have come naturally only to men in whom the American principles of government and life were ingrained, just as they were ingrained in the men of my regiment. I need scarcely add, but I will add for the benefit of those who do not know, that this attitude of self-respecting identification of interest and purpose is not only compatible with, but can only exist when there is fine and real discipline, as thorough and genuine as the discipline that has always obtained in the most formidable fighting fleets and armies. The discipline and the mutual respect are complementary, not antagonistic. During the presidency, all of us, but especially the children, became close friends with many of the sailor men. The four bearers of the vase to Mrs. Roosevelt were promptly hailed as delightful big brothers by our two smallest boys, who at once took them to see the sights of Washington in the Landau, the president's land ho, as with seafaring humor our guests immediately styled it. Once, after we were in private life again, Mrs. Roosevelt was in a railway station and had some difficulty with her ticket. A fine-looking, quiet man stepped up and asked if he could be of help. He remarked that he had been one of the Mayflower's crew and knew us well, and in answer to a question explained that he had left the Navy in order to study dentistry, and added, a delicious touch, that while thus preparing himself to be a dentist, he was earning the necessary money to go on with his studies by practicing the profession of a prize-fighter, being a good man in the ring. There are various bronzes in the house. St. Gaudens Puritan, a token from my staff officers when I was governor. Proctor's Cougar, the gift of the tennis cabinet, who also gave us a beautiful silver bowl, which is always lovingly pronounced to rhyme with owl, because that was the pronunciation used at the time of the giving by the valued friend who acted as spokesman for his fellow members, and who was himself the only non-American member of the said cabinet. There is a horseman by Mac Moniz, and a big bronze vase by Chemis, an adaption or development of the pottery vases of the southwestern Indians. Mixed with all these gifts from various sources, ranging from a brazen Buddha sent me from the Dalai Lama, and a wonderful psalter from the Emperor Menelik to a priceless ancient samurai sword, coming from Japan in remembrance of the peace of Portsmouth, and a beautifully inlaid miniature suit of Japanese armor given me by a favorite hero of mine, Admiral Togo, when he visited Sagamore Hill. There are things from European friends, a mosaic picture of Pope Leo the Thirteenth in his garden, a huge, very handsome edition of the Nibelungen lead, a striking miniature of John Hampton from Windsor Castle, editions of Dante and the campaigns of Eugenio von Savoy, another of my heroes, a dead hero this time, a Viking cup, the state sword of a Uganda king, the gold box in which the freedom of the city of London was given me, a beautiful head of Abraham Lincoln given me by the French authorities after my speech at the Sarbonne, and many other things from sources as diverse as the Sultan of Turkey and the Dowager Empress of China. Then there are things from home friends, a polo bear skin from Perry, a Sioux buffalo robe with on it painted by some long dead Sioux artist the picture story of Custer's fight, a bronze portrait plaque of Joel Chandler Harris, the candlestick used in sealing the Treaty of Portsmouth sent me by Captain Cameron Winslow, a shoe worn by Dan Patch when he paced a mile in a minute and fifty-nine seconds, sent me by his owner. There is a picture of a bull moose by Carl Rungius, 
which seems to me as spirited an animal painting as I have ever seen. In the north room, with its tables and mantelpiece, and desks and chests made of woods sent from the Philippines by army friends, or by other friends for other reasons, with its bison and wapiti heads, there are three paintings by Marcus Simmons, where light and shadow meet, the porcelain towers, and the seats of the mighty. He is dead now, and he had scant recognition while he lived, yet surely he was a great imaginative artist, a wonderful colorist, and a man with a vision more wonderful still. There is one of Lundgren's pictures of the western plains, and a picture of the Grand Canyon, and one by a Scandinavian artist who could see the fierce picturesqueness of workaday Pittsburgh, and sketches of the White House by Sargent and by Hopkinson Smith. The books are everywhere. There are as many in the north room and in the parlor. Is drawing room a more appropriate name than parlor? As in the library. The gun room at the top of the house, which incidentally has the loveliest view of all, contains more books than any of the other rooms, and they are particularly delightful books to browse among, just because they have not much relevance to one another, this being one of the reasons why they are relegated to their present abode. But the books have overflowed into all the other rooms, too. I could not name any principle upon which the books have been gathered. Books are almost as individual as friends. There is no earthly use in laying down general laws about them. Some meet the needs of one person, and some of another. And each person should beware of the book lover's besetting sin, of what Mr. Edgar Allan Poe calls the mad pride of intellectuality, taking the shape of arrogant pity for the man who does not like the same kind of books. Of course there are books which a man or woman uses as instruments of a profession, law books, medical books, cookery books, and the like. I am not speaking of these, for they are not properly books at all. They come in the category of timetables, telephone directories, and other useful agencies of civilized life. I am speaking of books that are meant to be read. Personally, granted that these books are decent and healthy, the one test to which I demand that they all submit is that of being interesting. If the book is not interesting to the reader, then in all but an infinitesimal number of cases it gives scant benefit to the reader. Of course, any reader ought to cultivate his or her taste so that good books will appeal to it, and that trash won't. But after this point has once been reached, the needs of each reader must be met in a fashion that will appeal to those needs. Personally, the books by which I have profited infinitely more than by any others have been those in which profit was a by-product of the pleasure. That is, I read them because I enjoyed them, because I liked reading them and the profit came in as part of the enjoyment. Of course, each individual is apt to have some special tastes in which he cannot expect that any but a few friends will share. Now, I am very proud of my big-game library. I suppose there must be many big-game libraries in continental Europe, and possibly in England, more extensive than mine, but I have not happened to come across any such library in this country. Some of the originals go back to the 16th century, and there are copies or reproductions of the two or three most famous hunting books of the Middle Ages, such as the Duke of York's translation of Gaston Phoebus, and the queer book of the Emperor Maximilian. It is only very occasionally that I meet anyone who cares for any of these books. On the other hand, I expect to find many friends who will turn naturally to some of the old or the new books of poetry or romance or history to which we of the household habitually turn. Let me add that ours is in no sense a collector's library. Each book was procured because some one of the family wished to read it. We can never afford to take over much thought for the outsides of books. We were too much interested in their insides. Now and then I am asked as to what books a statesman should read, and my answer is poetry and novels, including short stories under the head of novels. I don't mean that he should read only novels and modern poetry. If he cannot also enjoy the Hebrew prophets and the Greek dramatists, he should be sorry. He ought to read interesting books on history and government, and books of science and philosophy. And really good books on these subjects are as enthralling as any fiction ever written in prose or verse. Gibbon and Macaulay, Herodotus, Thucydides and Tacitus, the Heimskringla, 
Froissart, Joinville and Villardouin, Parkman and Mahon, Momsen and Ronca. Why, there are scores and scores of solid histories, the best in the world, which are as absorbing as the best of all the novels, and of as permanent value. The same thing is true of Darwin and Huxley and Carlyle and Emerson and parts of Kant, and of volumes like Sutherland's Growth of the Moral Instinct, or Acton's Essays in Lounsbury's Studies. Here again, I am not trying to class books together, or measure one by another, or enumerate one in a thousand of those worth reading, but just to indicate that any man or woman of some intelligence and some cultivation can in some line or other of serious thought, scientific or historical, or philosophical or economic or governmental, find any number of books which are charming to read, and which in addition give that for which his or her soul hungers. I do not for a minute mean that the statesman ought not to read a great many different books of this character, just as every one else should read them. But, in the final event, the statesman, and the publicist, and the reformer, and the agitator for new things, and the upholder of what is good in old things, all need more than anything else to know human nature, to know the needs of the human soul, and they will find this nature and these needs set forth as nowhere else by the great imaginative writers whether of prose or of poetry. The room for choice is so limitless that to my mind it seems absurd to try to make catalogues which shall be supposed to appeal to all the best thinkers. This is why I have no sympathy whatever with writing lists of the one hundred best books or the five-foot library. It is all right for a man to amuse himself by composing a list of a hundred very good books, and if he is to go off for a year or so where he cannot get many books, it is an excellent thing to choose a five-foot library of particular books, which in that particular year, and on that particular trip, he would like to read. But there is no such thing as a hundred books that are best for all men, or for the majority of men, or for one man at all times. And there is no such thing as a five-foot library which will satisfy the needs of even one particular man on different occasions extending over a number of years. Milton is best for one mood, and Pope for another. Because a man likes Whitman, or Browning, or Lowell, he should not feel himself debarred from Tennyson, or Kipling, or Corner, or Heine, or the bard of Dimbovitsa. Tolstoy's novels are good at one time, and those of Shinkevich at another, and he is fortunate who can relish Salambo, and Tom Brown, and the two admirals, and Quentin Doward, and Artemis Ward, and the Inglesby Legends, and Pickwick, and Vanity Fair. Why, there are hundreds of books like these, each one of which, if really read, really assimilated by the person to whom it happens to appeal, will enable that person quite unconsciously to furnish himself with much ammunition which he will find of use in the battle of life. A book must be interesting to the particular reader at that particular time. But there are tens of thousands of interesting books, and some of them are sealed to some men, and some are sealed to others, and some stir the soul at some given point of a man's life, and yet convey no message at other times. The reader, the book-lover, must meet his own needs without paying too much attention to what his neighbors say those needs should be. He must not hypocritically pretend to like what he does not like. Yet at the same time he must avoid the most unpleasant of all the indications of puffed-up vanity which consists in treating mere individual, and perhaps unfortunate, idiosyncrasy as a matter of pride. I happen to be devoted to Macbeth, whereas I very seldom read Hamlet, though I like parts of it. Now I am humbly and sincerely conscious that this is a demerit in me, and not in Hamlet and yet it would not do me any good to pretend that I like Hamlet as much as Macbeth, when as a matter of fact I don't. I am very fond of simple epics and of ballad poetry, from the Nibelungenlied and the Roland Song through Chevy Chase and Patrick Spens and Twa Corby's to Scott's poems and Longfellow's Saga of King Olaf and O There. On the other hand, I don't care to read dramas as a rule. I cannot read them with enjoyment unless they appeal to me very strongly. They must almost be Aeschylus or Euripides, Garta or Moliere, in order that I may not feel after finishing them a sense of virtuous pride in having achieved a task. 
Now I would be the first to deny that even the most delightful old English ballad should be put on a par with any one of scores of dramatic works by authors whom I have not mentioned. I know that each of these dramatists has written what is of more worth than the ballad. Only I enjoy the ballad, and I don't enjoy the drama. And therefore the ballad is better for me, and this fact is not altered by the other fact that my own shortcomings are to blame in the matter. I still read a number of Scott's novels over and over again, whereas if I finish anything by Miss Austen, I have a feeling that duty performed is a rainbow to the soul. But other book lovers who are very close kin to me, and whose taste I know to be better than mine, read Miss Austen all the time. And moreover, they are very kind, and never pity me in too offensive a manner for not reading her myself. Aside from the masters of literature, there are all kinds of books which one person will find delightful, and which he certainly ought not to surrender just because nobody else is able to find as much in the beloved volume. There is on our bookshelves a little pre-Victorian novel or tale called The Semi-Attached Couple. It is told with much humor. It is a story of gentlefolk who are really gentlefolk, and to me it is altogether delightful. But outside the members of my own family, I have never met a human being who had even heard of it, and I don't suppose I ever shall meet one. I often enjoy a story by some living author so much that I write to tell him so, or to tell her so, and at least half the time I regret my action because it encourages the writer to believe that the public shares my views, and he then finds that the public doesn't. End of chapter 9, part 2 Recording by Jennifer Nelson, Hemet, California. This is Chapter 9, Part 3 of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Nelson. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Chapter 9 Outdoors and Indoors, Part 3 Books are all very well in their way, and we love them at Sagamore Hill, but children are better than books. Sagamore Hill is one of three neighboring houses in which small cousins spent very happy years of childhood. In the three houses there were at one time sixteen of these small cousins, all told, and once we ranged them in order of size and took their photograph. There are many kinds of success in life worth having. It is exceedingly interesting and attractive to be a successful business man, or railroad man, or farmer, or a successful lawyer or doctor, or a writer, or a president, or a ranchman, or the colonel of a fighting regiment, or to kill grizzly bears and lions. But for unflagging interest and enjoyment, a household of children if things go reasonably well, certainly makes all other forms of success and achievement lose their importance by comparison. It may be true that he travels farthest who travels alone, but the goal thus reached is not worth reaching. And as for a life deliberately devoted to pleasure as an end, why, the greatest happiness is the happiness that comes as a by-product of striving to do what must be done, even though sorrow is met in the doing. There is a bit of homely philosophy quoted by Squire Bill Widener of Widener's Valley, Virginia, which sums up one's duty in life. Do what you can, with what you've got, where you are. The country is the place for children, and if not the country, a city small enough so that one can get out into the country. When our own children were little, we were for several winters in Washington, and each Sunday afternoon the whole family spent in Rock Creek Park which was then very real country indeed. I would drag one of the children's wagons, and when the very smallest pairs of feet grew tired of trudging bravely after us, or of racing on rapturous side trips after flowers and other treasures, the owners would clamber into the wagon. One of these wagons, by the way, a gorgeous red one, had express painted on it in gilt letters, and was known to the younger children as the Spress wagon. They evidently associated the color with the term, once, while we were at Sagamore, something happened to the cherished brass wagon to the distress of the children, and especially of the child who owned it. 
Their mother and I were just starting for a drive in the buggy, and we promised the bereaved owner that we would visit a store we knew in East Norwich, a village a few miles away, and bring back another express wagon. When we reached the store, we found to our dismay that the wagon which we had seen had been sold. We could not bear to return without the promised gift, for we knew that the brains of small persons are much puzzled when their elders seem to break promises. Fortunately, we saw in the store a delightful little bright red chair and bright red table, and these we brought home and handed solemnly over to the expectant recipient, explaining that as there unfortunately was not a express wagon, we had brought him back a express chair and a express table. It worked beautifully. The express chair and table were received with such rapture that we had to get duplicates for the other small member of the family who was the particular crony of the proprietor of the new treasures. When their mother and I returned from a row, we would often see the children waiting for us, running like sand spiders along the beach. They always liked to swim in company with a grown-up of buoyant temperament and inventive mind, and the float offered limitless opportunities for enjoyment while bathing. All dutiful parents know the game of stagecoach. Each child is given a name, such as the whip, the nigh-leader, the off-wheeler, the old lady passenger, and under penalty of paying a forfeit, must get up and turn round when the grown-up, who is improvising a thrilling story, mentions that particular object, and when the word stagecoach is mentioned, everybody has to get up and turn round. Well, we used to play stagecoach on the float while in swimming, and instead of tamely getting up and turning round, the child whose turn it was had to plunge overboard. When I mentioned stagecoach, the water fairly foamed with vigorously kicking little legs, and then there was always a moment of interest while I counted, so as to be sure that the number of heads that came up corresponded with the number of children who had gone down. No man or woman will ever forget the time when some child lies sick of a disease that threatens its life. Moreover, much less serious sickness is unpleasant enough at the time. Looking back, however, there are elements of comedy in certain of the less serious cases. I well remember one such instance which occurred when we were living in Washington, in a small house, with barely enough room for everybody when all the chinks were filled. Measles descended on the household. In the effort to keep the children that were well and those that were sick apart, their mother and I had to camp out in improvised fashion. When the eldest small boy was getting well, and had recovered his spirits, I slept on a sofa beside his bed, the sofa being so short that my feet projected over anyhow. One afternoon the small boy was given a toy organ by a sympathetic friend. Next morning early I was waked to find the small boy very vivacious and requesting a story. Having drowsily told the story, I said, Now father's told you a story, so you amuse yourself and let your father go to sleep to which the small boy responded most virtuously, "'Yes, father will go to sleep, and I'll play the organ,' which he did at a distance of two feet from my head. Later his sister, who had just come down with the measles, was put into the same room. The small boy was convalescing and was engaged in playing on the floor with some tin ships, together with two or three pasteboard monitors and rams of my own manufacture. He was giving a vivid rendering of Farragut at Mobile Bay from memories of how I had told the story. My pasteboard rams and monitors were fascinating, if a naval architect may be allowed to praise his own work, and as property they were equally divided between the little girl and the small boy. The little girl looked on with alert suspicion from the bed, for she was not yet convalescent enough to be allowed down on the floor. The small boy was busily reciting the phases of the fight, which now approached its climax, and the little girl evidently suspected that her monitor was destined to play the part of victim. Little boy. And then they steamed bang into the monitor. Little girl. Brother, don't you sink my monitor. Little boy, without heeding and hurrying toward the climax. And the torpedo went at the monitor. Little girl. My monitor is not to sink, little boy dramatically, and bang, the monitor sank. Little girl, it didn't do any such thing. My monitor always goes to bed at seven, and it's now quarter past. My monitor was in bed and couldn't sink. 
When I was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Leonard Wood and I used often to combine forces and take both families of children out to walk, and occasionally some of their playmates. Leonard Wood's son, I found, attributed the paternity of all of those not of his own family to me. Once we were taking the children across Rock Creek on a fallen tree. I was standing on the middle of the log, trying to prevent any of the children from falling off, and while making a clutch at one peculiarly active and heedless child, I fell off myself. As I emerged from the water, I heard the little wood boy calling frantically to the general, "'Oh! Oh! The father of all the children fell into the creek!' which made me feel like an uncommonly moist patriarch. Of course, the children took much interest in the trophies I occasionally brought back from my hunts. When I started from my regiment in 98, the stress of leaving home, which was naturally not pleasant, was somewhat lightened by the next to the youngest boy, whose ideas of what was about to happen were hazy, clasping me round the legs with a beaming smile and saying, "'And is my father going to the war?' And will he bring me back a bear? When some five months later I returned, of course in my uniform, this little boy was much puzzled as to my identity, although he greeted me affably with, Good afternoon, Colonel. Half an hour later somebody asked him, Where's father? To which he responded, I don't know, but the Colonel is taking a bath. Of course the children anthropomorphized if that is the proper term, their friends of the animal world. Among these friends at one period was the baker's horse, and on a very rainy day I heard the little girl, who was looking out of the window, say, with a melancholy shake of her head, "'Oh, there's poor Kraft's horse, all soppin' wet!' While I was in the White House the youngest boy became an habit, too, of a small and rather noisome animal shop and the good-natured owner would occasionally let him take pets home to play with. On one occasion I was holding a conversation with one of the leaders in Congress, Uncle Pete Hepburn, about the railroad rate bill. The children were strictly trained not to interrupt business, but on this particular occasion the little boy's feelings overcame him. He had been loaned a king snake, which, as all nature lovers know, is not only a useful but a beautiful snake, very friendly to human beings and he came rushing home to show the treasure. He was holding it inside his coat, and it contrived to wiggle partly down the sleeve. Uncle Pete Hepburn naturally did not understand the full import of what the little boy was saying to me as he endeavored to wriggle out of his jacket, and kindly started to help him, and then jumped back with alacrity as the small boy and the snake both popped out of the jacket. There could be no healthier and pleasanter place in which to bring up children than in that nook of old-time America around Sagamore Hill. Certainly I never knew small people to have a better time or a better training for their work in after-life than the three families of cousins at Sagamore Hill. It was real country, and, speaking from the somewhat detached point of view of the masculine parent, I should say there was just the proper mixture of freedom and control in the management of the children. They were never allowed to be disobedient or to shirk lessons or work, and they were encouraged to have all the fun possible. They often went barefoot, especially during the many hours passed in various enthralling pursuits along and in the waters of the bay. They swam, they tramped, they boated, they coasted and skated in winter. They were intimate friends with the cows, chickens, pigs, and other livestock. They had in succession two ponies. General Grant, and when the General's legs became such that he lay down too often and too unexpectedly in the road, a calico pony named Algonquit, who is still living a life of honorable leisure in the stable and in the pasture, where he has to be picketed because otherwise he chases the cows. Sedate Pony Grant used to draw the cart in which the children went driving when they were very small, the driver being their old nurse Mamie, who had held their mother in her arms when she was born and who was knit to them by a tie as close as any tie of blood. I doubt whether I ever saw Mamie really offended with them except once, when out of pure but misunderstood affection they named a pig after her. They loved Pony Grant. Once I saw the thin little boy of three hugging Pony Grant's forelegs. As he leaned over, his broad straw hat tilted on end, and Pony Grant meditatively munched the brim. 
whereupon the small boy looked up with a wail of anguish, evidently thinking the pony had decided to treat him like a radish. The children had pets of their own, too, of course. Among them guinea pigs were the standbys. Their highly unemotional nature fits them for companionship with adoring but over-enthusiastic young masters and mistresses. Then there were flying squirrels and kangaroo rats, gentle and trustful, and a badger whose temper was short but whose nature was fundamentally friendly. The badger's name was Josiah. The particular little boy whose property he was used to carry him about, clasped firmly around what would have been his waist if he had had any. Inasmuch as when on the ground the badger would play energetic games of tag with the little boy and nip his bare legs, I suggested that it would be uncommonly disagreeable if he took advantage of being held in the little boy's arms to bite his face, but this suggestion was repelled with scorn as an unworthy assault on the character of Josiah. "'He bites legs sometimes, but he never bites faces,' said the little boy. We also had a young black bear whom the children christened Jonathan Edwards, partly out of compliment to their mother, who was descended from the great Puritan divine and partly because the bear possessed a temper in which gloom and strength were combined in what the children regarded as Calvinistic proportions. As for the dogs, of course, there were many, and during their lives they were intimate and valued family friends, and their deaths were household tragedies. One of them, a large yellow animal of several good breeds, and valuable rather because of psychical than physical traits, was named Susan by his small owners, in commemoration of another retainer, a white cow, the fact that the cow and the dog were not of the same sex being treated with indifference. Much the most individual of the dogs, and the one with the strongest character, was Sailor Boy, a Chesapeake Bay dog. He had a masterful temper and a strong sense of both dignity and duty. He would never let the other dogs fight, and he himself never fought unless circumstances imperatively demanded it. But he was a murderous animal when he did fight. He was not only exceedingly fond of the water, as was to be expected, but passionately devoted to gunpowder in every form, for he loved firearms and fairly reveled in the Fourth of July celebrations, the latter being rather hazardous occasions, as the children strongly objected to any safe and sane element being injected into them, and had the normal number of close shaves with rockets, Roman candles, and firecrackers. One of the standbys for enjoyment, especially in rainy weather, was the old barn. This had been built nearly a century previously, and was as delightful as only the pleasantest kind of old barn can be. It stood at the meeting spot of three fences. A favorite amusement used to be an obstacle race when the barn was full of hay. The contestants were timed and were started successively from outside the door. They rushed inside, clambered over, or burrowed through the hay, as suited them best, dropped out of a place where a loose board had come off, got over, through, or under the three fences, and raced back to the starting point. When they were little, their respective fathers were expected also to take part in the obstacle race, and when with the advance of years the fathers finally refused to be contestants, there was a general feeling of pained regret among the children at such a decline in the sporting spirit. Another famous place for handicap races was Cooper's Bluff, a gigantic sandbank rising from the edge of the bay, a mile from the house. If the tide was high, there was an added thrill, for some of the contestants were sure to run into the water. As soon as the little boys learned to swim, they were allowed to go off by themselves in rowboats and camp out for the night along the sound. Sometimes I would go along so as to take the smaller children. Once a schooner was wrecked on a point half a dozen miles away. She held together well for a season or two, after having been cleared of everything down to the timbers, and this gave us the chance to make camping-out trips in which the girls could also be included, for we put them to sleep in the wreck, while the boys slept on the shore. Squaw picnics, the children called them. My children, when young, went to the public school near us, the Little Cove School, as it is called. For nearly thirty years we have given the Christmas tree to the school. Before the gifts are distributed, I am expected to make an address, which is always mercifully short, my own children having impressed upon me with frank sincerity the attitude of other children to addresses of this kind on such occasions. There are, of course, performances by the children themselves, while all of us parents look admiringly on. 
each sympathizing with his or her particular offspring, in the somewhat wooden recital of Darius Green and his flying machine, or the mountain and the squirrel had a quarrel. But the tree and the gifts make up for all shortcomings. We had a sleigh for winter, but if when there was much snow the whole family desired to go somewhere, we would put the body of the farm wagon on runners and all bundle in together. We always liked snow at Christmas time, and the sleigh ride down to the church on Christmas Eve. One of the hymns always sung at this Christmas Eve festival begins, It's Christmas Eve on the river, it's Christmas Eve on the bay. All good natives of the village firmly believe that this hymn was written here, and with direct reference to Oyster Bay. Although if such were the case, the word river would have to be taken in a hyperbolic sense, as the nearest approach to a river is the village pond. I used to share this belief myself, until my faith was shaken by a Denver lady who wrote that she had sung that hymn when a child in Michigan, and that at the present time her little Denver babies also loved it, although in their case the river was not represented by even a village pond. When we were in Washington, the children usually went with their mother to the Episcopal Church, while I went to the Dutch Reformed. But if any child misbehaved itself, it was sometimes sent next Sunday to church with me, on the theory that my companionship would have a sedative effect, which it did, as I and the child walked along with rather constrained politeness, each eyeing the other with watchful readiness for the unexpected. On one occasion, when the child's conduct fell just short of warranting such extreme measures, his mother, as they were on the point of entering church, concluded a homily by a quotation which showed a certain haziness of memory concerning the marriage and baptismal services. No, little boy, if this conduct continues, I shall think that you neither love, honor, nor obey me. However, the culprit was much impressed with a sense of shortcoming as to the obligations he had undertaken, so the result was as satisfactory as if the quotation had been from the right service. As for the education of the children, there was, of course, much of it that represented downright hard work and drudgery. There was also much training that came as a by-product and was perhaps almost as valuable, not as a substitute, but as an addition. After their supper, the children, when little, would come trotting up to their mother's room to be read to, and it was always a surprise to me to notice the extremely varied reading which interested them, from Howard Pyle's Robin Hood, Mary Alicia Owen's Voodoo Tales, and Joel Chandler Harris's Aaron in the Wild Woods, to Lycides and King John. If their mother was absent, I would try to act as vice-mother, a poor substitute, I fear, superintending the supper and reading aloud afterwards. The children did not wish me to read the books they desired their mother to read, and I usually took some such book as Here Ward the Wake or Guy Mannering or The Last of the Mohicans or else some story about a man-eating tiger or a man-eating lion from one of the hunting books in my library. These latter stories were always favorites, and as the authors told them in the first person, my interested auditors grew to know them by the name of the I stories, and regarded them as adventures all of which happened to the same individual. When Celis, the African hunter, visited us, I had to get him to tell the younger children two or three of the stories with which they were already familiar from my reading, and as Celis is a most graphic narrator, and always enters thoroughly into the feeling not only of himself, but of the opposing lion or buffalo, my own rendering of the incidents was cast entirely into the shade. Besides profiting by the more canonical books on education, we profited by certain essays and articles of a less orthodox type. I wish to express my warmest gratitude for such books, not of avowedly didactic purpose, as Laura Richards' books, Josephine Dodge Daskam's Madness of Philip, Palmer Cox's Queer People, The Melodies of Father Goose and Mother Wild Goose, Flandrau's Mrs. White's, Myra Kelly's stories of her little East Side pupils, and Mickelson's Madigans. It is well to take duties in life generally seriously. It is also well to remember that a sense of humor is a healthy anti-scorbutic to that portentous seriousness which defeats its own purpose. Occasionally, bits of self-education proved of unexpected help to the children in later years. 
Like other children, they were apt to take to bed with them treasures which they particularly esteemed. One of the boys, just before his sixteenth birthday, went moose hunting with the family doctor and close personal friend of the entire family, Alexander Lambert. Once night overtook them before they camped, and they had to lie down just where they were. Next morning Dr. Lambert rather enviously congratulated the boy on the fact that stones and roots evidently did not interfere with the soundness of his sleep, to which the boy responded, "'Well, doctor, you see it isn't very long since I used to take fourteen china animals to bed with me every night.'" As the children grew up, Sagamore Hill remained delightful for them. There were picnics and riding parties. There were dances in the North Room, sometimes fancy dress dances, and open-air plays on the green tennis court of one of the cousins' houses. The children are no longer children now. Most of them are men and women, working out their own fates in the big world, some in our own land, others across the great oceans or where their southern cross blazes in the tropic nights. Some of them have children of their own. Some are working at one thing, some at another. In cable ships, in business offices, in factories, in newspaper offices, building steel bridges, bossing gravel trains and steam shovels, or laying tracks and superintending freight traffic. They have had their share of accidents and escapes. As I write, word comes from a far-off land that one of them, whom Seth Bullock used to call Kim because he was the friend of all mankind, while bossing a dangerous but necessary steel structural job, has had two ribs and two back teeth broken and is back at work. They have known and they will know joy and sorrow, triumph and temporary defeat. But I believe they are all the better off because of their happy and healthy childhood. It is impossible to win the great prizes of life without running risks, and the greatest of all prizes are those connected with the home. No father and mother can hope to escape sorrow and anxiety, and there are dreadful moments when death comes very near those we love, even if for the time being it passes by. But life is a great adventure, and the worst of all fears is the fear of living. There are many forms of success, many forms of triumph, but there is no other success that in any shape or way approaches that which is open to most of the many, many men and women who have the right ideals. These are the men and women who see that it is the intimate and homely things that count most. They are the men and women who have the courage to strive for the happiness which comes only with labor and effort and self-sacrifice, and only to those whose joy in life springs in part from power of work and sense of duty. End of chapter 9 Recording by Jennifer Nelson, Hemet, California Chapter 10, Part 1 of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Chapter 10, The Presidency, Making an Old Party Progressive, Part 1. On September 6, 1901, President McKinley was shot by an anarchist in the city of Buffalo. I went to Buffalo at once. The President's condition seemed to be improving, and after a day or two we were told that he was practically out of danger. I then joined my family, who were in the Adirondacks, near the foot of Mount Tahollis. A day or two afterwards we took a long tramp through the forest, and in the afternoon I climbed Mount Tahollis. After reaching the top I had descended a few hundred feet to a shelf of land where there was a little lake, when I saw a guide coming out of the woods on our trail from below. I felt at once that he had bad news, and sure enough he handed me a telegram, saying that the President's condition was much worse, and that I must come to Buffalo immediately. It was late in the afternoon, and darkness had fallen by the time I reached the clubhouse where we were staying. It was some time afterwards before I could get a wagon to drive me to the nearest railway station, North Creek, some forty or fifty miles distant. The roads were the ordinary wilderness roads, and the night was dark. But we changed horses two or three times, when I say we, I mean the driver and I, as there was no one else with us, and reached the station just at dawn, to learn from Mr. Loeb, who had a special train waiting, that the President was dead. That evening I took the oath of office, in the house of Ansley Wilcox at Buffalo. On three previous occasions the Vice-President had succeeded to the Presidency on the death of the President. 
In each case there had been a reversal of party policy, and a nearly immediate and nearly complete change in the personnel of the higher offices, especially the cabinet. I had never felt that this was wise from any standpoint. If a man is fit to be president, he will speedily so impress himself in the office that the policies pursued will be his anyhow, and he will not have to bother as to whether he is changing them or not, while as regards the offices under him, the important thing for him is that his subordinates shall make a success in handling their several departments. The subordinate is sure to desire to make a success of his department for his own sake, and if he is a fit man, whose views on public policy are sound, and whose abilities entitle him to his position, he will do excellently under almost any chief with the same purposes. I at once announced that I would continue, unchanged, McKinley's policies for the honour and prosperity of the country, and I asked all the members of the Cabinet to stay. There were no changes made among them save as changes were made among their successors whom I myself appointed. I continued Mr. McKinley's policies, changing and developing them and adding new policies only as the questions before the public changed, and as the needs of the public developed. Some of my friends shook their heads over this, telling me that the men I retained would not be loyal to me, and that I would seem as if I were a pale copy of McKinley. I told them that I was not nervous on this score, and that if the men I retained were loyal to their work, they would not be giving me the loyalty for which I most cared, and that if the men I retained were loyal to their work, they would be giving me the loyalty for which I most cared, and that if they were not, I would change them anyhow, and that as for being a pale copy of McKinley, I was not primarily concerned with either following or not following in his footsteps, but in facing the new problems that arose, and that if I were competent I would find ample opportunity to show my competence by my deeds, without worrying myself as to how to convince people of the fact. For the reasons I have already given in my chapter on the governorship of New York, the Republican Party, which in the days of Abraham Lincoln was founded as the radical progressive party of the nation, had been obliged during the last decade of the nineteenth century to uphold the interests of popular government against a foolish and ill-judged mock radicalism. It remained the Nationalist as against the Particularist, or States' Rights Party, and in so far it remained absolutely sound, for little permanent good can be done by any party which worships the state's rights fetish or which fails to regard the state, like the county or the municipality, as merely a convenient unit for local self-government, while in all national matters, of importance to the whole people, the nation is to be supreme over state, county, and town alike. But the state's rights fetish, although still effectively used at certain times by both courts and Congress to block needed national legislation, directed against the huge corporations, or in the interest of working men, was not a prime issue at the time of which I speak. In 1896, 1898, and 1900, the campaigns were waged on two great moral issues. One, the imperative need of a sound and honest currency. Two, the need, after 1898, of meeting in manful and straightforward fashion the extraterritorial problems arising from the Spanish War. On these great moral issues the Republican Party was right, and the men who were opposed to it, and who claimed to be the radicals, and their allies among the sentimentalists, were utterly and hopelessly wrong. This had, regrettably but perhaps inevitably, tended to throw the party into the hands not merely of the conservatives, but of the reactionaries, of men who, sometimes for personal and improper reasons, but more often with entire sincerity and uprightness of purpose, distrusted anything that was progressive and dreaded radicalism. These men, still from force of habit, applauded what Lincoln had done in the way of radical dealing with the abuses of his day, but they did not apply the spirit in which Lincoln worked to the abuses of their own day. Both houses of Congress were controlled by these men. Their leaders in the Senate were Messrs. Aldrich and Hale. The Speaker of the House, when I became President, was Mr. Henderson, but in a little over a year he was succeeded by Mr. Cannon, who, although widely differing from Senator Aldrich in matters of detail, represented the same type of public sentiment. There were many points on which I agreed with Mr. Cannon and Mr. Aldrich, and some points on which I agreed with Mr. Hale. I made a resolute effort to get on with all three, and with their followers, and I have no question that they made an equally resolute effort to get on with me. We succeeded in working together, although with increasing friction, for some years, I pushing forward and they hanging back. Gradually, however, I was forced to abandon the effort to persuade them to come my way, and then I achieved results only by appealing over the heads of the Senate and House leaders to the people, who were the masters of both of us. 
I continued in this way to get results until almost the close of my term, and the Republican Party became once more the progressive, and indeed, the fairly radical progressive party of the nation. When my successor was chosen, however, the leaders of the House and Senate, or most of them, felt that it was safe to come to a break with me, and the last or short session of Congress, held between the election of my successor and his inauguration four months later, saw a series of contests between the majorities in the two Houses of Congress and the President, myself, quite as bitter as if they and I had belonged to opposite political parties. However, I held my own. I was not able to push through the legislation I desired during these four months, but I was able to prevent them doing anything I did not desire, or undoing anything I had already succeeded in getting done. There were, of course, many senators and members of the lower house with whom, up to the very last, I continued to work in hearty accord, and with a growing understanding. I have not the space to enumerate, as I would like to, these men. For many years Senator Lodge had been my close personal and political friend, with whom I discussed all public questions that arose, usually with agreement, and our intimately close relations were of course unchanged by my entry into the White House. He was, of all our public men, the man who had made the closest and wisest study of our foreign relations, and more clearly than almost any other man, he understood the vital fact that the efficiency of our navy conditioned our national efficiency in foreign affairs. Anything relating to our international relations, from Panama and the navy to the Alaskan boundary question, the Algeciras negotiations or the peace of Portsmouth, I was certain to discuss with Senator Lodge and also with certain other members of Congress, such as Senator Turner of Washington and Representative Hitt of Illinois. Anything relating to labor legislation and to measures for controlling big business or efficiently regulating the giant railway systems, I was certain to discuss with Senator Dolliver or Congressman Hepburn or Congressman Cooper. With men like Senator Beveridge, Congressman, afterwards Senator Dixon, and Congressman Murdoch, I was apt to discuss pretty nearly everything relating to either our internal or our external affairs. There were many, many others. The present President of the Senate, Senator Clark of Arkansas, was as fearless and high-minded a representative of the people of the United States as I ever dealt with. He was one of the men who combined loyalty to his own state with an equally keen loyalty to the people of the United States. He was politically opposed to me, but when the interests of the country were at stake, he was incapable of considering party differences, and this was especially his attitude in international matters, including certain treaties which most of his party colleagues, with narrow lack of patriotism and complete subordination of national to factional interest, opposed. I have never, anywhere, met finer, more faithful, more disinterested, and more loyal public servants than Senator O. H. Platt, a Republican from Connecticut, and Senator Cockrell, a Democrat from Missouri. They were already old men when I came to the Presidency, and doubtless there were points on which I seemed to them to be extreme and radical, but eventually they found that our motives and beliefs were the same, and they did all in their power to help any movement that was for the interest of our people as a whole. I had met them while I was Civil Service Commissioner and Assistant Secretary of the Navy. All I had ever to do with either was to convince them that a given measure I championed was right, and he then at once did all that he could to have it put into effect. If I could not convince them, why, that was my fault, or my misfortune, but if I could convince them, I never had to think again as to whether they would or would not support me. There were many other men of mark in both houses with whom I could work on some points, whereas on others we had to differ. There was one powerful leader, a burly, forceful man of admirable traits, who had, however, been trained in the post-bellum school of business and politics, so that his attitude towards life, quite unconsciously, reminded me a little of Artemis Ward's view of the Tower of London. If I like it, I'll buy it. There was a big governmental job in which this leader was much interested, and in reference to which he always wished me to consult a man whom he trusted, whom I will call Pitt Rodney. One day I answered him, The trouble with Rodney is that he misestimates his relations to Cosmos. To which he responded, Cosmos? Cosmos? Never heard of him. You stick to Rodney, he's your man. Outside of the public servants there were multitudes of men, in newspaper offices, in magazine offices, in business or the professions, or on farms or in shops, who actively supported the policies for which I stood, and did work of genuine leadership, which was quite as effective as any work done by men in public office. Without the active support of these men, I would have been powerless. In particular, the leading newspaper correspondents at Washington were as a whole a singularly able, 
trustworthy, and public-spirited body of men, and the most useful of all agents in the fight for efficient and decent government. As for the men under me in executive office, I could not overstate the debt of gratitude I owe them. From the heads of the departments, the cabinet officers down, the most striking feature of the administration was the devoted, zealous, and efficient work that was done, as soon as it became understood, that the one bond of interest among all of us was the desire to make the government the most effective instrument in advancing the interests of the people as a whole, the interests of the average men and women of the United States, and of their children. I do not think I overstate the case when I say that most of the men who did the best work under me felt that ours was a partnership, and that we all stood on the same level of purpose and service, and that it mattered not what position any one of us held, so long as in that position he gave the very best that was in him. We worked very hard, but I made a point of getting a couple of hours off each day for equally vigorous play. The men with whom I then played, whom we laughingly grew to call the tennis cabinet, have been mentioned in a previous chapter of this book, in connection with the gift they gave me at the last breakfast which they took at the White House. There were many others in the public service under me, with whom I happened not to play, but who did their share of our common work just as effectively as it was done by us who did play. Of course, nothing could have been done in my administration if it had not been for the zeal, intelligence, masterful ability, and downright hard labor of these men in countless positions under me. I was helpless to do anything except as my thoughts and orders were translated into action by them, and, moreover, each of them, as he grew specially fit for his job, used to suggest to me the right thought to have, and the right order to give, concerning that job. It is, of course, hard for me to speak with cold and dispassionate partiality of these men, who were as close to me as were the men of my regiment. But the outside observers best fitted to pass judgment about them felt as I did. At the end of my administration, Mr. Bryce, the British ambassador, told me that in a long life, during which he had studied intimately the government of many different countries, he had never in any country seen a more eager, high-minded, and efficient set of public servants, men more useful and more creditable to their country, than the men then doing the work of the American government in Washington and in the field. I repeat this statement with the permission of Mr. Bryce. At about the same time, or a little before, in the spring of 1908, there appeared in the English Fortnightly Review an article, evidently by a competent eye-witness, setting forth more in detail the same views to which the British ambassador thus privately gave expression. It was in part as follows. Mr. Roosevelt has gathered around him a body of public servants, who are nowhere surpassed, I question whether they are anywhere equaled, for efficiency, self-sacrifice, and an absolute devotion to their country's interests. Many of them are poor men, without private means, who have voluntarily abandoned high professional ambitions, and turned their backs on the rewards of business, to serve their country on salaries that are not merely inadequate, but indecently so. There is not one of them who is not constantly assailed by offers of positions in the world of commerce, finance, and the law, that would satisfy every material ambition with which he began life. There is not one of them who could not, if he chose, earn outside Washington from ten to twenty times the income on which he economizes as a state official. But these men are as indifferent to money and to the power that money brings as to the allurements of Newport in New York, or to merely personal distinctions, or to the commercialized ideals which the great bulk of their fellow countrymen accept without question. They are content, and more than content, to sink themselves in the national service without a thought of private advancement, and often at a heavy sacrifice of worldly honors, and to toil on, sustained by their own native impulse, to make of patriotism an efficient instrument of public betterment. The American public rarely appreciate the high quality of the work done by some of our diplomats, work, usually unnoticed and unrewarded, which redounds to the interest and the honor of all of us. The most useful man in the entire diplomatic service, during my presidency, and for many years before, was Henry White. And I say this having in mind the high quality of work done by such admirable ambassadors and ministers as Bacon, Meyer, Strauss, O'Brien, Rockhill, and Egan, to name only a few among many. When I left the presidency, White was ambassador to France. Shortly afterwards he was removed by Mr. Taft, for reasons unconnected with the good of the service. The most important factor in getting the right spirit in my administration, next to the insistence upon courage, honesty, and a genuine democracy of desire to serve the plain people, 
was my insistence upon the theory that the executive power was limited only by specific restrictions and prohibitions appearing in the Constitution, or imposed by the Congress under its constitutional powers. My view was that every executive officer, and above all every executive officer in high position, was a steward of the people bound actively and affirmatively to do all he could for the people, and not to content himself with the negative merit of keeping his talents undamaged in a napkin. I declined to adopt the view that what was imperatively necessary for the nation could not be done by the President, unless he could find some specific authorization to do it. My belief was that it was not only his right but his duty to do anything that the needs of the nation demanded, unless such action was forbidden by the Constitution or by the laws. Under this interpretation of executive power, I did, and caused to be done, many things not previously done by the President and the heads of the departments. I did not usurp power, but I did greatly broaden the use of executive power. In other words, I acted for the public welfare. I acted for the common well-being of all our people, whenever and in whatever manner was necessary, unless prevented by direct constitutional or legislative prohibition. I did not care a rap for the mere form and show of power. I cared immediately for the use that could be made of the substance. The Senate at one time objected to my communicating with them in printing, preferring the expensive, foolish, and laborious practice of writing out the messages by hand. It was not possible to return the outworn archaism of handwriting, but we endeavored to have printing made as pretty as possible. Whether I communicated with the Congress in writing or by word of mouth, and whether the writing was by a machine or a pen, were equally and absolutely unimportant matters. The importance lay in what I said, and in the heed paid to what I said. So as to my meeting and consulting senators, congressmen, politicians, financiers, and labor men, I consulted all who wished to see me, and if I wished to see any one I sent for him, and where the consultation took place was a matter of supreme unimportance. I consulted every man with the sincere hope that I could profit by and follow his advice. I consulted every member of Congress who wished to be consulted, hoping to be able to come to an agreement of action with him, and I always finally acted as my conscience and common sense bade me act. About Appointments I was obliged by the Constitution to consult the Senate, and the long-established custom of the Senate meant that in practice this consultation was with individual senators, and even with big politicians who stood behind the senators. I was only one-half the appointing power. I nominated, but the Senate confirmed. In practice, by what was called the courtesy of the Senate, the Senate normally refused to confirm any appointment if the senator from the state objected to it. In exceptional cases, where I could arouse public attention, I could force through the appointment in spite of the opposition of the senators. In all ordinary cases this was impossible. On the other hand, the senator could, of course, do nothing for any man unless I chose to nominate him. In consequence, the Constitution itself forced the President and the senators from each state to come to a working agreement on the appointments in and from that state. My course was to insist on absolute fitness, including honesty, as a prerequisite to every appointment, and to remove only for good cause, and, where there was such cause, to refuse even to discuss with the senator in interest the unfit servant's retention. Subject to these considerations, I normally accepted each senator's recommendations for offices of a routine kind, such as most post offices and the like, but insisted on myself choosing the men for the more important positions. I was willing to take any good man for postmaster, but in the case of a judge or district attorney or canal commissioner or ambassador, I was apt to insist either on a given man or else on any man with a given class of qualifications. If the senator deceived me, I took care that he had no opportunity to repeat the deception. I can perhaps best illustrate my theory of action by two specific examples. In New York, Governor Odell and Senator Platt sometimes worked in agreement and sometimes were at sword's points, and both wished to be consulted. To a friendly congressman, who was also their friend, I wrote as follows on July twenty second, 1903. I want to work with Platt. I want to work with Odell. I want to support both and take the advice of both. But, of course, ultimately I must be the judge as to acting on the advice given. When, as in the case of the judgeship, I am convinced that the advice of both is wrong, I shall act as I did when I appointed Holt. When I could find a friend of Odell's like Cooley, who is thoroughly fit for the position I desire to fill, it gives me the greatest pleasure to appoint him. When Platt proposes to me a man like Hamilton Fish, it is equally a pleasure to appoint him. 
This was written in connection with events which led up to my refusing to accept Senator Platt's or Governor Odell's suggestions as to a federal judgeship and a federal district attorneyship, and insisting on the appointment, first of Judge Howe, and later of District Attorney Simpson, because in each case I felt that the work to be done was of so high an order that I could not take an ordinary man. End of chapter 10, part 1《Chapter Ten, Part Two of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Amanda Hindman. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter Ten: The Presidency, Making an Old Party Progressive, Part Two. The other case was that of Senator Fulton of Oregon. Through Francis Heaney I was prosecuting men who were implicated in a vast network of conspiracy against the law in connection with the theft of public land in Oregon. I had been acting on Senator Fulton's recommendations for office in the usual manner. Heaney had been insisting that Fulton was in league with the men we were prosecuting, and that he had recommended unfit men. Fulton had been protesting against my following Heaney's advice, particularly as regards appointing Judge Wolverton as United States Judge. Finally, Henny laid before me a report which convinced me of the truth of his statements. I then wrote to Fulton as follows on November twentieth, 1905. My dear Senator Fulton, I enclose you herewith a copy of the report made to me by Mr. Henny. I have seen the originals of the letters from you and Senator Mitchell quoted therein. I do not at this time desire to discuss the report itself, which of course I must submit to the Attorney General. But I have been obliged to reach the painful conclusion that your own letters, as therein quoted, tend to show that you recommended for the position of district attorney B, when you had good reason to believe that he had himself been guilty of fraudulent conduct, that you recommended C for the same position simply because it was for B's interest that he should be so recommended, and, as there is reason to believe, because he had agreed to divide the fees with B if he were appointed and that you finally recommended the reappointment of H, with the knowledge that if H were appointed, he would abstain from prosecuting B for criminal misconduct, this being why B advocated H's claims for reappointment. If you care to make any statement in the matter, I shall of course be glad to hear it. As the District Judge of Oregon, I shall appoint Judge Wolverton. In the letter, I of course gave in full the names indicated above by initials. Senator Fulton gave no explanation. I therefore ceased to consult him about appointments under the Department of Justice and the Interior, the two departments in which the crookedness had occurred. There was no question of crookedness in the other offices in the state, and they could be handled in the ordinary manner. Legal proceedings were undertaken against his colleague in the Senate and one of his colleagues in the lower house, and the former was convicted and sentenced to the penitentiary. In a number of instances, the legality of executive acts of my administration was brought before the courts. They were uniformly sustained. For example, prior to 1907, statutes relating to the disposition of coal lands had been construed as fixing the flat price at $10 to $20 per acre. The result was that valuable coal lands were sold for wholly inadequate prices, chiefly to big corporations. By executive order, the coal lands were withdrawn and not opened for entry until proper classification was placed thereon by government agents. There was a great clamor that I was usurping legislative power. But the acts were not assailed in court until we brought suits to set aside entries made by persons and associations to obtain larger areas than the statutes authorized. This position was opposed on the ground that the restrictions imposed were illegal, that the executive orders were illegal. The Supreme Court sustained the government. In the same way, our attitude in the water power question was sustained, the Supreme Court holding that the federal government had the rights we claimed over streams that are or may be declared navigable by Congress. Again, when Oklahoma became a state, we were obliged to use the executive power to protect Indian rights and property, for there had been an enormous amount of fraud in the obtaining of Indian lands by white men. Here, we were denounced as usurping power over a state as well as usurping power that did not belong to the executive. The Supreme Court sustained our action. In connection with the Indians, by the way, it was again and again necessary to assert the position of the President as steward of the whole people. I had a capital Indian commissioner, Francis E. Loop. 
i found that i could rely on his judgment not to get me into fights that were unnecessary and therefore i always backed him to the limit when he told me that a fight was necessary on one occasion for example congress passed a bill to sell to settlers about half a million acres of indian land in oklahoma at one and a half dollars an acre i refused to sign it and turned the matter over to loop the bill was accordingly withdrawn amended so as to safeguard the welfare of the indians and the minimum price raised to five dollars an acre then i signed the bill we sold that land under sealed bids and realized for the kiowa comanche and apache indians more than four million dollars three millions and a quarter more than they would have obtained if i had signed the bill in its original form in another case where there had been a division among the sauk and fox indians part of the tribe removing to iowa the iowa delegation in congress backed by two iowans who were members of my cabinet passed a bill awarding a sum of nearly a half million dollars to the iowa seceders they had not consulted the indian bureau luke protested against the bill and i vetoed it a subsequent bill was passed on the lines laid down by the indian bureau referring the whole controversy to the courts and the supreme court in the end justified our position by deciding against the iowa seceders and awarding the money to the oklahoma state homes as to all action of this kind there have long been two schools of political thought upheld with equal sincerity the division has not normally been along political but temperamental lines the course i followed of regarding the executive as subject only to the people and under the constitution bound to serve the people affirmatively in cases where the constitution does not explicitly forbid him to render the service was substantially the course followed by both andrew jackson and abraham lincoln other honorable and well-meaning presidents such as james buchanan took the opposite and as it seems to me narrowly legalistic view that the president is the servant of congress rather than of the people and could do nothing no matter how necessary it be to act unless the constitution explicitly commands the action most able lawyers who are past middle age take this view and so do large numbers of well-meaning respectable citizens my successor in office took this the buchanan view of the president's powers and duties for example under my administration we found that one of the favorite methods adopted by the men desirous of stealing the public domain was to carry the decision of the secretary of the interior into court by vigorously opposing such action and only by so doing we were able to carry out the policy of properly protecting the public domain my successor not only took the opposite view but recommended to congress the passage of a bill which would have given the courts direct appellate power over the secretary of the interior in these land matters this bill was reported favorably by mr mondale chairman of the house committee on public lands a congressman who took the lead in every measure to prevent the conservation of our natural resources and the preservation of the national domain for the use of home seekers fortunately congress declined to pass the bill its passage would have been a veritable calamity i acted on the theory that the president could at any time in his discretion withdraw from entry any of the public lands of the united states and reserve the same for forestry for water power sites for irrigation and other public purposes without such action it would have been impossible to stop the activity of the land thieves no one ventured to test its legality by lawsuit my successor however himself questioned it and referred the matter to congress again congress showed its wisdom by passing a law which gave the president the power which he had long exercised and of which my successor had shorn himself perhaps the sharp difference between what may be called the lincoln jackson and the buchanan taft schools in their views of the power and duties of the president may be best illustrated by comparing the attitude of my successor toward his secretary of the interior mr ballinger when the latter was accused of gross misconduct in office with my attitude towards my chiefs of department and other subordinate officers more than once while i was president my officials were attacked by congress generally because these officials did their duty well and fearlessly in every such case i stood by the official and refused to recognize the right of congress to interfere with me excepting by impeachment or in other constitutional manner on the other hand wherever i found the officer unfit for his position i promptly removed him even although the most influential men in congress fought for his retention the jackson lincoln view is that a president who is fit to do good work should be able to form his own judgment as to his own subordinates and above all of the subordinates standing highest and in closest and most intimate touch with him my secretaries and their subordinates were responsible to me and i accepted the responsibility for all their deeds as long as they were satisfactory to me i stood by them against every critic or assailant within or without congress and as for getting congress to make my mind up for me about them the thought would have been inconceivable to me 
my successor took the opposite or buchanan view when he permitted and requested congress to pass judgment on the charges made against mr ballinger as an executive officer these charges were made to the president the president had the facts before him and could get at them at any time and he alone had power to act if the charges were true however he permitted and requested congress to investigate mr ballinger the party minority of the committee that investigated him and one member of the majority declared that the charges were well founded and that mr ballinger should be removed the other members of the majority declared the charges ill founded the president abode by the view of the majority of course believers in the jackson lincoln theory of the presidency would not be content with this town meeting majority and minority method of determining by another branch of the government what it seems the especial duty of the president himself to determine for himself in dealing with his own subordinate in his own department there are many worthy people who reprobate the buchanan method as a matter of history but who in actual life reprobate still more strongly the jackson lincoln method when it is put into practice these persons conscientiously believe that the president should solve every doubt in favor of inaction as against action that he should construe strictly and narrowly the constitutional grant of powers both to the national government and to the president within the national government in addition however to the men who conscientiously believe in this course from high although as i hold misguided motives there are many men who affect to believe in it merely because it enables them to attack and to try to hamper for partisan or personal reasons an executive whom they dislike there are other men in whom especially when they are themselves in office practical adherence to the buchanan principle represents not well thought out devotion to an unwise course but simple weakness of character and desire to avoid trouble and responsibility unfortunately in practice it makes little difference which class of ideas actuates the president who by his action sets a cramping precedent whether he is high-minded and wrong-headed or merely infirm of purpose whether he means well feebly or is bound by a mischievous misconception of the powers and duties of the national government and of the president the effect of his actions is the same the president's duty is to act so that he himself and his subordinates shall be able to do efficient work for the people and this efficient work he and they cannot do if congress is permitted to undertake the task of making up his mind for him as to how he shall perform what is clearly his sole duty one of the ways in which by independent action of the executive we were able to accomplish an immense amount of work for the public was through volunteer unpaid commissions appointed by the president it was possible to get the work done by these volunteer commissions only because of the enthusiasm for the public service which starting in the higher offices at washington made itself felt throughout the government departments as i have said i never knew harder and more disinterested work done by any people than was done by the men and women of all ranks in the government service the contrast was really extraordinary between their live interest in their work and the traditional clerical apathy which has so often been the distinguishing note of governmental work in washington most of the public service performed by these volunteer commissions carried on without a cent of pay to the men themselves and wholly without cost to the government was done by men the great majority of whom were already in the government service and already charged with responsibilities amounting each to a full man's job the first of these commissions was the commission on the organization of government scientific work whose chairman was charles d walcott appointed march thirteenth nineteen o three its duty was to report directly to the president upon the organization present condition and needs of the executive government work wholly or partially scientific in character and upon the steps which should be taken if any to prevent the duplication of such work to coordinate its various branches to increase its efficiency and economy and to promote its usefulness to the nation at large this commission spent four months in an examination which covered the work of about thirty of the larger scientific and executive bureaus of the government and prepared a report which furnished the basis for numerous improvements in the government service another commission appointed june second nineteen o five was that on department methods charles h keep chairman whose task was to find out what changes are needed to place the conduct of the executive business of the government in all its branches on the most economical and effective basis in the light of the best modern business practice the letter appointing this commission laid down nine principles of effective governmental work the most striking of which was the existence of any method standard custom or practice is no reason for its continuance when a better is offered this commission composed like that just described of men already charged with important work performed its functions wholly without cost to the government it was assisted by a body of about seventy experts in the government departments chosen for their special qualifications to carry forward a study of the best methods in business and organized into assistant committees under the leadership of overton w price secretary of the commission
these assistant committees all of whose members were still carrying on their regular work made their reports during the last half of nineteen o six the committee informed itself fully regarding the business methods of practically every individual branch of the business of the government and effected a marked improvement in general efficiency throughout the service the conduct of the routine business of the government had never been thoroughly overhauled before and this examination of it resulted in the promulgation of a set of working principles for the transaction of public business which are as sound today as they were when the committee finished its work the somewhat elaborate and costly investigations of government business methods since made have served merely to confirm the findings of the committee on departmental methods which were achieved without costing the government a dollar the actual savings in the conduct of the business of the government through the better methods thus introduced amounted yearly to many hundreds of thousands of dollars but a far more important gain was due to the remarkable success of the commission in establishing a new point of view in public servants toward their work the need for improvement in the governmental methods of transacting business may be illustrated by an actual case an officer in charge of an indian agency made a requisition in the autumn for a stove costing seven dollars certifying at the same time that it was needed to keep the infirmary warm during the winter because the old stove was worn out thereupon the customary papers went through the customary routine without unusual delay at any point the transaction moved like a glacier with dignity to its appointed end and the stove reached the infirmary in good order in time for the indian agent to acknowledge its arrival in these words the stove is here so is spring the civil service commission under men like john mcilney and garfield rendered service without which the government could have been conducted with neither efficiency nor honesty the politicians were not the only persons at fault almost as much improper pressure for appointments is due to mere misplaced sympathy and to the spiritless inefficiency which seeks a government office as a haven for the incompetent an amusing feature of office seeking is that each man desiring an office is apt to look down on all others with the same object as forming an objectionable class with which he has nothing in common at the time of the eruption of mount pele when among others the american council was killed a man who had long been seeking an appointment promptly applied for the vacancy he was a good man of persistent nature who felt i had been somewhat blind to his merits the morning after the catastrophe he wrote saying that as the council was dead he would like his place and that i could surely give it to him because even the office seekers could not have yet applied for it the method of public service involved in the appointment and the work of the two commissions just described was applied also in the establishment of four other commissions each of which performed its task without salary or expense for its members and wholly without cost to the government the other four commissions were commission on public lands commission on inland waterways commission on country life and commission on national conservation all of these commissions were suggested to me by gifford pinchot who served upon them all the work of the last four will be touched upon in connection with the chapter on conservation these commissions by their reports and findings directly interfered with many placeholders who were doing inefficient work and their reports and the action taken thereon by the administration strengthened the hands of those administrative officers who in the various departments and especially in the secret service were proceeding against land thieves and other corrupt wrongdoers moreover the mere fact that they did efficient work for the public along lines new to veteran and cynical politicians of the old type created vehement hostility to them senators like mr hale and congressmen like mr tawney were especially bitter against these commissions and towards the end of my term they were followed by the majority of their fellows in both houses who had gradually been sundered from me by the open or covert hostility of the financial or wall street leaders and of the newspaper editors and politicians who did their bidding in the interest of privilege these senators and congressmen asserted that they had a right to forbid the president profiting by the unpaid advice of disinterested experts of course i declined to admit the existence of any such right and continued the commissions my successor acknowledged the right upheld the view of the politicians in question and abandoned the commissions to the lasting detriment of the people as a whole one thing is worth pointing out during the seven and a half years of my administration we greatly and usefully extended the sphere of governmental action and yet we reduced the burden of the taxpayers for we reduced the interest-bearing debt by more than ninety million dollars to achieve a market increase in efficiency and at the same time an increase in economy is not an easy feat but we performed it end of chapter ten part two recording by amanda hindman glenn mississippi chapter ten part three of autobiography of theodore roosevelt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Amanda Hindman. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt.
Chapter Ten, The Presidency, Making an Old Party Progressive, Part Three. There was one ugly and very necessary task. This was to discover and root out corruption wherever it was found in any of the departments. The first essential was to make it clearly understood that no political or business or social influence of any kind would for one moment be even considered when the honesty of a public official was at issue. It took a little time to get this fact thoroughly drilled into the heads both of the men within the service and of the political leaders without. The feat was accomplished so thoroughly that every effort to interfere in any shape or way with the course of justice was abandoned definitely and for good. Most, although not all, of the frauds occurred in connection with the post office department and the land office. It was in the post office department that we first definitely established the rule of conduct which became universal throughout the whole service. Rumors of corruption in the department became rife, and finally I spoke of them to the then first assistant postmaster general, afterwards postmaster general, Robert J. Wynn. He reported to me, after some investigation, that in his belief there was doubtless corruption, but that it was very difficult to get at it, and that the offenders were confident and defiant because of their great political and business backing and the ramifications of their crimes. Talking the matter over with him, I came to the conclusion that the right man to carry on the investigation was the then fourth assistant postmaster general, now a senator from Kansas, Joseph L. Bristow, who possessed the iron fearlessness needful to front such a situation. Mr. Bristow had perforce seen a good deal of the seamy side of politics, and of the extent of the unscrupulousness with which powerful influence was brought to bear to shield defenders. Before undertaking the investigation, he came to see me and said that he did not wish to go into it unless he could be assured that I would stand personally behind him, and, no matter where his inquiries led him, would support him and prevent interference with him. I answered that I would certainly do so. He went into the investigation with relentless energy, dogged courage, and keen intelligence. His success was complete, and the extent of his services to the nation are not easily to be exaggerated. He unearthed a really appalling amount of corruption, and he did his work with such absolute thoroughness that the corruption was completely eradicated. We had, of course, the experience usual in all such investigations. At first, there was popular incredulity and disbelief that there was much behind the charges, or that much could be unearthed. Then, when the corruption was shown, there followed a yell of anger from all directions, and a period during which any man accused was forthwith held guilty by the public, and violent demands were made by the newspapers for the prosecution not only of the men who could be prosecuted with a fair chance of securing conviction and imprisonment, but of other men whose misconduct had been such as to warrant my removing them from office, but against whom it was not possible to get the kind of evidence which would render likely conviction in a criminal case. Suits were brought against all the officials whom we thought we could convict, and the public complained bitterly that we did not bring further suits. We secured several convictions, including convictions of the most notable offenders. The trials consumed a good deal of time. Public attention was attracted to something else. Indifference succeeded to excitement, and, in some subtle way, the jury seemed to respond to the indifference. One of the worst offenders was acquitted by a jury, whereupon not a few of the same men who had insisted that the government was derelict and not criminally prosecuting every man whose misconduct was established so as to make it necessary to turn him out of office, now turned round, and inasmuch as the jury had not found this man guilty of crime, demanded that he should be reinstated in office. It is needless to say that the demand was not granted. There were two or three other acquittals of prominent outsiders. Nevertheless, the net result was that the majority of the worst offenders were sent to prison, and the remainder dismissed from the government service, if they were public officials, and if they were not public officials, at least so advertised as to render it impossible that they should ever again have dealings with the government. The department was absolutely cleaned and became one of the very best in the government. Several senators came to see me, Mr. Garfield was present on the occasion, and said that they were glad I was putting a stop to corruption, but they hoped I would avoid all scandal, that if I would make an example of some one man and then let the others quietly resign, it would avoid a disturbance which might hurt the party. They were advising me in good faith, and I was as courteous as possible in my answer, but explained that I would have to act with the utmost rigor against the offenders, no matter what the effect on the party party, and, moreover, that I did not believe it would hurt the party. It did not hurt the party. It helped the party. A favorite war cry in American political life has always been, turn the rascals out. We made it evident that, as far as we were concerned, this war cry was pointless, for we turned our own rascals out. There were important and successful land fraud prosecutions in several western states. 
Probably the most important were the cases prosecuted in Oregon by Francis J. Henney, with the assistance of William J. Burns, a Secret Service agent who at that time began his career as a great detective. It would be impossible to overstate the services rendered to the cause of decency and honesty by Messrs. Henney and Burns. Mr. Henney was my close and intimate adviser, professionally and non-professionally, not only as regards putting a stop to frauds in the public lands, but in many other matters of vital interest to the Republic. No man in the country has waged the battle for national honesty with greater courage and success, with more whole-hearted devotion to the public good, and no man has been more traduced and maligned by the wrong-doing agents and representatives of the great sinister forces of evil. He secured the conviction of various men of high political and financial standing in connection with the Oregon prosecutions. He and Burns behaved with scrupulous fairness and propriety. But their services to the public caused them to incur the bitter hatred of those who had wronged the public. And after I left office, the National Administration turned against them. One of the most conspicuous of the men whom they had succeeded in convicting was pardoned by President Taft. In spite of the fact that the presiding judge, Judge Hunt, had held that the evidence amply warranted the conviction, and had sentenced the man to imprisonment. As was natural, the 146 land fraud defendants in Oregon, who included the foremost machine political leaders in the state, furnished the backbone of the opposition to me in the presidential contest of 1912. The opposition rallied behind Messrs. Taft and La Follet, and although I carried the primaries handsomely, half of the delegates elected from Oregon under the instructions to vote for me sided with my opponents in the National Convention and as regards some of them I became convinced that the mainspring of their motive lay in the intrigue for securing the pardon of certain of the men whose conviction Heaney had secured. Land fraud and post office cases were not the only ones. We were especially zealous in prosecuting all of the higher-up offenders in the realms of politics and finance who swindled on a large scale. Special assistants of the Attorney General, such as Mr. Frank Kellogg of St. Paul, and various first-class federal district attorneys in different parts of the country, secured notable results. Mr. Stimson and his assistants, Messrs. Wise, Dennison, and Frankfurter, in New York, for instance, in connection with the prosecution of the Sugar Trust and of the banker Morse, and of a great metropolitan newspaper for opening its columns to obscene and immoral advertisements. And in St. Louis, Messrs. Dyer and Nortoni, who, among other services, secured the conviction and imprisonment of Senator Burton of Kansas. And in Chicago, Mr. Sims, who raised his office to the highest pitch of efficiency, secured the conviction of the banker Walsh and of the Beef Trust, and first broke through the armor of the Standard Oil Trust. It is not too much to say that these men, and others like them, worked a complete revolution in the enforcement of the federal laws, and made their offices organized legal machines fit and ready to conduct smashing fights for the people's rights, and to enforce the laws in aggressive fashion. When I took the presidency, it was a common and bitter saying that a big man, a rich man, could not be put in jail. We put many big and rich men in jail, two United States Senators, for instance, and among others, two great bankers, one in New York and one in Chicago. One of the United States Senators died, the other served his term. One of the bankers was released from prison by executive order after I left office. These were merely individual cases among many others like them. Moreover, we were just as relentless in dealing with crimes of violence among the disorderly and brutal classes as in dealing with the crimes of cunning and fraud in which certain wealthy men and big politicians were guilty. Mr. Sims in Chicago was particularly efficient in sending to the penitentiary numbers of the infamous men who batten on the white slave traffic after July 1908, when by proclamation I announced the adherence of our government to the international agreement for the suppression of the traffic. The views I then held, and now hold, were expressed in a memorandum made in the case of a negro convicted of the rape of a young negro girl, practically a child. A petition for his pardon had been sent to me. White House, Washington, D.C., August 8, 1904. The application for the commutation of sentence of John W. Burley is denied. This man committed the most hideous crime known to our laws, and twice before he has committed crimes of a similar though less horrible character. In my judgment, there is no justification whatever for paying heed to the allegations that he is not of sound mind, allegations made after the trial and conviction. Nobody would pretend that there has ever been any such degree of mental unsoundness shown as would make people even consider sending him to an asylum if he had not committed this crime. 
Under such circumstances, he should certainly be esteemed sane enough to suffer the penalty for his monstrous deed. I have scant sympathy with the plea of insanity advanced to save a man from the consequences of crime, when, unless that crime had been committed, it would have been impossible to persuade any responsible authority to commit him to an asylum as insane. Among the most dangerous criminals, and especially among those prone to commit this particular kind of offence, there are plenty of a temper so fiendish or so brutal as to be incompatible with any other than a brutish order of intelligence. But these men are nevertheless responsible for their acts, and nothing more tends to encourage crime among such men than the belief that through the plea of insanity or any other method it is possible for them to escape paying the just penalty of their crimes. The crime in question is one to the existence of which we largely owe the existence of that spirit of lawlessness which takes the form in lynching. It is a crime so revolting that the criminal is not entitled to one particle of sympathy from any human being. It is essential that the punishment for it should be not only as certain but as swift as possible. The jury in this case did their duty by recommending the infliction of the death penalty. It is to be regretted that we do not have special provision for more summary dealing with this type of case. The more we do what in us lies to secure certain and swift justice in dealing with these cases, the more effectively do we work against the growth of that lynching spirit which is so full of evil omen for this people, because it seeks to avenge one infamous crime by the commission of another of equal infamy. The application is denied, and the sentence will be carried into effect. Signed, Theodore Roosevelt. One of the most curious incidents of lawlessness with which I had to deal affected an entire state. The state of Nevada in the year 1907 was gradually drifting into utter governmental impotence and downright anarchy. The people were at heart all right, but the forces of evil had been permitted to get the upper hand and, for the time being, the decent citizens had become helpless to assert themselves either by controlling the greedy corporations on the one hand or repressing the murderous violence of certain lawless labor organizations on the other hand. The governor of the state was a Democrat and a Southern man and, in the abstract, a strong believer in the doctrine of states' rights. But his experience finally convinced him that he could obtain order only through the intervention of the national government, and then he went over too far and wished to have the national government do his police work for him. In the Rocky Mountain states there had existed for years what was practically a condition of almost constant war between the wealthy mine owners and the Western Federation of Miners, at whose head stood Messrs. Haywood, Pettibone, and Moyer, who were about that time indicted for the murder of the governor of Idaho. Much that was lawless, much that was indefensible, had been done by both sides. The legislature of Nevada was in sympathy with, or at least was afraid of not expressing sympathy for, Messrs. Moyer, Haywood, Pettibone, and their associates. The state was practically without any police, and the governor had recommended the establishment of a state constabulary along the lines of the Texas Rangers but the legislature rejected his request the governor reported to me the conditions as follows during nineteen o seven the goldfield mining district became divided into two hostile camps half of the western federation of miners were constantly armed and arms and ammunition were purchased and kept by the union as a body while the mine owners on their side retained large numbers of watchmen and guards who were also armed and always on duty in addition to these opposing forces there was as the governor reported an unusually large number of the violent and criminal element always attracted to a new and booming mining camp under such conditions the civil authorities were practically powerless and the governor being helpless to avert civil war called on me to keep order i accordingly threw in a body of regular troops under general funston these kept order completely and the governor became so well satisfied that he thought he would like to have them there permanently this seemed to me unhealthy and on december twenty eighth nineteen o seven i notified him that while i would do my duty the first need was that the state authorities should do theirs and that the first step towards this was the assembling of the legislature i concluded my telegram if within five days from receipt of this telegram you shall have issued the necessary notice to convene the legislature of nevada i shall continue the troops during a period of three weeks if when the term of five days has elapsed the notice has not been issued the troops will be immediately returned to their former stations i had already investigated the situation through a committee composed of the chief of the bureau of corporations mr h k smith the chief of the bureau of labor mr c p neal and the comptroller of the treasury mr lawrence murray 
These men I could thoroughly trust, and their report, which was not over-favorable to either side, had convinced me that the only permanent way to get good results was to insist on the people of the state themselves grappling with and solving their own troubles. The governor summoned the legislature, it met, and the constabulary bill was passed. The troops remained in Nevada until time had been given for the state authorities to organize their force so that violence could at once be checked. Then they were withdrawn. Nor was it only as regards their own internal affairs that I sometimes had to get into active communication with the state authorities. There has always been a strong feeling in California against the immigration of Asiatic laborers, whether these are wage workers or men who occupy and till the soil. I believe this is to be fundamentally a sound and proper attitude, an attitude which must be insisted upon, and yet which can be insisted upon in such a manner, and with such courtesy, and such sense of mutual fairness, and reciprocal obligation, and respect, as not to give any just cause of offense to Asiatic peoples. In the present state of the world's progress, it is highly inadvisable that peoples in wholly different stages of civilization, or of wholly different types of civilization, even although both equally high, shall be thrown into intimate contact. This is especially undesirable when there is a difference of both race and standard of living. In California, the question became acute in connection with the admission of the Japanese. I then had, and now have, a hearty admiration for the Japanese people. I believe in them, I respect their great qualities, I wish that our American people had many of these qualities. Japanese and American students, travelers, scientific and literary men, merchants engaged in international trade, and the like, can meet on terms of entire equality, and should be given the freest access each to the country of the other. But the Japanese themselves would not tolerate the intrusion into their country of a mass of Americans who would displace Japanese in the business of the land. I think they are entirely right in this position. I would be the first to admit that Japan has the absolute right to declare on what terms foreigners shall be admitted to work in her country, or to own land in her country, or to become citizens of her country. America has, and must insist upon, the same right. The people of California were right in insisting that the Japanese should not come thither in mass, that there should be no influx of laborers, of agricultural workers, or small tradesmen, in short, no mass settlement or immigration. Unfortunately, during the latter part of my term as president, certain unwise and demagogic agitators in California, to show their disapproval of the Japanese coming into the state, adopted the very foolish procedure of trying to provide by law that the Japanese children should not be allowed to attend the schools with the white children, and offensive and injurious language was used in connection with the proposal. The Federal Administration promptly took up the matter with the California authorities, and I got into personal touch with them. At my request, the Mayor of San Francisco and other leaders in the government came to see me. I explained that the duty of the national government was twofold. In the first place, to meet every reasonable wish and every real need of the people in California or any other state in dealing with the people of a foreign power, and in the next place, itself exclusively and fully to exercise the right of dealing with this foreign power. Inasmuch as in the last resort, including that last of all resorts, war, the dealing of necessity had to be between the foreign power and the national government. It was impossible to admit that the doctrine of state sovereignty could be invoked in such a matter. As soon as legislative or other action in any state affects a foreign nation, then the affair becomes one for the nation, and the state should deal with the foreign power purely through the nation. I explained that I was in entire sympathy with the people of California as to the subject of immigration of the Japanese in mass, but that of course I wished to accomplish the object they had in view in the way that would be most courteous and most agreeable to the feelings of the Japanese, that all relations between the two peoples must be those of reciprocal justice, and that it was an intolerable outrage on the part of newspapers and public men to use offensive and insulting language about a high-spirited, sensitive, and friendly people, and that such action as was proposed about the schools could only have bad effects, and would in no shape or way achieve the purpose that the Californians had in mind. I also explained that I would use every resource of the national government to protect the Japanese and their treaty rights, and would count upon the state authorities backing me up to the limit in such action. In short, I insisted upon the two points. One, that the nation, and not the individual states, must deal with matters of such international significance, and must treat foreign nations with entire courtesy and respect. 
and two that the nation would at once and in efficient and satisfactory manner take action that would meet the needs of california i both asserted the power of the nation and offered a full remedy for the needs of the state this is the right and the only right course the worst possible course in such a case is to fail to insist on the right of the nation to offer no action of the nation to remedy what is wrong and yet to try to coax the state not to do what it is mistakenly encouraged to believe it has the power to do when no other alternative is offered after a good deal of discussion we came to an entirely satisfactory conclusion the obnoxious school legislation was abandoned and i secured an arrangement with japan under which the japanese themselves prevented any immigration to our country of their laboring people it being distinctly understood that if there was such immigration the united states would at once pass an exclusion law it was of course infinitely better that the japanese should stop their own people from coming rather than that we should have to stop them but it was necessary for us to hold this power in reserve unfortunately after i left office a most mistaken and ill-advised policy was pursued towards japan combining irritation and inefficiency which culminated in a treaty under which we surrendered this important and necessary right it was alleged in excuse that the treaty provided for its own abrogation but of course it is infinitely better to have a treaty under which the power to exercise a necessary right is explicitly retained rather than a treaty so drawn that recourse must be had to the extreme step of abrogating if it ever becomes necessary to exercise the right in question the arrangement we made worked admirably and entirely achieved its purpose no small part of our success was due to the fact that we succeeded in impressing on the japanese that we sincerely admired and respected them and desired to treat them with the utmost consideration i cannot too strongly express my indignation with and abhorrence of reckless public writers and speakers who with coarse and vulgar insolence insult the japanese people and thereby do the greatest wrong not only to japan but to their own country such conduct represents that nadir of underbreeding and folly the japanese are one of the great nations of the world entitled to stand and standing on a footing of full equality with any nation of europe or america i have the heartiest admiration for them they can teach us much their civilization is in some respects higher than our own it is eminently undesirable that japanese and americans should attempt to live together in masses any such attempt would be sure to result disastrously and the far-seeing statesmen of both countries should join to prevent it but this is not because either nation is inferior to the other it is because they are different the two peoples represent two civilizations which although in many respects equally high are so totally distinct in their past history that it is idle to expect in one or two generations to overcome this difference one civilization is as old as the other and in neither case is the line of cultural descent coincident with that of ethnic descent unquestionably the ancestors of the great majority both of the modern americans and the modern japanese were barbarians in that remote past which saw the origins of the cultured peoples to which the americans and the japanese of to-day severally trace their civilizations but the lines of development of these two civilizations of the orient and the occident have been separate and divergent since thousands of years before the christian era certainly since that hoary eld in which the akkadian predecessors of the shaladian semites held sway in mesopotamia an effort to mix together out of hand the peoples representing the culminating points of two such lines of divergent cultural development would be fraught with peril and this i repeat because the two are different not because either is inferior to the other why statesmen looking to the future will for the present endeavor to keep the two nations from mass contact and intermingling precisely because they wish to keep each in relations of permanent good will and friendship with the other End of chapter 10, part 3, recording by Amanda Hindman, Glen, Mississippi. Chapter 10, part 4 of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amanda Hindman. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter 10 the presidency making an old party progressive part four exactly what was done in the particular crisis to which i refer is shown in the following letter which after our policy had been successfully put into execution i sent to the then speaker of the california lower house of the legislature 
The White House, Washington, February 8, 1909. Honorable P. A. Stanton, Speaker of the Assembly, Sacramento, California. I trust there will be no misunderstanding of the federal government's attitude. We are jealously endeavoring to guard the interests of California and of the entire West in accordance with the desires of our Western people. By friendly agreement with Japan, we are now carrying out a policy which, while meeting the interests and desires of the Pacific Slope, is yet compatible not merely with mutual self-respect but with mutual esteem and admiration between the Americans and Japanese. The Japanese government is loyally and in good faith doing its part to carry out this policy, precisely as the American government is doing. The policy aims at mutuality of obligation and behavior. In accordance with it, the purpose is that the Japanese shall come here exactly as Americans go to Japan, which is in effect, that travelers, students, persons engaged in international business, men who sojourn for pleasure or study, and the like, shall have the freest access from one country to the other, and shall be sure of the best treatment, but that there shall be no settlement in mass by the people of either country in the other. During the last six months, under this policy, more Japanese have left the country than have come in, and the total number in the United States has diminished by over 2,000. These figures are absolutely accurate and cannot be impeached. In other words, if the present policy is consistently followed and works as well in the future as it is now working, all difficulties and causes of friction will disappear, while at the same time each nation will retain its self-respect and the good will of the other. But such a bill as this school bill accomplishes literally nothing whatever in the line of the object aimed at, and gives just and grave cause for irritation. While, in addition, the United States government would be obliged immediately to take action in the federal courts to test such legislation, as we hold it to be clearly a violation of the treaty. On this point, I refer you to the numerous decisions of the United States Supreme Court in regard to state laws which violate treaty obligations of the United States. The legislation would accomplish nothing beneficial and would certainly cause some mischief, and might cause very grave mischief. In short, the policy of the administration is to combine the maximum of efficiency in achieving the real object which the people of the Pacific Slope have at heart, with the minimum of friction and trouble, while the misguided men who advocate such action as this against which I protest are following a policy which combines the very minimum of efficiency with the maximum of insult, and which, while totally failing to achieve any real result for good, yet might accomplish an infinity of harm. If in the next year or two the action of the federal government fails to achieve what it is now achieving, then through the further action of the President and Congress it can be made entirely efficient. I am sure that the sound judgment of the people of California will support you, Mr. Speaker, in your effort. Let me repeat that at present we are actually doing the very thing which the people of California wish to be done, and to upset the arrangement under which this is being done cannot do good and may do great harm. If in the next year or two the figures of immigration prove that the arrangement which has worked so successfully during the last six months is no longer working successfully, then there would be ground for grievance and for the reversal by the national government of its present policy. But at present the policy is working well, and until it works badly it would be a grave misfortune to change it, and when changed it can only be changed effectively by the national government. Theodore Roosevelt in foreign and domestic affairs alike, the policy pursued during my administration was simple. In foreign affairs, the principle from which we never deviated was to have the nation behave toward other nations precisely as a strong, honorable, and upright man behaves in dealing with his fellow men. There is no such thing as international law in the sense that there is municipal law or law within a nation. Within the nation there is always a judge and a policeman who stands back of the judge. The whole system of law depends first upon the fact that there is a judge competent to pass judgment, and second upon the fact that there is some competent officer whose duty it is to carry out this judgment by force if necessary. In international law there is no judge unless the parties in interest agree that one shall be constituted, and there is no policeman to carry out the judge's orders. In consequence, as yet each nation must depend upon itself for its own protection. The frightful calamities that have befallen China solely because she has no power of self-defense ought to make it inexcusable in any wise American citizen to pretend 
to patriotic purpose, and yet to fail to insist that the United States shall keep in a condition of ability, if necessary, to assert its rights with a strong hand. It is folly of the criminal type for the nation not to keep up its navy, not to fortify its vital strategic points, and not to provide an adequate army for its needs. On the other hand, it is wicked for the nation to fail in either justice, courtesy, or consideration when dealing with any other power, big or little. John Hay was Secretary of State when I became President, and continued to serve under me until his death. And his and my views, as to the attitude that the nation should take in foreign affairs, were identical, both as regards our duty to be able to protect ourselves against the strong, and as regards our duty always to act not only justly but generously toward the weak. John Hay was one of the most delightful of companions, one of the most charming of all men of cultivation and action. Our views on foreign affairs coincided absolutely, but, as was natural enough, in domestic matters he felt much more conservative than he did in the days when, as a young man, he was private secretary to the great radical democratic leader of the, of the sixties, Abraham Lincoln. He was fond of jesting with me about my supposedly dangerous tendencies in favor of labor against capital. When I was inaugurated on March 4, 1905, I wore a ring he sent to me the evening before, containing the hair of Abraham Lincoln. This ring was on my finger when the Chief Justice administered to me the oath of allegiance to the United States. I often thereafter told John Hay that when I wore such a ring on such an occasion, I bound myself more than ever to treat the Constitution, after the manner of Abraham Lincoln, as a document which put human rights above property rights when the two conflicted. The last Christmas John Hay was alive, he sent me the manuscript of a Norse saga by William Morris, with the following note. Christmas Eve, 1904. Dear Theodore, In your quality of Viking, this Norse saga should belong to you, and in your character of enemy of property, this Ms. of William Morris will appeal to you. Wishing you a Merry Christmas and many happy years, I am yours affectionately, John Hay. In internal affairs I cannot say that I entered the presidency with any deliberately planned and far-reaching scheme of social betterment. I had, however, certain strong convictions, and I was on the lookout for every opportunity of realizing those convictions. I was bent upon making the government the most efficient possible instrument in helping the people of the United States to better themselves in every way, politically, socially, and industrially. I believed with all my heart in real and thorough-going democracy, and I wished to make this democracy industrial as well as political, although I had only partially formulated the methods I believed we should follow. I believed in the people's rights, and therefore in national rights and states' rights, just exactly to the degree in which they severely secured popular rights. I believed in invoking the national power with absolute freedom for every national need, and I believed that the Constitution should be treated as the greatest document ever devised by the wit of man to aid a people in exercising every power necessary for its own betterment, and not as a straitjacket cunningly fashioned to strangle growth. As for the particular methods of realizing these various beliefs, I was content to wait and see what method might be necessary in each given case as it arose, and I was certain that the cases would arise fast enough. As the time for the presidential nomination of 1904 drew near, it became evident that I was strong with the rank and file of the party, but that there was much opposition to me among many of the big political leaders, and especially among many of the Wall Street men. A group of these men met in conference to organize this opposition. It was to be done with complete secrecy, but such secrets are very hard to keep. I speedily knew all about it, and took my measures accordingly. The big men in question, who possessed much power so long as they could work under cover, or so long as they were merely throwing their weight one way or the other between forces fairly evenly balanced, were quite helpless when fighting in the open by themselves. I never found out that anything practical was even attempted by most of the men who took part in the conference. Three or four of them, however, did attempt something. The head of one big business corporation attempted to start an effort to control the delegations from New Jersey, North Carolina, and certain Gulf states against me. The head of a great railway system made preparations for a more ambitious effort looking towards the control of the delegations from Iowa, Kansas, Nebraska, Colorado, and California against me. He was a very powerful man financially, but his power politically was much more limited, and he did not really understand his own limitations, or the situation itself, whereas I did. 
he could not have secured a delegate against me from iowa nebraska or kansas in colorado and california he could have made a fight but even there i think he would have been completely beaten however long before the time for the convention came around it was recognized that it was hopeless to make any opposition to my nomination the effort was abandoned and i was nominated unanimously judge parker was nominated by the democrats against me practically all the metropolitan newspapers of largest circulation were against me in new york city fifteen out of every sixteen copies of papers issued were hostile to me i won by a popular majority of about two million and a half and in the electoral college carried three hundred and thirty votes against one hundred and thirty six it was by far the largest popular majority ever hitherto given any presidential candidate my opponents during the campaign had laid much stress upon my supposed personal ambition and intention to use the office of president to perpetuate myself in power i did not say anything on the subject prior to the election as i did not wish to say anything that could be construed into a promise offered as a consideration in order to secure votes but on election night after the returns were in i issued the following statement the wise custom which limits the president to two terms regards the substance and not the form and under no circumstances will i be a candidate for or accept another nomination the reason for my choice of the exact phraseology used was twofold in the first place many of my supporters were insisting that as i had served only three and a half years of my first term coming in from the vice presidency when president mckinley was killed i had really had only one elective term so that the third term custom did not apply to me and i wished to repudiate this suggestion i believed then and i believe now the third term custom or tradition to be wholesome and therefore i was determined to regard its substance refusing to quibble over the words usually employed to express it on the other hand i did not wish simply and specifically to say that i would not be a candidate for the nomination of nineteen o eight because if i had specified the year when i would not be a candidate it would have been widely accepted as meaning that i intended to be a candidate some other year and i had no such intention and had no idea that i would ever be a candidate again certain newspaper men did ask me if i intended to apply my prohibition to nineteen twelve and i answered that i was not thinking of nineteen twelve nor of nineteen twenty nor of nineteen forty and that i must decline to say anything whatever except what appeared in my statement the presidency is a great office and the power of the president can be effectively used to secure a renomination especially if the president has the support of certain great political and financial interests it is for this reason and this reason alone that the wholesome principle of continuing in office so long as he is willing to serve an incumbent who has proved capable is not applicable to the presidency therefore the american people have wisely established a custom against allowing any man to hold that office for more than two consecutive terms but every shred of power which a president exercises while in office vanishes absolutely when he has once left office an ex-president stands precisely in the position of any other private citizen and has not one particle more power to secure a nomination or election than if he had never held the office at all indeed he probably has less because of the very fact that he has held the office therefore the reasoning on which the anti-third term custom is based has no application whatever to an ex-president and no application whatever to anything except consecutive terms as a barrier of precaution against more than two consecutive terms the custom embodies a valuable principle applied in any other way it becomes a mere formula and like all formulas a potential source of mischievous confusion having this in mind i regarded the custom as applying practically if not just as much to a president who had been seven and a half years in office as to one who had been eight years in office and therefore in the teeth of a practically unanimous demand from my own party that i accept another nomination and the reasonable certainty that the nomination would be ratified at the polls i felt that the substance of the custom applied to me in nineteen o eight on the other hand it had no application whatever to any human being save where it was invoked in the case of a man desiring a third consecutive term having given such substantial proof of my own regard for the custom i deemed it a duty to add this comment on it i believe that it is well to have a custom of this kind to be generally observed but that it would be very unwise to have it definitely hardened into a constitutional prohibition it is not desirable ordinarily that a man should stay in office twelve consecutive years as president but most certainly the american people are fit to take care of themselves and stand in no need of an irrevocable self-denying ordinance 
they should not bind themselves never to take action which under some quite conceivable circumstances it might be to their great interest to take it is obviously of the last importance to the safety of a democracy that in time of real peril it should be able to command the service of every one among its citizens in the precise position where the service rendered will be most valuable it would be a benighted policy in such event to disqualify absolutely from the highest office a man who while holding it had actually shown the highest capacity to exercise its powers with the utmost effect for the public defence if for instance a tremendous crisis occurred at the end of the second term of a man like lincoln as such a crisis occurred at the end of his first term it would be a veritable calamity if the american people were forbidden to continue to use the services of the one man whom they knew and did not merely guess could carry them through the crisis the third term tradition has no value whatever except as it applies to a third consecutive term while it is well to keep it as a custom it would be a mark both of weakness and unwisdom for the american people to embody it into a constitutional provision which could not do them good and on some given occasion might work real harm there was one cartoon made while i was president in which i appeared incidentally that was always a great favorite of mine it pictured an old fellow with chin whiskers a farmer in his shirt sleeves with his boots off sitting before the fire reading the president's message on his feet were stockings of the kind i have seen hung up by the dozen in joe ferris's store at medora in the days when i used to come into town and sleep in one of the rooms over the store the title of the picture was his favorite author this was the old fellow whom i always used to keep in mind he had probably been in the civil war in his youth he had worked hard ever since he left the army he had been a good husband and father he had brought up his boys and girls to work he did not wish to do injustice to any one else but he wanted justice done to himself and to others like him and i was bound to secure that justice for him if it lay in my power to do so i believe i realize fairly well this ambition i shall turn to my enemies to attest the truth of this statement the new york sun shortly before the national convention of nineteen o four spoke of me as follows president roosevelt holds that his nomination by the national republican convention of nineteen o four is an assured thing he makes no concealment of his conviction and it is unreservedly shared by his friends we think president roosevelt is right there are strong and convincing reasons why the president should feel that success is within his grasp he has used the opportunities that he found or created and has used them with consummate skill and undeniable success the president has disarmed all his enemies every weapon they had new or old has been taken from them and added to the now unassailable roosevelt arsenal why should people wonder that mr bryan clings to silver has not mr roosevelt absorbed and sequestered every vestige of the kansas city platform that had a shred of practical value suppose that mr bryan had been elected president what could he have accomplished compared with what mr roosevelt has accomplished will his passionate followers pretend for one moment that mr bryan could have conceived much less enforced any such pursuit of the trust as that which mr roosevelt has just brought to a triumphant issue will mr bryan himself intimate that the federal courts would have turned to his projects the friendly countenance which they have lent to those of mr roosevelt where is government by injunction gone to the very emptiness of that once potent phrase is beyond description a regiment of bryans could not compete with mr roosevelt in harrying the trusts in bringing wealth to its knees and in converting into the palpable actualities of action the wildest dreams of bryans campaign orators he has outdone them all and how utterly the president has routed the pretensions of bryan and of the whole democratic horde in respect to organized labor how empty were all their professions their mouthings and their howlings in the face of the simple and unpretentious achievements of the president in his own straightforward fashion he inflicted upon capital in one short hour of the coal strike a greater humiliation than bryan could have visited upon it in a century he is the leader of the labor unions of the united states mr roosevelt has put them above the law and above the constitution because for him they are the american people this last i need hardly say is merely a rhetorical method of saying that i gave the labor union precisely the same treatment as the corporation senator la follet in the issue of his magazine immediately following my leaving the presidency in march nineteen o nine wrote as follows roosevelt steps from the stage gracefully he has ruled his party to a large extent against its will he has played a large part in the world's work for the past seven years 
the activities of his remarkably forcible personality have been so manifold that it will be long before his true rating will be fixed in the opinion of the race he is said to think that the three great things done by him are the undertaking of the construction of the panama canal and its rapid and successful carrying forward the making of peace between russia and japan and the seeing around the world of the fleet these are important things but many will be slow to think them his greatest services the panama canal will surely serve mankind when in operation and the manner of organizing this work seems to be fine but no one can say whether this project will be a gigantic success or a gigantic failure and the task is one which must in the nature of things have been undertaken and carried through some time soon as historic periods go anyhow the peace of portsmouth was a great thing to be responsible for and roosevelt's good offices undoubtedly saved a great and bloody battle in manchuria but the war was fought out and the parties ready to quit and there is reason to think that it was only when this situation was arrived at that the good offices of the president of the united states were more or less indirectly invited the fleet's cruise was a strong piece of diplomacy by which we informed japan that we will send our fleet wherever we please and whenever we please it worked out well but none of these things it will seem to many can compare with some of roosevelt's other achievements perhaps he is loath to take credit as a reformer for he is prone to spell the word with question marks and to speak despairingly of reform but for all that this contemner of reformers made reform respectable in the united states and this rebuker of muckrakers has been the chief agent in making the history of muckraking in the united states a national one conceded to be useful he has preached from the white house many doctrines but among them he has left impressed on the american mind the one great truth of economic justice couched in the pithy and stinging phrase the square deal the task of making reform respectable in a commercialized world and of giving the nation a slogan in a phrase is greater than the man who performed it is likely to think and then there is the great and statesmanlike movement for the conservation of our national resources into which roosevelt so energetically threw himself at a time when the nation as a whole knew not that we were ruining and bankrupting ourselves as fast as we can this is probably the greatest thing roosevelt did undoubtedly this globe is the capital stock of the race it is just so much coal and oil and gas this may be economized or wasted the same thing is true of phosphates and other mineral resources our water resources are immense and we are only just beginning to use them our forests have been destroyed they must be restored our soils are being depleted they must be built up and conserved these questions are not of this day only or of this generation they belong all to the future their consideration requires that high moral tone which regards the earth as the home of a posterity to whom we owe a sacred duty this immense idea roosevelt with high statesmanship dinned into the ears of the nation until the nation heeded he held it so high that it attracted the attention of the neighboring nations of the continent and will so spread and intensify that we will soon see the world's conferences devoted to it nothing can be greater or finer than this it is so great and so fine that when the historian of the future shall speak of theodore roosevelt he is likely to say that he did many notable things among them that of inaugurating the movement which finally resulted in the square deal but that his greatest work was inspiring and actually beginning a world movement for staying terrestrial waste and saving for the human race the things upon which and upon which alone a great and peaceful and progressive and happy race life can be founded what statesman in all history has done anything calling for so wide a view and for a purpose more lofty end of chapter ten recording by amanda Heineman, glenn mississippi Chapter 11, Part 1 of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter 11 The Natural Resources of the Nation. Part 1. When Governor of New York, as I have already described, I had been in consultation with Guilford Pinchot and F. H. Newell, and had shaped my recommendations about forestry largely in accordance with their suggestions. Like other men who had thought about the national future at all, I had been growing more and more concerned over the destruction of the forests. While I had lived in the West, 
I had come to realize the vital need of irrigation to the country, and I had been both amused and irritated by the attitude of Eastern men who obtained from Congress grants of national money to develop harbors, and yet fought the use of the nation's power to develop the irrigation work of the West. Major John Wesley Powell, the explorer of the Grand Canyon, and director of the Geological Survey, was the first man who fought for irrigation, and he lived to see the Reclamation Act passed and construction actually begun. Mr. F. H. Newell, the present director of the Reclamation Service, began his work as an assistant hydraulic engineer under Major Powell, and, unlike Powell, he appreciated the need of saving the forests and the soil as well as the need of irrigation. Between Powell and Newell came, as director of the Geological Survey, Charles D. Walcott, who, after the Reclamation Act was passed, by his force, pertinacity, and tact, succeeded in putting the act into effect in the best possible manner. Senator Francis G. Newlands of Nevada fought hard for the cause of reclamation in Congress. He attempted to get his state to act, and when that proved hopeless, to get the nation to act, and was ably assisted by Mr. G. H. Maxwell, a Californian, who had taken a deep interest in irrigation matters. Dr. W. J. McGee was one of the leaders in all the later stages of the movement. But Guilford Pinchot is the man to whom the nation owes most for what has been accomplished as regards the preservation of the natural resources of our country. He led, and indeed during its most vital period embodied, the fight for the preservation through the use of our forests. He played one of the leading parts in the effort to make the national government the chief instrument in developing the irrigation of the arid West. He was the foremost leader in the great struggle to coordinate all our social and governmental forces in the effort to secure the adoption of a rational and far-seeing policy for securing the conservation of all our national resources. He was already in the government service as head of the Forestry Bureau when I became president. He continued throughout my term not only as the head of the Forest Service, but as the moving and directing spirit in most of the conservation work and as counselor and assistant on most of the other work connected with the internal affairs of the country. Taking into account the varied nature of the work he did, its vital importance to the nation and the fact that, as regards much of it, he was practically breaking new ground, and taking into account also his tireless energy and activity, his fearlessness, his complete disinterestedness, his single-minded devotion to the interests of the plain people, and his extraordinary efficiency, I believe it is but just to say that among the many, many public officials who, under my administrations, rendered literally invaluable services to the people of the United States, he, on the whole, stood first. A few months after I left the presidency, he was removed from office by President Taft. The first work I took up when I became president was the work of reclamation. Immediately after I had come to Washington, after the assassination of President McKinley, while staying at the house of my sister, Miss Coles, before going into the White House, Newell and Pinchot called upon me and laid before me their plans for national irrigation of the arid lands of the West, and for the consolidation of the forest work of the government in the Bureau of Forestry. At that time, a narrowly legalistic point of view towards natural resources obtained in the departments, and controlled the governmental administrative machinery. Through the General Land Office and other government bureaus, the public resources were being handled and disposed of in accordance with the small considerations of petty legal formalities, instead of for the large purposes of constructive development and the habit of deciding, whenever possible, in favor of private interests against the public welfare was firmly fixed. It was as little customary to favor the bona fide settler and home builder as against the strict construction of the law as it was to use the law in thwarting the operations of the land grabbers. A technical compliance with the letter of the law was all that was required. The idea that our national resources were inexhaustible still obtained, and there was as yet no real knowledge of their extent and condition. The relation of the conservation of natural resources to the problems of national welfare and national efficiency had not yet dawned on the public mind. The reclamation of arid public lands in the West was still a matter for private enterprise alone, and our magnificent river system, with its superb possibility for public usefulness, was dealt with by the national government not as a unit, 
but as a disconnected series of pork-barrel problems whose only real interest was in their effect on the re-election or defeat of a congressman here and there, a theory which, I regret to say, still obtains. The place of the farmer in the national economy was still regarded solely as that of a grower of food to be eaten by others, while the human needs and interests of himself and his wife and children still remained wholly outside the recognition of the government. All the forests which belonged to the United States were held and administered in one department, and all the foresters in government employ were in another department. Forests and foresters had nothing whatever to do with each other. The national forests in the West, then called forest reserves, were wholly inadequate in area to meet the purpose for which they were created, while the need for forest protection in the East had not yet begun to enter the public mind. Such was the condition of things when Newell and Pinchot called on me. I was a warm believer in reclamation and in forestry, and, after listening to my two guests, I asked them to prepare material on the subject for me to use in my first message to Congress of December 3, 1901. This message laid the foundation for the development of irrigation and forestry during the next seven and one-half years. It set forth the new attitude towards the natural resources in the words, The forest and water problems are perhaps the most vital internal problems of the United States. On the day when the message was read, a committee of Western senators and congressmen was organized, to prepare a reclamation bill in accordance with the recommendations. By far the most effective of the senators in drafting and pushing the bill, which became known by his name, was Newlands. The draft of the bill was worked over by me and others at several conferences, and revised in important particulars. My active interference was necessary to prevent it from being made unworkable by an undue insistence upon state rights, in accordance with the efforts of Mr. Mondell and other congressmen who consistently fought for local and private interests as against the interests of the people as a whole. On June 17, 1902, the Reclamation Act was passed. It set aside the proceeds of the disposal of public lands for the purpose of reclaiming the waste areas of the arid west by irrigating lands otherwise worthless, and thus creating new homes upon the land. The money so appropriated was to be repaid to the government by the settlers and to be used again as a revolving fund continuously available for the work. The impatience of the Western people to see immediate results from the Reclamation Act was so great that red tape was discarded, and the work was pushed forward at a rate previously unknown in governmental affairs. Later, as in almost all such cases, there followed the criticisms of alleged illegality and haste which are so easy to make after results had been accomplished and the need for the measures without which nothing could have been done has gone by. These criticisms were in character precisely the same as that made about the acquisition of Panama, the settlement of the anthracite coal strike, the suits against the big trusts, the stopping of the panic of 1907 by the action of the executive concerning the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, and, in short, about most of the best work done during my administration. With the reclamation work, as with much other work under me, the men in charge were given to understand that they must get into the water if they would learn to swim, and, furthermore, they learned to know that if they acted honestly and boldly and fearlessly accepted responsibility, I would stand by them to the limit. In this, as in every other case, in the end, the boldness of the action fully justified itself. Every item of the whole great plan of reclamation now in effect was undertaken between 1902 and 1906. By the spring of 1909, the work was an assured success, and the government had become fully committed to its continuance. The work of reclamation was at first under the United States Geological Survey, of which Charles D. Walcott was at that time director. In the spring of 1908, the United States Reclamation Service was established to carry it on, under the direction of Frederick Hayes Newell, to whom the inception of the plan was due. Newell's single-minded devotion to this great task, the constructive imagination which enabled him to conceive it, and the executive power and high character through which he and his assistant, Arthur P. Davis, built up a model service, all of these have made him a model servant. The final proof of his merit is supplied by the character and records of the men who later assailed him. 
Although the gross expenditure of the Reclamation Act is not yet as large as that for the Panama Canal, the engineering obstacles to be overcome have been almost as great, and the political impediments many times greater. The reclamation work had to be carried on at widely separated points, remote from railroads under the most difficult pioneer conditions. The twenty-eight projects begun in the years 1902 to 1906 contemplated the irrigation of more than three million acres and the watering of more than thirty thousand farms. Many of the dams required for this huge task are higher than any previously built anywhere in the world. They feed mainline canals over seven thousand miles in total length and involve minor constructions such as culverts and bridges, tens of thousands in number. What the Reclamation Act has done for the country is by no means limited to its material accomplishments. This act, and the results flowing from it, have helped powerfully to prove to the nation that it can handle its own resources and exercise direct and business-like control over them. The population which the Reclamation Act has brought into the arid West, while comparatively small when compared with that in the more closely inhabited East, has been a most effective contribution to the national life, for it has gone far to transform the social aspect of the West, making for the stability of the institutions upon which the welfare of the whole country rests. It has substituted actual homemakers, who have settled on the lands with their families, for huge migratory bands of sheep herded by the hired shepherds of the absentee owners. The recent attacks on the Reclamation Service, and on Mr. Newell, arise in large part, if not altogether, from an organized effort to repudiate the obligations of the settlers to repay the government for what it has expended to reclaim the land. The repudiation of any debt can always find supporters, and in this case it has attracted the support not only of certain men among the settlers, who hope to be relieved of paying what they owe, but also of a variety of unscrupulous politicians, some highly placed. It is unlikely that their efforts to deprive the West of the revolving irrigation fund will succeed in doing anything but discrediting these politicians in the sight of all honest men. When, in the spring of 1911, I visited the Roosevelt Dam in Arizona and opened the reservoir, I made a short speech to the assembled people. Among other things, I said to the engineers present that, in the name of all good citizens, I thank them for their admirable work, as efficient as it was honest, and conducted according to the highest standards of public service. As I looked at the fine, strong, eager faces of those of the force who were present, and thought of similar men in the service in higher positions who were absent, and who were no less responsible for the work done, I felt the foreboding that they would never receive any real recognition for their achievements, and, only half humorously, I warned them not to expect any credit or any satisfaction except their own knowledge that they had done well a first-class job, for that probably the only attention Congress would ever pay them would be to investigate them. Well, a year later, a Congressional Committee actually did investigate them. The investigation was instigated by some unscrupulous local politicians, and by some settlers who wished to be relieved from paying their just obligations, and the members of the Committee joined in the attack on as fine and honorable a set of public servants as the government has ever had an attack made on them solely because they were honorable and efficient and loyal to the interests both of the government and the settlers. When I became president, the Bureau of Forestry, since 1905 the United States Forest Service, was a small but growing organization under Guilford Pinchot, occupied mainly with laying the foundation of American forestry by scientific study of the forests and with the promotion of forestry on private lands. It contained all the trained foresters in the government service, but had charge of no public timberlands whatsoever. The government forest reserves of that day were in the care of a division in the general land office, under the management of clerks wholly without knowledge of forestry, few, if any of whom, had ever seen a foot of the timberlands for which they were responsible. Thus, the reserves were neither well protected nor well used. There were no foresters among the men who had charge of the national forests and no government forests in charge of the government foresters. In my first message to Congress, I strongly recommended the consolidation of the forest work in the hands of the trained men of the Bureau of Forestry. This recommendation was repeated in other messages, but Congress did not give effect to it until three years later. In the meantime, by thorough study of the western public timberlands, 
The groundwork was laid for responsibilities which were to fall upon the Bureau of Forestry, when the care of the national forests came to be transferred to it. It was evident that trained American foresters would be needed in considerable numbers, and a forest school was established at Yale to supply them. In 1901, at my suggestion as President, the Secretary of the Interior, Mr. Hitchcock, made a formal request for technical advice from the Bureau of Forestry in handling the national forests, and an extensive examination of their conditions and needs was accordingly taken up. The same year a study was begun of the proposed Appalachian National Forest, the plan of which, already formulated at the time, has since been carried out. A year later experimental planning on the national forests was also begun, and studies preparatory to the application of practical forestry to the Indian reserves were undertaken. In 1903, so rapidly did the public work of the Bureau of Forestry increase, that the examination of lands for new forest reserves was added to the study of those already created. The forest lands of the various states were studied, and cooperation with several of them in the examination and handling of their forest lands was undertaken. While these practical tasks were pushed forward, a technical knowledge of American forests was rapidly accumulated. The special knowledge gained was made public in printed bulletins, and at the same time the Bureau undertook, through the newspaper and periodical press, to make all the people of the United States acquainted with the needs and the purpose of practical forestry. It is doubtful whether there has ever been elsewhere, under the government, such effective publicity, publicity purely in the interest of the people, at so low a cost. Before the educational work of the Forest Service was stopped by the Taft administration, it was securing the publication of facts about forestry in fifty million copies of newspapers a month, at a total expense of six thousand dollars a year. Not one cent has ever been paid by the Forest Service to any publication of any kind for the printing of this material. It was given out freely, and published without cost because it was news. Without this publicity, the Forest Service could not have survived the attacks made upon it by the representative of the great special interests in Congress, nor could forestry in America have made the rapid progress it has. The result of all the work outlined above was to bring together in the Bureau of Forestry, by the end of 1904, the only body of forest experts under the government, and practically all of the first-hand information about public forest which was then in existence. In 1905, the obvious and foolishness of continuing to separate the foresters and the forests, reinforced by the actions of the First National Forest Congress, held in Washington, brought about the act of February 1, 1905, which transferred the forests from the care of the Interior Department to the Department of Agriculture, which resulted in the creation of the present United States Forest Service. The men upon whom the responsibility of handling some sixty million acres of national forest land was thrown were ready for the work, both in the office and in the field, because they had been preparing for it for more than five years. Without delay they proceeded, under the leadership of Pinchot, to apply to the new work the principles they had already formulated. One of these was to open all the resources of the national forests to regulated use. Another was that of putting every part of the land to that use in which it would best serve the public. Following this principle, the Act of June 11, 1906, was drawn, and its passage was secured from Congress. This law throws open to settlement all lands in the national forest that is found, on examination, to be chiefly valuable for agriculture. Hitherto, all such land had been closed to the settler. The principles thus formulated and applied may be summed up in the statement that the rights of the public to the natural resources outweigh private rights, and must be given its first consideration. Until that time, in dealing with the national forests, and the public lands generally, private rights had almost uniformly been allowed to overbalance public rights. The change we made was right, and was vitally necessary, but of course it created bitter opposition from private interests. One of the principles whose application was the source of much hostility was this. It is better for the government to help a poor man to make a living for his family than to help a rich man make more profit for his company. This principle was too sound to be fought openly. It is the kind of principle to which politicians delight to pay unctuous homage in words. But we translated the words into deeds, and when they found that this was the case, many rich men, especially sheep owners, were stirred to hostility. 
and they used the congressmen they controlled to assault us, getting most aid from certain demagogues who were equally glad improperly to denounce rich men in public, and improperly to serve them in private. The Forest Service established and enforced regulations which favored the settler as against the large stock owner, required that necessary reductions in stock grazed on any national forest should bear first on the big man before the few head of the small man, upon which the living of his family depended, were reduced, and made grazing in the national forests a help, instead of a hindrance, to permanent settlement. As a result, the small settlers and their families became, on the whole, the best friends the Forest Service has, although in places their ignorance was played upon by the demagogues to influence them against the policy that was primarily for their own interest. End of chapter 11, part 1《Chapter Eleven, Part Two, of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Chapter Eleven, The Natural Resources of the Nation, Part Two. Another principle which led to the bitterest antagonism of all was this. Whoever, except a bona fide settler, takes public property for private profit, should pay for what he gets. In the effort to apply this principle, the Forest Service obtained a decision from the Attorney General that it was legal to make men who grazed sheep and cattle on the national forests pay for what they got. Accordingly, in the summer of 1906, for the first time, such a charge was made, and in the face of the bitterest opposition, it was collected. Up to the time the national forests were put under the charge of the Forest Service, the Interior Department had made no effort to establish public regulation and control of water powers. Upon the transfer, the Service immediately began its fight to handle the power resources of the national forests, so as to prevent speculation and monopoly, and to yield a fair return to the government. On May 1, 1906, an act was passed granting the use of certain power sites in Southern California to the Edison Electric Power Company, which act, at the suggestion of the service, limited the period of the permit to forty years, and required the payment of an annual rental by the company, the same conditions which were thereafter adopted by the service as the basis for all permits for power development. Then began a vigorous fight against the position of the service by the water power interests. The right to charge for water power development was, however, sustained by the Attorney General. In 1907, the area of the National Forest was increased by presidential proclamation more than 43 million acres. The plant necessary for the full use of the forests, such as roads, trails, and telephone lines, began to be provided on a large scale. The interchange of field and office men, so as to prevent antagonism between them, which is so destructive to efficiency in most great businesses, was established as a permanent policy, and the really effective management of the enormous area of the national forests began to be secured. With all this activity in the field, the progress of technical forestry and popular education was not neglected. In 1907, for example, Sixty-one publications on various phases of forestry, with a total of more than a million copies, were issued, as against three publications with a total of 82,000 copies in 1901. By this time, also, the opposition of the servants of the special interests in Congress to the Forest Service had become strongly developed, and more time appeared to be spent in the yearly attacks upon it during the passage of the appropriation bills than on all other government bureaus put together. Every year, the Forest Service had to fight for its life. One incident in these attacks is worth recording. While the Agricultural Appropriation Bill was passing through the Senate, in 1907, Senator Fulton of Oregon secured an amendment providing that the President could not set aside any national forests in the six northwestern states. This meant retaining some 16 million of acres to be exploited by land grabbers and by the representatives of the great special interests, at the expense of the public interest. But for four years the Forest Service had been gathering field notes as to what forests ought to be set aside in these states, and so was prepared to act. 
It was equally undesirable to veto the whole agricultural bill, and to sign it with this amendment effective. Accordingly, a plan to create the necessary national forest in these states before the agricultural bill could be passed and signed was laid before me by Mr. Pinchot. I approved it. The necessary papers were immediately prepared. I signed the last proclamation a couple of days before, by my signature, the bill became law, and, when the friends of the special interests in the Senate got their amendment through and woke up, they discovered that sixteen million acres of timberland had been saved for the people by putting them in the national forests before the land-grabbers could get at them. The opponents of the Forest Service turned handsprings in their wrath, and dire were their threats against the executive. But the threats could not be carried out, and were really only a tribute to the efficiency of our action. By 1908, the fire prevention work of the Forest Service had become so successful that eighty-six percent of the fires that did occur were held down to an area of five acres or less, and the timber sales, which yielded sixty thousand dollars in 1905, and in 1908 produced eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. In the same year, in addition to the work of the national forests, the responsibility for the proper handling of Indian timberlands was laid upon the Forest Service, where it remained with great benefit to the Indians until it was withdrawn as a part of the attack on the conservation policy made after I left office. By March 4, 1909, nearly half a million acres of agricultural land in the national forests had been opened to settlement under the Act of June 11, 1906. The business management of the Forest Service became so excellent, thanks to the remarkable executive capacity of the associate forester, Overton W. Price, removed after I left office, that it was declared by a well-known firm of business organizers to compare favorably with the best managed of the great private corporations, an opinion which was confirmed by the report of a congressional investigation, and by the report of the Presidential Committee on Department Method. The area of the national forests had increased from 43 to 194 million acres, the forest from about 500 to more than 3,000. There was saved for public use in the national forests more government timberland during the seven and a half years prior to March 4, 1909, than during all previous and succeeding years put together. The idea that the executive is the steward of the public welfare was first formulated and given practical effect in the Forest Service by its law officer, George Woodruff. The laws were often insufficient, and it became well-nigh impossible to get them amended in the public interest when once the representatives of privilege in Congress grasped the fact that I would sign no amendment that contained anything not in the public interest. It was necessary to use what law was already in existence, and then further to supplement it by executive action. The practice of examining every claim to public land before passing it into private ownership offers a good example of the policy in question. This practice, which has since become general, was first applied in the national forests. Enormous areas of valuable public timberland were thereby saved from fraudulent acquisition. More than 250,000 acres were thus saved in a single case. This theory of stewardship in the interest of the public was well illustrated by the establishment of a water power policy. Until the Forest Service changed the plan, water powers on the navigable streams on the public domain and in the national forests were given away for nothing, and substantially without question to whoever asked for them. At last, under the principle that public property should be paid for, and should not be permanently granted away when such permanent grant is avoidable, the Forest Service established the policy of regulating the use of power in the national forests, in the public interest, and making a charge for value received. This was the beginning of the water power policy now substantially accepted by the public, and doubtless soon to be enacted into law. But there was at the outset violent opposition to it on the part of the water power companies, and such representatives of their views in Congress as Messrs. Tawney and Bede. Many bills were introduced in Congress aimed, in one way or another, at relieving the power companies of control and payment. When these bills reached me, I refused to sign them, and the injury to the public interest which would follow their passage was brought sharply to public attention in my message of February 26, 1908. The bills made no further progress. Under the same principle of stewardship, railroads and other corporations, which applied for and were given rights in the national forests, 
were regulated in the use of those rights. In short, the public resources in charge of the Forest Service were handled frankly and openly for the public welfare under the clear-cut and clearly set forth principles that the public rights come first and private interests second. The natural result of this new attitude was the assertion in every forum by the representatives of special interests that the Forest Service was exceeding its legal powers and thwarting the intention of Congress. Suits were begun wherever the chance arose. It is worth recording that, in spite of the novelty and complexity of the legal questions it had to face, no court of last resort had ever decided against the Forest Service. This statement includes the two unanimous decisions by the Supreme Court of the United States. In its administration of the National Forests, the Forest Service found that valuable coal lands were in danger of passing into private ownership without adequate money returns to the government and without safeguard against monopoly, and that existing legislation was insufficient to prevent this. When this condition was brought to my attention, I withdrew all forms of entry about 68 million acres of coal land in the United States, including Alaska. The refusal of Congress to act in the public interest was solely responsible for keeping these lands from entry. The conservation movement was a direct outgrowth of the forest movement. It was nothing more than the application to our other natural resources of the principles which had been worked out in connection with the forests. Without the basis of public sentiment which had been built up for the protection of the forests, and without the example of public foresight in the protection of this, one of the great natural resources, the conservation movement, would have been impossible. The first formal step was the creation of the Inland Waterways Commission, appointed on March 14, 1907. In my letter appointing the commission, I called attention to the value of our streams as a great natural resource, and to the need for a progressive plan for their development and control, and said, It is not possible to properly frame so large a plan as this for the control of our rivers without taking account of the orderly development of other national resources. Therefore I ask that the Inland Waterways Commission shall consider the relations of the streams to the use of all great permanent national resources and their conservation for making and maintaining of prosperous homes. Over a year later, Writing on the report of the Commission, I said, The preliminary report of the Inland Waterways Commission was excellent in every way. It outlines a general plan of waterway improvement which, when adopted, will give assurance that the improvements will yield practical results in the way of increased navigation and water transportation. In every essential feature, the plan recommended by the Commission is new. In the principle of coordinating all uses of the waters and treating each water system as a unit, in the principle of correlating water traffic with rail and other land traffic, in the principle of expert initiation of projects in accordance with commercial foresight and the needs of a growing country, and in the principle of cooperation between the states and the federal government, in the administration and use of waterways, etc. The general plan proposed by the Commission is new, and at the same time sane and simple. The plan deserves unqualified support. I regret that it has not yet been adopted by Congress, but I am confident that ultimately it will be adopted. The most striking incident in the history of the Commission was the trip down the Mississippi River in October 1907, when, as President of the United States, I was the chief guest. This excursion, with the meetings which were held and the wide public attention it attracted, gave the development of our inland waterways a new standing in public estimation. During the trip, a letter was prepared and presented to me, asking me to summon a conference on the conservation of natural resources. My intention to call such a conference was publicly announced at a great meeting at Memphis, Tennessee. In the November following, I wrote to each of the governors of the several states, and to the presidents of the various important national societies concerned with national resources, inviting them to attend the conference, which took place May 13 to May 15, 1908, in the East Room of the White House. It is doubtful whether, except in time of war, any new idea of like importance has ever been presented to a nation, and accepted by it with such effectiveness and rapidity, as was the case with this conservation movement, when it was introduced to the American people by the Conference of Governors. The first result was the unanimous declaration of the governors of all the states and territories upon the subject of the conservation, a document which ought to be hung in every schoolhouse throughout the land. 
A further result was the appointment of 36 state conservation commissions, and, on June 8, 1908, of the National Conservation Commission. The task of this commission was to prepare an inventory, the first ever made for any nation, of all the natural resources which underlay its property. The making of this inventory was made possible by an executive order which placed the resources of the government departments at the command of the commission, and made possible the organization of subsidiary committees by which the actual facts for the inventory were prepared and digested. Guilford Pinchot was made chairman of the commission. The report of the National Conservation Commission was not only the first inventory of our resources, but was unique in the history of government in the amount and variety of information brought together. It was completed in six months. It laid squarely before the American people the essential facts regarding our natural resources, when facts were greatly needed as the basis for constructive action. This report was presented to the Joint Conservation Congress in December, at which there were present governors of twenty states, representatives of twenty-two state conservation commissions, and representatives of sixty national organizations, previously represented at the White House Conference. The report was unanimously approved and transmitted to me January 11, 1909. On January 22, 1909, I transmitted the report of the National Conservation Commission to Congress, with a special message, in which it was accurately described as one of the most fundamentally important documents ever laid before the American people. The Joint Conservation Congress of December 1908 suggested to me the practicability of holding a North American Conservation Congress. I selected Guilford Pinchot to convey this invitation in person to Lord Grey, Governor-General of Canada, and to Sir Wilfrid Laurier, and to President Diaz of Mexico, giving reason for my action, in the letter in which this invitation was conveyed, the fact that it is evident that natural resources are not limited by boundary lines which separate nations, and that the need for conserving them upon this continent is as wide as the area upon which they exist. In response to this invitation, which included the colony of Newfoundland, the commissioners assembled in the White House on February 18, 1909. The American commissioners were Guilford Pinchot, Robert Bacon, and James R. Garfield. After a session continuing through five days, the conference united in a declaration of principles and suggested to the President of the United States, quote, that all nations should be invited to join together in the conference on the subject of world resources and their inventory, conservation, and wide utilization. End quote. Accordingly, on February 19, 1909, Robert Bacon, Secretary of State, addressed to forty five nations a letter of invitation quote, to send delegates to a conference to be held at The Hague at such date to be found convenient there to meet and consult like the delegates of other countries, with a view of considering a general plan for an inventory of the natural resources of the world, and to devising a uniform scheme for the expression of the result of such inventory, to the end that there may be a general understanding and appreciation of the world supply of the material elements which underlie the development of civilization and the welfare of the peoples of the earth. End quote. After I left the White House, the project lapsed. End chapter 11, part 2. Chapter 11, part 3 of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt Chapter 11 The Natural Resources of the Nation Part 3 Throughout the early part of my administration, the public land policy was chiefly directed to the defense of the public lands against fraud and theft. Secretary Hitchcock's efforts along this line resulted in the Oregon land fraud cases, which led to the conviction of Senator Mitchell, and which made Francis J. Haney known to the American people as one of their best and most effective servants. These land fraud prosecutions under Mr. Henney, together with the study of the public lands which preceded the passage of the Reclamation Act in 1902, and the investigation of the land titles in the national forests by the Forest Service, all combined to create a clearer understanding of the need of land law reform. 
and thus led to the appointment of the Public Lands Commission. This commission, appointed by me on October 22, 1903, was directed to report to the President, quote, upon the condition, operation, and effect of the present land laws, and to recommend such changes as are needed to effect the largest practicable disposition of the public lands to the actual settlers who will build permanent homes upon them, and to secure in performance the fullest and most effective use of the resources of the public lands, end quote. It proceeded without loss of time to make a personal study on the ground of public land problems throughout the West, to confer with the governors and other public men most concerned, and to assemble the information concerning the public lands, the laws and decisions which govern them, and the methods of defeating or evading those laws, which was already in existence, but which remained unformulated in the records of the General Land Office and in the mind of its employees. The Public Lands Commission made its first preliminary report on March 7, 1904. It found, quote, that the present land laws do not fit the conditions of the remaining public lands, end quote, and recommended specific changes to meet the public needs. A year later, the second report of the Commission recommended still further changes, and said, quote, The fundamental fact that characterizes the situation under the present land laws is this that the number of patents issued is increasing out of all proportion to the number of new homes." End quote. This report laid the foundation of the movement for government control of the open range, and included by far the most complete statement ever made of the disposition of the public domain. Among the most difficult topics considered by the Public Lands Commission was that of the mineral land laws. This subject was referred by the Commission to the American Institute of Mining Engineers, which reported upon it through a committee. This committee made the very important recommendation, among others, quote, that the government of the United States should retain title to all minerals, including coal and oil, in the lands of unceded territory, and lease the same to individuals or corporations at a fixed rental, end quote. The necessity for this action has since come to be very generally recognized. Another recommendation, since partly carried into effect, was for the separation of the surface and the minerals in the land containing coal and oil. Our land laws have of recent years proved ineffective. Yet the land laws themselves have not been so much to blame as the lax, unintelligent, and often corrupt administration of these laws. The appointment on March 4, 1907, of James R. Garfield as Secretary of the Interior, led to a new era of the interpretation and enforcement of the laws governing the public lands. His administration of the Interior Department was, beyond comparison, the best we have ever had. It was based primarily on the conception that it is as much the duty of public land officials to help the honest settler get title to his claim as it is to prevent the looting of the public lands. The essential fact about public land frauds is not merely that public property is stolen, but that every claim fraudulently acquired stands in the way of the making of a home or a livelihood by an honest man. As the study of the public land laws proceeded, and their administration improved, a public land policy was formulated in which the saving of the resources on the public domain for public use became the leading principle. There followed the withdrawal of coal lands as already described, of oil lands and phosphate lands, and finally, just at the end of the administration, of water power sites on the public domain. These withdrawals were made by the executive in order to afford to Congress the necessary opportunity to pass wise laws dealing with their use and disposal, and the great crooked special interests fought them with incredible bitterness. Among the men of this nation interested in the vital problems affecting the welfare of the ordinary, hard-working men and women of the nation, there is none whose interest has been more intense and more wholly free from taint of thought of self than that of Thomas Watson of Georgia. While President, I often discussed with him the conditions of women on the small farms, and on the frontier, the hardship of their lives as compared with those of the men, and the need for taking their welfare into consideration in whatever was done for the improvement of life on the land. I also went over the matter with C. S. Barrett of Georgia, a leader in the Southern Farmers' Movement, and with other men, such as Henry Wallace, Dean L. H. Bailey of Cornell, and Kenyon Butterfield. One man from whose advice I especially profited 
was not an American, but an Irishman, Sir Horace Plunkett. In various conversations, he described to me and my close associates the reconstruction of farm life which had been accomplished by the Agricultural Organization Society of Ireland, of which he was the founder and the controlling force, and he discussed the application of similar methods to the improvement of farm life in the United States. In the spring of 1908, at my request, Plunkett conferred on the subject with Garfield and Pinchot, and the latter suggested to him the appointment of a commission on county life as a means for directing the attention of the nation to the problems of the farm, and for securing the necessary knowledge of the actual conditions of life in the open country. After long discussion, a plan for a county life commission was laid before me and approved. The appointment of the commission followed in August, 1908. In the letter of the appointment, the reasons for creating the commission were set forth as follows, quote, I doubt if any other nation can bear comparison with our own in the amount of attention given by the government, both federal and state, to agricultural matters. But practically the whole of this effort has hitherto been directed towards increasing the production of crops. Our attention has been concentrated almost exclusively on getting better farming. In the beginning this was unquestionably the right thing to do. The farmer must, first of all, grow good crops in order to support himself and his family. But when this has been secured, the effort for better farming should cease to stand alone, and should be accompanied by the effort for better business and better living on the farm. It is at least as important that the farmer should get the largest possible return in money, comfort, and social advantages from the crops he grows, as that he should get the largest possible return in crops from the land he farms. Agriculture is not the whole of country life. The great rural interests are human interests, and good crops are of little value to the farmer unless they open the door to a good kind of life on the farm. End quote. The Commission of Country Life did work of capital importance. By means of a widely circulated set of questions, the Commission informed itself upon the status of country life throughout the nation. Its trip through the east, south, and west brought it into contact with large numbers of practical farmers and their wives, secured for the commissioners a most valuable body of first-hand information, and laid the foundation for the remarkable awakening of interest in country life, which has since taken place throughout the nation. One of the most illuminating, and incidentally one of the most interesting and amusing, series of answers sent to the commission was from a farmer in Missouri. He stated that he had a wife and eleven living children, he and his wife being each fifty-two years old, and that they owned five hundred and twenty acres of land without any mortgage hanging over their heads. He had himself done well, and his views as to why many of his neighbors had done less well are entitled to consideration. These views are expressed in terse and vigorous English. They cannot always be quoted in full. He states that the farm homes in his neighborhood are not as good as they should be, because too many of them are encumbered by mortgages. That the schools do not train boys and girls satisfactorily for life on the farm, because they allow them to get an idea in their heads that city life is better, and that to remedy this, practical farming should be taught. To the question whether the farmers and their wives in his neighborhood are satisfactorily organized, he answers, quote, Oh, there is a little one-horse Grange gang in our locality, and every darned one thinks they ought to be a king. End quote. To the question, Are the renters of farms in your neighborhood making a satisfactory living? He answers, quote, No, because they move about so much hunting a better job. End quote. To the question, Is the supply of farm labor in your neighborhood satisfactory? The answer is, quote, No because the people have gone out of the baby business, end quote. And when asked as to the remedy, he answers, quote, Give a pension to every mother who gives birth to seven living boys on American soil, end quote. To the question, Are the conditions surrounding hired labor on the farm in your neighborhood satisfactory to the hired men? He answers, quote, Yes, unless he is a drunken cuss, end quote adding that he would like to blow up the stillhouses and root out whiskey and beer. To the question, Are the sanitary conditions on the farms in your neighborhood satisfactory? He answers, quote, No. Too careless about chicken yards and the like, and poorly covered wells. In one well on a neighbor's farm I counted seven snakes in the wall of the well, 
and they use the water daily. His wife is dead now, and he is looking for another." End quote. He ends by stating that the most important single thing to be done for the betterment of country life is, quote, good roads, end quote. But in his answers he shows very clearly that most important of all is the individual equation of the man or woman. Like the rest of the commissions described in this chapter, the Country Life Commission cost the government not one cent, but laid before the President and the country a mass of information so accurate and so vitally important as to disturb the serenity of the advocates of things as they are, and therefore it incurred the bitter opposition of the reactionaries. The report of the Country Life Commission was transmitted to Congress by me on February 9, 1909. In the accompanying message, I asked for $25,000 to print and circulate the report and to prepare for publication the immense amount of valuable material collected by the Commission, but still unpublished. The reply made by Congress was not only a refusal to appropriate the money, but a positive prohibition against continuing the work. The Taney Amendment to the Sundry Civil Bill forbade the President to appoint any further commissions unless specifically authorized by Congress to do so. Had this prohibition been enacted earlier and complied with, it would have prevented the appointment of the six Roosevelt commissions. But I would not have complied with it. Mr. Tawney, one of the most effective representatives of the cause of special privilege and against public interest to be found in the House, was later, in conjunction with Senator Hale and others, able to induce my successor to accept their view. As what was almost my last official act, I replied to Congress that if I did not believe the Tawney Amendment to be unconstitutional, I would veto the sundry civil bill which contained it, and that if I were remaining in office I would refuse to obey it. The memorandum ran in part. The chief object of this provision, however, is to prevent the executive repeating what it has done within the last year in connection with the Conservation Commission and the Country Life Commission. It is for the people of the country to decide whether or not they believe in the work done by the Conservation Commission and by the Country Life Commission. If they believe in improving our waterways, in preventing the waste of soil, in preserving the forests, in thrifty use of the mineral resources of the country for the nation as a whole, rather than merely for private monopolies, in working for the betterment of the condition of the men and women who live on the farms, then they will unstintedly condemn the action of every man who is in any way responsible for inserting this provision, and will support those members of the legislative branch who opposed its adoption. I would not sign the bill at all if I thought the provision entirely effective but the Congress cannot prevent the President from seeking advice. Any future President can do as I have done, and ask disinterested men who desire to serve the people to give this service free to the people through these commissions. My successor, the President-elect, in a letter to the Senate Committee on Appropriations, asked for the continuance and support of the Conservation Commission. The Conservation Commission was appointed at the request of the governors of over forty states, and almost all of these states have since appointed commissions to cooperate with the National Commission. Nearly all the great national organizations concerned with natural resources have been heartily cooperating with the Commission. With all these facts before it, the Congress has refused to pass a law to continue and provide for the Commission, and now it passes a law with the purpose of preventing the Executive from continuing the Commission at all. The Executive, therefore, must now either abandon the work and reject the cooperation of the states, or else must continue the work personally and through executive officers whom he may select for that purpose. The Chamber of Commerce in Spokane, Washington, a singularly energetic and far-seeing organization, itself published a report which Congress has thus discreditably refused to publish. The work of the Bureau of Corporations, under Herbert Knox Smith, formed an important part of the conservation movement almost from the beginning. Mr. Smith was a member of the Inland Waterways Commission and of the National Conservation Commission, and his bureau prepared material of importance for the reports of both. The investigation of standing timber in the United States by the Bureau of Corporations furnished, for the first time, a positive knowledge of the facts. Over 900 counties and timbered regions were covered by the Bureau, and the work took five years. The most important facts ascertained were that forty years ago 
three-fourths of the standing timber in the United States was publicly owned, while at the date of the report four-fifths of the timber in the country was in private hands. The concentration of private ownership had developed to such an amazing extent that about two hundred holders owned nearly one-half of all privately owned timber in the United States, and of this the three greatest holders, the Southern Pacific Railway, the Northern Pacific Railway, and the Warehouser Timber Company, held over ten per cent. Of this work, Mr. Smith says, It was important, indeed, to know the facts so that we could take proper action toward saving the timber still left to the public. But of far more importance was the light that this history, and the history of our other resources, throws on the basic attitude, tradition, and governmental beliefs of the American people. The whole standpoint of the people towards the proper aim of government, towards the relation of property to the citizen, and the relation of property to the government, were brought out first by this conservation work. The work of the Bureau of Corporations as to water power was equally striking. In addition to bringing the concentration of water power control first prominently to public attention, through material furnished for my message in my veto of the James River Dam Bill, the work of the Bureau showed that ten great interests and their allies held nearly sixty per cent of the developed water power in the United States. Says Commissioner Smith, Perhaps the most important thing in the whole work was its clear demonstration of the fact that the only effective place to control water power in the public domain is at the power sites, that as to power is now owned by the public, it is absolutely essential that the public shall retain title. The only way in which the public can get back to itself the margin of natural advantage in the water power site is to rent that site at a rental which, added to the cost of power production there, will make the total cost of water power about the same as fuel power, and then let the two sell at the same price, i.e., the price of fuel power. Of the fight of the water power men for state rights, at the St. Paul Conservation Congress in September 1909, Commissioner Smith says, it was the first open sign of the shift of the special interests to the Democratic Party for a logical political reason, namely, because of the availability of the state's rights idea for the purposes of the large corporations. It marked openly the turn of the tide. Mr. Smith brought to the attention of the Inland Waterways Commission the overshadowing importance to waterways of their relation with railroad lines. The fact that the bulk of the traffic is long-distance traffic that it cannot pass over the whole distance by water, while it can go anywhere by rail, and that therefore the power of the rail lines to prorate or not to prorate with water lines really determines the practical value of a river channel. The controlling value of the terminals, and the fact that out of fifty of our leading ports, over half the active water frontage in twenty-one ports, was controlled by the railroads, was also brought to the Commission's attention, and reports of great value were prepared both for the Inland Waterways Commission, and for the National Conservation Commission. In addition to developing the basic facts about the available timber supply, about waterways, water power, and iron ore, Mr. Smith helped to develop and drive into the public conscience the idea that the people ought to retain title to our national resources and handle them by the leasing system. The things accomplished that have been enumerated above were of immediate consequence to the economic well-being of our people. In addition to certain things that were done of which the economic bearing was more remote, but which bore directly upon our welfare, because they add to the beauty of living and therefore to the joy of life. Securing a great artist, St. Gorans, to give us the most beautiful coinage since the decay of Hellenistic Greece, was one such act. In this case, I had the power myself to direct the mint to employ St. Gorans. The first, and most beautiful, of his coins were issued in thousands, before Congress assembled or could intervene, and a great and permanent improvement was made in the beauty of the coinage. In the same way, on the advice and suggestion of Frank Millay, we got some really capital medals by sculptors of the first rank. Similarly, the new buildings in Washington were erected and placed in proper relation to one another, on plans provided by the best architects and landscape architects. I also appointed a fine arts council, an unpaid body of the best architects, painters, and sculptors in the country, to advise the government as to the erection and decoration of all new buildings. The pork-barrel senators and congressmen felt for this body an instinctive, and perhaps from their standpoint a natural, 
hostility, and my successor, a couple of months after taking office, revoked the appointment and disbanded the council. Even more important was the taking of steps to preserve from destruction beautiful and wonderful wild creatures, whose existence was threatened by greed and wantonness. During the seven and a half years closing on March 4, 1909, more was accomplished for the protection of wild life in the United States than during all the previous years, except only the creation of Yellowstone National Park. The record includes the creation of five national parks, Crater Lake, Oregon, Wind Cave, South Dakota, Platt, Oklahoma, Sully Hill, North Dakota, and Mesa Verde, Colorado, four big game refuges in Oklahoma, Arizona, Montana, and Washington, 51 bird reservations, and the enactment of laws for the protection of wildlife in Alaska, the District of Columbia, and on national bird reserves. These measures may be briefly enumerated as follows. The enactment of the first game laws for the territory of Alaska in 1902 and 1908, resulting in the regulation of the export of heads and trophies of big game and putting an end to the slaughter of deer for hides along the southern coast of the territory. The securing in 1902 of the first appropriation for the preservation of buffalo and the establishment in the Yellowstone National Park of the first and now the largest herd of buffalo belonging to the government. The passage of the Act of January 24, 1905, creating the Wichita Game Preserves, the first of the National Game Preserves. In 1907, 12,000 acres of this preserve were enclosed with a woven wire fence for the reception of the herd of 15 buffalo donated by the New York Zoological Society. The passage of the Act of June 29, 1906, providing for the establishment of the Grand Canyon Game Preserve of Arizona, now comprising 1,492,928 acres. The passage of the National Monuments Act of June 8, 1906, under which a number of objects of scientific interest have been preserved for all time. Among the monuments created are Muir Woods, Pinnacles National Monument in California, and the Mount Olympus National Monument, Washington, which form important refuges for game. The passage of the Act of June 30, 1906, regulating shooting in the District of Columbia, and making three-fourths of the environs of the national capital within the district, in effect, a national refuge. The passage of the Act of May 23, 1908, providing for the establishment of the National Bison Range in Montana. This range comprises about 18,000 acres of land, formerly in the Flathead Indian Reservation, on which is now established a herd of 80 buffalo, a nucleus of which was donated to the government by the American Bison Society. The issue of the order protecting the birds on the Niobrara Military Reservation, Nebraska, in 1908, making this entire reservation, in effect, a bird reservation. The establishment by executive order between March 14, 1903 and March 4, 1909, of 51 national bird reservations, distributed in 17 states and territories, from Puerto Rico to Hawaii and Alaska. The creation of these reservations at once placed the United States in the front rank in the world work of bird protection. Among these reservations are the celebrated Pelican Island Rookery in Indian River, Florida, the Mosquito Inlet Reservation, Florida, the northernmost home of the manatee, the extensive marshes bordering Klamath and Malheur Lakes in Oregon, formerly the scene of slaughter of ducks for market and the ruthless destruction of plume birds for the millinery trade the Tortugas Key, Florida, where, in connection with the Carnegie Institute, experiments have been made on the homing instincts of birds, and the great bird colonies on Laysan and sister inlets in Hawaii, some of the greatest colonies of seabirds in the world. End of chapter 11「Chapter 12, Part 1 of the Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt – this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Chapter 12 The Big Stick and the Square Deal, Part 1. One of the vital questions with which, as President, I had to deal was the attitude of the nation toward the great corporations. 
Men who understand and practice the deep underlying philosophy of the Lincoln School of American political thought are necessarily Hamiltonian in their belief in a strong and efficient national government, and Jeffersonian in their belief in the people as the ultimate authority, and in the welfare of the people as the end of government. The men who first applied the extreme democratic theory in American life were, like Jefferson, ultra-individualists, for at that time what was demanded by our people was the largest liberty for the individual. During the century that had elapsed since Jefferson became president, the need had been exactly reversed. There had been in our country a riot of individualistic materialism, under which complete freedom for the individual, that ancient license which President Wilson, a century after the term was excusable, has called the new freedom, turned out in practice to mean perfect freedom for the strong to wrong the weak. The total absence of governmental control had led to a portentous growth in the financial and industrial world, both of natural individuals and of artificial individuals, that is, corporations. In no other country in the world had such enormous fortunes been gained. In no other country in the world was such power held by the men who had gained these fortunes, and these men almost always worked through, and by means of, the giant corporations which they controlled. The power of the mighty industrial overlords of the country had increased with giant strides, while the methods of controlling them, or checking abuses by them, on the part of the people, through the government, remained archaic, and therefore practically impotent. The courts, not unnaturally, but most regrettably, and to the grave detriment of the people, and of their own standing, had for a quarter of a century been on the whole the agents of reaction, and by conflicting decisions which, however, in their sum were hostile to the interests of the people, had left both the nation and the several states well-nigh impotent to deal with the great business combinations. Sometimes they forbade the nation to interfere, because such interference trespassed on the rights of the states. Sometimes they forbade the states to interfere, and often they were wise in this, because to do so would trespass on the rights of the nation, or, well-nigh always, their action was negative action against the interests of the people, ingeniously devised to limit their power against wrong, instead of affirmative action giving to the people power to right wrong. They had rendered these decisions sometimes as upholders of property rights against human rights, being especially zealous in securing the rights of the men who were the most competent to take care of themselves, and sometimes, in the name of liberty, in the name of the so-called new freedom, in reality the old, old freedom, which secured to the powerful the freedom to prey on the poor and the helpless. One of the main troubles was the fact that the men who saw the evils and who tried to remedy them attempted to work in two wholly different ways, and the great majority of them in a way that offered little promise of real betterment. They tried, by the Sherman Law method, to bolster up an individualism already proved to be both futile and mischievous, to remedy by more individualism the concentration that was the inevitable result of the already existing individualism. They saw the evil done by the big combinations, and sought to remedy it by destroying them and restoring the country to the economic conditions of the middle of the nineteenth century. This was a hopeless effort, and those who went into it, although they regarded themselves as radical progressives, really represented a form of sincere rural Toryism. They confounded monopolies with big business combinations, and in the effort to prohibit both alike, instead of where possible prohibiting one and drastically controlling the other, they succeeded merely in preventing any effective control of either. On the other hand, a few men recognized that corporations and combinations had become indispensable in the business world, that it was folly to try to prohibit them, but that it was also folly to leave them without thoroughgoing control. These men realized that the doctrines of the old laissez-faire economists, of the believers in unlimited competition, unlimited individualism, were in the actual state of affairs false and mischievous. They realized that the government must now interfere to protect labor, to subordinate the big corporation to the public welfare, and to shackle cunning and fraud exactly as centuries before it had to interfere to shackle the physical force, which does wrong by violence. The big reactionaries of the business world and their allies and instruments among politicians and newspaper editors took advantage of this division of opinion, and especially of the fact that most of their opponents were on the wrong path, and fought to keep matters absolutely unchanged. These men demanded for themselves an immunity from governmental control which, if granted, would have been as wicked and as foolish as immunity to the barons of the twelfth century. Many of them were evil men. 
Many others were just as good men as were some of these same barons, but they were as utterly unable as any medieval castle owner to understand what the public interest really was. There have been aristocracies which have played a great and beneficent part at stages in the growth of mankind, but we had come to the stage where, for our people, what was needed was a real democracy, and of all forms of tyranny the least attractive and the most vulgar is the tyranny of mere wealth, the tyranny of a plutocracy. When I became president, the question as to the method by which the United States government was to control the corporations was not yet important. The absolutely vital question was whether the government had power to control them at all. This question had not yet been decided in favor of the United States government. It was useless to discuss methods of controlling big business by the national government until it was definitely settled that the national government had the power to control it. A decision of the Supreme Court had, with seeming definiteness, settled that the national government had not the power. This decision I caused to be annulled by the court that had rendered it, and the present power of the national government to deal effectively with the trusts is due solely to the success of the administration in securing this reversal of its former decision by the Supreme Court. The Constitution was formed very largely because it had to become imperative to give some central authority the power to regulate and control interstate commerce. At that time, when corporations were in their infancy, and big combinations unknown, there was no difficulty in exercising this power granted. In theory, the right of the nation to exercise this power continued unquestioned. But changing conditions obscured the matter in the sight of the people as a whole, and the conscious and the unconscious advocates of an unlimited and uncontrollable capitalism gradually secured the whittling away of the national power to exercise this theoretical right of control, until it practically vanished. After the Civil War, with the pretentious growth of industrial combinations in this country, came a period of reactionary decisions by the courts, which, as regards corporations, culminated in what is known as the Knight Case. The Sherman Antitrust Law was enacted in 1890, because the formation of the Tobacco Trust and the Sugar Trust, the only two great trusts then in the country, aside from the Standard Oil Trust, which was a gradual growth, had awakened a popular demand for legislation to destroy monopoly and curb industrial combinations. This demand the Antitrust Law was intended to satisfy. The administrations of Mr. Harrison and Mr. Cleveland evidently construed this law as prohibiting such combinations in the future, not as condemning those which had been formed prior to its enactment. In 1895, however, the Sugar Trust, whose output originally was about 55 per cent of all sugar produced in the United States, obtained control of three other companies in Philadelphia by exchanging its stock for theirs, and thus increased its business until it controlled ninety-eight per cent of the entire product. Under Cleveland the government brought proceedings against the Sugar Trust, invoking the antitrust law, to set aside the acquisition of these corporations. The test case was on the absorption of the Knight Company. The Supreme Court of the United States, with but one dissenting vote, held adversely to the government. They took the ground that the power conferred by the Constitution to regulate and control interstate commerce did not extend to the production or manufacture of commodities within a state, and that nothing in the Sherman Antitrust Law prohibited a corporation from acquiring all the stock of other corporations through exchange of its stock for theirs, such exchange not being commerce in the opinion of the court, even though by such acquisition the corporation was enabled to control the entire production of a commodity that was a necessary of life. The effect of this decision was not merely the absolute nullification of the antitrust law, so far as industrial corporations were concerned, but was also, in effect, a declaration that, under the Constitution, the national government could pass no law really effective for the destruction or control of such combinations. This decision left the national government, that is, the people of the nation, practically helpless to deal with the large combinations of modern business. The courts in other cases asserted the power of the federal government to enforce the antitrust law so far as transportation rates by railways engaged in interstate commerce were concerned. But so long as the trusts were free to control the production of commodities without interference from the general government, they were well content to let the transportation of commodities take care of itself, especially as the law against rebates was at that time a dead letter, and the court, by its decision in the Knight case, had interdicted any interference by the President or by Congress with the production of commodities. 
It was on the authority of this case that practically all the big trusts in the United States, excepting those already mentioned, were formed. Usually they were organized as holding companies, each one acquiring control of its constituent corporations by exchanging its stock for theirs, an operation which the Supreme Court had thus decided could not be prohibited, controlled, regulated, or even questioned by the federal government. Such was the condition of our laws when I acceded to the presidency. Just before my accession, a small group of financiers, desiring to profit by the governmental impotence to which we had been reduced by the night decision, had arranged to take control of practically the entire railway system in the Northwest, possibly as the first step toward controlling the entire railway system of the country. This control of the Northwestern railway systems was to be effected by organizing a new holding company, and exchanging its stock against the stock of the various corporations engaged in railway transportation throughout that vast territory, exactly as the Sugar Trust had acquired control of the Knight Company and other concerns. This company was called the Northern Securities Company. Not long after I became President, on the advice of the Attorney General, Mr. Knox, and through him, I ordered proceedings to be instituted for the dissolution of the company. As far as could be told by their utterances at that time, among all the great lawyers in the United States, Mr. Knox was the only one who believed that this action could be sustained. The defense was based expressly on the ground that the Supreme Court, in the Knight case, had explicitly sanctioned the formation of such a company as the Northern Securities Company. The representatives of privilege intimated, and sometimes asserted outright, that in directing the action to be brought I had shown a lack of respect for the Supreme Court, which had already decided the question at issue by a vote of eight to one. Mr. Justice White, then on the Court, and now Chief Justice, set forth the position that the two cases were in principle identical, with inconvertible logic. In giving the views of the dissenting minority on the action I had brought, he said, the parallel between the two cases, the Knight case and the Northern Securities case, is complete. The one corporation acquired the stock of other and competing corporations in exchange for its own. It was conceded for the purposes of the case that in doing so monopoly had been brought about in the refining of sugar, that the sugar to be produced was likely to become the subject of interstate commerce, and indeed that part of it would certainly become so. But the power of Congress was decided not to extend to this subject, because the ownership of the stock in the corporations was not itself commerce. Mr. Justice White was entirely correct in this statement. The cases were parallel. It was necessary to reverse the Knight case in the interest of the people against monopoly and privilege, just as it had been necessary to reverse the Dred Scott case in the interest of the people against slavery and privilege, just as later it became necessary to reverse the New York Bakeshop case in the interest of the people against that form of monopolistic privilege which put human rights below property rights where wage workers were concerned. By a vote of five to four the Supreme Court reversed its decision in the Knight case, and in the Northern Securities case sustained the government. The power to deal with industrial monopoly and suppress it, and to control and regulate combinations, of which the Knight case had deprived the federal government, was thus restored to it by the Northern Securities case. After this later decision was rendered, suits were brought by my direction against the American Tobacco Company and the Standard Oil Company. Both were adjudged criminal conspiracies, and their dissolution ordered. The Knight case was finally overthrown. The vicious doctrine it embodied no longer remains as an obstacle to obstruct the pathway of justice when it assails monopoly. Messrs. Knox, Moody, and Bonaparte, who successively occupied the position of Attorney General under me, were profound lawyers and fearless and able men, and they completely established the newer and more wholesome doctrine under which the federal government may now deal with monopolistic combinations and conspiracies. The decisions rendered in these various cases brought under my direction constitute the entire authority upon which any action must rest that seeks, through the exercise of national power, to curb monopolistic control. The men who organized and directed the Northern Securities Company were also the controlling forces in the Steel Corporation, which has since been prosecuted under the Act. The proceedings against the Sugar Trust for corruption in connection with the New York Custom House are sufficiently interesting to be considered separately. From the standpoint of giving complete control to the national government over big corporations engaged in interstate business, 
it would be impossible to overestimate the importance of the Northern Securities decision, and of the decision afterwards rendered in line with it in connection with the other trusts whose dissolution was ordered. The success of the Northern Securities case definitely established the power of the government to deal with all great corporations. Without this success, the national government must have remained in the impotence to which it had been reduced by the Knight decision as regards the most important of its internal functions. But our success in establishing the power of the national government to curb monopolies did not establish the right method of exercising that power. We had gained the power. We had not devised the proper method of exercising it. Monopolies can, although in rather cumbrous fashion, be broken up by lawsuits. Great business combinations, however, cannot possibly be made useful instead of noxious industrial agencies merely by lawsuits, and especially by lawsuits supposed to be carried on for their destruction, and not for their control and regulation. I at once began to urge upon Congress the need of laws supplementing the antitrust law, for this law struck at all big business, good and bad alike, and as the event proved, was very inefficient in checking bad big business, and yet was a constant threat against decent businessmen. I strongly urged the inauguration of a system of thoroughgoing and drastic governmental regulation and control over all big business combinations engaged in interstate industry. Here I was able to accomplish only a small part of what I desired to accomplish. I was opposed, both by the foolish radicals who desired to break up all big business, with the impossible ideal of returning to mid-nineteenth century industrial conditions, and also by the great privileged interests themselves, who used these ordinarily, but sometimes not entirely, well-meaning stool-pigeon progressives to further their own cause. The worst representatives of big business encouraged the outcry for the total abolition of big business because they knew that they could not be heard in this way, and that such an outcry distracted the attention of the public from the really efficient method of controlling and supervising them, in just but masterly fashion, which was advocated by the sane representatives of reform. However, we succeeded in making a good beginning by securing the passage of a law creating the Department of Commerce and Labor, and with it the erection of the Bureau of Corporations. The first head of the Department of Commerce and Labor was Mr. Cortelieu, later Secretary of the Treasury. He was succeeded by Mr. Oscar Strauss. The first head of the Bureau of Corporations was Mr. Garfield, who was succeeded by Mr. Herbert Knox Smith. No four better public servants from the standpoint of the people as a whole could have been found. The Standard Oil Company took the lead in opposing all this legislation. This was natural, for it had been the worst offender in the amassing of enormous fortunes by improper methods of all kinds, at the expense of business rivals and of the public, including the corruption of public servants. If any man thinks this condemnation extreme, I refer him to the language officially used by the Supreme Court of the Nation in its decision against the Standard Oil Company. Through their counsel, and by direct telegrams and letters to senators and congressmen from various heads of the Standard Oil Organization, they did their best to kill the bill providing for the Bureau of Corporations. I got hold of one or two of these telegrams and letters, however, and promptly published them, and, as generally happens in such a case, the men who were all-powerful as long as they could work in secret and behind closed doors became powerless as soon as they were forced into the open. The bill went through without further difficulty. The true way of dealing with monopoly is to prevent it by administrative action before it grows so powerful that even when courts condemn it they shrink from destroying it. The Supreme Court, in the tobacco and standard oil cases, for instance, used very vigorous language in condemning these trusts, but the net result of the decision was of positive advantage to the wrongdoers, and this has tended to bring the whole body of our law into disrepute in quarters where it is of the very highest importance that the law be held in respect and even in reverence. My effort was to secure the creation of a federal commission, which should neither excuse nor tolerate monopoly, but prevent it when possible, and uproot it when discovered, and which should, in addition, effectively control and regulate all big combinations, and should give honest business certainty as to what the law was, and security as long as the law was obeyed. Such a commission would furnish a steady expert control, a control adapted to the problem, and dissolution is neither control nor regulation, but is purely negative, and negative remedies are of little permanent avail. Such a commission would have complete power to examine into every big corporation engaged or proposing to engage in business between the states. 
it would have the power to discriminate sharply between corporations that are doing well and those that are doing ill, and the distinction between those who do well and those who do ill would be defined in terms so clear and unmistakable that no one could misapprehend them. Where a company is found seeking its profits through serving the community by stimulating production, lowering prices, or improving service, while scrupulously respecting the rights of others, including its rivals, its employees, its customers, and the general public, and strictly obeying the law, then no matter how large its capital, or how great the volume of its business would be encouraged to still more abundant production, or better service, by the fullest protection that the government could afford it. On the other hand, if a corporation were found seeking profit through injury or oppression of the community, by restricting production through trick or device, by plot or conspiracy against competitors, or by oppression of wage workers, and then extorting high prices for the commodity it had made artificially scarce, it would be prevented from organizing if its nefarious purpose could be discovered in time, or pursued and suppressed by all the power of the government, whenever found in actual operation. Such a commission, with the power I advocate, would put a stop to abuses of big corporations and small corporations alike. It would draw the line on conduct and not on size. It would destroy monopoly, and make the biggest business man in the country conform squarely to the principles laid down by the American people, while at the same time giving fair play to the little man, and certainty of knowledge as to what was wrong and what was right, both to big man and little man. Although under the decision of the courts the national government had power over the railways, I found, when I became president, that this power was either not exercised at all, or exercised with utter inefficiency. The law against rebates was a dead letter. All the unscrupulous railway men had been allowed to violate it with impunity, and because of this, as was inevitable, the scrupulous and decent railway men had been forced to violate it themselves, under penalty of being beaten by their less scrupulous rivals. It was not the fault of these decent railway men, it was the fault of the government. Thanks to a first-class railway man, Paul Morton of the Santa Fe, son of Mr. Cleveland's Secretary of Agriculture, I was able completely to stop the practice. Mr. Morton volunteered to aid the government in abolishing rebates. He frankly stated that he, like every one else, had been guilty in the matter, but he insisted that he uttered the sentiments of the decent railway men of the country when he said that he hoped the practice would be stopped, and that, if I would really stop it, and not merely make believe to stop it, he would give the testimony which would put into the hands of the government the power to put a complete check to the practice. Accordingly he testified, and on the information which he gave us we were able to take such action through the Interstate Commerce Commission and the Department of Justice, supplemented by the necessary additional legislation, that the evil was absolutely eradicated. He thus rendered, of his own accord, at his own personal risk, and from purely disinterested motives, an invaluable service to the people, a service which no other man who was able to render was willing to render. As an immediate sequel, the world-old alliance between Blue Phil and Black George was immediately revived against Paul Morton. In giving rebates he had done only what every honest railway man in the country had been obliged to do because of the failure of the government to enforce the prohibition as regards dishonest railway men. But unlike his fellows, he had then shown the courage and sense of obligation to the public which made him come forward, and without evasion or concealment state what he had done, in order that we might successfully put an end to the practice, and put an end to the practice we did, and we did it because of the courage and patriotism he had shown. The unscrupulous railway men, whose dishonest practices were thereby put a stop to, and the unscrupulous demagogues who were either under the influence of these men or desirous of gaining credit with thoughtless and ignorant people, no matter who was hurt, joined in vindictive clamor against Mr. Morton. They actually wished me to prosecute him, although such prosecution would have been a piece of unpardonable ingratitude and treachery on the part of the public toward him, for I was merely acting as the steward of the public in this matter. I need hardly say that I stood by him, and later he served under me as Secretary of the Navy, and a capital secretary he made, too. We not only secured the stopping of rebates, but in the Hepburn Rate Bill we were able to put through a measure which gave the Interstate Commerce Commission, for the first time, real control over the railways. There were two or three amusing features in the contest over this bill. All of the great business interests which objected to governmental control banded to fight it, and they were helped by the honest men of ultra-conservative type, who always dread change, whether good or bad. 
We finally forced it through the House. In the Senate it was referred to a committee in which the Republican majority was under the control of Senator Aldrich, who took the lead in opposing the bill. There was one Republican on the committee, however, whom Senator Aldrich could not control, Senator Dolliver of Iowa. The leading Democrat on the committee was Senator Tillman, of South Carolina, with whom I was not on good terms, because I had been obliged to cancel an invitation to him to dine at the White House, on account of his having made a personal assault in the Senate chamber on his colleague from South Carolina, and later I had to take action against him on account of his conduct in connection with certain land matters. Senator Tillman favored the bill. The Republican majority in the committee under Senator Aldrich, when they acted adversely on the bill, turned it over to Senator Tillman, thereby making him its sponsor. The object was to create what it was hoped would be an impossible situation in view of the relations between Senator Tillman and myself. I regarded the action as simply childish. It was a curious instance of how able and astute men sometimes commit blunders because of sheer inability to understand intensity of disinterested motive in others. I did not care a rap about Mr. Tillman's getting credit for the bill, or having charge of it. I was delighted to go with him, or with any one else, just so long as he was travelling in my way, and no longer. End of chapter 12, part 1《ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ハッピーバースデー・ Unwise zealots wished to make the effort totally to abolish the appeal in connection with the Hepburn Bill. Representatives of the special interests wished to extend the appeal to include what it ought not to include. Between stood a number of men whose votes would mean the passage of, or the failure to pass the bill, and who were not inclined towards either side. Three or four substantially identical amendments were proposed, and we then suddenly found ourselves face to face with an absurd situation. The good men who were willing to go with us, but had conservative misgivings about the ultra-radicals, would not accept a good amendment if one of the latter proposed it, and the radicals would not accept their own amendment if one of the conservatives proposed it. Each side got so wrought up as to be utterly unable to get matters into proper perspective, each prepared to stand on unimportant trifles, each announced with hysterical emphasis, the reformers just as hysterically as the reactionaries, that the decision as regards each unimportant trifle determined the worth or worthlessness of the measure. Gradually we secured a measurable return to sane appreciation of the essentials. Finally, both sides reluctantly agreed to accept the so-called Allison Amendment, which did not, as a matter of fact, work any change in the bill at all. The amendment was drawn by Attorney General Moody after consultation with the Interstate Commerce Commission, and was forwarded by me to Senator Dolliver. It was accepted, and the bill became law. Thanks to this law, and to the way in which the Interstate Commerce Commission was backed by the administration, the Commission, under men like Prouty, Lane, and Clark, became a most powerful force for good. Some of the good that we had accomplished was undone, after the close of my administration, by the unfortunate law creating a commerce court, but the major part of the immense advance we had made remained. There was one point on which I insisted, and upon which it was necessary always to insist. The Commission cannot do permanent good unless it does justice to the corporations, precisely as it exacts justice from them. The public, the shippers, the stock and bondholders, and the employees all have their rights, and none should be allowed unfair privileges at the expense of the others. Stock watering and swindling of any kind should of course not only be stopped but punished. When, however, a road is managed fairly and honestly, and when it renders a real and needed service, then the government must not see that it is not so burdened as to make it impossible to run at a profit. There is much wise legislation necessary for the safety of the public, 
or, like workmen's compensation, necessary to the well-being of the employee, which nevertheless imposes such a burden on the road, that the burden must be distributed between the general public and the corporation, or there will be no dividends. In such cases it may be the highest duty of the commissioners to raise rates, and the commission, when satisfied that the necessity exists, in order to do justice to the owners of the road, should no more hesitate to raise rates, than under other circumstances to lower them. So much for the big stick in dealing with the corporations when they went wrong. Now for a sample of the square deal. In the fall of 1907 there were several business disturbances and financial stringency, culminating in a panic which arose in New York and spread over the country. The damage actually done was great, and the damage threatened was incalculable. Thanks largely to the action of the government, the panic was stopped before, instead of being merely a serious business check, it became a frightful and nationwide calamity, a disaster fraught with untold misery and woe to all our people. For several days the nation trembled on the brink of such a calamity, of such a disaster. During these days both the Secretary of the Treasury and I personally were in hourly communication with New York, following every change in the situation and trying to anticipate every development. It was the obvious duty of the administration to take every step possible to prevent appalling disaster by checking the spread of the panic before it grew so that nothing could check it. And events moved with such speed that it was necessary to decide and to act on the instant, as each successive crisis arose, if the decision and action were to accomplish anything. The Secretary of the Treasury took various actions, some on his own initiative, some by my direction. Late one evening I was informed that two representatives of the Steel Corporation wished to see me early the following morning, the precise object not being named. Next morning, while at breakfast, I was informed that Messrs. Frick and Gary were waiting at the office. I at once went over, and as the Attorney General, Mr. Bonaparte, had not yet arrived from Baltimore, where he had been passing the night, I sent a message asking the Secretary of State, Mr. Root, who was also a lawyer, to join us, which he did. Before the close of the interview, and in the presence of the three gentlemen named, I dictated a note to Mr. Bonaparte, setting forth exactly what Messrs. Frick and Gary had proposed, and exactly what I had answered, so that there might be no possibility of misunderstanding. This note was published in a Senate document while I was still President. It runs as follows. The White House, Washington, November 4, 1907. My dear Mr. Attorney General, Judge E. H. Gary and Mr. H. C. Frick, on behalf of the Steel Corporation, have just called upon me. They state that there is a certain business firm, the name of which I have not been told, but which is of real importance in New York business circles, which will undoubtedly fail this week if help is not given. Among its assets are a majority of the securities of the Tennessee Coal Company. Application has been urgently made to the Steel Corporation to purchase this stock as the only means of avoiding a failure. Judge Gary and Mr. Frick informed me that, as a mere business transaction, they do not care to purchase the stock, that under ordinary circumstances they would not consider purchasing the stock, because but little benefit will come to the Steel Corporation from the purchase, that they are aware that the purchase will be used as a handle for attack upon them, on the ground that they are striving to secure a monopoly of the business and prevent competition, not that this would represent what could honestly be said, but what might recklessly and untruthfully be said. They further informed me that, as a matter of fact, the policy of the company has been to decline to acquire more than sixty per cent of the steel properties, and that this purpose has been persevered in for several years past, with the object of preventing these accusations, and as a matter of fact, their proportion of steel properties has slightly decreased, so that it is below this sixty per cent, and the acquisition of the property in question will not raise it above sixty per cent but they feel that it is immensely to their interest, as to the interest of every responsible businessman, to try to prevent a panic and general industrial smash-up at this time, and that they are willing to go into this transaction, which they would not otherwise go into, because it seems the opinion of those best fitted to express judgment in New York, that it will be an important factor in preventing a break that might be ruinous, and that this has been urged upon them by the combination of the most responsible bankers in New York, who are now thus engaged in endeavouring to save the situation. But they asserted that they did not wish to do this if I stated that it ought not to be done. I answered that, while of course I could not advise them to take the action proposed, I felt it no public duty of mine to interpose any objections. Sincerely yours, signed Theodore Roosevelt. 
Hon. Charles J. Bonaparte, Attorney General. Mr. Bonaparte received this note in about an hour, and that same morning he came over, acknowledged its receipt, and said that my answer was the only proper answer that could have been made, having regard both to the law and to the needs of the situation. He stated that the legal situation had been in no way changed, and that no sufficient ground existed for prosecution of the Steel Corporation. But I acted purely on my own initiative, and the responsibility for the act was solely mine. I was intimately acquainted with the situation in New York. The word panic means fear, unreasoning fear. To stop a panic it is necessary to restore confidence, and at the moment the so-called Morgan interests were the only interests which retained a full hold on the confidence of the people of New York. Not only the business people, but the immense mass of men and women who owned small investments, or had small savings in the banks and trust companies. Mr. Morgan and his associates were of course fighting hard to prevent the loss of confidence, and the panic distrust from increasing to such a degree as to bring any other big financial institutions down, for this would probably have been followed by a general, and very likely a world-wide crash. The Knickerbocker Trust Company had already failed, and runs had begun on, or were threatening as regards, two other big trust companies. These companies were now on the fighting line, and it was to the interest of everybody to strengthen them, in order that the situation might be saved. It was a matter of general knowledge and belief that they, or the individuals prominent in them, held the securities of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, which securities had no market value and were useless as a source of strength in the emergency. The Steel Corporation securities, on the contrary, were immediately marketable, their great value being known and admitted all over the world, as the event showed. The proposal of Messrs. Frick and Gary was that the Steel Corporation should at once acquire the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, and thereby substitute, among the assets of the threatened institutions, which, by the way, they did not name to me, securities of great and immediate value for securities which, at the moment, were of no value. It was necessary for me to decide on the instant, before the stock exchange opened, for the situation in New York was such that any hour might be vital, and failure to act for even an hour might make all subsequent effort to act utterly useless. From the best information at my disposal, I believed, what was actually the fact, that the addition of the Tennessee coal and iron property would only increase the proportion of the steel company's holdings by about four per cent making them about 62 per cent instead of about 58 per cent of the total value in the country, an addition which, by itself, in my judgment, concurred in, not only by the Attorney General, but by every competent lawyer, worked no change in the legal status of the Steel Corporation. The diminution in the percentage of holdings and production has gone on steadily, and the percentage is now about 10 per cent less than it was ten years ago. The action was emphatically for the general good. It offered the only chance for arresting the panic, and it did arrest the panic. I answered Messrs. Frick and Gary, as set forth in the letter quoted above, to the effect that I did not deem it my duty to interfere, that is, to forbid the action which more than anything else in actual fact saved the situation. The result justified my judgment. The panic was stopped, public confidence in the solvency of the threatened institution being at once restored. Business was vitally helped by what I did. The benefit was not only for the moment, it was permanent. Particularly was this the case in the South. Three or four years afterwards I visited Birmingham. Every man I met, without exception, who was competent to testify, informed me voluntarily that the results of the action taken had been of the utmost benefit to Birmingham, and therefore to Alabama, the industry having profited to an extraordinary degree, not only from the standpoint of the business, but from the standpoint of the community at large and of the wage workers, by the change in ownership. The results of the action I took were beneficial from every standpoint, and the action itself, at the time when it was taken, was vitally necessary to the welfare of the people of the United States. I would have been derelict in my duty, I would have shown myself a timid and unworthy public servant, if in that extraordinary crisis I had not acted precisely as I did act. In every such crisis the temptation to indecision, to non-action, is great, for excuses can always be found for non-action, and action means risk and the certainty of blame to the man who acts. But if the man is worth his salt, he will do his duty, he will give the people the benefit of the doubt, and act in any way which their interest demands, and which is not affirmatively prohibited by law, unheeding the likelihood that he himself, when the crisis is over and the danger past, will be assailed for what he has done. 
Every step I took in this matter was open as the day, and was known in detail at the moment to all people. The press contained full accounts of the visit to be of Messrs. Frick and Gary, and heralded widely and with acclamation the results of that visit. At the time, the relief and rejoicing over what had been done were well nigh universal. The danger was too eminent and too appalling for me to be willing to condemn those who were successful in saving them from it. But I fully understood, and expected, that when there was no longer danger, when the fear had been forgotten, attack would be made upon me, and, as a matter of fact, after a year had elapsed the attack was begun, and has continued at intervals ever since, my ordinary assailant being some politician of rather cheap type. If I were on a sailboat, I should not ordinarily meddle with any of the gear, but if a sudden squall struck us, and the main sheet jammed, so that the boat threatened to capsize, I would unhesitatingly cut the main sheet, even though I were sure that the owner, no matter how grateful to me at the moment for having saved his life, would a few weeks later, when he had forgotten his danger and his fear, decide to sue me for the value of the cut rope. But I would feel a hearty contempt for the owner who so acted. There were many other things that we did in connection with the corporations. One of the most important was the passage of the meat inspection law, because of scandalous abuses shown to exist in the great packing-houses in Chicago and elsewhere. There was a curious result of this law, similar to what occurred in connection with the law providing for effective railway regulation. The big beef men bitterly opposed the law, just as the big railway men opposed the Hepburn Act. Yet three or four years after these laws had been put on the statute books, every honest man, both in the beef business and the railway business, came to the conclusion that they worked good and not harm to the decent business concerns. They hurt only those who were not acting as they should have acted. The law providing for the inspection of packing-houses, and the Pure Food and Drugs Act, were also extremely important, and the way in which they were administered was even more important. It would be hard to overstate the value of the service rendered in all these cases by such cabinet officers as Moody and Bonaparte, and their outside assailants of the stamp of Frank Kellogg. It would be useless to enumerate all the suits we brought. Some of them I have already touched upon. Others, such as the suits against the Harriman Railway Corporations, which were successful, and which had been rendered absolutely necessary by the grossly improper actions of the corporations concerned, offered no special points of interest. The Sugar Trust proceedings, however, may be mentioned as showing just the kind of thing that was done, and the kind of obstacle encountered and overcome in prosecutions of this character. It was on the advice of my secretary, William Loeb, Jr., afterward head of the New York Custom House, that the action was taken which started the uncovering of the frauds perpetrated by the Sugar Trust, and other companies in connection with the importing of sugar. Loeb had, from time to time, told me that he was sure there was fraud in connection with the importations by the Sugar Trust through the New York Custom House. Finally, some time toward the end of 1904, he informed me that Richard Parr, a sampler at the New York appraiser's stores, whose duties took him almost continually on the docks in connection with the sampling of merchandise, had called on him, and had stated that in his belief the sugar companies were defrauding the government in the matter of weights, and had stated that if he could be made an investigating officer of the Treasury Department, he was confident that he could show there was wrongdoing. Parr had been a former schoolfellow of Loeb in Albany, and Loeb believed him to be loyal, honest, and efficient. He thereupon laid the matter before me, and advised the appointment of Parr as a special employee of the Treasury Department, for the specific purpose of investigating the alleged sugar frauds. I instructed the Treasury Department accordingly, and was informed that there was no vacancy in the force of special employees, but that Parr would be given the first place that opened up. Early in the spring of 1905 Parr came to Loeb again, and said that he had received additional information about the sugar frauds, and was anxious to begin the investigation. Loeb again discussed the matter with me, and I notified the Treasury Department to appoint Parr immediately. On June 1, 1905, he received his appointment, and was assigned to the Port of Boston for the purpose of gaining some experience as an investigating officer. During the month he was transferred to the main district, with headquarters at Portland, where he remained until March 1907. During his service in Maine he uncovered extensive wool smuggling frauds. At the conclusion of the wool case he appealed to Loeb to have him transferred to New York, so that he might undertake the investigation of the sugar underweighing frauds. 
I now called the attention of Secretary Cortelieu personally to the matter, so that he would be able to keep a check over any subordinates who might try to interfere with Parr, for the conspiracy was evidently widespread, the wealth of the offenders great, and the corruption in the service far-reaching, while, moreover, as always happens with respectable offenders, there were many good men who sincerely disbelieved in the possibility of corruption on the part of men of such high financial standing. Parr was assigned to New York early in March 1907, and at once began an active investigation of the conditions existing on the sugar docks. This terminated in the discovery of a steel spring in one of the scales of Havemeyer and Elder Docks in Brooklyn, November 20, 1907, which enabled us to uncover what were probably the most colossal frauds ever perpetrated in the customs service. From the beginning of his active work in the investigation of the sugar frauds in March 1907 to March 4, 1909, Parr, from time to time, personally reported to Loeb, at the White House, the progress of his investigations, and Loeb in his turn kept me personally advised. On one occasion there was an attempt made to shunt Parr off the investigation and substitute another agent of the Treasury, who was suspected of having some relations with the sugar companies under investigation, but Parr reported the facts to Loeb. I sent for Secretary Cortelieu, and Secretary Cortelieu promptly took charge of the matter himself, putting Parr back on the investigation. During the investigation, Parr was subjected to all sorts of harassments, including an attempt to bribe him by Spitzer, the dock superintendent of the Havemeyer and Elder Refinery, for which Spitzer was convicted and served a term in prison. Brzezinski, a special agent, who was assisting Parr, was convicted of perjury, and also served a term in prison, he having changed his testimony, in the trial of Spitzer for the attempted bribery of Parr, from that which he gave before the grand jury. For his extraordinary services in connection with this investigation, Parr was granted an award of one hundred thousand dollars by the Treasury Department. District Attorney Stimson, of New York, assisted by Dennison, Frankfurter, Wise, and other employees of the Department of Justice, took charge of the case, and carried on both civil and criminal proceedings. The trial and the action against the Sugar Trust for the recovery of duties on the cargo of sugar, which was being sent over the scales at the time of the discovery of the steel spring by Parr, was begun in 1908. Judgment was rendered against the defendants on March 5, 1909, the day after I left office. Over four million dollars were recovered and paid back into the United States Treasury by the sugar companies which had perpetrated the various forms of fraud. These frauds were unearthed by Parr, Loeb, Stimson, Frankfurter, and the other men mentioned, and their associates, and it was to them that the people owed the refunding of the huge sum of money mentioned. We had already secured heavy fines from the Sugar Trust, and from various big railways and private individuals, such as Edwin Earl, for unlawful rebates. In the case of the chief offender, the American Sugar Refining Company, the Sugar Trust, criminal prosecutions were carried on against every living man whose position was such that he would naturally know about the fraud. All of them were indicted, and the biggest and most responsible ones were convicted. The evidence showed that the president of the company, Henry O. Havemeyer, virtually ran the entire company, and was responsible for all the details of the management. He died two weeks after the fraud was discovered, just as proceedings were being begun. Next to him in importance was the secretary and treasurer, Charles R. Hike, who was convicted. Various other officials and employees of the trust, and various government employees were indicted, and most of them convicted. Ernest W. Gerbracht, the superintendent of one of the refineries, was convicted, but his sentence was commuted to a short jail imprisonment because he became a government witness and greatly assisted the government in the suits. Hike's sentence was commuted so as to excuse him from going to the penitentiary, just as the penitentiary sentence of Morse, the big New York banker, who was convicted of gross fraud and misapplication of funds, was commuted. Both commutations were granted long after I left office. In each case the commutation was granted because, as was stated, of the prisoner's age and state of health. In Morse's case the President originally refused the request, saying that Morse had exhibited fraudulent and criminal disregard of the trust imposed upon him, that he was entirely unscrupulous as to the methods he adopted, and that he seemed at times to be absolutely heartless with regard to the consequences to others, and he showed great shrewdness in obtaining large sums of money from the bank, without adequate security, and without making himself personally liable, therefore. 
The two cases may be considered in connection with the announcement in the public press that on May 17, 1913, the President commuted the sentence of Louis A. Banks, who was serving a very long penitentiary sentence for an attack on a girl in the Indian Territory. The reason for the commutation, which is set forth in the press, being that Banks is in poor health. End of chapter 12, part 2《ハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピー In these three cases, all of which I had personal cognizance, I disagreed radically with the views my successors took, and with the views which many respectable men took, who, in these and similar cases, both while I was in office and afterwards, urged me to show, or asked others to show, clemency. It then seemed to me, and it now seems to me, that such clemency is from the larger standpoint a gross wrong to the men and women of the country. One of the former special assistants of the district attorney, Mr. W. Cleveland Runyon, in commenting bitterly on the release of Hike and Morse on account of their health, pointed out that their health apparently became good when once they themselves became free men, and added, The commutation of these sentences amounts to a direct interference with the administration of justice by the courts. Hike got a $25,000 salary and has escaped his imprisonment. But what about the six eighteen-dollar-a-week checkers, who were sent to jail, one of them a man of more than sixty? It is cases like this that create discontent and anarchy. They make it seem plain that there is one law for the rich, and another for the poor man, and I for one will protest. In dealing with Hike the individual, or Morse, or any other individual, it is necessary to emphasize the social aspects of his case. The moral of the Hike case, as has been well said, is how easy it is for a man in modern corporate organizations to drift into wrongdoing. The moral restraints are loosened in the case of a man like Hike, by the insulation of himself from the sordid details of crime, through industrially coerced intervening agents. Professor Ross has made the penetrating observation that distance disinfects dividends. It also weakens individual responsibility, particularly on the part of the very managers of large business, who should feel it most acutely. One of the officers of the Department of Justice who conducted the suit, and who inclined to the side of mercy in the matter, nevertheless writes, Hike is a beautiful illustration of mental and moral obscuration in the business life of an otherwise valuable member of society. Hike had an ample share in the guidance of the affairs of the American Sugar Company, and we are apt to have a foreshortened picture of his responsibility, because he operated from the easy coin of vantage of executive remoteness. It is difficult to say to what extent he did, directly or indirectly, profit by the sordid practices of his company. But the social damage of an individual in his position may be just as deep, whether merely the zest of the game or hard cash be his dominant motive. I have coupled the cases of the big banker and the sugar trust official and the case of the man convicted of a criminal assault on a woman. All of the criminals were released from penitentiary sentences on grounds of ill health. The offenses were typical of the worst crimes committed at the two ends of the social scale. One offense was a crime of brutal violence. The other offenses were crimes of astute corruption. All of them were offenses which, in my judgment, were of such a character that clemency towards the offender worked grave injustice to the community as a whole, injustice so grave that its effects might be far-reaching in their damage. Every time that rape or criminal assault on a woman is pardoned, and anything less than the full penalty of the law exacted, a premium is put on the practice of lynching such offenders. Every time a big-moneyed offender, who naturally excites interest and sympathy, and who has many friends, is excused from serving a sentence which a man of less prominence and fewer friends would have to serve, justice is discredited in the eyes of plain people, and to undermine faith in justice is to strike at the foundation of the Republic. As for ill health, it must be remembered that few people are as healthy in prison as they would be outside, and there should be no discrimination among criminals on this score. Either all criminals who grow unhealthy should be let out, or none. Pardons must sometimes be given in order that the cause of justice may be served, 
but in cases such as these I am considering, while I know that many amiable people differ from me, I am obliged to say that in my judgment the pardons work far-reaching harm to the cause of justice. Among the big corporations themselves, even where they did wrong, there was a wide difference in the moral obliquity indicated by the wrongdoer. There was a wide distinction between the offences committed in the case of the Northern Securities Company, and in the offences because of which the Sugar Trust, the Tobacco Trust, and the Standard Oil Trust were successfully prosecuted under my administration. It was vital to destroy the Northern Securities Company, but the men creating it had done so in an open and above-board fashion, acting under what they, and most of the members of the bar, thought to be the law established by the Supreme Court in the Knight Sugar case. But the Supreme Court, in its decree dissolving the Standard Oil and Tobacco Trusts, condemned them in the severest language for moral turpitude, and an even severer need of condemnation should be visited on the Sugar Trust. However, all the trusts and big corporations against which we proceeded, which included in their directorates practically all the biggest financiers in the country, joined in making the bitterest assaults on me and on my administration. Of their actions I wrote as follows to Attorney General Bonaparte, who had been a peculiarly close friend and adviser through the period covered by my public life in high office, and who, together with Attorney General Moody, possessed the same understanding sympathy with my social and industrial program that was possessed by such officials as Strauss, Garfield, H. K. Smith, and Pinchot. The letter runs, January 2, 1908. My dear Bonaparte, I must congratulate you on your admirable speech at Chicago. You said the very things it was good to say at this time. What you said bore a special weight because it represented what you had done. You have shown by what you have actually accomplished that the law is enforced against the wealthiest corporation, and the richest and most powerful manager or manipulator of that corporation, just as resolutely and fearlessly as against the humblest citizen. The Department of Justice is now in very fact the Department of Justice, and justice is meted out with an even hand to great and small, rich and poor, weak and strong. Those who have denounced you in the action of the Department of Justice are either misled, or else are the very wrongdoers, and the agents of the very wrongdoers, who have for so many years gone scot-free and flouted the laws with impunity. Above all, you are to be congratulated upon the bitterness felt and expressed towards you by the representatives and agents of the great law-defying corporations of immense wealth, who, until within the last half-dozen years, have treated themselves and have expected others to treat them as being beyond and above all possible check from the law. It was time to say something, for the representatives of predatory wealth, of wealth accumulated on a giant scale by iniquity, by wrongdoing in many forms, by plain swindling, by oppressing wage-workers, by manipulating securities, by unfair and unwholesome competition, and by stock-jobbing, in short, by conduct abhorrent to every man of ordinary decent conscience, have during the last few months made it evident that they are banded together to work for a reaction, to endeavour to overthrow and discredit all who honestly administer the law, and to secure a return to the days when every unscrupulous wrongdoer could do what he wished, unchecked, provided he had enough money. They attack you because they know your honesty and fearlessness, and dread them. The enormous sons of money these men have at their control enable them to carry on an effective campaign. They find their tools in a portion of the public press, including especially certain of the great New York papers. They find their agents in some men in public life, now and then occupying, or having occupied, positions as high as senator or governor. In some men in the pulpit, and most melancholy of all, in a few men on the bench. By gifts to colleges and universities they are occasionally able to subsidize in their own interests some head of an educational body, who, save only a judge, should of all men be most careful to keep his skirts clear from the taint of such corruption. There are ample material rewards for those who serve with fidelity the mammon of unrighteousness, but they are dearly paid for by that institution of learning, whose head, by example and precept, teaches the scholars who sit under him that there is one law for the rich and another for the poor. The amount of money the representatives of the great moneyed interests are willing to spend can be gauged by their recent publication broadcast throughout the papers of this country from the Atlantic to the Pacific of huge advertisements attacking with envenomed bitterness the administration's policy of warring against successful dishonesty, advertisements that must have cost enormous sums of money. 
This advertisement, as also a pamphlet called The Roosevelt Panic, and one or two similar books and pamphlets, are written especially in the interest of the Standard Oil and Harriman combinations, but also defend all the individuals and corporations of great wealth that have been guilty of wrongdoing. From the railroad rate law to the pure food law, every measure for honesty in business that has been pressed during the last six years has been opposed by these men, on its passage and in its administration, with every resource that bitter and unscrupulous craft could suggest, and the command of an almost unlimited money secure. These men do not themselves speak aright, they hire others to do their bidding. Their spirit and purpose are made clear alike by the editorials of the papers owned in, or whose policy is dictated by, Wall Street, and by the speeches of public men who, as senators, governors, or mayors, have served these, their masters, to the cost of the plain people. At one time one of their writers or speakers attacks the rate law as the cause of the panic. He is, whether in public life or not, usually a clever corporation lawyer, and he is not so foolish a being as to believe in the truth of what he says. He has too closely represented the railroads not to know well that the Hepburn rate bill has helped every honest railroad, and has hurt only the railroads that regarded themselves as above the law. At another time, one of them assails the administration for not imprisoning people under the Sherman antitrust law, for declining to make what he well knows, in view of the actual attitude of juries, as shown in the tobacco trust cases and in San Francisco, in one or two of the cases brought against corrupt businessmen would have been the futile endeavour to imprison defendants whom we are actually able to find. He raises the usual clamour, raised by all who object to the enforcement of the law, that we are fining corporations instead of putting the heads of the corporations in jail, and he states that this does not really harm the chief offenders. Were this statement true, he himself would not be found attacking us. The extraordinary violence of the assault upon our policy contained in speeches like these, in the articles in the subsidized press, in such huge advertisements and pamphlets as those above referred to, and the enormous sums of money spent in these various ways, give a fairly accurate measure of the anger and terror which our actions have caused the corrupt men of vast wealth to feel in the very marrow of their being. The man thus attacking us is usually, like so many of his fellows, either a great lawyer or a paid editor who takes his commands from the financiers and his arguments from their attorneys. If the former, he has defended many malefactors, and he knows well that, thanks to the advice of lawyers like himself, a certain kind of modern corporation has been turned into an admirable instrument by which to render it well-nigh impossible to get at the really guilty man so that in most cases the only way of punishing the wrong is by fining the corporation, or by proceeding personally against some of the minor agents. These lawyers and their employers are the men mainly responsible for this state of things, and their responsibility is shared with the legislators who ingeniously oppose the passing of just and effective laws, and with those judges whose one aim seems to be to construe such laws so that they cannot be executed. Nothing is sillier than this outcry on behalf of the innocent stockholders in the corporations. We are besought to pity the Standard Oil Company for a fine relatively far less great than the fines every day inflicted in the police courts upon multitudes of pushcart peddlers and other petty offenders, whose woes never extort one word from the men whose withers are wrung by the woes of the mighty. The stockholders have the control of the corporation in their own hands. The corporation officials are elected by those holding the majority of the stock, and can keep office only by having behind them the good will of these majority stockholders. They are not entitled to the slightest pity if they deliberately choose to resign into the hands of great wrongdoers the control of the corporations in which they own the stock. Of course, innocent people have become involved in these big corporations and suffer because of the misdeeds of their criminal associates. Let these innocent people be careful not to invest in corporations where those in control are not men of probity, men who respect the laws. Above all, let them avoid the men who make it their one effort to evade or defy the laws. But if these honest innocent people are in the majority in any corporation, they can immediately resume control and throw out of the directory the men who misrepresent them. Does any man for a moment suppose that the majority stockholders of the Standard Oil are others than Mr. Rockefeller and his associates themselves, and the beneficiaries of their wrongdoing? When the stock is watered so that the innocent investors suffer, 
a grave wrong is indeed done to those innocent investors, as well as to the public, but the public men, lawyers and editors, to whom I refer, do not under these circumstances express sympathy for the innocent. On the contrary, they are the first to protest with frantic vehemence against our efforts, by law, to put a stop to over-capitalization and stock-watering. The apologists of successful dishonesty always declaim against any effort to punish or prevent it, on the ground that such effort will unsettle business. It is they who by their acts have unsettled business, and the very men raising this cry spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in securing, by speech, editorial, book, or pamphlet, the defense by misstatement of what they have done. And yet, when we correct their misstatements by telling the truth, they declaim against us for breaking silence, lest values be unsettled. They have hurt honest businessmen, honest working men, honest farmers, and now they clamor against the truth being told. The keynote of all these attacks upon the effort to secure honesty in business and in politics is expressed in a recent speech, in which the speaker stated that prosperity had been checked by the effort for the moral regeneration of the business world, an effort which he denounced as unnatural, unwarranted, and injurious, and for which he stated the panic was the penalty. The morality of such a plea is precisely as great as if made on behalf of the men caught in a gambling establishment, when that gambling establishment is raided by the police. If such words mean anything, they mean that those whose sentiments they represent stand against the effort to bring about a moral regeneration of business, which will prevent a repetition of the insurance, banking, and street railroad scandals in New York, a repetition of the Chicago and Alton deal, a repetition of the combination between certain professional politicians, certain professional labor leaders, and certain big financiers, from the disgrace of which San Francisco has just been rescued, a repetition of the successful efforts by the Standard Oil people to crush out every competitor, to overawe the common carriers, and to establish a monopoly which treats the public with the contempt which the public deserves, so long as it permits men, like the public men of whom I speak, to represent it in politics, men like the heads of colleges to whom I refer to educate its youth. The outcry against stopping dishonest practices among the very wealthy is precisely similar to the outcry raised against every effort for cleanliness and decency in city government, because, forsooth, it will hurt business. The same outcry is made against the Department of Justice for prosecuting the heads of colossal corporations that is made against the men who, in San Francisco, are prosecuting with impartial severity the wrongdoers among businessmen, public officials, and labor leaders alike. The principle is the same in the two cases. Just as the blackmailer and the bribe-giver stand on the same evil eminence of infamy, so the man who makes an enormous fortune by corrupting legislatures and municipalities, and fleecing his stockholders and the public stands on a level with the creature who fattens on the blood-money of the gambling-house, the saloon, and the brothel. Moreover, both kinds of corruption in the last analysis are far more intimately connected than would at first appear. The wrongdoing is at the bottom the same. Corrupt business and corrupt politics act and react, with ever-increasing debasement, one on the other, the rebate-taker, the franchise-trafficker, the manipulator of securities, the purveyor and protector of vice, the blackmailing ward-boss, the ballot-box-stuffer, the demagogue, the mob-leader, the hired bully and man-killer, all alike work at the same web of corruption, and all alike should be abhorred by honest men. The business which is hurt by the movement for honesty is the kind of business which, in the long run, it pays the country to have hurt. It is the kind of business which has tended to make the very name high finance a term of scandal, to which all honest American men of business should join in putting an end. One of the special pleaders for business dishonesty, in a recent speech, in denouncing the administration for enforcing the law against the huge and corrupt corporations which have defied the law, also denounced it for endeavoring to secure a far-reaching new law making employers liable for injuries to their employees. It is meet and fit that the apologists for corrupt wealth should oppose every effort to relieve weak and helpless people from crushing misfortune brought upon them by injury in the business from which they gain a bare livelihood and their employers' fortunes. It is hypocritical baseness to speak of a girl who works in a factory where the dangerous machinery is unprotected as having the right, freely, to contract to expose herself to dangers to life and limb. 
she has no alternative but to suffer want, or else to expose herself to such dangers, and when she loses a hand, or is otherwise maimed or disfigured for life, it is a moral wrong that the burden of the risk necessarily incidental to the business should be placed with crushing weight upon her weak shoulders, and the man who has profited by her work escapes scot-free. This is what our opponents advocate, and it is proper that they should advocate it, for it rounds out their advocacy of those most dangerous members of the criminal class, the criminals of vast wealth, the men who can afford best to pay for such championship in the press and on the stump. It is difficult to speak about the judges, for it behooves us all to treat with the utmost respect the high office of judge, and our judges as a whole are brave and upright men. But there is need that those who go wrong should not be allowed to feel that there is no condemnation of their wrongdoing. A judge who on the bench either truckles to the mob or bows down before a corporation, or who, having left the bench to become a corporation lawyer, seeks to aid his clients by denouncing as enemies of property all those who seek to stop the abuses of the criminal rich, such a man performs an even worse service to the body politic than the legislator or executive who goes wrong. In no way can respect for the courts be so quickly undermined as by teaching the public, through the action of a judge himself, that there is reason for the loss of such respect. The judge who, by word or deed, makes it plain that the corrupt corporation, the law-defying corporation, the law-defying rich man, has in him a sure and trustworthy ally, the judge who by misuse of the process of injunction makes it plain that in him the wage-worker has a determined and unscrupulous enemy, the judge who, when he decides in an employer's liability or a tenement-house factory case, shows that he has neither sympathy for nor understanding of those fellow-citizens of his who most need his sympathy and understanding, these judges work as much evil as if they pandered to the mob, as if they shrank from sternly repressing violence and disorder. The judge who does his full duty well stands higher, and renders a better service to the people, than any other public servant. He is entitled to great respect, and if he is a true servant of the people, if he is upright, wise, and fearless, he will unhesitatingly disregard even the wishes of the people, if they conflict with the eternal principles of right as against wrong. He must serve the people, but he must serve his conscience first. All honor to such a judge, and all honor cannot be rendered to him, if it is rendered equally to his brethren who fall immeasurably below the high ideals for which he stands. There should be a sharp distinction against such judges. They claim immunity from criticism, and the claim is heatedly advanced by men and newspapers like those of whom I speak. Most certainly they can claim immunity from untruthful criticism, and their champions, the newspapers and the public men I have mentioned, exquisitely illustrate by their own actions mendacious criticism in its most flagrant and iniquitous form. But no servant of the people has a right to expect to be free from just and honest criticism. It is the newspapers, and the public men whose thoughts and deeds show them to be most alien to honesty and truth, who themselves loudly object to truthful and honest criticism of their fellow-servants, of the great moneyed interests. We have no quarrel with the individuals, whether public men, lawyers, or editors, to whom I refer. These men derive their sole power from the great, sinister offenders who stand behind them. They are but puppets, who move as the strings are pulled by those who control the enormous masses of corporate wealth, which, if itself left uncontrolled, threatens dire evil to the Republic. It is not the puppets, but the strong, cunning men, and the mighty forces working for evil behind, and to a certain extent through the puppets, with whom we have to deal. We seek to control law-defying wealth, in the first place to prevent its doing evil, and in the next place to avoid the vindictive and dreadful radicalism, which, if left uncontrolled, it is certain, in the end, to arouse. Sweeping attacks upon all property, upon all men of means, without regard to whether they do well or ill, would sound the death knell of the Republic, and such attacks become inevitable if decent citizens permit rich men whose lives are corrupt and evil to domineer in a swollen pride, unchecked and unhindered, over the destinies of this country. We act in no vindictive spirit, and we are no respecters of persons." If a labor union does what is wrong, we oppose it as fearlessly as we oppose a corporation that does wrong, and we stand with equal stoutness for the rights of the man of wealth and for the rights of the wage-workers, just as much so for one as for the other. We seek to stop wrongdoing, and we desire to punish the wrongdoer only so far as is necessary in order to achieve this end. 
We are the staunch upholders of every honest man, whether business man or wage worker. I do not for a moment believe that our actions have brought on business distress, so far as this is due to local and not worldwide causes, and to the actions of any particular individuals. It is due to the speculative folly and flagrant dishonesty of a few men of great wealth, who now seek to shield themselves from the effects of their own wrongdoings by ascribing its result to the actions of those who have sought to put a stop to the wrongdoing. But if it were true that to cut out rottenness from the body politic meant a momentary check to an unhealthy seeming prosperity, I should not for one moment hesitate to put the knife to the cancer. On behalf of all our people, on behalf no less of the honest man of means than of the honest man who earns each day's livelihood by that day's sweat of his brow, it is necessary to insist upon honesty in business and politics alike, in all walks of life, in big things and in little things, upon just and fair dealing as between man and man. We are striving for the right in the spirit of Abraham Lincoln when he said, Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray, that this mighty scourge may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills that it continue until all wealth piled by the bondsman's two hundred and fifty years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword, as was said three thousand years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right, as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in. Sincerely yours, Theodore Roosevelt. The Honorable Charles J. Bonaparte, Attorney General. End of Chapter 12, Part 3 Chapter 13, Part 1 of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Chapter 13, Social and Industrial Justice, Part 1. By the time I became President I had grown to feel, with deep intensity of conviction, that governmental agencies must find their justification largely in the way in which they are used for the practical betterment of living and working conditions among the mass of the people. I felt that the fight was really for the abolition of privilege, and one of the first stages in the battle was necessarily to fight for the rights of the working man. For this reason I felt most strongly that all that the government could do in the interest of labor should be done. The federal government can rarely act with the directness that the state governments act. It can, however, do a good deal. My purpose was to make the national government itself a model employer of labor, the effort being to make the per diem employee just as much as the cabinet officer regard himself as one of the partners employed in the service of the public, proud of his work, eager to do it in the best possible manner, and confident of just treatment. Our aim was also to secure good laws wherever the national government had power, notably the territories, in the District of Columbia, and in connection with interstate commerce. I found the eight-hour law a mere farce, the departments rarely enforcing it with any degree of efficiency. This I remedied by executive action. Unfortunately, thoroughly efficient government servants often proved to be the prime offenders so far as the enforcement of the eight-hour law was concerned, because in their zeal to get good work done for the government they became harsh taskmasters, and declined to consider the needs of their fellow employees who served under them. The more I had studied the subject, the more strongly I had become convinced that an eight-hour day, under the conditions of labor in the United States, was all that could, with wisdom and propriety, be required either by the government or by private employers, that more than this meant, on the average, a decrease in the qualities that tell for good citizenship. I finally solved the problem, as far as government employees were concerned, by calling in Charles P. Neal, the head of the Labor Bureau, and acting on his advice. I speedily made the eight-hour law really effective. Any man who shirked his work, who dawdled and idled, received no mercy. Slackness is even worse than harshness, for exactly as in battle mercy to the coward is cruelty to the brave man, so in civil life slackness towards the vicious and idle is harshness towards the honest and hard-working. We passed a good law protecting the lives and health of miners in the territories, and other laws providing for the supervision of the employment agencies in the District of Columbia, and protecting the health of motormen and conductors on street railways in the district. 
we practically started the Bureau of Mines. We provided for safeguarding factory employees in the district against accidents, and for the restriction of child labor therein. We passed a workman's compensation for the protection of government employees, a law which did not go as far as I wished, but which was the best I could get, and which committed the government to the right policy. We provided for an investigation of women and child labor in the United States. We incorporated the National Child Labor Committee. Where we had most difficulty was with the railway companies engaged in interstate business. We passed an act improving safety appliances on railway trains without much opposition, but we had more trouble with acts regulating the hours of labor of railway employees and making those railways, which were engaged in interstate commerce, liable for injuries to or the death of their employees while on duty. One important step in connection with these latter laws was taken by Attorney General Moody when, on behalf of the government, he intervened in the case of a wronged employee. It is unjust that a law which has been declared public policy by the representatives of the people should be submitted to the possibility of nullification, because the government leaves the enforcement of it to the private initiative of poor people who have suffered some crushing accident. It should be the business of the government to enforce laws of this kind, and to appear in court to argue for their constitutionality and proper enforcement. Thanks to Moody, the government assumed this position. The first employer's liability law affecting interstate railroads was declared unconstitutional. We got through another, which stood the test of the courts. The principle to which we especially strove to give expression, through these laws and through executive action, was that a right is valueless unless reduced from the abstract to the concrete. This sounds like a truism. So far from being such, the effort practically to apply it was almost revolutionary, and gave rise to the bitterest denunciation of us by all the big lawyers and all the big newspaper editors, who, whether sincerely or for hire, gave expression to the views of the privileged classes. Ever since the Civil War, very many of the decisions of the courts, not as regards ordinary actions between man and man, but as regards the application of great governmental policies for social and industrial justice, had been, in reality, nothing but ingenious justification of the theory that these policies were mere high-sounding abstractions, and were not to be given practical effect. The tendency of the courts had been, in the majority of cases, jealously to exert their great power in protecting those who least needed protection, and hardly to use their power at all in the interest of those who most needed protection. Our desire was to make the federal government efficient as an instrument for protecting the rights of labor within its province, and therefore to secure and enforce judicial decisions which would permit us to make this desire effective. Not only some of the federal judges, but some of the state courts invoked the Constitution in a spirit of the narrowest legalistic obstruction to prevent the government from acting in defense of labor on interstate railways. In effect, these judges took the view that while Congress had complete power as regards the goods transported by the railways, and could protect wealthy or well-to-do owners of these goods, yet that it had no power to protect the lives of the men engaged in transporting the goods. Such judges freely issued injunctions to prevent the obstruction of traffic in the interest of the property owners, but declared unconstitutional the action of the government in seeking to safeguard the men, and the families of the men, without whose labor the traffic could not take place. It was an instance of the largely unconscious way in which the courts had been twisted into the exaltation of property rights over human rights, and the subordination of the welfare of the laborer when compared with the profit of the men for whom he labored. By what I fear my conservative friends regarded as frightfully aggressive missionary work, which included some uncommonly plain speaking as to certain unjust and anti-social judicial decisions, we succeeded in largely, but by no means altogether, correcting this view, at least so far as the best and most enlightened judges were concerned. Very much the most important action I took as regards labor had nothing to do with legislation, and represented executive action which was not required by the Constitution. It illustrated, as well as anything that I did, the theory which I have called the Jackson-Lincoln theory of the presidency, that is, that occasionally great national crises arise which call for immediate and vigorous executive action, and that in such cases it is the duty of the President to act upon the theory that he is the steward of the people, and that the proper attitude for him to take is that he is bound to assume he has the legal right to do whatever the needs of the people demand, unless the Constitution or the laws explicitly forbid him to do it. Early in the spring of 1902 a universal strike began in the anthracite regions. 
The miners and the operators became deeply embittered, and the strike went on throughout the summer and the early fall without any sign of reaching an end, and with almost complete stoppage of mining. In many cities, especially in the East, the heating apparatus is designed for anthracite, so that the bituminous coal is only a very partial substitute. Moreover, in many regions, even in farmhouses, many of the provisions are for burning coal and not wood. In consequence, the coal famine became a national menace as the winter approached. In most big cities, and in many farming districts east of the Mississippi, the shortage of anthracite threatened calamity. In the populous industrial states, from Ohio eastward, it was not merely calamity, but the direct disaster that was threatened. Ordinarily conservative men, men very sensitive as to the rights of property under normal conditions, when faced by this crisis felt, quite rightly, that there must be some radical action. The governor of Massachusetts and the mayor of New York both notified me, as the cold weather came on, that if the coal famine continued the misery throughout the northeast, and especially in the great cities, would become appalling, and the consequent public disorder so great that frightful consequences might follow. It is not too much to say that the situation which confronted Pennsylvania, New York, and New England, and to a less degree the states of the Middle West, in October 1902, was quite as serious as if they had been threatened by the invasion of a hostile army of overwhelming force. The big coal operators had banded together, and positively refused to take any steps looking toward an accommodation. They knew that the suffering among the miners was great. They were confident that if order were kept, and nothing further done by the government, they would win, and they refused to consider that the public had any rights in the matter. They were, for the most part, men of unquestionably good private life, and they were merely taking the extreme individualistic view of the rights of property and the freedom of individual action upheld in the laissez-faire political economics. The mines were in the state of Pennsylvania. There was no duty whatever laid upon me by the Constitution in the matter, and I had in theory the power to act directly, unless the Governor of Pennsylvania or the Legislature, if it were in session, should notify me that Pennsylvania could not keep order and request me, as Commander-in-Chief of the Army of the United States, to intervene and keep order. As long as I could avoid interfering, I did so, but I directed the head of the Labor Bureau, Carol Wright, to make a thorough investigation and lay the facts fully before me. As September passed without any sign of weakening, either among the employers or the striking workmen, the situation became so grave that I felt I would have to try to do something. The thing most feasible was to get both sides to agree to a commission of arbitration, with a promise to accept its findings, the miners to go to work as soon as the commission was appointed, at the old rate of wages. To this proposition the miners, headed by John Mitchell, agreed, stipulating only that I should have the power to name the commission. The operators, however, positively refused. They insisted that all that was necessary to do was for the State to keep order, using the militia as a police force although both they and the miners asked me to intervene under the interstate commerce law, each side requesting that I proceed against the other, and both requests being impossible. Finally, on October 3rd, the representatives of both the operators and the miners met before me, in pursuance of my request. The representatives of the miners included as their head and spokesman John Mitchell, who kept his temper admirably and showed to much advantage. The representatives of the operators, on the contrary, came down in a most insolent frame of mind, refused to talk of arbitration or other accommodation of any kind, and used language that was insulting to the miners and offensive to me. They were curiously ignorant of the popular temper, and when they went away from the interview they, with much pride, gave their own account of it to the papers, exulting in the fact that they had turned down both the miners and the President. I refused to accept the rebuff, however, and continued the effort to get an agreement between the operators and the miners. I was anxious to get this agreement, because it would prevent the necessity of taking the extremely drastic action I meditated, and which is here and after described. Fortunately, this time we were successful. Yet we were on the verge of failure, because of self-willed obstinacy on the part of the operators. This obstinacy was utterly silly from their own standpoint, and well-nigh criminal from the standpoint of the people at large. The miners proposed that I should name the commission, and that if I put on a representative of the employing class, I should also put on a labor union man. The operators positively declined to accept the suggestion. They insisted upon my naming a commission of only five men, and specified the qualifications these men should have, 
carefully choosing these qualifications so as to exclude those whom it had leaked out I was thinking of appointing, including ex-President Cleveland. They made the condition that I was to appoint one officer of the Engineering Corps of the Army or Navy, one man with experience of mining, one man of prominence, eminent as a sociologist, one federal judge of the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, and one mining engineer. They positively refused to have me appoint any representative of labor, or to put on an extra man. I was desirous of putting on the extra man, because Mitchell and the other leaders of the miners had urged me to appoint some high Catholic ecclesiastic. Most of the miners were Catholics, and Mitchell and the leaders were very anxious to secure peaceful acquiescence by the miners in any decision rendered, and they felt that their hands would be strengthened if such an appointment were made. They also, quite properly, insisted that there should be one representative of labor on the commission, as all of the others represented the property classes. The operators, however, absolutely refused to acquiesce in the appointment of any representative of labor, and also announced that they would refuse to accept a sixth man on the commission, although they spoke much less decidedly on this point. The labor men left everything in my hands. The final conferences with the representatives of the operators took place in my rooms on the evening of October 15th. Hour after hour went by while I endeavored to make the operators, through their representatives, see that the country would not tolerate their insisting upon such conditions, but in vain. The two representatives of the operators were Robert Bacon and George W. Perkins. They were entirely reasonable, but the operators themselves were entirely unreasonable. They had worked themselves into a frame of mind where they were prepared to sacrifice everything and see civil war in the country, rather than back down and acquiesce in the appointment of a representative of labor. It looked as if a deadlock were inevitable. Then, suddenly, after about two hours' argument, it dawned on me that they were not objecting to the thing, but to the name. I found that they did not mind my appointing any man, whether he was a labor man or not so long as he was not appointed as a labor man, or as a representative of labor. They did not object to my exercising any latitude I chose in the appointments, so long as they were made under the headings they had given. I shall never forget the mixture of relief and amusement I felt when I thoroughly grasped the fact that while they would heroically submit to anarchy rather than have a Tweedledum, yet if I would call it Tweedledee, they would accept it with rapture, it gave me an illuminating glimpse into one corner of the mighty brains of these captains of industry. In order to carry the great and vital point, and secure agreement by both parties, all that was necessary for me to do was to commit a technical and nominal absurdity with a solemn face. This I gladly did. I announced at once that I accepted the terms laid down. With this understanding, I appointed the labor man I had all along in view, Mr. E. E. Clark, the head of the Brotherhood of Railway Conductors, calling him an eminent sociologist, a term which I doubt whether he had ever previously heard. He was a first-class man, whom I afterward put on the Interstate Commerce Commission. I added to the Arbitration Commission, on my own authority, a sixth member, in the person of Bishop Spalding, a Catholic bishop of Peoria, Illinois, one of the very best men to be found in the entire country. The man whom the operators had expected me to appoint as a sociologist was Carol Wright, who really was an eminent sociologist. I put him on as recorder of the commission, and added him as a seventh member as soon as the commission got fairly started. In publishing the list of the commissioners, when I came to Clark's appointment, I added, as a sociologist, the president assuming that for the purposes of such a commission the term sociologist means a man who has thought and studied deeply on social questions, and has practically applied his knowledge. The relief of the whole country was so great that the sudden appearance of the head of the Brotherhood of Railway Conductors as an eminent sociologist merely furnished material for puzzled comment on the part of the press. It was a most admirable commission. It did noteworthy work, and its report is a monument in the history of the relations of labor and capital in this country. The strike, by the way, brought me into contact with more than one man who was afterward a valued friend and fellow worker. On the suggestion of Carol Wright, I appointed as assistant recorders to the commission Charles P. Neal, whom I afterward made labor commissioner, to succeed Wright himself, and Mr. Edward A. Mosley. Wilkes Barr was the centre of the strike, and the man in Wilkes Barr who helped me most was Father Curran. I grew to know and trust and believe in him, and throughout my term in office, and afterward, 
he was not only my staunch friend, but one of the men by whose advice and counsel I profited most in matters affecting the welfare of the miners and their families. I was greatly relieved at the result, for more than one reason. Of course, first and foremost, my concern was to avert a frightful calamity to the United States. In the next place I was anxious to save the great coal operators, and all of the class of big propertied men, of which they were members, from the dreadful punishment which their own folly would have brought on them if I had not acted. And one of the exasperating things was that they were so blinded that they could not see that I was trying to save themselves, and to avert, not only for their sakes, but for the sake of the country, the excesses which would have been indulged in at their expense if they had longer persisted in their conduct." The great anthracite strike of 1902 left an indelible impress upon the people of the United States. It showed clearly to all wise and far-seeing men that the labor problem in this country had entered upon a new phase. Industry had grown. Great financial corporations, doing a nationwide and even a worldwide business, had taken the name of the smaller concerns of an earlier time. The old familiar, intimate relations between employer and employee were passing. A few generations before, the boss had known every man in his shop. He called his men Bill, Tom, Dick, John. He inquired after their wives and babies. He swapped jokes and stories and perhaps a bit of tobacco with them. In the small establishment there had been a friendly human relationship between employer and employee. There was no such relation between the great railway magnates who controlled the anthracite industry and the 150,000 men who worked in their mines, or the half-million women and children who were dependent upon these miners for their daily bread. Very few of these mine-workers had ever seen, for instance, the president of the Reading Railroad. Had they seen him, many of them could not have spoken to him, for tens of thousands of mine-workers were recent immigrants, who did not understand the language which he spoke, and who spoke a language which he could not understand. Again, a few generations ago, an American workman could have saved money, gone west, and taken up a homestead. Now the free lands were gone. In earlier days a man who began with a pick and shovel might have come to own a mine. That outlet, too, was now closed, as regards the immense majority, and few, if any, of the 150,000 mine-workers could ever aspire to enter the small circle of men who held in their grasp the great anthracite industry. The majority of the men who earned wages in the coal industry, if they wished to progress at all, were compelled to progress not by ceasing to be wage-earners, but by improving the conditions under which all the wage-earners in all the industries of the country lived and worked, as well as, of course, as improving their own individual efficiency. Another change which had come about as a result of the foregoing was a crass inequality in the bargaining relation between the employer and the individual employee standing alone. The great coal-mining and coal-carrying companies, which employed their tens of thousands, could easily dispense with the services of any particular miner. The miner, on the other hand, however expert, could not dispense with the companies. He needed a job. His wife and children would starve if he did not get one. What the miner had to sell, his labor, was a perishable commodity. The labor of to-day, if not sold to-day, was lost forever. Moreover, his labor was not like most commodities, a mere thing. It was part of a living, breathing human being. The workmen saw, and all the citizens who gave earnest thought to the matter saw, that the labor problem was not only an economic, but also a moral human problem. Individually, the miners were impotent when they sought to enter a wage contract with the great companies. They could make fair terms only by uniting into trade unions to bargain collectively. The men were forced to cooperate to secure not only their economic, but their simple human rights. They, like other workmen, were compelled by the very conditions under which they lived to unite in unions of their industry or trade, and these unions were bound to grow in size, in strength, and in power for good and evil, as the industries in which the men were employed grew larger and larger. A democracy can be such, in fact, only if there is some rough approximation in similarity and stature among the men composing it. One of us can deal in our private lives with the grocer or the butcher or the carpenter or the chicken-raiser, or, if we are the grocer or carpenter or butcher or farmer, we can deal with our customers, because we are all of about the same size. Therefore, a simple and poor society can exist as a democracy on a basis of sheer individualism. But a rich and complex industrial society cannot so exist, 
for some individuals, and especially those artificial individuals called corporations, become so very big that the ordinary individual is utterly dwarfed beside them, and cannot deal with them on terms of equality. It therefore becomes necessary for these ordinary individuals to combine in their turn, first in order to act in their collective capacity through the biggest of all combinations called the government, and second, to act also in their own self-defense, through private combinations, such as farmers' associations and trade unions. This the great coal operators did not see. They did not see that their property rights, which they so stoutly defended, were of the same texture as were the human rights, which they so blindly and hotly denied. They did not see that the power which they exercised by representing their stockholders was of the same texture as the power which the union leaders demanded of representing the workmen, who had democratically elected them. They did not see that the right to use one's property as one will can be maintained only so long as it is consistent with the maintenance of certain fundamental human rights, of the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, or, as we may restate them in these later days, of the rights of the worker to a living wage, to reasonable hours of labor, to decent working and living conditions, to freedom of thought and speech in industrial representation, in short, to a measure of industrial democracy, and in return for his arduous toil, to a worthy and decent life according to American standards. Still another thing these great business leaders did not see. They did not see that both their interests and the interests of the workers must be accommodated, and if need be, subordinated, to the fundamental, permanent interests of the whole community. No man, and no group of men, may so exercise their rights as to deprive the nation of the things which are necessary and vital to the common life. A strike which ties up the coal supplies of a whole section is a strike invested with a public interest. So great was that public interest in the coal strike of 1902, so deeply and strongly did I feel the wave of indignation which swept over the whole country, that had I not succeeded in my efforts to induce the operators to listen to reason, I should reluctantly, but none the less decisively, have taken a step which would have brought down upon my head the execrations of many of the captains of industry, as well as of sundry respectable newspapers who dutifully take their clue from them. As a man should be judged by his intentions as well as by his actions, I will give here the story of the intervention that never happened. While the coal operators were exulting over the fact that they had turned down the miners and the President, there arose in all parts of the country an outburst of wrath so universal that even so naturally conservative a man as Grover Cleveland wrote to me, expressing his sympathy with the course I was following, his indignation at the conduct of the operators, and his hope that I would devise some method of effective action. In my own mind I was already planning effective action, but it was of a very drastic character, and I did not wish to take it until the failure of all other expedients had rendered it necessary. Above all, I did not wish to talk about it until and unless I actually acted. I had definitely determined that somehow or other act I would, that somehow or other the coal famine should be broken. To accomplish this end it was necessary that the mine should be run, and if I could get no voluntary agreement between the contending sides, that an arbitration commission should be appointed which would command such public confidence as to enable me, without too much difficulty, to enforce its terms upon both parties. Ex-President Cleveland's letter not merely gratified me, but gave me the chance to secure him as head of the arbitration commission. I at once wrote him, stating that I would very probably have to appoint an arbitration commission or investigating commission to look into the matter and decide on the rights of the case, whether or not the operators asked for or agreed to abide by the decisions of such a commission, and that I would ask him to accept the chief place on the commission. He answered that he would do so. I picked out several first-class men for other positions on the commission. End of chapter 13, part 1《Chapter Thirteen, Part Two of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Chapter Thirteen Social and Industrial Justice, Part Two. Meanwhile, the Governor of Pennsylvania had all the Pennsylvania militia in the anthracite region, although without any effect upon the resumption of mining. 
The method of action upon which I had determined the last resort was to get the governor of Pennsylvania to ask me to keep order. Then I would put in the army under the command of some first-rate general. I would instruct this general to keep absolute order, taking any steps whatever that were necessary to prevent interference by the strikers or their sympathizers with the men who wanted to work. I would also instruct him to dispossess the operators and run the mines as a receiver until such time as the commission might make its report, and until I, as President, might issue further orders in view of this report. I had to find a man who possessed the necessary good sense, judgment, and nerve to act in such an event. He was ready to hand in the person of Major General Schofield. I sent for him, telling him that if I had to make use of him it would be because the crisis was only less serious than that of the Civil War, that the action taken would be practically a war measure, and that if I sent him he must act in a purely military capacity under me as Commander-in-Chief, paying no heed to any authority, judicial or otherwise, except mine. He was a fine fellow, a most respectable-looking old boy, with side-whiskers and a black skull-cap, without any of the outward aspect of the conventional military dictator, but in both nerve and judgment he was all right, and he answered quietly that if I gave the order he would take possession of the mines, and would guarantee to open them and to run them without permitting any interference, either by the owners, or the strikers, or anybody else, so long as I told him to stay. I then saw Senator Key, who, like every other responsible man in high position, was greatly wrought up over the condition of things. I told him that he need be under no alarm as to the problem not being solved, that I was going to make another effort to get the operators and miners to come together, but that I would solve the problem in any event and get coal. That, however, I did not wish to tell him anything of the details of my intention, but merely to have him arrange, whenever I gave the word, the Governor of Pennsylvania should request me to intervene that when this was done I would be responsible for all that followed, and would guarantee that the coal famine would end forthwith. The senator made no inquiry or comment, and merely told me that he in his turn would guarantee that the governor would request my intervention the minute I asked that the request be made. These negotiations were concluded with the utmost secrecy, General Schofield being the only man who knew exactly what my plan was, and Senator Key, two members of my cabinet, and ex-President Cleveland, and the other men whom I proposed to put on the commission, the only other men who knew that I had a plan. As I have above outlined, my efforts to bring about an agreement between the operators and miners were finally successful. I was glad not to have to take possession of the mines on my own initiative by means of General Schofield and the regulars. I was all ready to act, and would have done so without the slightest hesitation or a moment's delay if the negotiations had fallen through, and my action would have been entirely effective. But it is never well to take drastic action if the result can be achieved with equal efficiency in a less drastic faction, and although this was a minor consideration, I was personally saved a good deal of future trouble by being able to avoid this drastic action. At the time I should have been almost unanimously supported. With the famine upon them, the people would not have tolerated any conduct that would have thwarted what I was doing. Probably no man in Congress, and no man in the Pennsylvania State Legislature, would have raised his voice against me. Although there would have been plenty of muttering, nothing would have been done to interfere with the solution of the problem which I had devised, until the solution was accomplished and the problem ceased to be a problem. Once this was done, and when people were no longer afraid of a coal famine, and began to forget that they had ever been afraid of it, and to be indifferent as regards the consequences to those who put an end to it, then my enemies would have plucked up heart and begun a campaign against me. I doubt if they could have accomplished much, anyway, for the only effective remedy against me would have been impeachment, and that they would not have ventured to try. One of my appointees on the Anthracite Strike Commission was Judge George Gray of Delaware, a Democrat whose standing in the country was second only to that of Grover Cleveland. A year later he commented on my action as follows. I have no hesitation in saying that the President of the United States was confronted, in October 1902, by the existence of a crisis more grave and threatening than any that had occurred since the Civil War. I mean that the cessation of mining in the Anthracite country, brought about by the dispute between miners and those who controlled the greatest natural monopoly in this country, and perhaps in the world, had brought upon more than one half of the American people a condition of deprivation of one of the necessaries of life, and the probable continuance of the dispute threatened not only the comfort and health, but the safety and good order of the nation. 
He was without legal or constitutional power to interfere, but his position as President of the United States gave him an influence, a leadership, as first citizen of the Republic, that enabled him to appeal to the patriotism and good sense of the parties to the controversy, and to place upon them the moral coercion of public opinion, to agree to an arbitrament of the strike then existing, and threatening consequences so direful to the whole country. He acted promptly and courageously, and in so doing averted the dangers to which I have alluded. So far from interfering or infringing upon property rights, the President's actions tended to conserve them. The peculiar situation, as regards the anthracite coal interest, was that they controlled a natural monopoly of a product necessary to the comfort and to the very life of a large portion of the people. A prolonged deprivation of the enjoyment of this necessary of life would have tended to precipitate an attack upon those property rights of which you speak, for, after all, it is vain to deny that this property, so peculiar in its conditions, and which is properly spoken of as a natural monopoly, is affected with a public interest. I do not think that any President ever acted more wisely, courageously, or promptly in a national crisis. Mr. Roosevelt deserves unstinted praise for what he did. They would doubtless have acted precisely as they acted as regards the acquisition of the Panama Canal Zone in 1903, and the stoppage of the Panic of 1907 by my action in the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company matter. Nothing could have made the American people surrender the Canal Zone. But after it was an accomplished fact, and the canal was under way, then they settled down to comfortable acceptance of the accomplished fact, and as their own interests were no longer in jeopardy, they paid no heed to the men who attacked me because of what I had done, and also continued to attack me, although they are exceedingly careful not to propose to right the wrong, in the only proper way, if it really was a wrong, by replacing the old Republic of Panama under a tyranny of Colombia, and giving Colombia sole or joint ownership of the canal itself. In the case of the Panic of 1907, as in the case of Panama, what I did was not only done openly, but depended for its effect by being done with the widest advertisement. Nobody in Congress ventured to make an objection at the time. No serious leader, outside, made any objection. The one concern of everybody was to stop the panic, and everybody was overjoyed that I was willing to take the responsibility of stopping it upon my old soldiers. But a few months afterward, the panic was a thing of the past. People forgot the frightful condition of alarm in which they had been. They no longer had a personal interest in preventing any interference with the stoppage of the panic. Then the men who had not dared to raise their voices until all danger was past, came bravely forth from their hiding-places and denounced the action which had saved them. They had kept a hushed silence when there was danger. They made clamorous outcry when there was safety in doing so. Just the same course would have been followed in connection with the anthracite coal strike if I had been obliged to act in the fashion I intended to act, had I failed to secure a voluntary agreement between the miners and the operators. Even as it was, my action was remembered with rancor by the heads of the great moneyed interests, and as time went by was assailed with constantly increasing vigor by the newspapers these men controlled. Had I been forced to take possession of the mines, these men and the politicians hostile to me would have waited until the popular alarm was over, and the popular needs met, just as they waited in the case of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, and then they would have attacked me precisely as they did attack me as regards the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company. Of course, in labor controversies, it was not always possible to champion the cause of the workers, because in many cases strikes were called which were utterly unwarranted, and were fought by methods which cannot be too harshly condemned. No straightforward man can believe, and no fearless man will assert, that a trade union is always right. That man is an unworthy public servant, who by speech or silence, by direct statement or cowardly evasion, invariably throws the weight of his influence on the side of the trade union, whether it is right or wrong. It has occasionally been my duty to give utterance to the feelings of all right-thinking men by expressing the most emphatic disapproval of unwise or even immoral notions by representatives of labor. The man is no true democrat, and if an American is unworthy of the traditions of his country, who, in problems calling for the exercise of a moral judgment, fails to take his stand in conduct and not on class. There are good and bad wage workers just as there are good and bad employers, and good and bad men of small means and of large means alike. 
but a willingness to do equal and exact justice to all citizens, irrespective of race, creed, section, or economic interest and position, does not imply a failure to recognize the enormous economic, political, and moral possibilities of the trade union. Just as democratic government cannot be condemned because of errors and even crimes committed by men democratically elected, so trade unionism must not be condemned because of errors or crimes of occasional trade union leaders. The problem lies deeper. While we must repress all illegalities and discourage all immoralities, whether of labor organizations or of corporations, we must recognize the fact that today the organization of labor into trade unions and federations is necessary, is beneficent, and is one of the greatest possible agencies in the attainment of a true industrial, as well as a true political, democracy in the United States. It is a fact which many well-intentioned people even today do not understand. They do not understand that the labor problem is a human and a moral as well as an economic problem, that a fall in wages, an increase in hours, a deterioration of labor conditions, mean wholesale moral as well as economic degeneration, and the needless sacrifice of human lives and human happiness, while a rise of wages, a lessening of hours, a bettering of conditions, mean an intellectual, moral, and social uplift of millions of American men and women. There are employers today who, like the great co-operators, speak as though they were lords of these countless armies of Americans, who toil in factory, in shop, in mill, and in the dark places under the earth. They fail to see that all these men have the right and the duty to combine to protect themselves and their families from want and degradation. They fail to see that the nation and the government, within the reach of fair play and a just administration of the law, must inevitably sympathize with the men who have nothing but their wages, with the men who are struggling for a decent life, as opposed to men, however honorable, who are merely fighting for larger profits and an autocratic control of big business. Each man should have all he earns, whether by brain or body, and the dictator, the great industrial leader, is one of the greatest of earners, and should have a proportional reward. But no man should live on the earnings of another, and there should not be too gross inequality between service and reward. There are men of today, men of integrity and intelligence, who honestly believe that we must go back to the labor conditions of half a century ago. They are opposed to trade unions, root and branch. They note the unworthy conduct of many labor leaders. They find instances of bad work by union men, of a voluntary restriction of output, of vexations and violent strikes, of jurisdictional disputes between unions which often disastrously involve the best-intentioned and fairest of employers. All these things occur and should be repressed. But the same critic of the trade union might find equal causes of complaint against individual employers of labor, or even against great associations of manufacturers. He might find many great instances of an unwarranted cutting of wages, of flagrant violations of factory laws and tenement house laws, of the deliberate and systematic cheating of employees, by means of truck stores, of the speeding up of work to a point which is fatal to the health of the workmen, of the sweating of foreign-born workers, of the drafting of feeble little children into dusty workshops, of blacklisting, of putting spies into union meetings, and of the employment in strike times of vicious and desperate ruffians, who are neither better nor worse than are the thugs who are occasionally employed by unions under the sinister name entertainment committees. I believe that the overwhelming majority, both of workmen and of employers, are law-abiding, peaceful, and honorable citizens, and I do not think that it is just to lay up the errors and wrongs of individuals to the entire group to which they belong. I also think, and this is a belief which has been borne upon me through many years of practical experience, that the trade union is growing constantly in wisdom as well as in power, and it is becoming one of the most efficient agencies toward the solution of our industrial problems, the elimination of poverty and of industrial disease and accidents, the lessening of employment, the achievement of industrial democracy, and the attainment of a larger measure of social and industrial justice. If I were a factory employee, a workman on the railroads, or a wage earner of any sort, I would undoubtedly join the union of my trade. If I disapproved of its policy, I would join in order to fight that policy. If the union leaders were dishonest, I would join in order to put them out. I believe in the Union, and I believe that all men who are benefited by the Union are morally bound to help to the extent of their power in the common interests advanced by the Union. 
Nevertheless, irrespective of whether a man should or should not, and does or does not, join the union of his trade, all the rights, privileges, and immunities of that man, as an American, and as a citizen, should be safeguarded and upheld by the law. We dare not make an outlaw of any individual or any group, whatever his or its opinions or professions. The non-unionist, like the unionist, must be protected in all his legal rights by the full weight and power of the law. This question came up before me in the shape of a right of a non-union printer named Miller to hold his position in the government printing office. As I said before, I believe in trade unions. I always prefer to see a union's shop. But any private preferences cannot control my public actions. The government can recognize neither union men nor non-union men as such, and it is bound to treat both exactly alike. In the government printing office, not many months prior to the opening of the presidential campaign of 1904, when I was up for re-election, I discovered that a man had been dismissed, because he did not belong to the union. I reinstated him. Mr. Gompers, the president of the American Federation of Labor, with various members of the executive council of that body, called upon me to protest on September 29, 1903, and I answered them as follows. I thank you and your committee for your courtesy, and I appreciate the opportunity to meet with you. It will always be a pleasure to see you or any representative of your organizations or of your federation as a whole. As regards the Miller case, I have little to add to what I have already said. In dealing with it, I ask you to remember that I am dealing purely with the relations of government to its employees. I must govern my action by the laws of the land, which I am sworn to administer, and which differentiate any case in which the government of the United States is a party from all other cases whatsoever. These laws are enacted for the benefit of the whole people, and cannot and must not be construed as permitting the crimination against some of the people. I am President of all the people of the United States, without regard to creed, color, birthplace, occupation, or social condition. My aim is to do equal and exact justice as among them all. In the employment and dismissal of men in the government service, I can no more recognize the fact that a man does or does not belong to a union as being for or against him, than I can recognize the fact that he is a Protestant or a Catholic, a Jew or a Gentile, as being for or against him. In the communications sent me by various labor organizations protesting against the retention of Miller in the government printing office, the grounds alleged are twofold. One, that he is a non-union man. Two, that he is not personally fit. The question of his personal fitness is one to be settled in the routine of administrative detail, and cannot be allowed to conflict with or to complicate the larger question of governmental discrimination for or against him, or any other man, because he is or is not a member of a union. This is the only question now before me for my decision, and, as to this, my decision is final. Because of things I have done on behalf of justice to the working man, I have often been called a socialist. Usually I have not taken the trouble even to notice the epithet. I am not afraid of names, and I am not one of those who fear to do what is right, because someone else will confound me with partisans with whose principles I am not in accord. Moreover, I know that many American socialists are high-minded and honorable citizens, who in reality are merely radical social reformers. They are oppressed by the brutalities and industrial injustices which we see everywhere about us. When I recall how often I have seen socialists and ardent non-socialists working side by side for some specific measure of social or industrial reform, and how I have found opposed to them on the side of privilege many shrill reactionaries who insist on calling all reformers socialists, I refuse to be panic-stricken by having this title mistakenly applied to me. Nonetheless, without imputing their motives, I do disagree most emphatically with both the fundamental philosophy and the proposed remedies with the Marxian socialists. These socialists are unalterably opposed to our whole industrial system. They believe that the payment of wages means everywhere and inevitably an exploitation of the laborer by the employer, and that this leads inevitably to a class war between those two groups, or, as they would say, between the capitalists and proletariat. They assert that this class war is already upon us, and can only be ended when capitalism is entirely destroyed, and all the machines, mills, mines, railroads, and other private property used in production are confiscated, expropriated, or taken over by the workers. They do not as a rule claim, although some of the sinister extremists among them do, that there is and must be a continual struggle between two great classes, whose interests are opposed and cannot be reconciled. 
In this war they insist that the whole government, national, state, and local, is on the side of the employers, and is used by them against the workmen, and that our law and even our common morality are class weapons, like a policeman's club or a gatling gun. I have never believed, and do not to-day believe, that such a class war is upon us, or need ever be upon us, nor do I believe that the interests of wage-earners and employers cannot be harmonized, compromised, and adjusted. It would be idle to deny that wage-earners have certain different economic interests from, let us say, manufacturers or importers, just as farmers have different interests from sailors and fishermen from bankers. There is no reason why any of these economic groups should not consult their group interests by any legitimate means, and with due regard to the common, overlying interests of all. I do not even deny that the majority of wage-earners, because they have less property and less industrial security than others, and because they do not own the machinery with which they work, as does the farmer, are perhaps in greater need of acting together than are other groups in the community. But I do insist, and I believe that the great majority of wage-earners take the same view, that employers and employees have overwhelming interests in common, both as partners in industry and as citizens of the Republic, and that where these interests are apart they can be adjusted by so altering our laws and their interpretation as to secure to all members of the community social and industrial justice. I have always maintained that our worst revolutionaries today are those reactionaries who do not see and will not admit that there is any need for change. Such men seem to believe that the four and a half million progressive voters, who in 1912 registered their solemn protest against our social and industrial injustices, are anarchists, who are not willing to let ill enough alone. If these reactionaries had lived at an earlier time in our history, they would have advocated sedition laws, opposed free speech and free assembly, and voted against free schools, free access by settlers to the public lands, mechanics' lien laws, the prohibition of truck stores, and the abolition of imprisonment for debt, and they are the men who to-day oppose minimum wage laws, insurance of workmen against the ills of industrial life, and the reform of our legislators and our courts, which can alone render such measures possible. Some of these reactionaries are not bad men, but merely short-sighted and belated. It is these reactionaries, however, who, by standing pat on industrial injustice, incite inevitably to industrial revolt, and it is only we who advocate political and industrial democracy who render possible the progress of our American industry on large constructive lines, with a minimum of friction, because with a maximum of justice. Everything possible should be done to secure the wage-workers' fair treatment. There should be an increased wage for the worker of increased productiveness. Everything possible should be done against the capitalist who strives, not to reward special efficiency, but to use it as an excuse for reducing the reward of moderate efficiency. The capitalist is an unworthy citizen who pays the efficient man no more than he has been content to pay the average man, and nevertheless reduces the wage of the average man, and effort should be made by the government to check and punish him. When labor-saving machinery is introduced, special care should be taken, by the government, if necessary, to see that the wage-worker gets his share of the benefit, and that it is not all absorbed by the employer or capitalist. The following case, which has come to my knowledge, illustrates what I mean. A number of new machines were installed in a certain shoe factory, and as a result there was a heavy increase in production, even though there was no increase in the labor force. Some of the workmen were instructed in the use of these machines by special demonstrators sent out by the makers of the machines. These men, by reason of their special aptitudes and the fact that they were not called upon to operate the machines continuously nine hours every day, week in and week out, but only for an hour or so at special times, were naturally able to run the machines at their maximum capacity. When these demonstrators had left the factory, and the company's own employees had become used to operating the machines at a fair rate of speed, the foreman of the establishment gradually speeded the machines, and demanded a larger and still larger output, constantly endeavoring to drive the men on to greater exertions. Even with a slightly less maximum capacity, the introduction of this machinery resulted in a great increase over former production with the same amount of labor and so great were the profits from the business in the following two years as to equal the total capitalized stock of the company. 
but not a cent got into the pay envelope of the workmen beyond what they had formerly been receiving before the introduction of this new machinery, notwithstanding that it had meant an added strain, physical and mental, upon their energies, and that they were forced to work harder than ever before. The whole of the increased profits remained with the company. Now this represented an increase of efficiency, with a positive decrease of social and industrial justice. The increase of prosperity, which came from the increase of production, in no way benefited the wage-workers. I hold that they were treated with gross injustice, and that society, acting if necessary through the government, in such a case should bend its energies to remedy such injustice, and I will support any proper legislation that will aid in securing the desired end. The wage-worker should not only receive fair treatment, he should give fair treatment. In order that prosperity may be passed around, it is necessary that the prosperity exist. In order that labor shall receive its fair share in the division of reward, it is necessary that there be a reward to divide. Any proposal to reduce efficiency by insisting that the most efficient shall be limited in their output to what the least efficient can do, is a proposal to limit by so much production, and therefore to impoverish by so much the public and specifically to reduce the amount that can be divided among the producers. This is all wrong. Our protest must be against unfair division of the reward for production. Every encouragement should be given the business man, the employer, to make his business prosperous, and therefore to earn more money for himself, and in like fashion every encouragement should be given the efficient workman. We must always keep in mind that to reduce the amount of production serves merely to reduce the amount that is to be divided, is in no way permanently efficient as a protest against unequal distribution, and is permanently detrimental to the entire community. But increased productiveness is not secured by excessive labor amid unhealthy surroundings. The contrary is true. Shorter hours, and healthful conditions, and opportunity for the wage-worker to make more money, and the chance for enjoyment as well as work, add to efficiency. My contention is that there should be no penalization of efficient productiveness, brought about under healthy conditions, but that every increase of production brought about by an increase in efficiency should benefit all the parties to it, including wage-workers, as well as employers or capitalists, men who work with their hands, as well as men who work with their heads. End of chapter 13, part 2《Chapter Thirteen, Part Three of the Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Chapter Thirteen, Social and Industrial Justice, Part Three. With the Western Federation of Miners, I more than once had serious trouble. The leaders of this organization had preached anarchy, and certain of them were indicted for having practiced murder in the case of Governor Steunenberg of Idaho. On one occasion, in a letter or speech, I coupled condemnation of these labor leaders and condemnation of certain big capitalists, describing them all alike as undesirable citizens. This gave great offense to both sides. The open attack upon me was made for the most part either by the New York papers, which were so frankly representatives of Wall Street, or else by these so-called and miscalled socialists, who had anarchistic leanings. Many of the latter sent me open letters of denunciation, and to one of them I responded as follows. The White House, Washington, April 22, 1907. Dear Sir, I have received your letter of the 19th instant, in which you enclose the draft of the formal letter which is to follow. I have been notified that several delegations, bearing similar requests, are on the way hither. In the letter you, on behalf of the Cook County Moyer Haywood Conference, protest against certain language I used in a recent letter, which you assert to be designed to influence the course of justice in the case of the trial for murder of Messrs. Moyer and Haywood. I entirely agree with you that it is improper to endeavor to influence the course of justice, whether by threats or in any similar manner. For this reason I have regretted most deeply the actions of such organizations as your own, in undertaking to accomplish this very result, in the very case of which you speak. For instance, your letter is headed, Cook County Moyer Haywood Pettibone Conference, with the headlines, Death Cannot, Will Not, and Shall Not Claim Our Brothers. 
This shows that you and your associates are not demanding a fair trial, or working for a fair trial, but are announcing in advance that the verdict shall only be one way, and that you will not tolerate any other verdict. Such action is flagrant in its impropriety, and I join heartily in condemning it. But it is a simple absurdity to suppose that because any man is on trial for a given offence, he is therefore to be freed from all criticism upon his general conduct and manner of life. In my letter to which you object, I referred to a certain prominent financier, Mr. Harriman, on the one hand, and to Messrs. Moyer, Haywood, and Debs on the other, as being equally undesirable citizens. It is as foolish to assert that this was designed to influence the trial of Moyer and Haywood as to assert that it was designed to influence the suits that have been brought against Mr. Harriman. I neither expressed nor indicated any opinion as to whether Messrs. Moyer and Haywood were guilty of the murder of Governor Steunenberg. If they are guilty, they certainly ought to be punished. If they are not guilty, they certainly ought not to be punished. But no possible outcome, either of the trial or the suits, can affect my judgment as to the undesirability of the type of citizen of those whom I mentioned. Messrs. Moyer, Haywood, and Debs stand as representatives of those men who have done as much to discredit the labor movement as the worst speculative financiers, or most unscrupulous employers of labor and debauchers of legislatures, have done to discredit honest capitalists and fair-dealing businessmen. They stand as the representatives of those men who, by their public utterances and manifestos, by the utterances of the papers they control or inspire, and by the words and deeds of those associated with or subordinated to them, habitually appear as guilty of incitement to, or apology for bloodshed and violence. If this does not constitute undesirable citizenship, then there can never be any undesirable citizens. The men whom I denounce represent the men who have abandoned that legitimate movement for the uplifting of labor, with which I have the utmost hearty sympathy. They have adopted practices which cut them off from those who lead this legitimate movement. In every way I shall support the law-abiding and upright representatives of labor, and in no way can I better support them than by drawing the sharpest possible line between them, on the one hand, and on the other hand, those preachers of violence, who are themselves the worst foes of honest laboring men. Let me repeat my deep regret that any body of men should so far forget their duty to the country, as to endeavor, by the formation of societies, and in other ways, to influence the course of justice in this matter. I have received many such letters as yours. Accompanying them were newspaper clippings announcing demonstrations, parades, and mass meetings designed to show that the representatives of labor, without regard to the facts, demand the acquittal of Messrs. Haywood and Moyer. Such meetings can, of course, be designed only to coerce the court or jury in rendering a verdict, and they therefore deserve all the condemnation which you, in your letter, say should be awarded to those who endeavor improperly to influence the course of justice. You would, of course, be entirely within your rights if you merely announced that you thought Messrs. Moyer and Haywood were desirable citizens, though in such case I should take frank issue with you, and I should say that, wholly and without regard to whether or not they are guilty of the crime for which they are now being tried, they represent as thoroughly undesirable a type of citizenship as can be found in this country, a type which, in the letter to which you so unreasonably take exception, I showed not to be confined to any one class, but to exist among some representatives of great capitalists, as well as among some representatives of wage-workers. In that letter I condemned both types. Certain representatives of the great capitalists, in turn, condemned me for including Mr. Harriman in my condemnation of Messrs. Moyer and Haywood. Certain of the representatives of labor in their turn condemned me because I included Messrs. Moyer and Haywood as undesirable citizens together with Mr. Harrison. I am as profoundly indifferent to the condemnation in one case as in the other. I challenge as a right the support of all good Americans, whether wage-workers or capitalists, whatever their occupation or creed, or in whatever portion of the country they live, when I condemn both types of bad citizenship, which I have held up to reprobation." It seems to be a mark of utter insincerity to fail thus to condemn both, and to apologize for either robs the man thus apologizing of all right to condemn any wrong-doing in any man, rich or poor, in public or in private life. You say you ask for a square deal for Messrs. Moyer and Haywood. So do I. 
When I say square deal, I mean a square deal to every one. It is equally a violation of the policy of the square deal for a capitalist to protest against denunciation of a capitalist who is guilty of wrongdoing, and for a labor leader to protest against the denunciation of a labor leader who has been guilty of wrongdoing. I stand for equal justice to both, and so far as in my power lies I shall uphold justice, whether the man accused of guilt has behind him the wealthiest corporation, the greatest aggregations of riches in the country, or whether he has behind him the most influential labor organization in the country. I treated anarchists and the bomb-throwing and dynamiting gentry precisely as I treated other criminals. Murder is murder. It is not rendered one whit better by the allegation that it is committed on behalf of a cause. It is true that law and order are not sufficient, but they are essential. Lawlessness and murderous violence must be quelled before any permanence of reform can be obtained. Yet when they have been quelled, the beneficiaries of the enforcement of law must in their turn be taught that law is upheld as a means to the enforcement of justice, and that we will not tolerate its being turned into an engine of injustice and oppression. The fundamental need in dealing with our people, whether laboring men or others, is not charity but justice. We must all work in common for the common end of helping each and all, in a spirit of the sanest, broadest, and deepest brotherhood. It was not always easy to avoid feeling very deep anger with the selfishness and short-sightedness shown by both the representatives of certain employers' organizations and by certain great labor federations or unions. One such employers' association was called the National Association of Manufacturers. Extreme, though the attacks sometimes made upon me by the extreme labor organizations were, they were not quite as extreme as the attacks made upon me by the head of the National Association of Manufacturers, and as regards their attitude towards legislation, I came to the conclusion, toward the end of my term, that the latter had actually gone farther the wrong way than did the former, and the former went a good distance also. The opposition of the National Association of Manufacturers to every rational and moderate measure for benefiting the working man, such as measures abolishing child labor, or securing workmen's compensation, caused me real and grave concern, for I felt that it was ominous of evil for the whole country to have men who ought to stand high in wisdom and in guiding force take a course and use such language of such reactionary type as directly to incite revolution for this is what the extreme reactionary always does. Often I was attacked by the two sides at once. In the spring of 1906 I received in the same mail a letter from a very good friend of mine, who thought that I had been unduly hard on some labor men, and a letter from another friend, the head of a great corporation, who complained about me for both favoring labor and speaking against large fortunes. My answers ran as follows. April 26, 1906 personal. My dear doctor, in one of my last letters to you I enclosed a copy of a letter of mine, in which I quoted from so-and-so's advocacy of murder. You may be interested to know that he and his brother socialists, in reality anarchists, of the frankly murderous type, have been violently attacking my speech because of my allusion to the sympathy expressed for murder. In The Socialist of Toledo, Ohio, of April 21st, for instance, the attack on me is based specifically on the following paragraph of my speech, to which he takes violent exception. We can no more and no less afford to condone evil in the man of capital than evil in the man of no capital. The wealthy man who exults because there is a failure of justice in the effort to bring some trust magnet to an account for his misdeeds is as bad as, and no worse than, the so-called labor leader, who clamorously strives to excite a foul class feeling on behalf of some other labor leader who is implicated in murder. One attitude is as bad as the other, and no worse. In each case the accused is entitled to exact justice, and in neither case is there need of action by others, which can be construed into an expression of sympathy for crime. Remember that this crowd of labor leaders have done all in their power to overawe the executive and the courts of Idaho on behalf of men accused of murder, and beyond question inciters of murder in the past. April 26, 1906 My dear Judge, I wish the papers had given more prominence to what I said as to the murder part of my speech. But, oh, my dear sir, I utterly and radically disagree with you in what you say about large fortunes. I wish it were in my power to devise some scheme to make it increasingly difficult to heap them up beyond a certain amount. 
as the difficulties in the way of such a scheme are very great, let us at least prevent their being bequeathed after death, or given during life, to any one man in excessive amount. You and other capitalist friends, on one side, shy off at what I say against them. Have you seen the frantic articles against me, by the anarchists and the socialists of the bomb-throwing persuasion, on the other side, because of what I said in my speech in reference to those who, in effect, advocate murder? On another occasion I was vehemently denounced in certain capitalistic papers, because I had a number of labor leaders, including miners from Butte, lunch with me at the White House, and this at the very time that the Western Federation of Miners was most ferocious in its denunciation of me, because of what it alleged to be my unfriendly attitude toward labor. To one of my critics I set forth my views in the following letter. November 26th, 1903. I have your letter of the 25th instant, with enclosure. These men, not all of whom were miners, by the way, came here and were at lunch with me, in company with Mr. Carroll D. Wright, Mr. Wayne McVeigh, and Secretary Corteloo. They are as decent a set of men as can be. They all agreed entirely with me in my denunciation of what had been done in the Cour d'Alene country, and it appeared that some of them were on the platform with me when I denounced this type of outrage three years ago in Butte. There is not one man who was here, who, I believe, was in any way, shape, or form responsible for such outrages. I find that the ultra-socialistic members of the unions in Butte denounced these men for coming here, in a manner as violent, and I may say as irrational, as the denunciation by the capitalistic writer in the article you sent me. Doubtless the gentleman of whom you speak as your general manager is an admirable man. I, of course, was not alluding to him, but I most emphatically was alluding to men who write such articles as that you sent me. These articles are to be paralleled by the similar articles in the populist and socialist papers, when two years ago I had dinner at one time with Pierpont Morgan, and at another time J. J. Hill, and at another Harriman, and at another time Schiff. Furthermore, they could be paralleled by the articles in the same type of paper which at the time of the Miller incident in the printing office were in a condition of nervous anxiety, because I met the labor leaders to discuss it. It would have been a great misfortune if I had not met them, and it would have been an even greater misfortune if after meeting them I had yielded to their protests in the matter. You say in your letter that you know I am on record as opposed to violence. Pardon my saying that this seems to me not the right way to put the matter, if by record you mean utterance and not action. Aside from what happened when I was governor in connection, for instance, with the Croton Dam strike riots, all you have to do is turn back to what took place last June in Arizona, and you can find out all about it from Mr. X of New York. The miners struck, violence followed, and the Arizona territorial authorities notified me that they could not grapple with the situation. Within twenty minutes of the receipt of the telegram, orders were issued to the nearest available troops, and twenty-four hours afterwards General Baldwin and his regulars were on the ground, and twenty-four hours later every vestige of disorder had disappeared. The Miners' Federation in their meeting, I think at Denver, a short while afterwards, passed resolutions denouncing me. I do not know whether the Mining and Engineering Journal paid any heed to this incident, or know of it. If the journal did, I suppose it can hardly have failed to understand that to put an immediate stop to rioting by the use of the United States Army is a fact of importance, besides which the criticism of my having labor leaders to lunch shrinks into the same insignificance as the criticism in a different type of paper about my having trust magnets to lunch. While I am president, I wish the labor man to feel that he has the same right of access to me that the capitalist has that the doors swing open as easily to the wage worker as to the head of a big corporation, and no easier. Anything else seems to be not only un-American, but as symptomatic of an attitude which will cost grave trouble if persevered in. To discriminate against labor men from Butte, because there is a reason to believe that rioting has been excited in other districts by certain labor unions, or individuals in labor unions in Butte, would be to adopt precisely the attitude of those who desire me to discriminate against all capitalists in Wall Street, because there are plenty of capitalists in Wall Street who have been guilty of bad financial practices, and who have endeavored to override or evade the laws of the land. In my judgment, the only safe attitude for a private citizen, and still more for a public servant, to assume, is that he will draw the line on conduct, discriminating against neither corporation nor union as such, nor in favor of either as such, but endeavoring to make the decent member of the union and the upright capitalist alike 
feel that they are bound, not only by self-interest, but by every consideration of principle and duty, to stand together on the matters of most moment to the nation. On another of the various occasions, when I had labor leaders to dine at the White House, my critics were rather shocked because I had John Morley to meet them. The labor leaders in question included the heads of the various railroad brotherhoods, men like Mr. Morrissey, in whose sound judgment and high standard of citizenship I had peculiar confidence, and I asked Mr. Morley to meet them because they represented the exact type of American citizen with whom I thought he ought to be brought in contact. One of the devices sometimes used by big corporations to break down the law was to treat the passage of laws as an excuse for action on their part, which they knew would be resented by the public, it being their purpose to turn this resentment against law instead of against themselves. The heads of the Louisville and Nashville Road were bitter opponents of everything done by the government towards securing good treatment for their employees. In February, 1908, they and various other railways announced that they intended to reduce the wages of their employees. A general strike, with all the attendant disorder and trouble, was threatened in consequence. I accordingly sent the following open letter to the Interstate Commerce Commission. February 16, 1908. To the Interstate Commerce Commission. I am informed that a number of railroad companies have served notice of a proposed reduction of wages of their employees. One of them, the Louisville and Nashville, in announcing the reduction, states that the drastic laws inimical to the interests of the railroads that have in the past year or two been enacted by Congress and the state legislatures are largely or chiefly responsible for the conditions requiring the reduction. Under such circumstances, it is possible that the public may soon be confronted by serious industrial disputes, and the law provides that in such a case either party may demand the services of your chairman and the commissioner of labor as a board of mediation and conciliation. These reductions in wages may be warranted, or they may not. As to this, the public, which is a vitally interested party, can form no judgment, without a more complete knowledge of the essential facts and real merits of the case, than it has now, or that it can possibly obtain from the special pleadings, certain to be put forth by each side in case their dispute should bring about serious interruption to traffic. If the reduction in wages is due to natural causes, the loss of business being such that the burden should be, and is, equitably distributed between capitalist and wage worker, the public should know it. If it is caused by legislation, the public and Congress should know it, and if it is caused by misconduct on the past financial or other operations of any railroad, then everybody should know it, especially if the excuse of unfriendly legislation is advanced as a method of covering up past business misconduct by the railroad managers, or as a justification for failure to treat fairly the wage-earning employees of the company. Moreover, an industrial conflict between a railroad corporation and its employees offers peculiar opportunities to any small number of evil-disposed persons to destroy life and property and foment public disorder. Of course, if life, property, and public order are endangered, prompt and drastic measures for their protection become the first plain duty. All other issues then become subordinate to the preservation of the public peace, and the real merits of the original controversy are necessarily lost from view. This vital consideration should be ever kept in mind by all law-abiding and far-sighted members of labor organizations. It is sincerely to be hoped, therefore, that any wage controversy that may arise between the railroads and their employees may find a peaceful solution through the methods of conciliation and arbitration already provided by Congress, which have proven so effective during the last year. To this end, the Commission should be in a position to have available for any Board of Conciliation or Arbitration relevant data pertaining to such carriers as may become involved in industrial disputes. Should conciliation fail to effect a settlement and arbitration be rejected, accurate information should be available in order to develop a properly informed public opinion. I therefore ask you to make such an investigation, both of your records and by other means at your command, as will enable you to furnish data concerning such conditions obtaining on the Louisville and Nashville and any other roads, as may relate, directly or indirectly, to the real merits of the possibly impending controversy. Theodore Roosevelt This letter achieved its purpose, and the threatened reduction of wages was not made. It was an instance of what could be accomplished by governmental action. 
Let me add, however, with all the emphasis I possess, that this does not mean any failure on my part to recognize the fact, that if governmental action places too heavy burdens on railways, it will be impossible for them to operate without doing injustice to somebody. Railways cannot pay proper wages, and render proper service, unless they make money. The investors must get a reasonable profit, or they will not invest, and the public cannot be well served unless the investors are making reasonable profits. There is every reason why rates should not be too high, but they must be sufficiently high to allow the railways to pay good wages. Moreover, when laws like workmen's compensation laws and the like are passed, it must always be kept in mind by the legislature that the purpose is to distribute over the whole community a burden that should not be borne only by those least able to bear it, that is, by the injured man or the widow and orphans of the dead man. If the railway is already receiving a disproportionate return from the public, then the burden may, with propriety, bear purely on the railway, but if it is not earning a disproportionate return, then the public must bear its share of the burden of the increased service the railway is rendering. Dividends and wages should go up together, and the relation of rates to them should not be forgotten. This, of course, does not apply to dividends based on water, nor does it mean that if foolish people have built a road that renders no service, the public must nevertheless in some way guarantee a return on the investment, but it does mean that the interests of the honest investor are entitled to the same protection as the interests of the honest manager, the honest shipper, and the honest wage earner. All these conflicting considerations should be carefully considered by legislatures before passing laws. One of the great objects in creating commissions should be the provision of disinterested, fair-minded experts, who will really and wisely consider all these matters, and will shape their actions accordingly. This is one reason why such matters as the regulation of rates, the provision for full crews on roads, and the like, should be left for treatment by railway commissions, and not be settled off-hand by direct legislative action. End of chapter 13, part 3《Chapter 14, Part 1 of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Chapter 14 The Monroe Doctrine and the Panama Canal, Part 1. No nation can claim rights without acknowledging the duties that go with the rights. It is a contemptible thing for a great nation to render itself impotent in international action, whether because of cowardice or sloth, or sheer inability or unwillingness to look into the future. It is a very wicked thing for a nation to do wrong to others. But the most contemptible and most wicked course of conduct is for a nation to use offensive language, or be guilty of offensive actions toward other people, and yet fail to hold its own if the other nation retaliates and it is almost as bad to undertake responsibilities and then not fulfill them. During the seven and a half years that I was president, this nation behaved in international matters toward all other nations, precisely as an honorable man behaves to his fellow men. We made no promise which we could not and did not keep. We made no threat which we did not carry out. We never failed to assert our rights in the face of the strong, and we never failed to treat both strong and weak with courtesy and justice, and against the weak, when they misbehaved, we were slower to assert our rights than we were against the strong. As a legacy of the Spanish War we were left with peculiar relations to the Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico, and with an immensely added interest in Central America and the Caribbean Sea. As regards the Philippines, my belief was that we should train them for self-government as rapidly as possible, and then leave them free to decide their own fate. I did not believe in setting the time limit within which we would give them independence, because I did not believe it wise to try to forecast how soon they would be fit for self-government, and once having made the promise, I would have felt that it was imperative to keep it. Within a few months of my assuming office we had stamped out the last armed resistance in the Philippines that was not of merely sporadic character, and as soon as peace was secured we turned our energies to developing the islands in the interest of the natives. We established schools everywhere, we built roads, we administered an even-handed justice, we did everything possible to encourage agriculture and industry, and in constantly increasing measure we employed natives to do their own governing, and finally provided a legislative chamber. 
no higher grade of public officials ever handled the affairs of any colony than the public officials who in succession governed the Philippines. With the possible exception of the Sudan, and not even excepting Algiers, I know of no country ruled and administered by men of the white race, where that rule and that administration have been exercised so emphatically, with an eye single to the welfare of the natives themselves. The English and Dutch administrators of Malaysia have done admirable work, but the profit to the Europeans in those states has always been one of the chief elements considered, whereas in the Philippines our whole attention was concentrated upon the welfare of the Filipinos themselves, if anything, to the neglect of our own interests. I do not believe that America has any special beneficial interest in retaining the Philippines. Our work there has benefited us only as any efficiently done work performed for the benefit of others does incidentally help the character of those who do it. The people of the islands have never developed so rapidly, from every standpoint, as during the years of the American occupation. The time will come when it will be wise to take their own judgment as to whether they wish to continue their association with America or not. There is, however, one consideration upon which we should insist— Either we should retain complete control of the islands, or absolve ourselves from all responsibility for them. Any half-and-half -half course would be both foolish and disastrous. We are governing, and have been governing the islands in the interests of the Filipinos themselves. If after due time the Filipinos themselves decide that they do not wish to be thus governed, then I trust that we will leave. But when we do leave, it must be distinctly understood that we retain no protectorate, and above all, that we take no part in joint protectorate, over the islands, and give them no guarantee of neutrality or otherwise, that, in short, we are absolutely quit of responsibility for them, of every kind and description. The Filipinos were quite incapable of standing by themselves when we took possession of the islands, and we had made no promise concerning them. But we had explicitly promised to leave the island of Cuba, had explicitly promised that Cuba should be independent. Early in my administration that promise was redeemed. When the promise was made, I doubt if there was a single ruler or diplomat in Europe who believed that it would be kept. As far as I know, the United States was the first power which, having made such a promise, kept it in letter and spirit. England was unwise enough to make such a promise when she took Egypt. It would have been a capital misfortune to have kept the promise, and England has remained in Egypt for over thirty years, and will unquestionably remain indefinitely, but, though it is necessary for her to do so, the fact of her doing so has meant the breaking of a positive promise, and has been a real evil. Japan made the same guarantee about Korea, but as far as can be seen there was never even any thought of keeping the promise in this case, and Korea, which had shown herself utterly impotent either for self-government or self-defense, was in actual fact almost immediately annexed to Japan. We made the promise to give Cuba independence, and we kept the promise. Leonard Wood was left in as governor for two or three years, and evolved order out of chaos, raising the administration of the island to a level, moral and material, which it had never before achieved. We also, by treaty, gave the Cubans substantial advantages in our markets. Then we left the island, turning the government over to its own people. After four or five years a revolution broke out, during my administration, and we again had to intervene to restore order we promptly sent thither a small army of pacification. Under General Barry, order was restored and kept, and absolute justice done. The American troops were then withdrawn, and the Cubans re-established in complete possession of their own beautiful island, and they are in possession of it now. There are plenty of occasions in our history when we have shown weakness or inefficiency, and some occasions when we have not been as scrupulous as we should have been as regards the rights of others but I know of no action by any other government in relation to a weaker power, which showed such disinterested efficiency in rendering service as was true in connection with our intervention in Cuba. As in the Philippines, and as in Puerto Rico, Santo Domingo, and later in Panama, no small part of our success was due to the fact that we put in the highest grade of men as public officials. This practice was inaugurated under President McKinley. I found admirable men in office, and I continued them and appointed men like them as their successors. The way that the custom-houses in Santo Domingo were administered by Colton definitely established the success of our experiment in securing peace for that island republic, and in Puerto Rico, under the administration of affairs under such officials as Hunt, Winthrop, Post, Ward, and Graham, more substantial progress was achieved in a decade than in any previous century." 
The Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico came within our own sphere of governmental action. In addition to this, we asserted certain rights in the Western Hemisphere under the Monroe Doctrine. My endeavor was not only to assert these rights, but frankly and fully to acknowledge the duties that went with the rights. The Monroe Doctrine lays down the rule that the Western Hemisphere is not hereafter to be treated as subject to settlement and occupation by old world powers. It is not international law, but it is a cardinal principle of our foreign policy. There is no difficulty at the present day in maintaining this doctrine, save where the American power, whose interest is threatened, has shown itself in international matters both weak and delinquent. The great and prosperous civilized commonwealths, such as Argentina, Brazil, and Chile, in the southern half of South America, have advanced so far that they no longer stand in any position of tutelage toward the United States. They occupy toward us precisely the position that Canada occupies. Their friendship is the friendship of equals, for equals. My view was that as regards these nations there was no more necessity for asserting the Monroe Doctrine than there was to assert it in regard to Canada. They were competent to assert it for themselves. Of course, if one of these nations, or if Canada, should be overcome by some old world power, which then proceeded to occupy its territory, we would undoubtedly, if the American nation needed our help, give it in order to prevent such occupation from taking place. But the initiative would come from the nation itself, and the United States would merely act as a friend whose help was invoked. The case was, and is, widely different as regards certain, not all, of the tropical states in the neighborhood of the Caribbean Sea. Where these states are stable and prosperous, they stand on a footing of absolute equality with all other communities. But some of them have been prey to such continuous revolutionary misrule as to have grown impotent, either to do their duties to outsiders, or to enforce their rights against outsiders. The United States has not the slightest desire to make aggressions on any one of these states. On the contrary, it will submit to much from them without showing resentment. If any great civilized power, Russia or Germany, for instance, had behaved toward us as Venezuela under Castro behaved, this country would have gone to war at once. We did not go to war with Venezuela, merely because our people declined to be irritated by the actions of a weak opponent, and showed a forbearance which probably went beyond the limits of wisdom in refusing to take umbrage at what was done by the weak, although we would certainly have resented it had it been done by the strong. In the case of two states, however, affairs reached such a crisis that we had to act. These two states were Santo Domingo and the then owner of the Isthmus of Panama, Colombia. The Santo Domingan case was the less important, and yet it possessed a real importance, and moreover is instructive because the action there taken should serve as a precedent for American action in all similar cases. During the early years of my administration, Santo Domingo was in its usual condition of chronic revolution. There was always fighting, always plundering, and the successful graspers for governmental power were always pawning ports and custom-houses, or trying to put them up as guarantees for loans. Of course the foreigners who made loans under such conditions demanded exorbitant interest, and if they were Europeans expected their governments to stand by them. So utter was the disorder that on one occasion when Admiral Dewey landed to pay a call of ceremony on the President, he and his party were shot at by revolutionists in crossing the square, and had to return to the ships, leaving the call unpaid. There was default on the interest due to the creditors, and finally the latter insisted upon their governments intervening. Two or three of the European powers were endeavouring to arrange for concerted action, and I was finally notified that these powers intended to take and hold several of the seaports which held custom-houses. This meant that unless I acted at once I would find foreign powers in partial possession of Santo Domingo, in which event the very individuals who, in the actual event deprecated the precaution taken to prevent such action, would have advocated extreme and violent measures to undo the effect of their own supineness. Nine-tenths of wisdom is to be wise in time, and at the right time, and my whole foreign policy was based on the exercise of intelligent forethought, and of decisive action sufficiently far in advance of any likely crisis, to make it improbable that we would run into serious trouble. Santo Domingo had fallen into such chaos that once, for some weeks, there were two rival governments in it, and a revolution was being carried on against each. At one period one government was at sea in a small gunboat, but still stoutly maintained that it was in possession of the island, and entitled to make loans and declare peace or war. The situation had become intolerable by the time that I interfered. 
There was a naval commander in the waters whom I directed to prevent any fighting which might menace the custom-houses. He carried out his orders, both to his and my satisfaction, in thoroughgoing fashion. On one occasion, when an insurgent force threatened to attack a town in which Americans had interests, he notified the commanders on both sides that he would not permit any fighting in the town, but that he would appoint a certain place where they could meet and fight it out, and that the victors should have the town. They agreed to meet his wishes. The fight came off at the appointed place, and the victors, who, if I remember rightly, were the insurgents, were given the town. It was the custom-houses that caused the trouble, for they offered the only means of raising money, and the revolutions were carried on to get possession of them. Accordingly I secured an agreement with the governmental authorities, who for the moment seemed best able to speak for the country, by which these custom-houses were placed under American control. The arrangement was that we should keep order and prevent any interference with the custom-houses or the places where they stood, and should collect the revenues. Forty-five per cent of the revenue was then turned over to the Santo Domingan government, and fifty-five per cent put in a sinking fund in New York for the benefit of the creditors. The arrangement worked in capital style. On the forty-five per cent basis the Santo Domingan government received from us a larger sum than it had ever received before, when nominally all the revenue went to it. The creditors were entirely satisfied with the arrangement, and no excuse for interference by European powers remained. Occasional disturbances occurred in the island, of course, but on the whole there ensued a degree of peace and prosperity which the island had not known before for at least a century. All this was done without the loss of life, with the assent of all parties in interest, and without subjecting the United States to any charge, while practically all of the interference, after the naval commander whom I have mentioned had taken the initial steps in preserving order, consisted in putting a first-class man trained in our insular service at the head of the Santo Domingan Customs Service. We secured peace, we protected the people of the islands against foreign foes, and we minimized the chance of domestic trouble. We satisfied the creditors and the foreign nations to which the creditors belonged, and our own part of the work was done with the utmost efficiency and with rigid honesty, so that not a particle of scandal was ever so much as hinted at. Under these circumstances those who do not know the nature of the professional international philanthropists would suppose that these apostles of international peace would have been overjoyed with what we had done. As a matter of fact, when they took any notice of it at all, it was to denounce it, and those American newspapers which are fondest of proclaiming themselves the foes of war and the friends of peace violently attacked me for averting war from, and bringing peace to the island. They insisted I had no power to make the agreement, and demanded the rejection of the treaty which was to perpetuate the agreement. They were, of course, wholly unable to advance a single sound reason of any kind for their attitude. I suppose the real explanation was partly their dislike of me personally, and unwillingness to see peace come through or national honour upheld by me, and in the next place their sheer, simple devotion to prattle and dislike of efficiency. They liked to have people come together and talk about peace, or even sign bits of paper with something about peace or arbitration on them, but they took no interest in whatever the practical achievement of a peace that told for good government and decency and honesty. They were joined by the many moderately well-meaning men who always demand that a thing be done, but also always demand that it be not done in the only way in which it was, as a matter of fact, possible to do it. The men of this kind insisted that, of course, Santo Domingo must be protected and made to behave itself, and that, of course, the Panama Canal must be dug, but they insisted even more strongly that neither feat should be accomplished in the only way in which it was possible to accomplish it at all. The Constitution did not explicitly give me power to bring about the necessary agreement with Santo Domingo, but the Constitution did not forbid my doing what I did. I put the agreement into effect, and I continued its execution for two years before the Senate acted, and I would have continued it until the end of my term, if necessary, without any action by Congress. But it was far preferable that there should be action by Congress, so that we might be proceeding under a treaty, which was the law of the land, and not merely by a direction of the chief executive which would lapse when that particular executive left office. I therefore did my best to get the Senate to ratify what I had done. There was a good deal of difficulty about it. With the exception of one or two men like Clark of Arkansas, the Democratic senators acted in that spirit of unworthy partisanship which subordinates national interest to some fancied partisan advantage, and they were cordially backed by all that portion of the press which took its inspiration from Wall Street, 
and was violently hostile to the administration because of its attitude towards great corporations. Most of the Republican senators under the lead of Senator Lodge stood by me, but some of them, of the more conservative or reactionary type, who were already growing hostile to me on the trust question, first proceeded to sneer at what had been done, and to raise all kinds of meticulous objections, which they themselves finally abandoned, but which furnished an excuse on which the opponents of the treaty could hang adverse action. Unfortunately, the senators who were the most apt to speak of the dignity of the Senate, and to insist upon its importance, were the very ones who were also most apt to try to make display of this dignity and importance by thwarting the public business. This case was typical. The Republicans in question spoke against certain provisions of the proposed treaty. They then, having ingeniously provided ammunition for the foes of the treaty, abandoned their position, and the Democrats stepped into the position they had abandoned. Enough Republicans were absent to prevent the securing of a two-thirds vote for the treaty, and the Senate adjourned without any action at all, and with a feeling of entire self-satisfaction at having left the country in the position of assuming a responsibility, and then failing to fulfill it. Apparently the senators in question felt that in some way they had upheld their dignity. All that they had really done was to shirk their duty. Somebody had to do that duty, and accordingly I did it. I went ahead and administered the proposed treaty anyhow, considering it as a simple agreement on the part of the executive, which would be converted into a treaty whenever the Senate acted. After a couple of years the Senate did act, having previously made some utterly unimportant changes which I ratified and persuaded Santo Domingo to ratify. In all its history Santo Domingo has had nothing happen to it as fortunate as this treaty, and the passing of it saved the United States from having to face serious difficulties with one or more foreign powers. It cannot in the long run prove possible for the United States to protect delinquent American nations from punishment for the non-performance of their duties, unless she undertakes to make them perform their duties. People may theorize about this as much as they wish, but whenever a sufficiently strong outside nation becomes sufficiently aggrieved, then either that nation will act, or the United States government itself will have to act. We were face to face at one period of my administration with this condition of affairs in Venezuela, when Germany, rather feebly backed by England, undertook a blockade against Venezuela to make Venezuela adopt the German and English view about certain agreements. There was real danger that the blockade would finally result in Germany's taking possession of certain cities or custom houses. I succeeded, however, in getting all the parties in interest to submit their cases to the Hague Tribunal. End of chapter 14, part 1《ハッピーエンドリングアップ》アドバイオグラフィーオブ・ティオドロ・ロズヴェルト。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Chapter 14 The Monroe Doctrine and the Panama Canal, Part 2 By far the most important action I took in foreign affairs during the time I was president related to the Panama Canal. Here again there was much accusation about my having acted in an unconstitutional manner, a position which can be upheld only if Jefferson's action in acquiring Louisiana be treated as unconstitutional, and at different stages of the affair believers in a do-nothing policy denounced me as having usurped authority, which meant that when nobody else could or would exercise efficient authority, I exercised it. During the nearly four hundred years that had elapsed since Balboa crossed the Isthmus, there had been a good deal of talk about building an Isthmus canal, and there had been various discussions of the subject and negotiations about it in Washington for the previous half-century. So far it had all resulted merely in conversation, and the time had come when, unless somebody was prepared to act with decision, we would have to resign ourselves to at least half a century of further conversation. Under the hay Ponsfold Treaty, signed shortly after I became President, and thanks to our negotiations with the French Panama Company, the United States at last acquired a possession, so far as Europe was concerned, which warranted her in immediately undertaking the task. It remained to decide where the canal should be, whether along the line already pioneered by the French Company in Panama, or in Nicaragua. Panama belonged to the Republic of Colombia. Nicaragua bid eagerly for the privilege of having the United States build the canal through her territory. 
As long as it was doubtful which route we would decide upon, Colombia extended every promise of friendly cooperation. At the Pan-American Congress in Mexico, her delegate joined in the unanimous vote which requested the United States forthwith build the canal, and at her eager request we negotiated the hay heron Treaty with her, which gave us the right to build the canal across Panama. A board of experts sent to the Isthmus had reported that this route was better than the Nicaragua route, and that it would be well to build the canal over it, provided we could purchase the rights of the French company for forty million dollars, but that otherwise they would advise taking the Nicaragua route. Ever since 1846 we had had a treaty with the power then in control of the Isthmus, the Republic of New Granada, the predecessor of the Republic of Colombia, and of the present Republic of Panama, by which treaty the United States was guaranteed free and open right of way across the Isthmus of Panama by any mode of communication that might be constructed, while in return our government guaranteed the perfect neutrality of the Isthmus with a view to the preservation of free transit. For nearly fifty years we had asserted the right to prevent the closing of this highway of commerce. Secretary of State Cass, in 1858, officially stated the American position as follows. Sovereignty has its duties as well as its rights, and none of these local governments, even if administered with more regard to the just demands of other nations than they have been, would be permitted, in a spirit of eastern isolation, to close the gates of intercourse of the great highways of the world, and justify the act by the pretension that these avenues of trade and travel belong to them, and that they choose to shut them, or what is almost equivalent to encumber them with such unjust relations as would prevent their general use. We had again and again been forced to intervene to protect the transit across the isthmus, and the intervention was frequently at the request of Colombia herself. The effort to build a canal by private capital had been made under de Lesseps, and had resulted in lamentable failure. Every serious proposal to build the canal in such manner had been abandoned. The United States had repeatedly announced that we would not permit it to be built or controlled by any old-world government. Colombia was utterly impotent to build it herself. Under these circumstances it had become a matter of imperative obligation that we should build it ourselves without further delay. I took final action in 1903. During the preceding fifty-three years the governments of New Granada and of its successor, Colombia, had been in a constant state of flux, and the state of Panama had sometimes been treated as almost independent, in a loose federal league, and sometimes as the mere property of the government at Bogota, and there had been innumerable appeals to arms, sometimes of adequate, sometimes for inadequate reasons. The following is a partial list of the disturbances on the Isthmus of Panama during the period in question, as reported to us by our consuls. It is not possible to give a complete list, and some of the reports that speak of revolutions must mean unsuccessful revolutions. May twenty second, eighteen fifty. Outbreak. Two Americans killed. War vessel demanded to quell outbreak. October, eighteen fifty. Revolutionary plot to bring about independence of the Isthmus. July twenty second, eighteen fifty one, revolution in four southern provinces. November fourteenth, eighteen fifty one, outbreak at Chagres, man of war requested for Chagres. June twenty seventh, eighteen fifty three, insurrection at Bogota and consequent disturbance on Isthmus, war vessel demanded. May twenty third, eighteen fifty four, political disturbances, war vessel requested. June twenty eighth, eighteen fifty four, attempted revolution. October twenty fourth, eighteen fifty four, independence of isthmus demanded by provincial legislature. April eighteen fifty six, riot and massacre of Americans. May fourth, eighteen fifty six, riot. May eighteenth, eighteen fifty six, riot. June third, eighteen fifty six, riot. October second, eighteen fifty six, conflict between two native parties. United States force landed. December eighteenth, eighteen fifty eight. Attempted secession of Panama. April, 1859. Riots. September, 1860. Outbreak. October 4, 1860. Landing of United States forces in consequence. May 23, 1861. Intervention of the United States force required by Intendente. October 2, 1861. Insurrection and civil war. April 4, 1862. Measures to prevent rebels crossing Isthmus. June thirteenth, eighteen sixty two. Mosquera's troops refused admittance to Panama. 
March, 1865. Revolution, and United States troops landed. August, 1865. Riots. Unsuccessful attempt to invade Panama. March, 1866. Unsuccessful revolution. April, 1867. Attempt to overthrow government. August, 1867. Attempt at revolution. July 5, 1868. Revolution. Provisional government inaugurated. August 29, 1868. Revolution. Provisional government overthrown. April, 1871. Revolution. Followed apparently by counter-revolution. April, 1873. Revolution and civil war which lasted to October, 1875. August, 1876. Civil war which lasted until April, 1877. July, 1878. Rebellion. December, 1878. Revolt. April, 1879. Revolution. June, 1879. Revolution. March, 1883. Riot. May, 1883. Riot. June, 1884. Revolutionary attempt. December, 1884. Revolutionary attempt. January, 1885. Revolutionary disturbances. March, 1885. Revolution. April, 1887. Disturbance on Panama Railroad. November, 1887. Disturbance on Line of Canal. January, 1889. Riot. January, 1895. Revolution which lasted until April. March, 1895. Incendiary attempt. October, 1899. Revolution. February, 1900 to July, 1900. Revolution. January, 1901. Revolution. July, 1901. Revolutionary disturbances. September, 1901. City of Colon taken by rebels. March, 1902. Revolutionary disturbances. July, 1902. Revolution. The above is only a partial list of the revolutions, rebellions, insurrections, riots, and other outbreaks that occurred during the period in question, yet they number fifty-three for the fifty-three years, and they showed a tendency to increase, rather than decrease, in numbers and intensity. One of them lasted for nearly three years before it was quelled, another for nearly a year. In short, the experience of over half a century had shown Colombia to be utterly incapable of keeping order on the isthmus. Only the active interference of the United States had enabled her to preserve so much as a semblance of sovereignty. Had it not been for the exercise by the United States of the police power in her interest, her connection with the isthmus would have been sundered long before it was. In 1856, in 1860, in 1873, in 1885, in 1901, and again in 1902, sailors and marines from United States warships were forced to land in order to patrol the isthmus, to protect life and property, and to see that the transit across the isthmus was kept open. In 1861, in 1862, in 1885, and in 1900, the Colombian government asked that the United States government would land troops to protect Colombian interests and maintain order on the isthmus. The people of Panama during the preceding twenty years had three times sought to establish their independence by revolution or secession, in 1885, in 1895, and in 1899. The peculiar relations of the United States towards the Isthmus, and the acquiescence by Colombia in acts which were quite incompatible with the theory of her having an absolute and unconditioned sovereignty on the Isthmus, are illustrated by the following three telegrams between two of our naval officers whose ships were at the Isthmus, and the Secretary of the Navy on the occasion of the first outbreak that occurred on the Isthmus after I became President, a year before Panama became independent. September 12, 1902 Ranger, Panama. The United States guarantees perfect neutrality of isthmus, and that a free transit from sea to sea be not interrupted or embarrassed. Any transportation of troops which might contravene these provisions of treaty should not be sanctioned by you, nor should use of road be permitted which might convert the line of transit into a theatre of hostility. Moody. Colon, September twentieth, nineteen o two, Secretary Navy, Washington. Everything is conceded. The United States guards and guarantees traffic in the line of transit. Today I permitted the exchange of Colombian troops from Panama to Colon, about one thousand men each way, the troops without in arms guarded by American naval force in the same manner as other passengers, arms and ammunition in separate train, guarded also by naval force in the same manner as other freight. McLean. 
Panama, October 3, 1902. Secretary Navy, Washington, D.C. Have sent this communication to the American Consul at Panama. Inform Governor, while trains running under United States protection, I must decline transportation any combatants, ammunition, arms, which might cause interruption to traffic or convert line of transit into theater hostilities. Casey. When the government in nominal control of the isthmus continually besought American interference to protect the rights it could not itself protect, and permitted our government to transport Colombian troops unarmed, under protection of our own armed men, while the Colombian arms and ammunition came in a separate train, it is obvious that Colombian sovereignty was of such a character as to warrant our instigating that, inasmuch as it only existed because of our protection, there should be in requital a sense of the obligations that the acceptance of this protection implied. Meanwhile, Colombia was under a dictatorship. In 1898, M. A. San Clemente was elected president, and J. M. Marroquin vice-president, of the Republic of Colombia. On July 31, 1900, the vice-president, Marroquin, executed a coup d'état by seizing the person of the president, San Clemente, and imprisoning him at a place a few miles out of Bogotá. Marroquin thereupon declared himself possessed of the executive power because of the absence of the president, a delightful touch of unconscious humor. He then issued a decree that public order was disturbed, and upon that ground assumed to himself legislative power under another provision of the Constitution. That is, having himself disturbed the public order, he alleged that the disturbances as a justification for seizing absolute power. Thenceforth, Marroquin, without the aid of any legislative body, ruled as a dictator, combining the supreme executive, legislative, civil, and military authorities in the so-called Republic of Colombia. The absence of San Clemente from the capital became permanent by his death in prison in the year 1902. When the people of Panama declared their independence in November 1903, no Congress had sat in Colombia since the year 1898, except the special Congress called by Marroquin to reject the Canal Treaty, and which did reject it by a unanimous vote, and adjourned without legislating on any other subject. The Constitution of 1886 had taken away from Panama the power of self-government and vested it in Colombia. The coup d'état of Marroquin took away from Colombia herself the power of government and vested it in an irresponsible dictator. Consideration of the above facts ought to be enough to show any human being that we were not dealing with normal conditions on the isthmus and in Colombia. We were dealing with the government of an irresponsible alien dictator, and with a condition of affairs on the isthmus itself which was marked by one uninterrupted series of outbreaks and revolutions. As for the consent of the governed theory, that absolutely justified our action. The people on the isthmus were governed. They were governed by Colombia without their consent, and they unanimously repudiated the Colombian government, and demanded that the United States build the canal. End of chapter 14, part 2chapter 14 part 3 of autobiography of theodore roosevelt this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org autobiography of theodore roosevelt chapter 14 the monroe doctrine and the panama canal part 3 i had done everything possible personally and through secretary hay to persuade the colombian government to keep faith under the hay ponsfote Treaty, it was explicitly provided that the United States should build the canal, should control, police, and protect it, and keep it open to the vessels of all nations on equal terms. We had assumed the position of guarantor of the canal, including, of course, the building of the canal, and of its peaceful use by all the world. The enterprise was recognized everywhere as responding to an international need. It was a mere travesty on justice to treat the government in possession of the isthmus as having the right, which Secretary Cass, forty-five years before, had so emphatically repudiated, to close the gates of intercourse on one of the great highways of the world. When we submitted to Columbia the hay heron Treaty, it had been settled that the time for delay, the time for permitting any government of antisocial character, or of imperfect development, to bar the work, had passed. The United States had assumed, in connection with the canal, certain responsibilities, not only to its own people, but to the civilized world, which imperatively demanded that there should be no further delay in beginning the work. 
The Hay-Heron Treaty, if it erred at all, erred in being over-generous toward Colombia. The people of Panama were delighted with the treaty, and the President of Colombia, who embodied in his own person the entire government of Colombia, had authorized the treaty to be made. But after the treaty had been made, the Colombia government thought it had the matter in its own hands, and the further thought, equally wicked and foolish, came into the heads of the people in control at Bogotá, that they would seize the French company at the end of another year, and take for themselves the forty million dollars which the United States had agreed to pay the Panama Canal Company. President Marroquin, through his minister, had agreed to the Hay-Heron Treaty in January 1903. He had the absolute power of an unconstitutional dictator to keep his promise or break it. He determined to break it. To furnish himself an excuse for breaking it, he devised the plan of summoning a Congress especially called to reject the Canal Treaty. This the Congress, a Congress of mere puppets, did, without a dissenting vote, and the puppets adjourned forthwith without legislating on any other subject. The fact that this was a mere sham, and that the President had entire power to confirm his own treaty, and act on it if he desired, was shown as soon as the revolution took place, for on November 6th General Reyes of Colombia addressed the American minister at Bogotá, on behalf of President Marroquin, saying that if the government of the United States would land troops and restore the Colombian sovereignty, the Colombian president would declare martial law, and by virtue of vested constitutional authority, when public order is disturbed, would approve by decree the ratification of the Canal Treaty as signed, or if the government of the United States prefers, would call an extra session of the Congress, with new and friendly members, next May to approve the treaty. This, of course, is proof positive that the Colombian dictator had used his Congress as a mere shield, and a sham shield at that, and it shows how utterly useless it would have been to further trust his good faith in the matter. When in August 1903 I became convinced that Colombia intended to repudiate the treaty made the preceding January, under cover of securing its rejection by the Colombian legislature, I began carefully to consider what should be done. By my direction, Secretary Hay, personally and through the minister at Bogotá, repeatedly warned Colombia that grave consequences might follow her rejection of the treaty. The possibility of ratification did not wholly pass away until the close of the session of the Colombian Congress on the last day of October. There would then be two possibilities. One was that Panama would remain quiet. In that case I was prepared to recommend to Congress that we should at once occupy the isthmus. In that case I was prepared to recommend to Congress that we should at once occupy the isthmus anyhow and proceed to dig the canal, and I had drawn out a draft of my message to this effect. But from the information I received, I deemed it likely that there would be a revolution in Panama as soon as the Colombian Congress adjourned without ratifying the treaty, for the entire population of Panama felt that the immediate building of the canal was of vital concern to their well-being. Correspondents of the different newspapers on the Isthmus had sent their respective papers widely published forecasts indicating that there would be a revolution in such an event. Moreover, on October 16th, at the request of Lieutenant General Young, Captain Humphrey, and Lieutenant Murphy, two army officers who had returned from the Isthmus, saw me and told me that there would unquestionably be a revolution on the Isthmus, that the people were unanimous in their criticism of the Bogota government and their disgust over the failure of that government to ratify the treaty, and that the revolution would probably take place immediately after the adjournment of the Colombian Congress. They did not believe that it would be before October 20th, but they were confident that it would certainly come at the end of October or immediately afterwards, when the Colombian Congress had adjourned. Accordingly, I directed the Navy Department to station various ships within easy reach of the Isthmus, to be ready to act in the event of need arising. These ships were barely in time. On November 3rd the revolution occurred. Practically everybody on the Isthmus, including all the Colombian troops that were already stationed there, joined in the revolution, and there was no bloodshed. But on that same day four hundred new Colombian troops were landed at Colón. Fortunately, the gunboat, Nashville, under Commander Hubbard, reached Colón almost immediately afterwards, and when the commander of the Colombian forces threatened the lives and property of the American citizens, including women and children, in Colón, Commander Hubbard landed a few score sailors and marines to protect them. 
By a mixture of firmness and tact he not only prevented any assault on our citizens, but persuaded the Colombian commander to re-embark his troops for Cartagena. On the Pacific side a Colombian gunboat shelled the city of Panama, with the result of killing one Chinaman, the only life lost in the whole affair. No one connected with the American government had any part in preparing, inciting, or encouraging the revolution, and except for the reports of our military and naval officers, which I forwarded to Congress, no one connected with the government had any previous knowledge concerning the proposed revolution, except such as was accessible to any person who read the newspapers, and kept abreast of current questions and current affairs. By the unanimous action of its people, and without the firing of a shot, the state of Panama declared themselves an independent republic. The time for hesitation on our part had passed. My belief then was, and the events that have occurred since have more than justified it, that from the standpoint of the United States it was imperative, not only for civil but for military reasons, that there should be the immediate establishment of easy and speedy communication by sea between the Atlantic and the Pacific. These reasons were not of convenience only, but of vital necessity, and did not admit of indefinite delay. The action of Columbia had shown not only that the delay would be indefinite, but that she intended to confiscate the property and the rights of the French Panama Canal Company. The report of the Panama Canal Committee of the Colombian Senate on October 14, 1903, on the proposed treaty with the United States, proposed that all consideration of the matter should be postponed until October 31, 1904, when the next Colombian Congress would have convened, because by that time the new Congress would be in condition to determine whether, through lapse of time, the French company had not forfeited its property and rights. When that time arrives, the report significantly declared, the Republic, without any impediment, will be able to contract, and will be in more clear, more definite, and more advantageous possession, both legally and materially. The naked meaning of this was that Columbia proposed to wait a year, and then enforce a forfeiture of the rights and property of the French Panama Canal Company, so as to secure the forty million dollars our government had authorized as payment to this company. If we had sat supine, this would doubtless have meant that France would have interfered to protect the company, and we should have had on the isthmus not the company but France, and the gravest international complications might have ensued. Every consideration of international morality and expediency, of duty to the Panama people, and of satisfaction of our own national interests and honor, bade us take immediate action. I recognized Panama forthwith on behalf of the United States, and practically all the countries of the world immediately followed suit. The State Department immediately negotiated a canal treaty with the new republic. One of the foremost men in securing the independence of Panama, and the treaty which authorized the United States forthwith to build the canal, was M. Philippe Bunard Varia, an eminent French engineer formerly associated with de Lesseps, and then living on the Isthmus. His services to civilization were notable, and deserve the fullest recognition. From the beginning to the end our course was straightforward, and in absolute accord with the highest standards of international morality. Criticism of it can come only from misinformation, or else from a sentimentality which represents both mental weakness and a moral twist. To have acted otherwise than I did would have been, on my part, betrayal of the interests of the United States, indifference to the interests of Panama, and recurrency to the interests of the world at large. Colombia had forfeited every claim to consideration. Indeed, this is not stating the case strongly enough. She had so acted that yielding to her would have meant, on our part, that culpable form of weakness which stands on a level with wickedness. As for me personally, if I had hesitated to act, and had not in advance discounted the clamor of those Americans who, who have made a fetish of disloyalty to their country, I should have esteemed myself as deserving a place in Dante's Inferno, beside the faint-hearted cleric who was guilty of Il Gran Rufito. The facts I have given above are mere bald statements from the record. They show that from the beginning there had been an acceptance of our right to insist on free transit, in whatever form was best, across the isthmus, and that towards the end there had been a no less universal feeling that it was our duty to the world to provide this transit in the shape of a canal. The resolution of the Pan-American Congress was practically a mandate to this effect. Colombia was then under a one-man government, a dictatorship, founded on usurpation of absolute and irresponsible power. 
she eagerly pressed us to enter into an agreement with her, as long as there was any chance of our going to the alternative route through Nicaragua. When she thought we were committed, she refused to fulfil the agreement, with the avowed hope of seizing the French company's property for nothing, and thereby holding us up. This was a bit of pure bandit morality. It would have achieved its purpose had I possessed as weak a moral fibre as those of my critics who announced that I ought to have confined my action to feeble scolding and temporising until the opportunity for action passed. I did not lift my finger to incite the revolutionists. The right simile to use is totally different. I simply ceased to stamp out the different revolutionary fuses that were already burning. When Columbia committed flagrant wrong against us, I considered it no part of my duty to aid and abet her in her wrong-doing at our expense, and also at the expense of Panama, of the French company, and of the world generally. There had been fifty years of continuous bloodshed and civil strife in Panama. Because of my action, Panama has now known ten years of such peace and prosperity as she never before saw during the four centuries of her existence. For in Panama, as in Cuba and Santo Domingo, it was the action of the American people, against the outcries of the professed apostles of peace, which alone brought peace. We gave to the people of Panama self-government, and freed them from subjection to alien oppressors. We did our best to get Colombia to let us treat her with a more than generous justice. We exercised patience to beyond the verge of proper forbearance. When we did act and recognize Panama, Colombia at once acknowledged her own guilt by promptly offering to do what we had demanded, and what she protested it was not in her power to do. But the offer came too late. What we would have gladly done before, it had by that time become impossible for us honorably to do, for it would have necessitated our abandoning the people of Panama, our friends, and turning them over to their and our foes, who would have wrecked vengeance on them precisely because they had shown friendship to us. Colombia was solely responsible for her own humiliation, and she had not then, and has not now, one shadow of claim upon us, moral or legal, all the wrong that was done was done by her. If, as representing the American people, I had not acted precisely as I did, I would have been an unfaithful or incompetent representative, and in action at that crisis would have meant not only indefinite delay in building the canal, but also practical admission on our part that we were not fit to play the part on the isthmus which we had arrogated to ourselves. I acted on my own responsibility in the Panama matter. John Hay spoke of this action as follows. The action of the President in the Panama matter is not only in the strictest accordance with the principles of justice and equity, and in line with all the best precedents of our public policy, but it was the only course he could have taken in compliance with our treaty rights and obligations. I deeply regretted, and now deeply regret, the fact that the Colombian government rendered it imperative for me to take the action I took, but I had no alternative, consistent with the full performance of my duty to my own people, and to the nations of mankind. For, be it remembered, that certain other nations, Chile, for example, will probably benefit even more by our action than will the United States itself. I am well aware that the Colombian people have many fine traits, that there is among them a circle of high-bred men and women which would reflect honour on the social life of any country, and that there has been an intellectual and literary development within this small circle which partially atones for the stagnation and illiteracy of the mass of the people, and I also know that even the illiterate mass possesses many sterling qualities." But, unfortunately, in international matters, every nation must be judged by the action of its government. The good people in Colombia apparently made no effort, certainly no successful effort, to cause the government to act with reasonable good faith towards the United States, and Colombia had to take the consequences. If Brazil, or the Argentine, or Chile had been in possession of the Isthmus, doubtless the canal would have been built under the governmental control of the nation thus controlling the Isthmus, with the hearty acquiescence of the United States, and of all other powers. But in the actual fact the canal would not have been built at all, save for the action I took. If men choose to say that it would have been better not to build it, than to build it as the result of such an action, their position, although foolish, is compatible with belief in their wrong-headed sincerity. But it is hypocrisy, alike odious and contemptible, for any man to say both that we ought to have built the canal, and that we ought not to have acted in the way we did. 
After a sufficient period of wrangling, the Senate ratified the treaty with Panama, and work on the canal was begun. The first thing that was necessary was to decide the type of canal. I summoned a board of engineering experts, foreign and native. They divided on their report. The majority of the members, including all the foreign members, approved a sea-level canal. The minority, including most of the American members, approved a lock canal. Studying these conclusions, I came to the belief that the minority was right. The two great traffic canals of the world were the Suez and the Sioux. The Suez Canal is a sea-level canal, and it was the one best known to European engineers. The Sioux Canal, through which an even greater volume of traffic passes every year, is a lock canal, and the American engineers were thoroughly familiar with it, whereas, in my judgment, the European engineers had failed to pay proper heed to the lessons taught by its operation and management. Moreover, the engineers who were to do the work at Panama all favored a lock canal. I came to the conclusion that a sea-level canal would be slightly less exposed to damage in the event of war, that the running expenses, apart from the heavy cost of interest on the amount necessary to build it, would be less, and that for small ships the time of transit would be less. But I also came to the conclusion that the lock canal, at the proposed level, would only cost about half as much to build, and would be built in half the time, with much less risk, that for large ships the transit would be quicker, and that taking into account the interest saved, the cost of maintenance would be less. Accordingly, I recommended to Congress, on February 19, 1906, that a lock canal should be built, and my recommendation was adopted. Congress insisted upon having it built by a commission of several men. I tried faithfully to get good work out of the commission, and found it quite impossible, for a many-headed commission is an extremely poor executive instrument. At last I put Colonel Goethals in as head of the commission. Then, when Congress still refused to make the commission single-headed, I solved the difficulty by an executive order of January 6, 1908, which practically accomplished the object by enlarging the powers of the chairman, making all the other members of the commission dependent upon him, and thereby placing the work under one-man control. Dr. Gorgas had already performed an inestimable service by caring for the sanitary conditions so thoroughly as to make the isthmus as safe as a health resort. Colonel Goethals proved to be the man of all others to do the job. It would be impossible to overstate what he has done. It is the greatest task of any kind that any man in the world has accomplished during the years that Colonel Goethals has been at work. It is the greatest task of its kind that has ever been performed in the world at all. Colonel Goethals has succeeded in instilling into the men under him a spirit which elsewhere has been found only in a few victorious armies. It is proper and appropriate that, like the soldiers of such armies, they should receive medals which are allotted to each man who has served for a sufficient length of time. A finer body of men has never been gathered by any nation than the men who have done the work of building the Panama Canal. The conditions under which they have lived and have done their work have been better than in any similar work ever undertaken in the tropics. They have all felt an eager pride in their work, and they have made, not only America, but the whole world their debtors by what they have accomplished. APPENDIX COLUMBIA, THE PROPOSED MESSAGE TO CONGRESS The rough draft of the message I had proposed to send Congress ran as follows. The Colombian government, through its representative here, and directly in communication with our representative at Colombia, has refused to come to any agreement with us, and has delayed action so as to make it evident that it intends to make extortionate and improper terms with us. The Ismanian Canal Bill was, of course, passed upon the assumption that whatever route was used, the benefit to the particular section of the isthmus through which it passed would be so great that the country controlling this part would be eager to facilitate the building of the canal. It is out of the question to submit to extortion on the part of a beneficiary of the scheme. All the labor, all the expense, all the risk are to be assumed by us and the skill shown by us. Those controlling the ground through which the canal is to be put are wholly incapable of building it. Yet the interest of international commerce generally and the interest of this country generally demands that the canal should be begun with no needless delay. The refusal of Colombia properly to respond to our sincere and earnest efforts to come to an agreement, 
or to pay heed to the many concessions we have made, renders it, in my judgment, necessary, that the United States should take immediate action on one of two lines. Either we should drop the Panama Canal project, and immediately begin work on the Nicaraguan Canal, or else we should purchase all the rights of the French company, and without any further parley with Colombia, enter upon the completion of the canal which the French company has begun. I feel that the latter course is the one demanded by the interests of this nation, and therefore I bring the matter to your attention for such action in the premises as you may deem wise. If in your judgment it is better not to take such action, then I shall proceed at once with the Nicaraguan Canal. The reason that I advocate the action above outlined in regard to the Panama Canal is, in the first place, the strong testimony of the experts that this route is the most feasible, and in the next place, the impropriety from an international standpoint of permitting such conduct as that to which Columbia seems to incline. The testimony of the experts is very strong, not only that the Panama route is feasible, but that in the Nicaragua route we may encounter some unpleasant surprises, and that it is far more difficult to forecast the result with any certainty as regards this latter route. As for Columbia's attitude, it is incomprehensible upon any theory of desire to see the canal built upon the basis of mutual advantage, alike to those building it and to Columbia herself. All we desire to do is to take up the work begun by the French government and to finish it. Obviously, it is Columbia's duty to help toward such a completion. We are most anxious to come to an agreement with her, in which most scrupulous care should be taken to guard her interests and ours but we cannot consent to permit her to block the performance of the work, which it is so greatly to our interest immediately to begin and carry through. Shortly after this rough draft was dictated, the Panama Revolution came, and I never thought of the rough draft again until I was accused of having instigated the revolution. This accusation is preposterous in the eyes of any one who knows the actual conditions at Panama. Only the menace of action by us in the interest of Colombia kept down revolution, as soon as Colombia's own conduct removed such menace, all check on the various revolutionary movements, there were at least three, from entirely separate sources, ceased, and then an explosion was inevitable, for the French company knew that all their property would be confiscated if Colombia put through her plans, and the entire people of Panama felt that, if in disgust with Colombia's extortions the United States turned to Nicaragua, they, the people of Panama, would be ruined." Knowing the character of those then in charge of the Colombian government, I was not surprised at their bad faith, but I was surprised at their folly. They apparently had no idea either of the power of France or the power of the United States, and expected to be permitted to commit wrong with impunity, just as Castro in Venezuela had done. The difference was that, unless we acted in self-defense, Colombia had it in her power to do a serious harm, and Venezuela did not have such power. Colombia's wrong-doing, therefore, recoiled on her own head. There was no new lesson taught. It ought already to have been known to every one that wickedness, weakness, and folly combined rarely fail to meet punishment, and that the intent to do wrong, when joined to the inability to carry the evil purpose to a successful conclusion, inevitably reacts on the wrong-doer. For the full history of the acquisition and building of the canal, see The Panama Gateway by Joseph Buckland Bishop. Scribner's Sons. Mr. Bishop has been for eight years Secretary of the Commission, and is one of the most efficient of the many efficient men to whose work on the Isthmus America owes so much. End of chapter 14of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Carafit. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter 15. The Peace of Righteousness. Part 1. There can be no nobler cause for which to work than the peace of righteousness. And high honor is due those serene and lofty souls who with wisdom and courage, 
with high idealism tempered by sane facing of the actual facts of life have striven to bring nearer the day when armed strife between nation and nation between class and class between man and man shall end throughout the world because all this is true it is also true that there are no men more ignoble or more foolish no men whose actions are fraught with greater possibility of mischief to their country and to mankind than those who exalt unrighteous peace as better than righteous war the men who have stood highest in our history as in the history of all countries are those who scorned injustice who were incapable of oppressing the weak or of permitting their country with their consent to oppress the weak but who did not hesitate to draw the sword when to leave it undrawn meant inability to arrest triumphant wrong. All this is so obvious that it ought not be necessary to repeat it. Yet every man in active affairs who also reads about the past grows by bitter experience to realize that there are plenty of men, not only among those who mean ill, but among those who mean well, who are ready enough to praise what was done in the past, and yet are incapable of profiting by it when faced by the needs of the present during our generations this seems to have been peculiarly the case among the men who have become obsessed with the idea of obtaining universal peace by some cheap patent panacea there has been a real and substantial growth in the feeling for international responsibility and justice among the great civilized nations during the past three score or four score years there has been a real growth of recognition of the fact that moral turpitude is involved in the wrong-going of one nation by another, and that in most cases war is an evil method of settling international difficulties. But as yet, there has been only a rudimentary beginning of the development of international tribunals of justice, and there has been no development at all of any international police power. Now, as I have already said, the whole fabric of municipal law, of law within each nation, rests ultimately upon the judge and the policeman, and the complete absence of the policeman, and the most complete absence of the judge in international affairs, prevents there being as yet any real homology between municipal and international law. Moreover, the questions which sometimes involve nations in war are far more difficult and complex than any questions that affect merely individuals. Almost every great nation has inherited certain questions, either with other nations or with sections of its own people, which it is quite impossible, in the present state of civilization, to decide as matters between private individuals can be decided. During the last century, at least half of the wars that have been fought have been civil and not foreign wars, there are big and powerful nations which habitually commit either upon other nations or upon sections of their own people wrongs so outrageous as to justify even the most peaceful persons in going to war there are also weak nations so utterly incompetent either to protect the rights of foreigners against their own citizens or to protect their own citizens against foreigners that it becomes a matter of sheer duty for some outside power to interfere in connection with them. As yet, in neither case is there any efficient method of getting international action, and if joint action by several powers is secured, the result is usually considerably worse than if only one power interfered. The worst infamies of modern times, such affairs as the massacres of the Armenians by the Turks, for instance, have been perpetuated in a time of nominally profound international peace, when there has been a concert of big powers to prevent the breaking of this peace, although only by breaking it could the outrages be stopped. Be it remembered that the peoples who suffered by these hideous massacres, who saw their women violated and their children tortured, were actually enjoying the benefits of, quote, disarmament, unquote. Otherwise, they would not have been massacred. For if the Jews in Russia and the Armenians in Turkey had been armed and had been efficient in the use of their arms, no mob would have meddled with them. 
Yet amiable but fatuous persons, with all these facts before their eyes, pass resolutions demanding universal arbitration for everything, and the disarmament of free civilized powers, and their abandonment of their armed forces. Or else they write well-meaning, solemn little books, or pamphlets or editorials, and articles in magazines or newspapers, to show that it is, quote, an illusion, unquote, to believe that war ever pays, because it is expensive. This is precisely like arguing that we should disband the police, and devote our sole attention to pursuing criminals, that it is, quote, an illusion, unquote, to suppose that burglary, highway robbery, and white slavery are profitable. It is almost useless to attempt to argue with these well-intentioned persons, because they are suffering under an obsession and are not open to reason. They go wrong at the outset, for they lay all the emphasis on peace and none at all on righteousness. They are not all of them physically timid men, but they are usually men of soft life, and they rarely possess a high sense of honor or keen patriotism. They rarely try to prevent their fellow countrymen from insulting or wronging the people of other nations. But they always ardently advocate that we in our turn shall tamely submit to wrong and insult from other nations. As Americans, their folly is peculiarly scandalous, because if the principles they now uphold are right, it means that it would have been better that Americans should never have achieved their independence, and better that, in 1861, they should have peacefully submitted to seeing their country split into half a dozen jangling confederacies and slavery made perpetual. If unwilling to learn from their own history, let those who think that it is, quote, an illusion, unquote, to believe that a war never benefits a nation, look at the difference between China and Japan. China has neither a fleet nor an efficient army. It is a huge civilized empire, one of the most populous on the globe, and it has been the helpless prey of outsiders because it does not possess the power to fight. Japan stands on a footing of equality with European and American nations because it does possess this power. China now sees Japan, Russia, Germany, England, and France in possession of fragments of her empire, and has twice within the lifetime of the present generation seen her capital in the hands of allied invaders, because she, in very fact, realizes the ideals of the persons who wish the United States to disarm, and then trust that our helplessness will secure us a contemptuous immunity from attack by outside nations. The chief trouble comes from the entire inability of these worthy people to understand that they are demanding things that are mutually incompatible when they demand peace at any price and also justice and righteousness. I remember one representative of their number who used to write little sonnets on behalf of the Mahdi and the Sudanese. These sonnets setting forth the need that the Sudan should be both independent and peaceful. As a matter of fact, the Sudan valued independence only because it desired to war against all Christians and to carry out an unlimited slave trade. It was, quote, independent, unquote, under the Mahdi for a dozen years, and during those dozen years the bigotry, tyranny, and cruel religious intolerance were such as flourished in the seventh century, and in spite of systematic slave raids, the population decreased by nearly two-thirds, and practically all the children died. Peace came, well-being came, freedom from rape and murder and torture and highway robbery and every brutal gratification of lust and greed came only when the Sudan lost its independence and passed under English rule. Yet this well-meaning little sonneteer sincerely felt that his verses were issued in the cause of humanity. Looking back from the vantage point of a score of years, Probably everyone will agree that he was an absurd person, but he was not one whit more absurd than most of the more prominent persons who advocate disarmament by the United States, the cessation of upbuilding the Navy, and the promise to agree to arbitrate all matters, including those affecting our national interests and honor with all foreign nations. These persons would do no harm if they affected only themselves. 
Many of them are, in the ordinary relations of life, good citizens. They are exactly like the other good citizens who believe that enforced universal vegetarianism or anti-vaccination is the panacea for all ills. But in their particular case, they are able to do harm because they affect our relations with foreign powers, so that other men pay the debt which they themselves have really incurred. It is the foolish peace at any price persons who try to persuade our people to make unwise and improper treaties or to stop building up the navy. But if trouble comes and the treaties are repudiated or there is a demand for armed intervention, it is not these people who will pay anything. They will stay at home in safety and leave brave men to pay in blood and honest men to pay in shame for their folly. The trouble is that our policy is apt to go in zigzags because different sections of our people exercise at different times unequal pressure on our government. One class of our citizens clamors for treaties impossible of fulfillment and improper to fulfill. Another class has no objection to the passage of these treaties so long as there is no concrete case to which they apply but instantly oppose a veto on their application when any concrete case does actually arise. One of our cardinal doctrines is freedom of speech, which means freedom of speech about foreigners as well as about ourselves. And insomuch as we exercise this right, with complete absence of restraint, we cannot expect other nations to hold us harmless unless in the last resort we are able to make our own words good by our deeds. One class of our citizens indulges in gushing promises to do everything for foreigners. Another class offensively and improperly reviles them. And it is hard to say which class more thoroughly misrepresents the sober, self-respecting judgment of the American people as a whole. The only safe rule is to promise little and faithfully to keep every promise, to speak softly, and carry a big stick. A prime need for our nation, as of course for every other nation, is to make up its mind definitely what it wishes, and not to try to pursue paths of conduct incompatible with the other. If this nation is content to be the China of the New World, then and only then, can it afford to do away with the navy and the army. If it is content to abandon Hawaii and the Panama Canal, to cease to talk of the Monroe Doctrine and to admit the right of any European or Asiatic power to dictate what immigrants shall be sent to and received in America, and whether or not they shall be allowed to become citizens and hold land, why of course if America is content to have nothing to say on any of these matters and to keep silent in the presence of armed outsiders, then it can abandon its navy and agree to arbitrate all questions of all kinds with every foreign power. In such event, it can afford to pass its spare time in one continuous round of universal peace celebrations and of smug self-satisfaction and having earned the derision of all the virile peoples of mankind, those who advocate such a policy do not occupy a lofty position, but at least their position is understandable. It is entirely inexcusable, however, to try to combine the unready hand with the unbridled tongue. It is folly to permit freedom of speech about foreigners as well as ourselves, and the peace at any price persons are much too feeble a folk to try to interfere with freedom of speech and yet try to shirk the consequences of freedom of speech. It is folly to try to abolish our navy and at the same time to insist that we have a right to enforce the Monroe Doctrine, that we have the right to control the Panama Canal which we ourselves dug, that we have a right to retain Hawaii and prevent nations from taking Cuba and a right to determine what immigrants, Asiatic or European, shall come to our shores, and the terms on which they shall be naturalized, 
and shall hold land and exercise other privileges. We are a rich people and an unmilitary people. In international affairs, we are a short-sighted people. But I know my countrymen. Down at bottom, their temper is such that they will not permanently tolerate injustice done to them. In the long run, they will no more permit affronts to their national honor than injuries to their national interests. Such being the case, they will do well to remember that the surest of all ways to invite disaster is to be opulent, aggressive, and unarmed. Throughout the seven and a half years that I was president, I pursued without faltering one consistent foreign policy, a policy of genuine international goodwill and of consideration for the rights of others, and at the same time of steady preparedness. The weakest nations knew that they, no less than the strongest, were safe from insolent and injury at our hands, and the strong and the weak alike also knew that we possessed both the will and the ability to guard ourselves from wrong or insult at the hands of any one. It was under my administration that the Hague Court was saved from becoming an empty farce. It had been established by joint international agreement, but no power had been willing to resort to it. Those establishing it had grown to realize that it was in danger of becoming a mere paper court, so that it would never really come into being at all. Monsieur de Estronales de Constant had been especially alive to this danger. By correspondence and in personal interviews, he impressed upon me the need not only of making advances by actually applying arbitration, not merely promising by treaty to apply it, to the questions that were up for settlement, but of using the Hague Tribunal for this purpose. I cordially sympathized with these views. On the recommendation of John Hay, I succeeded in getting an agreement with Mexico to lay a matter in dispute between the two republics before the Hague Court. This was the first case ever brought before the Hague Court. It was followed by numerous others, and it definitely established that court as the great international peace tribunal. By mutual agreement with Great Britain, through the decision of a joint commission, of which the American members were Senators Lodge and Turner and Secretary Root, we were able peacefully to settle the Alaska boundary question, the only question remaining between ourselves and the British Empire, which it was not possible to settle by friendly arbitration. This, therefore, represented the removal of the last obstacle to absolute agreement between the two peoples. We were of substantial service in bringing to a satisfactory conclusion the negotiations at Algeciras concerning Morocco. We concluded with Great Britain, and with most of the other great nations, arbitration treaties specifically agreeing to arbitrate all matters and especially the interpretation of treaties save only as regards questions affecting territorial integrity, national honor, and vital national interests. We made with Great Britain a treaty guaranteeing the free use of the Panama Canal on equal terms with the ships of all nations, while reserving to ourselves the right to police and fortify the canal, and therefore to control it in the time of war. Under this treaty, we are in honor bound to arbitrate the question of canal tolls for coastwise traffic between the western and eastern coasts of the United States. I believe that the American position as regards this matter is right. I also believe that under the arbitration treaty, we are in honor bound to submit the matter to arbitration in view of Great Britain's contention, although I hold it to be an unwise contention that our position is unsound. I empathetically disbelieve in making universal arbitration treaties which neither the makers nor anyone else would for a moment dream of keeping. I no less emphatically insist that it is our duty to keep the limited and sensible arbitration treaties which we have already made. The importance of a promise lies not in making it, but in keeping it. And the poorest of all positions for a nation to occupy in such a matter is readiness to make impossible promises at the same time that there is a failure to keep promises which have been made, which can be kept, and which it is discreditable 
to break. During the early part of the year 1905, the strain on the civilized world caused by the Russo-Japanese War became serious. The losses of life and of treasure were frightful. From all the sources of information at hand, I grew most strongly to believe that a further continuation of the struggle would be a very bad thing for Japan, and an even worse thing for Russia. Japan was already suffering terribly from the drain upon her men, and especially upon her resources, and had nothing further to gain from the continuance of the struggle. Its continuance to her meant more loss than gain, even if she were victorious. Russia, in spite of her gigantic strength, was, in my judgment, apt to lose even more than she had already lost, if the struggle continued. I deemed it probable that she would no more be able successfully to defend eastern Siberia and northern Manchuria than she had been able to defend southern Manchuria and Korea. If the war went on, I thought it on the whole, likely that Russia would be driven west of Lake Baikal. But it was very far from certain. There is no certainty in such a war. Japan might have met defeat, and defeat to her would have spelt overwhelming disaster. And even if she had continued to win, what she thus won would have been of no value to her, and the cost in blood and money would have left her drained white. I believed, therefore, that the time had come when it was greatly to the interest of both combatants to have peace, and when, therefore, it was possible to get both to agree to peace. I first satisfied myself that each side wished me to act but that, naturally and properly, each side was exceedingly anxious that the other should not believe that the action was taken on its initiative. I then sent an identical note to the two powers proposing that they should meet through the representatives to see if peace could not be made directly between them, and offered to act as an intermediary in bringing about such a meeting, but not for any other purpose. Each ascended to my proposal in principle. There was difficulty in getting them to agree on a common meeting place, but each finally abandoned its original contention in the matter, and the representatives of the two nations finally met at Portsmouth in New Hampshire. I previously received the two delegations at Oyster Bay on the USS Mayflower, which together with another naval vessel I put at their disposal on behalf of the United States government to take them from Oyster Bay to Portsmouth. As is customary, but both unwise and undesirable in such cases, each side advanced claims that the other could not grant. The chief difficulty came because of Japan's demand for a money indemnity. I felt that it would be better for Russia to pay some indemnity than to go on with the war, for there was little chance, in my judgment, of the war turning out favorably for Russia and the revolutionary movement already under way bade fair to overthrow the negotiations entirely. I advised the Russian government to this effect, at the same time urging them to abandon their pretensions on certain other points, notably concerning the southern half of the Segalian which the Japanese had taken. I also, however, and equally strongly, advised the Japanese that in my judgment it would have been the gravest mistake on their part to insist on continuing the war for the sake of a money indemnity. And the longer the war continued, the less able she would be to pay. I pointed out that there was no possible analogy between their case and that of Germany in the war with France, which they were fond of quoting. The Germans held Paris and half of France, and gave up much territory in lieu of the indemnity, whereas the Japanese were still many thousands miles from Moscow, and had no territory whatever which they wished to give up. I also pointed out that in my judgment, whereas the Japanese had enjoyed the sympathy of most of the civilized powers at the outset of and during the continuance of the war, they would forfeit it if they turned the war into one merely for getting money, and moreover, they would most certainly fail to get the money, and would simply find themselves at the end of a year, even if things prospered with them, in possession of territory they did not want, having spent enormous additional sums of money, and lost enormous additional numbers of men, and yet without a penny of remuneration. The Treaty of Peace, 
was finally signed. As is inevitable under such circumstances, each side felt that it ought to have got better terms. And when the danger was well past, each side felt that it had been overreached by the other, and that if the war had gone on it would have gotten more than it actually did get. The Japanese government had been wise throughout, except in the matter of announcing that it would insist on a money indemnity. Neither in national nor in private affairs is it ordinarily advisable to make a bluff which cannot be put through personally. I never believe in doing it under any circumstances. The Japanese people had been misled by this bluff of their government, and the unwisdom of the government's action in the matter was shown by the great resentment the treaty aroused in Japan. Although it was so beneficial to Japan, there were various mob outbreaks, especially in the Japanese cities. The police were roughly handled, and several Christian churches were burned, as reported to me by the American minister. In both Russia and Japan, I believe that the net result, as regards myself, was a feeling of injury, and of dislike of me among the people at large. I had expected this. I regarded it as entirely neutral, and I did not resent it in the least. The governments of both nations behaved towards me not only with correct and entire propriety, but with much courtesy and the fullest acknowledgment of the good effect of what I had done. And in Japan, at least, I believe that the leading men sincerely felt I had been their friend. I had certainly tried my best to be the friend not only of the Japanese people, but of the Russian people, and I believe that what I did was for the best interests of both and of the world at large. During the course of the negotiations, I tried to enlist the aid of the governments of one nation which was friendly to Russia, and of another nation which was friendly to Japan, in helping to bring about peace. I got no aid from either. I did, however, receive aid from the Emperor of Germany. His ambassador at St. Petersburg was the one ambassador who helped the American ambassador, Mr. Meyer, at delicate and doubtful points of the negotiations. Mr. Meyer, who was with the exception of Mr. White, the most useful diplomat in the American service, rendered literally invaluable aid by insisting upon himself seeing the Tsar at critical periods of the transaction, when it was no longer possible for me to act successfully through the representatives of the Tsar, who were often at cross-purposes with one another. As a result of the Portsmouth Peace, I was given the Nobel Peace Prize. This consisted of a medal, which I kept, and a sum of forty thousand dollars, which I turned over as a foundation of industrial peace to a board of trustees, which included Oscar Strauss, Seth Lowe, and John Mitchell. In the present state of the world's development, industrial peace is even more essential than international peace, and it was fitting and appropriate to devote the Peace Prize to such a purpose. In 1910, while in Europe, one of my most pleasant experiences was my visit to Norway, where I addressed the Nobel Committee, and set forth in full the principles upon which I had acted, not only in this particular case, but throughout my administration. I received another gift, which I deeply appreciated an original copy of Sully's Memoirs of Henry Legrand, sent me with the following inscription. I translate it roughly. Paris, January 1906. The undersigned members of the French Parliamentary Group of International Arbitration and Consolation have decided to tender President Roosevelt a token of their high esteem and their sympathetic recognition of the persistent and decisive initiative he has taken towards gradually substituting friendly and judicial for violent methods in case of conflict between nations. They believe that the action of President Roosevelt, which has realized the most generous hopes to be found in history, should be classified as a continuance of similar illustrious attempts of former times. Notably, the project for international concord known under the name of the great design of Henry the Fourth, 
and the memoirs of his prime minister, the Duke de Sully. In consequence, they have sought out a copy of the first edition of these memoirs, and they take pleasure in offering it to him with the request that he will keep it among his family papers. The signatures include those of Emily Loubet, A. Carnot, D. Estronales, D. Constant, Astride Briand, Sully Prodhomme, Jan Yores, A. Falires, R. Poincare, and two or three hundred others. Of course, what I had done in connection with the Portsmouth piece was misunderstood by some good and sincere people, just as after the settlement of the coal strike there were persons who thereupon thought that it was in my power and was in my duty to settle all other strikes. So after the peace of Portsmouth there were other persons, not only Americans, by the way, who thought it my duty forthwith to make myself a kind of international meddlesome matty, and interfere for peace and justice promiscuously over the world. Others, with a delightful non-sequitur, jumped to the conclusion that insomuch as I had helped to bring about a beneficent and necessary peace, I must of necessity have changed my mind about war being ever necessary. A couple of days after peace was concluded, I wrote to a friend, quote, Don't you be misled by the fact that just at the moment men are speaking well of me. They will speak ill soon enough. As Loeb remarked to me today, sometime soon I shall have to spank some little international brigand, and then all the well-meaning idiots will turn and shriek that this is inconsistent with what I did at the peace conference, whereas in reality it will be exactly in line with it. End quote. To one of my political opponents, Mr. Schertz, who wrote me congratulating me upon the outcome at Portsmouth and suggesting that the time was opportune for a move towards disarmament, I answered in a letter setting forth views which I thought sound then and think sound now. The letter read as follows. Oyster Bay, New York, September 8, 1905. My dear Mr. Schertz, I thank you for your congratulations. As to what you say about disarmament, which I suppose is the rough equivalent of, quote, the gradual diminution of the oppressive burdens opposed upon the world by armed peace, unquote, I am not clear either as to what can be done or what ought to be done. If I had been known as one of the conventional type of peace advocates, I could have done nothing whatever in bringing about peace now. I would be powerless in the future to accomplish anything, and I would not have been able to help counter the boons upon Cuba, the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and Panama brought about by our action therein. If the Japanese had not armed during the last twenty years, this would indeed be a sorrowful century for Japan. If this country had not fought the Spanish War, if we had failed to take the action we did about Panama, all mankind would have been the loser. While the Turks were butchering the Armenians, the European powers kept the peace, and thereby added a burden of infamy to the nineteenth century, for in keeping that peace, a greater number of lives were lost than in any European war since the days of Napoleon, and these lives were those of women and children as well as of men while the moral degradation, the brutality inflicted and endured, the aggregate of hideous wrong done surpassed that of any war which we have record in modern times. Until people get it firmly fixed in their minds that peace is valuable chiefly as a means to righteousness, and that it can only be considered as an end when it also coincides with righteousness, we can do only a limited amount to advance its coming on this earth. There is, of course, no analogy at present between international law and private or municipal law, because there is no sanction of force for the former, while there is for the latter. Inside our own nation, 
The law-abiding man does not have to arm himself against the lawless, simply because there is some armed force, the police, the sheriff's posse, the National Guard, the regulars, which can be called out to enforce the laws. At present, there is no similar international force to call on, and I do not as yet see how it could at present be created. Hitherto, peace has often come only because some strong and on the whole just power has by armed force or the threat of armed force put a stop to disorder. In a very interesting French book the other day, I was reading how the Mediterranean was freed from pirates only by the Pax Britannica, established by England's naval force. The hopeless and hideous bloodshed and wickedness of Algiers and Turkestan was stopped, and could only be stopped when civilized nations in the shape of Russia and France took possession of them. The same was true of Burma and the Malay states, as well as Egypt. With regard to England, peace has come only as the sequel to armed interference of a civilized power, which relatively to its opponent was a just and beneficent power. If England had disarmed to the point of being unable to conquer the Sudan and protect Egypt, so that the Matists had established their supremacy in northeastern Africa, the result would have been a horrible and bloody calamity to mankind. It was only the growth of the European powers and military efficiency that freed Eastern Europe from the dreadful scourge of the Tartar and partially freed it from the dreadful scourge of the Turk. Unjust war is dreadful. A just war may be the highest duty. To have the best nations, the free and civilized nations, disarm and leave the despotisms and barbarisms with great military force would be a calamity compared to which the calamities caused by all the wars of the 19th century would be trivial. Yet it is not easy to see how we can by international agreement state exactly which power ceases to be free and civilized and which comes near the line of barbarism or despotism. For example, I suppose it would be very difficult to get Russia and Japan to come to a common agreement on this point, and there are at least some citizens of other nations, not to speak of their governments, whom it would also be hard to get together. This does not in the least mean that it is hopeless to make the effort. It may be that some scheme will be developed. America, fortunately, can cordially assist in such an effort, for no one in his senses would suggest our disarmament. And though we should continue to perfect our small navy and our minute army, I do not think it necessary to increase the number of our ships, at any rate as things look now, nor the number of our soldiers. Of course our navy must be kept up to the highest point of efficiency, and the replacing of old and worthless vessels by first-class new ones may involve an increase in the personnel, but not enough to interfere with our action along the lines you have suggested. But before I would know how to advocate such action, save in some such way as commending it to the attention of the Hague Tribunal, I would have to have a feasible and rational plan of action presented. It seems to me that a general stop in the increase of the war navies of the world might be a good thing, but I would not like to speak too positively offhand. Of course, it is only in continental Europe that the armies are too large, and before advocating action as regards them, I should have to weigh matters carefully, including, by the way, such a matter as the Turkish army. At any rate, nothing useful can be done unless with the clear recognition that we object to putting peace second to righteousness. Sincerely yours, Theodore Roosevelt. Honorable Carl Schurz, Bolton Landing, Lake George, New York. End of Chapter 15, Part 1 Recording by Stephen Carafit in Montezuma, Ohio, www.carafitfarms.com.
Chapter 15, Part 2 of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cameron Conaway. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. Chapter 15, The Peace of Righteousness, Part 2. In my own judgment, the most important service that I rendered to peace was the voyage of the battle fleet round the world. I had become convinced that for many reasons it was essential that we should have it clearly understood, by our own people especially, but also by other peoples, that the Pacific was as much our home waters as the Atlantic, and that our fleet could and would at will pass from one to the other of the two great oceans. It seemed to me evident that such a voyage would greatly benefit the Navy itself, would arouse popular interest in and enthusiasm for the Navy, and would make foreign nations accept as a matter of course that our fleet should from time to time be gathered in the Pacific, just as from time to time it was gathered in the Atlantic, and that its presence in one ocean was no more to be accepted as a mark of hostility to any Asiatic power then its presence in the Atlantic was to be accepted as a mark of hostility to any European power. I determined on the move without consulting the cabinet, precisely as I took Panama without consulting the cabinet. A council of war never fights, and in a crisis the duty of a leader is to lead, and not to take refuge behind the generally timid wisdom of a multitude of counselors. At that time, as I happen to know, Neither the English nor the German authorities believed it possible to take a fleet of great battleships round the world. They did not believe that their own fleets could perform the feat, and still less did they believe that the American fleet could. I made up my mind that it was time to have a showdown in the matter, because if it was really true that our fleet could not get from the Atlantic to the Pacific, it was much better to know it and be able to shape our policy in view of the knowledge. Many persons publicly and privately protested against the move on the ground that Japan would accept it as a threat. To this I answered nothing in public. In private I said that I did not believe Japan would so regard it, because Japan knew my sincere friendship and admiration for her, and realized that we could not as a nation have any intention of attacking her, and that if there were any such feeling on the part of Japan, as was alleged, that very fact rendered it imperative that that fleet should go. When in the spring of 1910 I was in Europe, I was interested to find that high naval authorities in both Germany and Italy had expected that war would come at the time of the voyage. They asked me if I had not been afraid of it, and if I had not expected that hostilities would begin at least by the time that the fleet reached the Straits of Magellan. I answered that I did not expect it, that I believed that Japan would feel as friendly in the matter as we did, but that if my expectations had proved mistaken, it would have been proof positive that we were going to be attacked anyhow, and that in such an event it would have been an enormous gain to have had the three months preliminary preparation which enabled the fleet to start perfectly equipped. In a personal interview before they left, I had explained to the officers in command that I believed the trip would be one of absolute peace, but that they were to take exactly the same precautions against sudden attack of any kind, as if we were at war with all the nations of the earth, and that no excuse of any kind would be accepted if there were a sudden attack of any kind and we were taken unawares. My prime purpose was to impress the American people, and this purpose was fully achieved. The crews did make a very deep impression abroad, Boasting about what we have done does not impress foreign nations at all, except unfavorably, but positive achievement does. And the two American achievements that really impressed foreign peoples during the first dozen years of this century were the digging of the Panama Canal and the cruise of the battle fleet round the world. But the impression made on our own people was of far greater consequence. No single thing in the history of the new United States Navy has done as much to stimulate popular interest and belief in it as the world cruise. This effect was forecast in a well-informed and friendly English periodical 
The London Spectator. Writing in October 1907, a month before the fleet sailed from Hampton Roads, the Spectator said, All over America, the people will follow the movements of the fleet. They will learn something of the intricate details of the cooling and commissariat work under warlike conditions. And in a word, their attention will be aroused. Next time Mr. Roosevelt or his representatives appeal to the country for new battleships, they will do so to people whose minds have been influenced one way or the other. The naval program will not have stood still. We are sure that, apart from increasing the efficiency of the existing fleet, this is the aim which Mr. Roosevelt had in mind. He has a policy which projects itself far into the future, but it is an entire misreading of it to suppose that it is aimed narrowly and definitely, at any single power. I first directed the fleet of 16 battleships to go round through the Straits of Magellan to San Francisco. From thence, I ordered them to New Zealand and Australia, then to the Philippines, China, and Japan, and home through Suez. They stopped in the Mediterranean to help the sufferers from the earthquake at Messina, by the way, and did this work as effectively as they had done all their other work. Admiral Evans commanded the fleet to San Francisco. There, Admiral Sperry took it. Admirals Thomas, Wainwright, and Schroeder rendered distinguished service under Evans and Sperry. The cooling and other preparations were made in such excellent shape by the department that there was never a hitch, not so much as the delay of an hour, in keeping every appointment made. All the repairs were made without difficulty. The ship concerned merely falling out of column for a few hours and when the job was done steaming at speed until she regained her position. Not a ship was left in any port, and there was hardly a desertion. As soon as it was known that the voyage was to be undertaken, men crowded to enlist, just as freely from the Mississippi Valley as from the seaboard, and for the first time since the Spanish War the ships put to sea overmanned, and by a stalwart a set of men-of-war's men as ever looked through a porthole, game for a fight or a frolic, but withal so self-respecting and with such a sense of responsibility that in all the ports in which they landed their conduct was exemplary. The fleet practiced incessantly during the voyage, both with the guns and in battle tactics, and came home a much more efficient fighting instrument than when it started sixteen months before. The best men of command rank in our own service were confident that the fleet would go round in safety, in spite of the incredulity of foreign critics. Even they, however, did not believe that it was wise to send the torpedo craft around. I accordingly acquiesced in their views, as it did not occur to me to consult the lieutenants. But shortly before the fleet started, I went in the government yacht, Mayflower, to inspect the target practice off Provincetown. I was accompanied by two torpedo boat destroyers, in charge of a couple of naval lieutenants, thorough gamecocks, and I had the two lieutenants aboard to dine one evening. Towards the end of the dinner, they could not refrain from asking if the torpedo flotilla was to go round with the big ships. I told them no, that the admirals and captains did not believe that the torpedo boats could stand it and believed that the officers and crews aboard the cockle shells would be worn out by the constant pitching and bouncing and the everlasting need to make repairs. My two guests chorused an eager assurance that the boats could stand it. They assured me that the enlisted men were even more anxious to go than were the officers, mentioning that on one of their boats the terms of enlistment of most of the crew were out, and the men were waiting to see whether or not to re-enlist as they did not care to do so unless the boats were to go on the cruise. I answered that I was only too glad to accept the word of the men who were to do the job, and that they should certainly go, and within half an hour I sent out the order for the flotilla to be got ready. It went round in fine shape, not a boat being laid up. I felt that the feat reflected even more credit upon the Navy than did the circumnavigation of the big ships, and I wrote the flotilla commander the following letter. May 18th, 1908. My dear Captain Cohn, A great deal of attention has been paid to the feet of our battleship fleet in encircling South America and getting to San Francisco, and it would be hard too highly to compliment the officers and enlisted men of that fleet for what they have done. 
Yet if I should draw any distinction at all, it would be in favor of you and your associates who have taken out the torpedo flotilla. Yours was an even more notable feat, and every officer and every enlisted man in the torpedo boat flotilla has the right to feel that he has rendered distinguished service to the United States Navy, and therefore to the people of the United States. And I wish I could thank each of them personally. Will you have this letter read by the commanding officer of each torpedo boat to his officers and crew? Sincerely yours, Theodore Roosevelt. Lieutenant Commander Hutch I. Cohn, USN, Commanding, 2nd Torpedo, Flotilla, Care Master, San Francisco Cal. There were various amusing features connected with the trip. Most of the wealthy people and leaders of opinion in the eastern cities were panic-struck at the proposal to take the fleet away from Atlantic waters. The great New York dailies issued frantic appeals to Congress to stop the fleet from going. The head of the Senate Committee on Naval Affairs announced that the fleet should not and could not go because Congress would refuse to appropriate the money, he being from an eastern seaboard state. However, I announced in response that I had enough money to take the fleet around to the Pacific anyhow, that the fleet would certainly go, and that if Congress did not choose to appropriate enough money to get the fleet back, why, it would stay in the Pacific. There was no further difficulty about the money. It was not originally my intention that the fleet should visit Australia, but the Australian government sent a most cordial invitation, which I gladly accepted, for I have, as every American ought to have, a hearty admiration for and fellow feeling with Australia and I believe that America should be ready to stand back of Australia in any serious emergency. The reception accorded the fleet in Australia was wonderful, and it showed the fundamental community of feeling between ourselves and the great commonwealth of the South Seas. The considerate, generous, and open-handed hospitality with which the entire Australian people treated our officers and men could not have been surpassed had they been our own countrymen. The fleet first visited Sydney, which has a singularly beautiful harbor. The day after the arrival, one of our captains noticed a member of his crew trying to go to sleep on a bench in the park. He had fixed above his head a large paper with some lines evidently designed to forestall any questions from friendly would-be hosts. I am delighted with the Australian people. I think your harbor the finest in the world. I am very tired and would like to go to sleep. The most noteworthy incident of the cruise was the reception given to our fleet in Japan. In courtesy and good breeding, the Japanese can certainly teach much to the nations of the Western world. I had been very sure that the people of Japan would understand aright what the cruise meant, and would accept the visit of our fleet as the signal honor which it was meant to be, a proof of the high regard and friendship I felt, and which I was certain the American people felt, for the great island empire. The event even surpassed my expectations. I cannot too strongly express my appreciation of the generous courtesy the Japanese showed the officers and crews of our fleet, and I may add that every man of them came back a friend and admirer of the Japanese. Admiral Sperry wrote me a letter of much interest, dealing not only with the reception in Tokyo, but with the work of our men at sea. I herewith give it almost in full. 28 October 1908 Dear Mr. Roosevelt, My official report of the visit to Japan goes forward in this mail, but there are certain aspects of the affair so successfully concluded which cannot well be included in the report. You are perhaps aware that Mr. Dennison of the Japanese Foreign Office was one of my colleagues at The Hague, for whom I have very high regard. Desiring to avoid every possibility of trouble or misunderstanding, I wrote to him last June explaining fully the character of our men which they have so well lived up to, the desirability of ample landing places, guides, rest houses, and places for changing money in order that there might be no delay in getting the men away from the docks on the excursions in which they delight. Very few of them go into a drinking place, except to get a resting place not to be found elsewhere, paying for it by taking a drink. I also explained our system of landing with liberty men, an unarmed patrol, properly officered, to quietly take in charge and send off to their ships any man who showed the slightest trace of disorderly conduct. This letter he showed to the Minister of the Navy, who highly approved of all our arrangements, including the patrol, of which I feared they might be jealous. Mr. Dennison's reply reached me in Manila, 
with a memorandum from the Minister of the Navy which removed all doubts. Three temporary piers were built for our boat landings, each 300 feet long, brilliantly lighted and decorated. The sleeping accommodations did not permit two or three thousand sailors to remain on shore, but the ample landings permitted them to be handled night and day with perfect order and safety. At the landings and railroad station in Yokohama, there were rest houses or booths, reputable money changers, and as many as a thousand English-speaking Japanese college students acted as volunteer guides, besides Japanese sailors and petty officers detailed for the purpose. In Tokyo, there were a great many excellent refreshment places where the men got excellent meals and could rest, smoke, and write letters, and in none of these places would they allow the men to pay anything, though they were more than ready to do so. The arrangements were marvelously perfect. As soon as your telegram of October 18, giving the address to be made to the emperor, was received, I gave copies of it to our ambassador to be sent to the foreign office. It seems that the emperor had already prepared a very cordial address to be forwarded through me to you, after delivery at the audience, but your telegram reversed the situation and his reply was prepared. I am convinced that your kind and courteous initiative on this occasion helped cause the pleasant feeling which was so obvious in the Emperor's bearing at the luncheon which followed the audience. X, who is reticent and conservative, told me that not only the Emperor but all the ministers were profoundly gratified by the course of events. I am confident that not even the most trifling incident has taken place which could in any way mar the general satisfaction, and our ambassador has expressed to me his great satisfaction with all that has taken place. Owing to heavy weather encountered on the passage up from Manila, the fleet was obliged to take about 3,500 tons of coal. The Yankton remained behind to keep up communication for a few days, and yesterday she transmitted the Emperor's telegram to you which was sent in reply to your message through our ambassador after the sailing of the fleet. It must be profoundly gratifying to you to have the mission on which you sent the fleet terminate so happily, and I am profoundly thankful that, owing to the confidence which you displayed in giving me this command, my active career draws to a close with such honorable distinction. As for the effect of the cruise upon the training, discipline, and effectiveness of the fleet, the good cannot be exaggerated. It is a war game in every detail. The wireless communication has been maintained with an efficiency hitherto unheard of. Between Honolulu and Auckland, 3,850 miles, we were out of communication with a cable station for only one night, whereas three non-American men of war trying recently to maintain a chain of only 1,250 miles between Auckland and Sydney were only able to do so for a few hours. The officers and men, as soon as we put to sea, turn to their gunnery and tactical work far more eagerly than they go to functions. Every morning, certain ships leave the column and move off seven or 8,000 yards as targets for range measuring, fire control, and battery practice for the others. And at night, certain ships do the same thing for night battery practice. I am sorry to say that this practice is unsatisfactory, and in some points misleading, owing to the fact that the ships are painted white. At Portland, in 1903, I saw Admiral Barker's white battleships under the searchlights of the enemy at a distance of 14,000 yards, seven sea miles, without glasses, while the Hartford, a black ship, was never discovered at all, though she passed within a mile and a half. I have for years, while a member of the general board, advocated painting the ship's war color at all times, and by this mail I am asking the department to make the necessary change in the regulations and paint the ships properly. I do not know that anyone now dissents from my view. Admiral Wainwright strongly concurs, and the War College Conference recommended it year after year without a dissenting voice. In the afternoons, the fleet has two or three hours practice at battle maneuvers, which excite as keen interest as gunnery exercises. The competition in coal economy goes on automatically and reacts in a hundred ways. It has reduced the waste and the use of electrical light and water and certain chief engineers are said to keep men ranging over the ships all night, turning out every light not in actual and immediate use. Perhaps the most important effect is the keen hunt for defects in the machinery causing waste of power. The Yankton, by resetting valves, increased her speed from 10 to 11.5 knots on the same expenditure. All this has been done, but the field is widening. The work has only begun. C.S. Sperry 
When I left the presidency, I finished seven and a half years of administration, during which not one shot had been fired against a foreign foe. We were at absolute peace, and there was no nation in the world with whom a war cloud threatened, no nation in the world whom we had wronged, or from whom we had anything to fear. The cruise of the battle fleet was not the least of the causes which ensured so peaceful an outlook. When the fleet returned after its 16 months voyage around the world, I went down to Hampton Roads to greet it. The day was Washington's birthday, February 22, 1907, literally on the minute the homing battlecraft came into view. On the flagship of the Admiral, I spoke to the officers and enlisted men as follows. Admiral Sperry, officers, and men of the battle fleet. Over a year has passed since you steamed out of this harbor, and over the world's rim. And this morning the hearts of all who saw you thrilled with pride as the holes of the mighty warships lifted above the horizon. You have been in the northern and the southern hemispheres. Four times you have crossed the line. You have steamed through all the great oceans. You have touched the coast of every continent. Ever your general course has been westward. And now you come back to the port from which you set sail. This is the first battle fleet that has ever circumnavigated the globe. Those who perform the feat again can but follow in your footsteps. The little torpedo flotilla went with you around South America, through the Straits of Magellan, to our own Pacific coast. The armored cruiser squadron met you, and left you again, when you were halfway round the world. You have falsified every prediction of the prophets of failure. In all your long cruise, not an accident worthy of mention has happened to a single battleship, nor yet to the cruisers or torpedo boats. You left this coast in a high state of battle efficiency, and you return with your efficiency increased, better prepared than when you left, not only in personal, but even in material. During your world cruise, you have taken your regular gunnery practice, and skilled though you were before with the guns, you have grown more skillful still and through practice you have improved in battle tactics, though here there is more room for improvement than in your gunnery. Incidentally, I suppose I need hardly say that one measure of your fitness must be your clear recognition of the need always steadily to strive to render yourselves more fit. If ever you grow to think that you are fit enough, you can make up your minds that from that moment you will begin to go backward. As a war machine, the fleet comes back in better shape than it went out. In addition, you, the officers and men of this formidable fighting force, have shown yourselves the best of all possible ambassadors and heralds of peace. Wherever you have landed, you have borne yourself so as to make us at home proud of being your countrymen. You have shown that the best type of fighting man of the sea knows how to appear to the utmost possible advantage when his business is to behave himself on shore and to make a good impression in a foreign land. We are proud of all the ships and all the men in this whole fleet, and we welcome you home to the country whose good repute among nations has been raised by what you have done. End of chapter 15 Recording by Cameron Conaway Appendix A, Part 1 of The Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Appendix A. The Trust, the People, and the Square Deal, Part I. Written when Mr. Taft's administration brought suit to dissolve the Steel Corporation, one of the grounds for the suit being the acquisition by the Corporation of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, this action was taken with my acquiescence while I was President, and while Mr. Taft was a member of my Cabinet. At the time he never protested against, and as far as I knew approved of my action in this case, as in the Harvester Trust case, and all similar cases. The suit against the Steel Trust by the Government has brought vividly before our people the need of reducing to order our chaotic Government policy as regards business. As President, in messages to Congress, I repeatedly called the attention of that body, and to the public, to the inadequacy of the anti-trust law by itself to meet business conditions, and secure justice to the people, and to the further fact that it might, if left unsupplemented by additional legislation, work mischief, with no compensating advantage. 
and I urged as strongly as I knew how, that the policy followed with relation to railways in connection with the interstate commerce law should be followed by the national government as regards all great business concerns, and therefore that, as a first step, the powers of the Bureau of Corporations should be greatly enlarged, or else that there should be created a governmental board or commission, with powers somewhat similar to those of the Interstate Commerce Commission, but covering the whole field of interstate business, exclusive of transportation, which should by law be kept wholly separate from ordinary industrial business, all common ownership of the industry and the railway being forbidden. In the end, I have always believed that it would also be necessary to give the national government complete power over the organization and capitalization of all business concerns engaged in interstate commerce. A member of my cabinet with whom, even more than with the various attorney generals, I went over every detail of the trust situation, was the one-time Secretary of the Interior, Mr. James R. Garfield. He writes me as follows concerning the suit against the Steel Corporation. Nothing appeared before the House Committee that made me believe we were deceived by Judge Gary. This, I think, is a case that shows clearly the difference between destructive litigation and constructive legislation. I have not yet seen a full copy of the government's petition, but our papers give nothing that indicates any kind of unfair or dishonest competition such as existed in both the Standard Oil and Tobacco cases. As I understand it, the competitors of the steel company have steadily increased in strength during the last six or seven years. Furthermore, the percent of the business done by the steel corporation has decreased during that time. As you will remember, at our first conference with Judge Gary, the judge stated that it was the desire and purpose of the company to conform to what the government wished, it being the purpose of the company absolutely to obey the law, both in spirit and in letter. Throughout the time that I had charge of the investigation, and while we were in Washington, I do not know of a single instance where the steel company refused any information requested, but on the contrary aided in every possible way our investigation. The position now taken by the government is absolutely destructive of legitimate business, because they outline no rule of conduct for business of any magnitude. It is absurd to say that the courts can lay down such rules. The most the courts can do is to find as legal or illegal the particular transactions brought before them. Hence, after years of tedious litigation, there would be no clear-cut rule for future action. This method of procedure is dealing with the device, not the result, and drives business to the elaboration of clever devices, each of which must be tested in the courts. I have yet to find a better method of dealing with the antitrust situation than that suggested by the bill which we agreed upon in the last days of your administration. That bill should be used as a basis for legislation, and there could be incorporated upon it whatever may be determined wise regarding the direct control and supervision of the national government, either through a commission similar to the Interstate Commerce Commission, or otherwise. Before taking up the matter in its large aspect, I wish to say one word as to one feature of the government suit against the Steel Corporation. One of the grounds for the suit is the acquisition by the Steel Corporation of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company. It has been alleged, on the authority of the government officials engaged in carrying on the suit, that as regards this transaction I was misled by the representatives of the Steel Corporation, and that the facts were not accurately or truthfully laid before me. This statement is not correct. I believed at the time that the facts in the case were as represented to me on behalf of the Steel Corporation, and my further knowledge has convinced me that this was true. I believed at the time that the representatives of the Steel Corporation told me the truth as to the change that would be worked in the percentage of the business which the proposed acquisition would give the Steel Corporation, and further inquiry has convinced me that they did so. I was not misled. The representatives of the Steel Corporation told me the truth as to what the effect of the action at that time would be, and any statement that I was misled, or that the representatives of the Steel Corporation did not thus tell me the truth as to the facts of the case, in the outlook of August 19th last, I gave in full the statement I had made to the investigating committee of the House of Representatives on this matter. That statement is accurate, and I reaffirm everything I therein said not only as to what occurred, but also as to my belief in the wisdom and propriety of my action. Indeed, the action not merely was wise and proper, but it would have been a calamity from every standpoint had I failed to take it. 
On page 137 of the printed report of the testimony before the committee will be found Judge Gary's account of the meeting between himself and Mr. Frick and Mr. Root and myself. This account states the facts accurately. It has been alleged that the purchase by the Steel Corporation of the property of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company gave the Steel Corporation practically a monopoly of the southern iron ores, that is, of the iron ores south of the Potomac and the Ohio. My information, which I have every reason to believe is accurate and not successfully to be challenged, is that of these southern iron ores the Steel Corporation has, including the property gained from the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company, less than twenty per cent, perhaps not over sixteen per cent. This is a very much smaller percentage than the percentage it holds of the Lake Superior ores, which even after the surrender of the Hill lease will be slightly over fifty per cent. According to my view, therefore, and unless, which I do not believe possible, these figures can be successfully challenged, the acquisition of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company's ores in no way changed the situation as regards making the Steel Corporation a monopoly. The showing as to the percentage of production of all kinds of steel ingots and steel casings in the United States by the Steel Corporation and by all other manufacturers, respectively, makes an even stronger case. It makes the case even stronger than I put it in my testimony before the investigating committee, for I was scrupulously careful to make statements that erred, if at all, against my own position. It appears from the figures of production that in 1901 the Steel Corporation had to its credit nearly 66 per cent of the total production, as against a little over 34 per cent by all other steel manufacturers. The percentage then shrank steadily, until, in 1906, the year before the acquisition of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Properties, the percentage was a little under 58 per cent. In spite of the acquisition of these properties, the following year, 1907, the total percentage shrank slightly, and this shrinking has continued, until, in 1910, the total percentage of the Steel Corporation is but a little over 54 per cent, and the percentage of all other steel manufacturers but a fraction less than 46 per cent. Of the fifty-four and thirty-one hundredths per cent produced by the Steel Corporation, one point nine one per cent is produced by the former Tennessee Coal and Iron Company. In other words, these figures show that the acquisition of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Company did not, in the slightest degree, change the situation, and that during the ten years which include the acquisition of these properties by the Steel Corporation, the percentage of total output of steel manufacturers in this country by the Steel Corporation has shrunk, from nearly 66 per cent, to but a trifle over 54 per cent. I do not believe that these figures can be successfully controverted, and if not successfully controverted they show clearly not only that the acquisition of the Tennessee Coal and Iron Properties wrought no change in the status of the Steel Corporation, but that the Steel Corporation, during the decade, has lost steadily, instead of gained, in monopolistic character. My own belief is that our nation should long ago have adopted the policy of merely leasing, for a term of years, mineral-bearing land. But it is the fault of us ourselves, of the people, not of the Steel Corporation, that this policy has not been adopted. So much for the facts in this particular case. Now for the general subject. When my administration took office, I found not only that there had been little real enforcement of the anti-trust law, and but little more effective enforcement of the interstate commerce law, but also that the decisions were so chaotic, and the laws themselves so vaguely drawn, or at least interpreted in such widely varying fashions, that the biggest business men tended to treat both laws as dead letters. The series of actions by which we succeeded in making the interstate commerce law an efficient and most useful instrument in regulating the transportation of the country, and exacting justice from the big railways without doing them injustice, while indeed, on the contrary, securing them against injustice, need not be here related. The anti-trust law it was also necessary to enforce, as it had never hitherto been enforced, both because it was on the statute books, and because it was imperative to teach the masters of the biggest corporations in the land that they were not, and would not be permitted to regard themselves as above the law. Moreover, where the combination has really been guilty of misconduct, the law serves a useful purpose, and in such cases as those of the Standard Oil and Tobacco Trusts, if effectively enforced, the law confers a real and great good. Suits were brought against the most powerful corporations in the land, which we were convinced had clearly and beyond question violated the anti-trust law. 
these suits were brought with great care, and only where we felt so sure of our facts that we could be fairly certain that there was a likelihood of success. As a matter of fact, in most of the important suits we were successful. It was imperative that these suits should be brought, and a very real good was achieved by bringing them, for it was only these suits that made the great masters of corporate capital in America fully realize that they were the servants and not the masters of the people, that they were subject to the law, and that they would not be permitted to be a law unto themselves, and the corporations against which we proceeded had sinned, not merely by being big, which we did not regard as in itself a sin, but by being guilty of unfair practices towards their competitors, and by procuring fair advantages from the railways. But the resulting situation has made it evident that the antitrust law is not adequate to meet the situation that has grown up, because of modern business conditions and the accompanying tremendous increase in the business use of vast quantities of corporate wealth. As I have said, this was already evident to my mind when I was President, and in communications to Congress I repeatedly stated the facts. But when I made these communications there were still plenty of people who did not believe that we would succeed in the suits that had been instituted against Standard Oil, the Tobacco, and other corporations, and it was impossible to get the public as a whole to realize what the situation was. Sincere zealots who believed that all combinations could be destroyed, and the old-time conditions of unregulated competition restored, insincere politicians who knew better, but made believe they thought whatever their constituents wished them to think, crafty reactionaries who wished to see on the statute books laws which they believed unenforceable, and the almost solid Wall Street crowd, or representatives of big business, who at that time opposed with equal violence both wise and necessary and unwise and improper regulation of business, all fought against the adoption of a sane, effective, and far-reaching policy. It is a vitally necessary thing to have the persons in control of big trusts of the character of the Standard Oil Trust and Tobacco Trust taught that they are under the law, just as it was a necessary thing to have the Sugar Trust taught the same lesson in drastic fashion by Mr. Henry L. Stimson, when he was United States District Attorney in the city of New York. But to attempt to meet the whole problem not by administrative governmental action, but by a succession of lawsuits, is hopeless from the standpoint of working out a permanently satisfactory solution. Moreover, the results sought to be achieved are achieved only in extremely insufficient and fragmentary measure, by breaking up all big corporations, whether they have behaved well or ill, into a number of little corporations which it is perfectly certain will be largely, and perhaps altogether, under the same control. Such action is harsh and mischievous if the corporation is guilty of nothing except its size, and where, as in the case of the Standard Oil, and especially the Tobacco Trusts, the corporation has been guilty of immoral and antisocial practices, there is need for far more drastic and thoroughgoing action than any that has been taken, under the recent decree of the Supreme Court. In the case of the Tobacco Trust, for instance, the settlement in the Circuit Court, in which the representatives of the government seem inclined to concur, practically leaves all of the companies still substantially under the control of the twenty-nine original defendants. Such a result is lamentable from the standpoint of justice. The decision of the circuit court, if allowed to stand, means that the tobacco trust has merely been obliged to change its clothes, that none of the real offenders have received any real punishment, while, as the New York Times, a pro-trust paper says, the tobacco concerns, in their new clothes, are in positions of ease and luxury, and immune from prosecution under the law. Surely a miscarriage of justice is not too strong a term to apply to such a result, when considered in connection with what the Supreme Court said of this trust. That great court, in its decision, used language which, in spite of its habitual and severe self-restraint in stigmatizing wrongdoing, yet unhesitatingly condemns the tobacco trust for moral turpitude, saying that the case shows an ever-present manifestation of conscious wrongdoing by the trust, whose history is replete with the doing of acts which it was the obvious purpose of the statute to forbid, demonstrative of the existence from the beginning of such a purpose to acquire dominion and control of the tobacco trade, not by the mere exertion of the ordinary right to contract into trade, but by methods devised in order to monopolize the trade by driving competitors out of business, which were ruthlessly carried out upon the assumption that to work upon the fears or play upon the cupidity of competitors would make success possible. 
The letters from and to various officials of the Trust, which were put in evidence, show a literally astounding and horrifying indulgence by the Trust in wicked and depraved business methods, such as the endeavour to cause a strike in their rival firm's factory, or the shutting off the market of an independent tobacco firm by taking the necessary steps to give them a warm reception, or forcing importers into a price agreement by causing and continuing a demoralization of the business for such length of time as may be deemed desirable. I quote from the letters. A trust guilty of such conduct should be absolutely disbanded, and the only way to prevent the repetition of such conduct is by strict governmental supervision, and not merely by lawsuits. End of Appendix A, Part 1 Appendix A, Part 2 of the Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt, Appendix A. The Trusts, the People, and the Square Deal, Part 2. The antitrust law cannot meet the whole situation, nor can any modification of the principle of the antitrust law avail to meet the whole situation. The fact is that many of the men who have called themselves progressives, and who certainly believe that they are progressives, represent in reality in this matter not progress at all, but a kind of sincere rural Toryism. These men believe that it is possible, by strengthening the antitrust law, to restore business to the competitive conditions of the middle of the last century. Any such effort is foredoomed to end in failure, and if successful would be mischievous to the last degree. Business cannot be successfully conducted in accordance with the practices and theories of sixty years ago unless we abolish steam, electricity, big cities, and, in short, not only all modern business and modern industrial conditions, but all the modern conditions of our civilization. The effort to restore competition as it was sixty years ago, and to trust for justice solely to this proposed restoration of competition, is just as foolish as if we should go back to the flintlocks of Washington's Continentals as a substitute for modern weapons of precision. The effort to prohibit all combinations, good or bad, is bound to fail, and ought to fail. When made, it merely means that some of the worst combinations are not checked, and that honest business is checked. Our purpose should be, not to strangle business as an incident of strangling combinations, but to regulate big corporations in thoroughgoing and effective fashion, so as to help legitimate business as an incident to thoroughly and completely safeguarding the interests of the people as a whole. Against all such increase of government regulation, the argument is raised that it would amount to a form of socialism. The argument is familiar. It is precisely the same as that which was raised against the creation of the Interstate Commerce Commission, and of all the different utility commissions in the different states, as I myself saw thirty years ago, when I was a legislator at Albany, and these questions came up in connection with our state government. Nor can action be effectively taken by any one state. Congress alone has power under the Constitution, effectively and thoroughly, and at all points, to deal with interstate commerce, and where Congress, as it should do, provides laws that will give the nation full jurisdiction over the whole field, then that jurisdiction becomes, of necessity, exclusive, although until Congress does act affirmatively and thoroughly, it is idle to expect that the states will, or ought, to rest content with non-action on the part of both federal and state authorities. This statement, by the way, applies also to the question of usurpation by any one branch of our government of the rights of another branch. It is contended that in these recent decisions the Supreme Court legislated. So it did, and it had to, because the Congress had signally failed to do its duty by legislating. For the Supreme Court to nullify an act of the legislature is unconstitutional, except on the clearest grounds as usurpation. To interpret such an act in an obviously wrong sense as usurpation, but where the legislative body persistently leaves open a field, which it is absolutely imperative, from the public standpoint, to fill, then no possible blame attaches to the official or officials who step in because they have to, and who then do the needed work in the interest of the people. The blame in such cases lies with the body which has been derelict, and not with the body which reluctantly makes good the dereliction. A quarter of a century ago, Senator Cushman K. Davis, a statesman who amply deserved the title of statesman, a man of the highest courage, of the sternest adherence to the principles laid down by an exacting sense of duty, an unflinching believer in democracy, 
who was as little to be cowed by a mob as by a plutocrat, and, moreover, a man who possessed the priceless gift of imagination, a gift as important to a statesman as to a historian, in an address delivered at the annual commencement of the University of Michigan on July 1, 1886, spoke as follows of corporations. Feudalism, with its domains, its untaxed lords, their retainers, its exemptions and privileges, made war upon the aspiring spirit of humanity, and fell with all its grandeurs. Its spirit walks the earth and haunts the institutions of to-day, in the great corporations, with the control of the national highways, their occupation of great domains, their power to tax, their cynical contempt for the law, their sorcery to debase most gifted men to the capacity of splendid slaves, their pollution of the ermine of the judge and the robe of the senator, their aggregation in one man of wealth so enormous as to make Croesus seem a pauper, their picked, paid, and skilled retainers who are summoned by the message of electricity and appear upon the wings of steam. If we look into the origin of feudalism and of the modern corporations, those dromios of history, we find that the former originated in a strict paternalism, which is scouted by modern economists, and that the latter have grown from an unrestrained freedom of action, aggression, and development, which they command as the very ideal of political wisdom. Laissez-faire, says the professor, when it often means bind and gag that the strongest may work his will. It is a plea for the survival of the fittest, for the strongest male to take possession of the herd by a process of extermination. If we examine this battle-cry of political polemics, we find that it is based upon the conception of the divine right of property, and that the preoccupation by older or more favoured or more alert or richer men or nations of territory, of the forces of nature, of machinery, of all the functions of what we call civilization. Some of these men, who are really great, follow these conceptions to their conclusions with dauntless intrepidity. When Senator Davis spoke, few men of great power had the sympathy and the vision necessary to perceive the menace contained in the growth of corporations, and the men who did see the evil were struggling blindly to get rid of it, not by frankly meeting the new situation with new methods, but by insisting upon the entire feudal effort to abolish what modern conditions had rendered absolutely inevitable. Senator Davis was under no such illusion. He realized keenly that it was absolutely impossible to go back to an outworn social status, and that we must abandon definitely the laissez-faire theory of political economy, and fearlessly champion a system of increased governmental control, paying no heed to the cries of the worthy people who denounced this as socialistic. He saw that, in order to meet the inevitable increase in the power of corporations produced by modern industrial conditions, it would be necessary to increase in like fashion the activity of the sovereign power, which alone could control such corporations. As has been aptly said, the only way to meet a billion-dollar corporation is by invoking the protection of a hundred-billion-dollar government, in other words, of the national government, for no state government is strong enough both to do justice to the corporations and to exact justice from them said Senator Davis in this admirable address, which should be reprinted and distributed broadcast, the liberty of the individual has been annihilated by the logical process constructed to maintain it. We have come to a political deification of mammon. Laissez-faire is not utterly blameworthy. It begat modern democracy, and made the modern republic possible. There can be no doubt of that. But there it reached its limits of political benefaction, and began to incline toward the point where extremes meet. To every assertion that the people, in their collective capacity of a government, ought to exert their indefeasible right of self-defense, it is said you touch the sacred rights of property. The senator then goes on to say that we have now to deal with an oligarchy of wealth, and that the government must develop power sufficient enough to enable it to do the task. Few will dispute the fact that the present situation is not satisfactory, and cannot be put on a permanently satisfactory basis, unless we put an end to the period of groping and declare for a fixed policy, a policy which shall clearly define and punish wrongdoing, which shall put a stop to the iniquities done in the name of business, but which shall do strict equity to business. We demand that big business give the people a square deal. 
In return we must insist that when any one engaged in big business honestly endeavours to do right, he shall himself be given a square deal, and the first and most elementary kind of square deal is to give him in advance full information as to just what he can and what he cannot legally and properly do. It is absurd, and much worse than absurd, to treat the deliberate lawbreaker as on an exact par with the man eager to obey the law, whose only desire is to find out from some competent government authority what the law is, and then to live up to it. Moreover, it is absurd to treat the size of a corporation as in itself a crime. As Judge Hook says in his opinion on the Standard Oil case, magnitude of business does not alone constitute a monopoly. The genius and industry of man, when kept to ethical standards, still have full play, and what he achieves is his. Success and magnitude of business, the rewards of fair and honorable endeavor, are not forbidden. The public welfare is threatened only when success is attained by wrongful or unlawful methods. Size may, and in my opinion does, make a corporation fraught with potential menace to the community, and may, and in my opinion should, therefore make it incumbent upon the community to exercise, through its administrative, not merely through its judicial officers, a strict supervision over that corporation, in order to see that it does not go wrong. But the size in itself does not signify wrongdoing, and should not be held to signify wrongdoing. Not only should any huge corporation which has gained its position by unfair methods, and by interference with the rights of others, by demoralizing and corrupt practices, in short, by sheer baseness and wrongdoing, be broken up, but it should be made the business of some administrative governmental body, by constant supervision, to see that it does not come together again, save under such strict control as shall ensure the community against all repetition of the bad conduct, and it should never be permitted thus to assemble its parts as long as these parts are under the control of the original offenders. For actual experience has shown that these men are, from the standpoint of the public at large, unfit to be trusted with the power implied in the management of a large corporation. But nothing of importance is gained by breaking up a huge interstate and international industrial organization which has not offended otherwise than by its size, into a number of small concerns without any attempt to regulate the way in which those concerns as a whole shall do business. Nothing is gained by depriving the American nation of good weapons wherewith to fight in the great field of international industrial competition. Those who would seek to restore the days of unlimited and uncontrolled competition, and who believe that a panacea for our industrial and economic ills is to be found in the mere breaking up of all big corporations, simply because they are big, are attempting not only the impossible, but what, if possible, would be undesirable. They are acting as we should act if we try to dam the Mississippi, to stop its flow outright. The effort would be certain to result in failure and disaster. We would have attempted the impossible, and so would have achieved nothing, or worse than nothing. But by building levees along the Mississippi, not seeking to dam the stream, but to control it, we are able to achieve our object and to confer inestimable good in the course of doing so. This nation should definitely adopt the policy of attacking, not the mere fact of combination, but the evils and wrongdoing which so frequently accompany combination. The fact that a combination is very big is ample reason for exercising a close and jealous supervision over it, because its size renders it potent for mischief, but it should not be punished unless it actually does the mischief. It should merely be so supervised and controlled as to guarantee us, the people, against its doing mischief. We should not strive for a policy of unregulated competition and of the destruction of all big corporations, that is, of all the most efficient business industries in the land. Nor should we persevere in the hopeless experiment of trying to regulate these industries by means only of lawsuits, each lasting several years and of uncertain result. We should enter upon a course of supervision, control, and regulation of these great corporations, a regulation which we should not fear, if necessary, to bring to the point of the control of monopoly prices, just as in exceptional cases railway rates are now regulated. Either the Bureau of Corporations should be authorized, or some other governmental body similar to the Interstate Commerce Commission should be created, to exercise this supervision, this authoritative control. When once immoral business practices have been eliminated by such control, Competition will thereby be again revived as a healthy factor, although not as formerly an all-sufficient factor, in keeping the general business situation sound. 
Wherever immoral business practices still obtain, as they obtained in the cases of the Standard Oil Trust and Tobacco Trust, the antitrust law can be invoked, and wherever such a prosecution is successful, and the courts declare a corporation to possess a monopolistic character, then that corporation should be completely dissolved, and the parts ought never to be assembled again, save on whatever terms, and under whatever conditions, may be imposed by the governmental body, in which is vested the regulatory power. Methods can be readily devised by which corporations sincerely desiring to act fairly and honestly can, on their own initiative, come under this thoroughgoing administrative control by the government, and thereby be free from the working of the antitrust law. But the law will remain to be invoked against wrongdoers, and under such conditions it could be invoked far more vigorously and successfully than at present. It is not necessary, in an article like this, to attempt to work out such a plan in detail. It can assuredly be worked out. Moreover, in my opinion, substantially some plan must be worked out, or business chaos will continue. Wrongdoings, such as was perpetrated by the Standard Oil Trust, and especially by the Tobacco Trust, should not only be punished, but, if possible, punished in the persons of the chief authors and beneficiaries of the wrong, far more severely than at present. But punishment should not be the only, or indeed the main, end in view. Our aim should be a policy of construction, and not one of destruction. Our aim should not be to punish the men who have made a big corporation successful, merely because they have made it big and successful, but to exercise such thorough-growing supervision and control over them, as to ensure their business skill being exercised in the interest of the public, and not against the public interest. Ultimately, I believe that this control should undoubtedly, indirectly, or directly extend to dealing with all questions connected with their treatment of their employees, including the wages, the hours of labor, and the like. Not only is the proper treatment of corporation, from the standpoint of the managers, shareholders, and employees, compatible with securing from that corporation the best standard of public service, but when the effort is wisely made, it results in benefit both to the corporation and to the public. The success of Wisconsin in dealing with the corporations within her borders, so as both to do them justice and to exact justice in return from them toward the public, has been signal, and this nation should adopt a progressive policy in substance akin to the progressive policy not merely formulated in theory, but reduced to actual practice which such striking success in Wisconsin. To sum up, then, it is practically impossible, and, if possible, it would be mischievous and undesirable to try to break up all combinations merely because they are large and successful, and to put the business of the country back into the middle of the eighteenth-century conditions of intense and unregulated competition between small and weak business concerns. Such an effort represents not progressiveness, but an unintelligent, though doubtless entirely well-meaning, Toryism. Moreover, the effort to administer a law merely by lawsuits and court decisions is bound to end in signal failure, and meanwhile to be attended with delays and uncertainties, and to put a premium upon legal sharp practice. Such an effort does not adequately punish the guilty, and yet works great harm to the innocent. Moreover, it entirely fails to give the publicity which is one of the best by-products of the system of control by administrative officials publicity, which is not only good in itself, but furnishes the data for whatever further action may be necessary. We need to formulate immediate and definitely a policy, which, in dealing with big corporations that behave themselves and which contain no menace, save what is necessarily potential in any corporation which is of great size and very well managed, shall aim not at their destruction but at their regulation and supervision, so that the government shall control them in such fashion as to amply safeguard the interests of the whole public, including producers, consumers, and wage workers. This control should, if necessary, be pushed in extreme cases to the point of exercising control over monopoly prices, as rates on railways are now controlled, although this is not a power that should be used when it is possible to avoid it. The law should be clear, unambiguous, certain, so that honest men may not find that unwittingly they have violated it. In short, our aim should be, not to destroy, but effectively, and in thoroughgoing fashion to regulate and control, in the public interest, the great instrumentalities of modern business, which it is destructive of the general welfare of the community to destroy, and which, nevertheless, it is vitally necessary to that general welfare to regulate and control. Competition will remain as a very important factor when once we have destroyed the unfair business methods, 
the criminal interference with the rights of others, which alone enabled certain swollen combinations to crush out their competitors, and, incidentally, the conservatives will do well to remember that these unfair and iniquitous methods by great masters of corporate capital have done more to cause popular discontent with the propertied classes than all the orations of the socialist orators in the country put together. I have spoken above of Senator Davis's admirable address delivered a quarter of a century ago. Senator Davis's one-time partner, Frank B. Kellogg, the government counsel who did so much to win success for the government in its prosecutions of the trust, has recently delivered before the Palimpsest Club of Omaha an excellent address on the subject. Mr. Prouty, of the Interstate Commerce Commission, has recently, in his speech before the Congregational Club of Brooklyn, dealt with the subject from the constructive side, and in the proceedings of the American Bar Association for 1904 there is an admirable paper on the need of a thoroughgoing federal control over corporations doing an interstate business, by Professor Horace L. Wilgus of the University of Michigan. The national government exercises control over interstate commerce railways, and it can, in similar fashion, through an appropriate governmental body, exercise control over all industrial organizations engaged in interstate commerce. This control should be exercised, not by the courts, but by an administrative bureau or board such as the Bureau of Corporations, or the Interstate Commerce Commission, for the courts cannot, with advantage, permanently perform executive and administrative functions. End of Appendix A, Part 2「Appendices B and C of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt Appendix B The Control of Corporations and the New Freedom in his book, The New Freedom, and in the magazine articles of which it is composed, which appeared just after he has been inaugurated as president, Mr. Woodrow Wilson made an entirely unprovoked attack upon me and upon the Progressive Party in connection with what he asserts the policy of that party to be concerning the trusts, and as regards my attitude while president about the trusts. I am reluctant to say anything whatever about President Wilson at the outset of his administration unless I can speak of him with praise. I have scrupulously refrained from saying or doing one thing since election that could put the slightest obstacle even of misinterpretation in his path. It is to the interest of the country that he should succeed in his office. I cordially wish him success, and I shall cordially support any policy of his that I believe to be in the interests of the people of the United States. But when Mr. Wilson, after being elected president within the first fortnight after he has been inaugurated into that high office, permits himself to be betrayed into a public misstatement of what I have said and what I stand for, then he forces me to correct his statements. Mr. Wilson opens his article by saying that the progressive doctrine is that monopoly is inevitable and that the only course open to the people of the United States is to submit to it. This statement is without one particle of foundation in fact. I challenge him to point out a sentence in the progressive platform or in any speech of mine which bears him out. I can point him out any number which flatly contradict him. We have never made any such statement as he alleges about monopolies. We have said, the corporation is an essential part of modern business. The concentration of modern business in some degree is both inevitable and necessary for national and international business efficiency. Does Mr. Wilson deny this? Let him answer yes or no directly. 
it is easy for a politician detected in a misstatement to take refuge in evasive rhetorical hyperbole but mr wilson is president of the united states and as such he is bound to candid utterance on every subject of public interest which he himself has broached if he disagrees with us let him be frank and consistent and recommend to congress that all corporations be made illegal mr wilson's whole attack is largely based on a deft but far from ingenuous confounding of what we have said of monopoly which we propose so far as possible to abolish and what we have said of big corporations which we propose to regulate mr wilson's own vaguely set forth proposals being to attempt the destruction of both in ways that would harm neither in our platform we use the word monopoly but once and then we speak of it as an abuse of power coupling it with stock watering unfair competition and unfair privileges does mr wilson deny this if he does then where else will he assert that we speak of monopoly as he says we do he certainly owes the people of the united states a plain answer to the question in my speech of acceptance i said we favor strengthening the sherman law by prohibiting agreements to divide territory or limit output refusing to sell to customers who buy from business rivals to sell below cost in certain areas while maintaining higher prices in other places, using the power of transportation to aid or injure special business concerns and all other unfair trade practices. The platform pledges us to guard and keep open equally to all the highways of American commerce. This is the exact negation of monopoly unless mr wilson is prepared to show the contrary surely he is bound in honor to admit frankly that he has been betrayed into a misrepresentation and to correct it mr wilson says that for sixteen years the national administration has been virtually under the regulation of the trusts and that the big business men have already captured the government such a statement as this might perhaps be pardoned as mere rhetoric in a candidate seeking office although it is the kind of statement that never under any circumstances have i permitted myself to make whether on the stump or off the stump about any opponent unless i was prepared to back it up with explicit facts but there is an added seriousness to the charge when it is made deliberately and in cold blood by a man who is at the time president in this volume i have set forth my relations with the trusts i challenge mr wilson to controvert anything i have said or to name any trusts or any big business men who regulated or in any shape or way controlled or captured the government during my term as president he must furnish specifications if his words are taken at their face value and i venture to say in advance that the absurdity of such a charge is patent to all my fellow citizens not excepting mr wilson mr wilson says that the new party was founded under the leadership of mr roosevelt with the conspicuous aid i mention him with no satirical intention but merely to set the facts down accurately of mr george w perkins organizer of the steel trust whether mr wilson's intention was satirical or not is of no concern but i call his attention to the fact that he has conspicuously and strikingly failed to set the facts down accurately mr perkins was not the organizer of the steel trust and when it was organized he had no connection with it or with the morgan people this is well known and it has again and again been testified to before congressional committees controlled by mr wilson's friends who were endeavoring to find out something against mr perkins if mr wilson does not know that my statement is correct he ought to know it and he is not to be excused for making such a misstatement as he has made when he has not a particle of evidence in support of it 
Mr. Perkins was from the beginning in the Harvester Trust, but when Mr. Wilson points out this fact, why does he not add that he was the only man in that trust who supported me, and that the president of the trust ardently supported Mr. Wilson himself? It is disingenuous to endeavor to conceal these facts and to mislead ordinary citizens about them. Under the administrations of both Mr. Taft and Mr. Wilson, Mr. Perkins has been singled out for special attack, obviously not because he belonged to the Harvester and Steel Trusts, but because he alone among the prominent men of the two corporations fearlessly supported the only party which afforded any real hope of checking the evil of the Trusts. Mr. Wilson states that the progressives have a program perfectly agreeable to monopolies. The plain and unmistakable inference to be drawn from this and other similar statements in his article, and the inference which he obviously desired to have drawn, is that the big corporations approved the progressive plan and supported the progressive's candidate. If President Wilson does not know perfectly well that this is not the case, he is the only intelligent person in the United States who is thus ignorant. Everybody knows that the overwhelming majority of the heads of the big corporations supported him or Mr. Taft. It is equally well known that of the corporations he mentions, the Steel and the Harvester Trusts, there was but one man who took any part in the progressive campaign, and that almost all the others, some thirty in number, were against us, and some of them, including the president of the Harvester Trust, openly and enthusiastically for Mr. Wilson himself. If he reads the newspapers at all, he must know that practically every man representing the great financial interests of the country, and without exception every newspaper controlled by Wall Street or State Street, actively supported either him or Mr. Taft, and showed perfect willingness to accept either if only they could prevent the Progressive Party from coming into power and from putting its platform into effect. Mr. Wilson says of the trust plank in that platform that it did not anywhere condemn monopoly except in words. Exactly of what else could a platform consist? Does Mr. Wilson expect us to use algebraic signs? This criticism is much as if he said the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence contained nothing but words. The progressive platform did contain words, and the words were admirably designed to express thought and meaning and purpose. Mr. Wilson says that I long ago classified trusts for us as good and bad, and said that I was afraid only of the bad ones. Mr. Wilson would do well to quote exactly what my language was and where it was used, for I am at a loss to know what statement of mine it is to which he refers. But if he means that I say that corporations can do well and that corporations can also do ill, he is stating my position correctly. I hold that a corporation does ill if it seeks profit in restricting production and then by extorting high prices from the community by reason of the scarcity of the product. Through adulterating, lyingly advertising, or overdriving the help, or replacing men workers with children, or by rebates, or in any illegal or improper manner driving competitors out of its way, or seeking to achieve monopoly by illegal or unethical treatment of its competitors, or in any shape or way offending against the moral law either in connection with the public or with its employees, or with its rivals. Any corporation which seeks its profit in such fashion is acting badly. It is, in fact, a conspiracy against the public welfare which the government should use all its powers to suppress. 
if, on the other hand, a corporation seeks profit solely by increasing its products through eliminating waste, improving its processes, utilizing its byproducts, installing better machines, raising wages in the effort to secure more efficient help, introducing the principle of cooperation and mutual benefit, dealing fairly with labor unions, setting its face against the underpayment of women and the employment of children, in a word treating the public fairly and its rivals fairly, then such a corporation is behaving well. It is an instrumentality of civilization operating to promote abundance by cheapening the cost of living so as to improve conditions everywhere throughout the whole community. Does Mr. Wilson controvert either of these statements? If so, let him answer directly. It is a matter of capital importance to the country that his position in this respect be stated directly, not by indirect suggestion. Much of Mr. Wilson's article, although apparently aimed at the Progressive Party, is both so rhetorical and so vague as to need no answer. He does, however, specifically assert, among other things equally without warrant in fact, that the Progressive Party says that it is futile to undertake to prevent monopoly, and only ventures to ask the trusts to be kind and pitiful. It is a little difficult to answer a misrepresentation of the facts so radical, not to say preposterous, with the respect that one desires to use in speaking of or to the President of the United States. I challenge President Wilson to point to one sentence of our platform or of my speeches which affords the faintest justification for these assertions. Having made this statement in the course of an unprovoked attack on me, he cannot refuse to show that it is true. I deem it necessary to emphasize here, but with perfect respect, that I am asking for a plain statement of fact, not for a display of rhetoric. I ask him, as is my right under the circumstances, to quote the exact language which justifies him in attributing these views to us. If he cannot do this, then a frank acknowledgment on his part is due to himself and to the people. I quote from the progressive platform, Behind the ostensible government sits enthroned an invisible government, owing no allegiance and acknowledging no responsibility to the people. To destroy this invisible government, to dissolve the unholy alliance between corrupt business and corrupt politics, is the first task of the statesmanship of the day. This country belongs to the people. Its resources, its business, its laws, its institutions should be utilized, maintained, or altered in whatever manner will best promote the general interest. This assertion is explicit. We say directly that the people are absolutely to control in any way they see fit the business of the country. I again challenge Mr. Wilson to quote any words of the platform that justify the statements he has made to the contrary. If he cannot do it, and of course he cannot do it, he must know that he cannot do it, surely he will not hesitate to say so, frankly. Mr. Wilson must know that every monopoly in the United States opposes the Progressive Party. If he challenges this statement, I challenge him in return, as is clearly my right, to name the monopoly that did support the Progressive Party, whether it was the Sugar Trust, the Steel Trust, the Harvester Trust, the Standard Oil Trust, the Tobacco Trust, or any other. Every sane man in the country knows well that there is not one word of justification that can truthfully be adduced for Mr. Wilson's statement that the progressive program was agreeable to the monopolies. Ours was the only program to which they objected, and they supported either Mr. Wilson or Mr. Taft against me, indifferent as to which of them might be elected so long as I was defeated. 
Mr. Wilson says that I got my idea with regard to the regulation of monopoly from the gentlemen who form the United States Steel Corporation. Does Mr. Wilson pretend that Mr. Van Hise and Mr. Crowley got their ideas from the Steel Corporation? Is Mr. Wilson unaware of the elementary fact that most modern economists believe that unlimited, unregulated competition is the source of evils which all men now concede must be remedied if this civilization of ours is to survive? Is he ignorant of the fact that the Socialist Party has long been against unlimited competition? This statement of Mr. Wilson cannot be characterized properly with any degree of regard for the office Mr. Wilson holds. Why, the ideas that I have championed as to controlling and regulating both competition and combination in the interest of the people, so that the people shall be masters over both, have been in the air in this country for a quarter of a century. I was merely the first prominent candidate for president who took them up. They are the progressive ideas, and progressive businessmen must in the end come to them, for I firmly believe that in the end all wise and honest businessmen, big and little, will support our program. Mr. Wilson, in opposing them, is the mere apostle of reaction. He says that I got my ideas from the gentlemen who form the Steel Corporation. I did not. But I will point out to him something in return. It was he himself and Mr. Taft who got the votes and the money of these same gentlemen and of those in the Harvester Trust. Mr. Wilson has promised to break up all trusts. He can do so only by proceeding at law. If he proceeds at law, he can hope for success only by taking what I have done as a precedent. In fact, what I did as president is the base of every action now taken, or that can be now taken, looking toward the control of corporations or the suppression of monopolies. The decisions rendered in various cases brought by my direction constitute the authority on which Mr. Wilson must base any action that he may bring to curb monopolistic control. Will Mr. Wilson deny this or question it in any way? With what grace can he describe my administration as satisfactory to the trusts when he knows that he cannot redeem a single promise that he has made to war upon the trusts unless he avails himself of weapons of which the federal government had been deprived before I became president and which were restored to it during my administration and through proceedings which I directed? Without my action, Mr. Wilson could not now undertake or carry on a single suit against a monopoly, and, moreover, if it had not been for my action and for the judicial decision in consequence obtained, Congress would be helpless to pass a single law against monopoly. Let Mr. Wilson mark that the men who organized and directed the Northern Securities Company were also the controlling forces in the very steel corporation which Mr. Wilson makes believe to think was supporting me. I challenge Mr. Wilson to deny this, and yet he well knew that it was my successful suit against the Northern Securities Company which first efficiently established the power of the people over the trusts. After reading Mr. Wilson's book, I am still entirely in the dark as to what he means by the new freedom. Mr. Wilson is an accomplished and scholarly man, a master of rhetoric, and the sentences in the book are well-phrased statements, usually inculcating a morality which is sound, although vague and ill-defined. There are certain proposals already long set forth and practiced by me and by others who have recently formed the Progressive Party, made by Mr. Wilson, with which I cordially agree. There are, however, certain things he has said, even as regards matters of abstract morality, with which I empathetically disagree. 
For example, in arguing for proper business publicity, as to which I cordially agree with Mr. Wilson, he commits himself to the following statement. You know, there is temptation in loneliness and secrecy. Haven't you experienced it? I have. We are never so proper in our conduct as when everybody can look and see exactly what we are doing. If you are off in some distant part of the world and suppose that nobody who lives within a mile of your home is anywhere around, there are times when you adjourn your ordinary standards. You say to yourself, well, I'll have a fling this time, nobody will know anything about it. If you were on the desert of Sahara, you would feel that you might permit yourself, well, say, some slight latitude of conduct, but if you saw one of your immediate neighbors coming the other way on a camel, you would behave yourself until he got out of sight. The most dangerous thing in the world is to get off where nobody knows you. I advise you stay around among the neighbors, and then you may keep out of jail. That is the only way some of us can keep out of jail. I empathetically disagree with what seems to be the morality inculcated in this statement, which is that a man is expected to do and is to be pardoned for doing all kinds of immoral things if he does them alone and does not expect to be found out. Surely it is not necessary in insisting upon proper publicity to preach a morality of so basely material a character. There is much more that Mr. Wilson says as to which I do not understand him clearly, and where I condemn what I do understand. In economic matters the course he advocates, as part of the new freedom, simply means the old, old freedom of leaving the individual strong man at liberty, unchecked by common action, to prey on the weak and the helpless. The new freedom, in the abstract, seems to be the freedom of the big to devour the little. In the concrete, I may add that Mr. Wilson's misrepresentations of what I have said seem to indicate that he regards the new freedom as freedom from all obligation to obey the Ninth Commandment. But, after all, my views or the principles of the Progressive Party are of much less importance now than the purposes of Mr. Wilson. These are wrapped in impenetrable mystery. His speeches and writings serve but to make them more obscure. If these attempts to refute his misrepresentations of my attitude towards the trusts should result in making his own clear, then this discussion will have borne fruits of substantial value to the country. If Mr. Wilson has any plan of his own for dealing with the trusts, it is to suppress all great industrial organizations, presumably on the principle proclaimed by his Secretary of State four years ago, that every corporation which produced more than a certain percentage of a given commodity, I think the amount specified was 25%, no matter how valuable its service should be suppressed. The simple fact is that such a plan is futile. In operation, it would far more damage than it could remedy. The progressive plan would give the people full control of, and in masterful fashion prevent all wrongdoing by, the trusts, while utilizing for the public welfare every industrial energy and ability that operates to swell abundance while obeying strictly the moral law and the law of the land. Mr. Wilson's plan would ultimately benefit the trusts and would permanently damage nobody but the people. For example, one of the steel corporations, which has been guilty of the worst practices towards its employees, is the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company. Mr. Wilson and Mr. Bryant's plan would, if successful, merely mean permitting four such companies, absolutely uncontrolled, to monopolize every big industry in the country. To talk of such an accomplishment as being the new freedom is enough to make the term one of contemptuous derision. President Wilson has made explicit promises, and the Democratic platform has made explicit promises. Mr. Wilson is now in power with a Democratic Congress in both branches. 
he and the democratic platform have promised to destroy the trusts to reduce the cost of living and at the same time to increase the well-being of the farmer and of the working man which of course must mean to increase the profits of the farmer and the wages of the working man he and his party won the election on this promise we have a right to expect that they will keep it if mr wilson's promises mean anything except the very emptiest words he is pledged to accomplish the beneficent purposes he avows by breaking up all the trusts and combinations and corporations so as to restore competition precisely as it was fifty years ago if he does not mean this he means nothing he cannot do anything else under penalty of showing that his promise and his performance do not square with each other mr wilson says that the trusts are our masters now but i for one do not care to live in a country called free even under kind masters good the progressives are opposed to having masters kind or unkind and they do not believe that a new freedom which in practice would mean leaving four fuel and iron companies free to do what they like in every industry would be of much benefit to the country the progressives have a clear and definite program by which the people would be the masters of the trusts instead of the trusts being their masters as mr wilson says they are with practical uh, unanimity the trusts supported the opponents of this program mr taft and mr wilson and they evidently dreaded our program infinitely more than anything that mr wilson threatened the people have accepted mr wilson's assurances now let him make his promises good he is committed if his words mean anything to the promise to break up every trust every big corporation perhaps every small corporation in the united states not to go through the motions of breaking them up but really to break them up he is committed against the policy of efficient control and mastery of the big corporations both by law and by administrative action in cooperation proposed by the progressives let him keep faith with the people let him in good faith try to keep the promises he has thus repeatedly made i believe that his promise is futile and cannot be kept i believe that any attempt sincerely to keep it and in good faith to carry it out will end in either nothing at all or in disaster but my beliefs are of no consequence mr wilson is president it is his acts that are of consequence he is bound in honor to the people of the united states to keep his promise and to break up not nominally but in reality all big business all trusts all combinations of every sort kind and description and probably all corporations what he says is henceforth of little consequence the important thing is what he does and how the results of what he does square with the promises and prophecies he made when all he had to do was speak not to act appendix c the blaine campaign in the house of harper written by j henry harper the following passage occurs curtis returned from the convention in company with young theodore roosevelt and they discussed the situation thoroughly on their trip to new york and came to the conclusion that it would be very difficult to consistently support blaine roosevelt however had a conference afterward with senator lodge and evidently fell in line behind blaine curtis came to our office and found that we were unanimously opposed to the support of blaine and with a hearty good will he trained his editorial guns on the plumed knight of mulligan letter fame his work was as effective and deadly as any fight he ever conducted in the weekly this statement has no foundation whatever in fact 
I did not return from the convention in company with Mr. Curtis. He went back to New York from the convention, whereas I went to my ranch in North Dakota. No such conversation as that ever took place between me and Mr. Curtis. In my presence in speaking to a number of men at the time in Chicago, Mr. Curtis said, You younger men can, if you think right, refuse to support Mr. Blaine, but I am too old a Republican, and have too long been associated with the party to break with it now. Not only did I never entertain after the convention, but I never during the convention or at any other time entertained the intention alleged in the quotation in question. I discussed the whole situation with Mr. Lodge before going to the convention, and we had made up our minds that if the nomination of Mr. Blaine was fairly made, we would, with equal good faith, support him. End of Appendices B and C This recording by Aaron Elliott, St. Louis, Missouri End of Autobiography of Theodore Roosevelt